If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1 Welcome to Pandora. Your baby Arjigonotosaurus, LVL 253 Arjigonotosaurus was killed by Liam, LVL 190. Again? It's the freaking fifth of the night. Yeah, I didn't get the health status of the mother and the color I wanted, Liam answered nonchalantly through the mic, not phased by the body of the baby glitching in and out of existence he was mining the prime meats of. Muting himself he yawned, rubbing his eyes as he looked at the hour, 0 09 am, he was surprised by how fast time flew by. Tomorrow, or more like in a few hours, he had to go to work, work as a sous chef in a restaurant, and if he arrived late he would get emotionally and mentally demolished by his superior. Pity, mercy, and anything remotely related to empathy was foreign concept when you enter the cuisine. Gonna stop for tonight. Good night guys, he unmuted himself and said, this was answered by three good nights and alright you have work tomorrow, rip bozo which was answered by a fuck you to that person and then he disconnected from the server, and discord. Stretching himself he stood up and walked up to his bed before plopping himself onto it. And so it was the last time on the earth of this universe that the 24 years old man that was Liam Cram will be. His body, void of any life, will be found two days later by his mother who was supposed to bring him to his aunt's birthday, his death forever inexplicable. It was as if his life was switched off. On a beach in another universe, on the moon of a giant gaseous planet light years away from the earth of this universe. What looked like a well-built human male could be seen breathing slowly in the atmosphere of Pandora, only having some minor difficulty doing so. He was shaved off of all bodily hair and only wore a white boxer drawing a thin line between nudity and exhibitionism. URG, Liam groaned, his body hurting all over like a bit asterisk H, turning around he was met with the sun assaulting his eyes. His mind was still not there but rapidly catching up to the oddness of the situation. Bringing his left hand in front of his face he blocked the harsh sun ray. His eyes turned to pinpricks as an all-familiar prism entered his vision. It was of an icy metallic grey with an orange hologram floating millimetres above it. He <laughs> he. This dream is strange, he instantly denied the possibility of it being real, he was having a very realistic dream while he was sleeping in his room and he would wake up. To prove his point he scratched the implant, the feeling of his finger against the metal and nail against his skin. He froze, it was too real. No. This doesn't make sense. This is a dream, this must be one. It must, he denied, but denying as must as he wanted didn't change anything but increase the weight of his current reality in his mind. The wind against his bare head and chest, the soft sand on his ass that was infiltrating everywhere, the distinctive smell of the sea. And the many moons with a fucking gas giant for all to see in the sky. He sat on his knee with his eyes closed trying to find anything to hold and prove it wasn't real. Panic was setting in, his breathing increased, and the only thing on his mind was, why the fuck was he on a beach with a survivor implant embedded in his left wrist? As time flew by he got his breathing in check, panic won't help. On the contrary, however, saying it was easier than doing but his mind felt clearer. He felt a strong sensation of deja vu, and he wasn't dense enough to not realize the possible implication. He stood up with difficulty, he was taller and more muscular. Before he had a thin frame and was 1.79 meters, 5 ft 9, tall and now 1.95 meters, 6 ft 4, tall with the body of a bodybuilder. Quite an imposing figure for a human. The difference was drastic and disorienting, the weaker gravity of Pandora only added salt to the injury. But he rapidly got the hang of it. With hesitation and no small amount of dread, he walked up to the clear water of the sea, the cool water washing over his bare feet. What he was met with wasn't his face, it was the face of a man in his late twenties early thirties, he closed his eyes and sighed. His skin was now tanned, his eyes now a soft grey with a hint of azure, almost ethereal. The overall shape of his face, nose, jaws, and ears. Nothing remained of what he once was but his mind and that also felt different. 
Luckily he wasn't using a PvP character nor did he like making abominations as funny and ridiculous as they look. The server was vanilla in almost everything stats being in that, and there were multiple quality of life mods on the server, one that gave more options to customize the survivor. To make them less ugly. I. Fuck, even my voice is not my own. This is insane, Leah muttered, his mind ablaze with too many questions mostly about the identity crisis and more questions that only made even more questions that will likely never be answered. He was his level 190 character, and it was more than appearance-wise, he felt stronger, stronger than he ever was, he felt like he could punch through a tree, break human bones like they were matchstick, and more. And there was new information, new knowledge, new data, about the various engrams the character had that were swimming in his mind. From how to make a simple stone axe to a futuristic force field capable of tanking the strongest nuke of humanity point blank. And it was only the tip of the iceberg, it was more than just the engrams in the games. So much more, he marveled at it, the ingenuity, complexity of IT and yet. He wasn't in his own body, he wasn't where he should be, it felt alien, wrong but also right in a strange way he couldn't explain. It was as if it always had been this way but he knew it wasn't. It was both terrifying and soothing. I I. I'm my fucking ARC survivor, Liam said, his voice quivering, yet he was calm, as calm as one can be in this unique situation. He was in control of himself and his emotions, he knew he shouldn't be this calm but he was and was somewhat grateful for that but he was far from fine. This situation was insane. It utterly violated all of what he believed possible. This. Okay. Well, go step by step. First, let's see how much I can use my implant, Liam thought, immediately deciding to set himself objectives, and the first was to learn more about the implant and what he can do with it. This little tech device, which was functioning with the small amount of element it passively produces with the help of the body was for all intent and purpose his lifeline both metaphorically and literally. It was fused with the bone of his left forearm, intricately connected to his nervous system, it was more than just an implant. It was an integral part of his body. It stored the memory matrix, his memory matrix, it was his consciousness, memories and personality combined, as close as soul as it could get. And it also stored all of his biometrics, constantly, such as muscle memories. The thing that interested him was to see if it worked like in the video game, he crouched down and picked a stone with his left hand. Now was the tricky part, he didn't know what to exactly do, focusing on the implant he sensed a sort of very deep pocket, a personal pocket space. Immediately he stared with bated breath as the stone and its close surroundings seemed to get spaghettified before the stone disappeared from the face of Pandora. He could still feel the weight of the stone. It was minimal and evenly distributed all over his body, if he didn't focus on it he wouldn't have sensed the difference. Picking another petal, this one decently sized, he repeated the same and had the same result. This is amazing, Liam said with awe, a small hopeful smile found its way on his face, the use of the inventory felt familiar, he was sure that he got more from his in-game character than his body and the implant scanned them giving him rough information on what the stones were composed of, they were composed of mostly high carbon iron, with a sliver of tin and a teeny tiny bit of gold. Then he willed one of the stones out, the process took a good two seconds then he stored it again, and he repeated the process a dozen times. The inventory is here. Now next on the list, he focused on the implant and a bright light emanated from it, it was a hologram only decipherable by him. The first thing he noticed was the dozen red messages popping up, one that said he was disconnected from the ARC orbital network, the colony ship, and all he should be currently connected to. This confirmed one thing, he wasn't in the universe of ARC survival evolved, this severely limited the implant's normal function such as the ability to tell the time, weather, humidity and temperatures, and let the survivor respond with his slash her memories if he slash she were to have an early death but it also meant that any rules were now void. The second thing is the interface was fundamentally different, with less video game-ish, 
and a clear lack of stats slash attributes with exception of the weight limit standing at 700 kg, 1543 pounds, which is equal to approximately three big adult female brown bears and a half, more or less. The other stats were here, just not shown, and in plain effect as an integral part of his body, all were based on the physical aspect and this resulted in him for one feeling this strong, and not being already dead of gas poisoning. This didn't mean he was imperceptible to the atmosphere of Pandora, he had an honorable and weak tingling sensation in his lungs. The in-game character was far from being restricted by human limits however it was far from magical here. It came with a cost, resources. It is impossible to light an entire house with the same amount of energy necessary to light a single light bulb. Third, there was no crafting, it was grayed out. Unusable, he will have to do everything with his own two hands. This was a major weakness as this function let him jump through a multitude of steps, but at least he had the theoretical knowledge in the deepest of detail. It was a strange sensation. To have such a wealth of knowledge, so much information from the most primitive and ancient human first tools to futuristic technological marvels only thought in fiction that would take several lifetimes of even the most brilliant mind to learn. Here all at his disposal, but ironically, most of this knowledge about future technology was unusable. And, fourth, all other aspects besides the one said and the ones containing the adventurer notes were grayed out. This is sorted out. Now only need to map the area to know where the fuck am I, find a stable food source, drinkable water, make shelter, tools, Liam said, each new task adding a mental weight, it will be hard. He then gazed upon the fantastical dreamy sky of Pandora, of enchanting blue with soft white clouds all of it beautified by the ethereal shape of the gas giant in the far distance. It was one of the most beautiful sights he ever saw, but he couldn't truly appreciate it. And some way, somewhat, somehow find a way home. He had a family, friends, and a simple and pleasant life he was forcefully taken from, he didn't want to be here, even with this superhuman body and a vast array of knowledge. How he dearly wished it was but a dream, but he knew better and this objective of finding his way back. An objective that he will with certainty not achieve, that much he was aware of, but that's still something to thrive for, an end goal. Anyway, that's good and all but he needs to survive, no, thrive to the highest extent before even thinking of that. Chapter 2 Pandorian Tickle Chicken the waves of the sea washed over a beautiful but seemingly desert beach while a practically naked human could be seen running around, exploring his surroundings. All was alien, and not in a good way, being beautiful doesn't make things comforting. Liam took whatever he could find, which was seashells and stones, which was all there was, certainly the presence of seashells indicated life, and as such potential food but the problem was he knew nothing about what was in the sea. The lack of cover was also a problem, as the lack of resources, and not forgetting also the lack of drinkable water, he wasn't going to try sea water. That's just suicidal. Adding to that the sea level was higher than before, indicating a rising tide. He will need to move, the only way being walking up the giant hills of sand behind him. In this kind of situation, anything he could do came with great risk, the only good choice was the one with the most optimal balance between risk and reward and moving away from an unknown sea filled with unknown creatures and the currents was the best choice. Liam walked up the hills, stumbling more than once but he arrived at the top and was met with an otherworldly sight. At the top of this hill from all directions a strange dead plant shaped like the horn of a goat grew out of the sand by millions, all glistening in the sunlight, all growing not past his ankle in height. Their complex and deep roots network was the only thing maintaining the billions of tons of sand in place. He stopped mid-step, halting himself from stomping on one of those strange plants. They were covered in small, sharp thorns made of salt crystals, and the reason why the area was sparkling. This instantly sparked his interest and he plucked one, from the base avoiding the thorn before putting it in his inventory. Hey, plenty of salt in those herbs like a good third of the plant is that. Useful. Very useful, Liam remarked. 
Salt was useful not only as a condiment but also to preserve food it can even be used to disinfect wounds and it was only a small part of its use. If he could efficiently extract the salt from them, that is, but he already had ideas for that. He dubbed those plants goat horns, for their shape and the fact that goats loved salt. Then a realization hit him. He will need to walk past them to arrive more inland. Fuck, he swore, walking barefoot on them for at least 200 meters, 218 yards, was not going to cut it, salt plus sand on wounds, and risk of infection. That was a big no. His first obstacle on Pandora, traversing the plain of goat horns, which was more of an annoyance for him. A good 30 minutes later Liam could be seen on the other side, a trail left behind of him plucking his way through. In his inventory was 154 kilograms, 340 pounds, of it, the more he collected the faster his movement and precision got. The weight of objects in his inventory affected his weight outside, but only by half of theirs. And the weight was more spread on his trunk, such as the chest. It was something to take into account. But it was a pretty unique feeling to know you are currently capable of carrying something this heavy with such ease. The fact he was this strong didn't quite register just yet. Scabs already falling off, Liam noticed with pleasant surprise that the superficial cuts he got from the razor-sharp salt crystal on his hands were healing at an increased rate. That by the way hurt way too much for the size of the wounds, similar to paper cuts but worse. Literally adding salt to the injury. Looking behind him his eyes widened as he saw the straight line he left behind, it made into perspective what he just did. Then he saw the plant already growing back, it was a surreal sight, he wasn't going to go to this beach any time soon. He breathed in and out, the base of his feet planted on a mix of sand and dirt. He advanced more inland, the harsh terrain of the seashore letting place to a lowland savanna hybrid mix composed of plains with flora progressively taking in size, color, and variety. Liam walked along the tall grass, noticing a lack of animals but putting on it is normal, what does he know of the fauna here? He didn't stop himself from picking up dead wood, and plants of all kinds, most being blades of grass, some even were similar to bamboo making them extremely useful. The grass in most areas was taller than him, greatly reducing his line of sight. He stopped in front of a plant with a familiar shape but it didn't look out of place in the middle of the alien flora. It looked like an aloe vera, so he took a leaf from the stem of the plant. He scanned it with his inventory and he got that there was a surprising amount of water inside. If it was safe for human consumption or not, he didn't know. The implant didn't have the precision, not the computing power to tell him if the complex and unknown compounds found in an alien plant are hazardous to humans or not. That didn't stop him from taking a good portion of the leaves from the plant, it was the only source of water he found and could use. He continued to walk, staying at a safe distance from the taller bush and tall grass, careful of where he stepped. But apparently, that wasn't enough. Squawk. Liam froze at this sound, hesitantly turning around, he was met face to face with an odd-looking bird standing out of a large bush a dozen of meters away from his location. The bird was 5 meters, 1.6 ft4, tall and possessed two pairs of horizontally slitted eyes that were gazing at him with clear aggressiveness, he didn't know what he specifically did to piss it off but it sure was looking mighty pissed. It was featherless, its skin was grey and blue. Its beak was similar to that of a duck or a swan, indicating it probably was herbivorous, its head attached at the top of a long and flexible neck had an orange crest, it possessed a pair of flamboyant membranous wings on its back too small for flight, it was menacingly flaring them out. The thing that was taking all of his attention was the claws had the end on its third pair of limbs, its arms. Each of the hands possessed three black claws, the one on the middle digit being bigger than himself. The bird was clacking them together and the sound was that of two pieces of metal hitting each other. Liam faced the unholy spawn of a therizinosaur, a cassowary, a swan, and a bat, his eyes dilated to their utmost limit while his heart started hammering in his chest, pumping blood and adrenaline throughout his body. He put his hand in the air and slowly walked backward, while always keeping eye contact with the alien beast. 
the great ostropede glared with its two pairs of eyes at the strange hairless small bipedal creature that dared to walk into its territory. These animals were territorial and rather aggressive, the fact that it was a young male in the middle of the mating season, and that the small bipedal creature in front of it felt not wrong per se, but out of place, out of sync, completely disconnected from the great and all-encompassing mother, and this only amplified the raging instinct that commended it to kill this pesky intruder. And the strange glowing prism was weird and shiny, it would be good to attract a mate. Shit, Liam internally swore. He could instinctively feel it, the palpable tension in the air, what it was going to do next, what it wanted. He was in extreme danger, he needed to run away, and find a place safe from this titanic bird, and fast. His grey eyes rapidly scanned his surroundings but he never let go of eye contact for more than a second. In the distance amid the small to medium-sized trees was one tree that seemed tall and strong enough for him to climb up and that the bird couldn't simply unroot, however, it was quite far. A stone materialized above the palm of his left hand, he prepared himself to run hoping that he would outrun the beast. Hurling the stone the alien bird focused on it for half a second, a time Liam used to sprint as if his life depended on it. Which it did. Right after he passed next to the confused bird he heard its squawk, a squawk that promised blood. This spurred him to run even faster, pushing even more strength he didn't know he had into each of his steps. He rapidly arrived at the human gnome limit speed and right after he broke through it, only the dense atmosphere of Pandora limited his speed to around 45 km per hour, 29 me slash h, and his lungs could not function at their full capacity. Running at such speed would have felt incredible if the claws that barely missed to cleave his head off didn't exist. Liam heard the snap of a beak behind him, and felt the wind produced by the swing of the massive claws along his back, he could die and he would if he didn't do something. He had never felt this close to death, it was visceral, both terrifying and oddly exhilarating, at the same time there was this feeling from a part deep within him that told him it wasn't the first time a situation like this happened. He took a sudden turn surprising the great ostropede, this made the distance between the two greater. Alas, it was but a temporary solution as it soon was back behind him. And so the chase continued for only Iwa or any other deity knew how long, Liam never looking back his mind hyper-focused, zigzagging, weaving between the tall grass, moving around bushes, he was starting to feel the ache and burn in his muscles. Hope was in sight as he rapidly approached the tree, its trunk rivaled giant redwood, it was tall as a six-story building, its branches covered in small green oval-shaped leaves with bell-shaped red flowers growing all around its light beige and smooth bark. I need to slow down, Liam thought, a very risky and rushed plan was forming in his mind. Running at such speed while not being particularly lightweight made he couldn't simply stop not like it would have changed if he was lighter, he needed to decelerate or he would smash into the tree. And that's what he did his heart somehow beat faster as he felt each of the steps of the great ostropede. Right at the moment he arrived at the tree he stopped moving and at the last second crouched down. His eyes wide open, shivers running down his spine, above him was the long middle claw of the bird half embedded into the trunk. It could have been him. It worked, Liam thought but didn't let himself be distracted. He wasted no time and got hold of a branch and pulled himself up passing in the middle of the claw that was above him. The branch barely holding on to his weight he took another on instincts and the next second was him climbing as fast as he could while from below a cry close to one of that of frustration could be heard and its vibration resonated through the tree. Liam's movements were far from precise, or optimal, he was really starting to feel weary, his lung burned but he continued, adrenaline coursing through his body. Then he felt something cold touch his upper back, time slowed down in his mind. He let out a muffled scream of agony as the two-meter-long claw cut diagonally all along his back from his left shoulder to his right lower back, missing his spine by a mere few centimeters. But Liam didn't stop climbing, he couldn't. Even with the white-hot pain vibrating in waves from his blood-covered back. He only clenched his jaws as hard as he could and focused on climbing. It was the only thing that mattered. He will survive. Chapter 3 Returning to Stone Age 
On the thick branch of a tree sat a human, his face was tense, pale and sweaty and his eyes bloodshot, his breathing ragged, the start of a headache, and his hands clutched against the bark. He succeeded in climbing but was injured in the process. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck, was all that Liam could think, looking down he was met with the great ostropede's head, its four eyes glaring at him, and one of its claws was tainted red with his blood. It was calmly sitting on the ground with its legs folded under itself. It was waiting for him to fall, for him to weaken enough through blood loss and finish what it started. It could wait as long as necessary, all this area was part of its territory. The realization that the bird will wait and will not give up on wanting to kill him lighted something in him, a deep-seated anger born from his current situation, and at the moment it was mainly aimed at the bird. He never felt such a powerful urge before, he was going to kill it he promised himself that. But not now, it was not blind anger, he wasn't going to kill himself for that and neither risk greater injury. His implant glowed brighter in response to his emotion. He will recover and be properly prepared, all of which will need to be done methodically. But he will for the moment injure it, at least try. The Law of Retribution An eye for an eye Amidst the agony caused by the open wound on his back, he stood up. Each of his movements was felt through his back, only amplifying the pain. A jagged stone appeared on his left hand just like before, Liam took in a throwing position, muscle fibers flexing, muscle memories of his body working in tandem with his mind. He concentrated, regulating his breathing, he then took a very deep breath and yelled at the top of his lungs. Hey! You son of a bit asterisk H, this instantly attracted the great ostropede who stood up, it didn't understand what the creature's noises meant and it didn't care, it attacked with its beak, snapping it shut at barely two meters from Liam's feet. Not wasting this chance he threw the stone with as much force he could muster, and the projectile flew through the air with great speed and force. Scare! It hit its mark, it dug right into the upper right eye's cornea, and blood immediately spurted out of the ruptured eyeball. The great ostraped panicked, it felt such intense pain for the first time, it didn't understand what just happened. It squawked in pain and moved away shaking its head and body to get rid of the stone, but it was in vain and only aggravated the damage on the now unusable eye. It stumbled before running away, it should have gone for the kill earlier. The human didn't even celebrate his temporary victory, too exhausted, both mentally and physically to do so or even care. The spur of anger had drained him of his last bit of strength. He lay against the smooth trunk, his weight on the uninjured side of his back, staring up at the sky he saw the beautiful sunset of Pandora from this place he could see the sea in the far distance. He closed his eyes and fell into a deep dreamless sleep. The next day he woke up not thanks to the melodious song of small hummingbird-like creatures flying around and gorging themselves on the delicious nectar contained deep within the flowers but to the pain in his body. This is real, Liam mumbled. This tiny bit of naive hope that it was but a nightmare was crushed. Looking up he saw a different yet similar enchanting sky that when he first woke up. There were different moons at different places. It was a sky he would see each time he woke up, each time a reminder he wasn't on earth. Moving he hissed as pain permeated his entire being. It was less powerful than yesterday but just as intense, his back turned the most and his legs were also extremely sore. Just like the next day of an intense workout, a workout was taken to the extreme, to the point of potentially crippling oneself. He was not in the best of shape, but he is alive. He didn't die of hemorrhage, and he was far from having lost a dangerous amount of blood. How do I even take care of that? Will it just heal away like the cuts on my hand, he thought with clear worry written on his face, a part of him was furious but he controlled it. Anger here will not help. His hands carefully explored his back, it was caked in dry blood and his face twitched in discomfort each time his finger moved too close to the claw wound, at the edge's skin where the cut was sallow or the skin already showed signs of healing. However, it will take time, he may heal faster than the average common mortal man but a wound of this size will take more than a few hours and a tap on the shoulder to fully heal. 
not counting that the wound would need to heal on its own without the help of suturing as he couldn't do it himself for obvious reasons, and other modern medical necessities that could prevent several complications. And that he wasn't a doctor, and was blind to the flora and fauna of this world, most of the things he could think of could lead to different problems or be counterproductive. The knowledge in his possession was more on the engineering side of things, multiple tools could help, such as the tech phase gun that could mend flesh but it was not made with sticks and stones. It was even more frustrating to have the solution but not the means to make it happen. I can only wait and hope I live. Fuck. At least. Let's use this time productively, he said to himself, with conviction in his voice. He wasn't going to let himself die. He was hungry and incredibly thirsty, both of these problems could be answered by the various plant life he collected, such as the alien aloe vera, there also were flowers he could grab on the tree. If certain flowers can be eaten on earth, surely why not here? Even the tree's sap could also potentially be used as a stable food and water source. He needed to regain strength. On the palm of his left hand appeared the beefy leaf of the aloe vera he took, the exterior was of a faded turquoise with some spine on the side. Switching the leaf of hands a black seashell appeared in its place. One part of it was serrated and sharp like the blade of a knife while the other was where the body creature that made the shell used to be when it was alive and now it served as a handle. He cut the stem of the leaf with practiced ease and technique, the flesh inside was transparent and of a beautiful shade of pink. He sniffed it, it smelled similar to basil oil. It was far from the most appetizing thing he saw, but far from less appetizing either. He wasn't a picky eater and wasn't going to be one here. Lacking utensils to eat properly and not wanting to bite the outer layer, he put pressure with his finger, and with his force like the tube of toothpaste the flesh was slowly squeezed out. Not waiting for it to fall he ate the gelatinous pink flesh from the source. It was weird in the mouth but otherwise tasted slightly sweet with an undertone of sourness at the end. Then his stomach grumbled and without realizing he already ate all of it and was cutting a second leaf open, which he then also ate in record times. Ten leaves later and he was only somewhat satiated, but he stopped, he needed to be mindful to not eat his entire stock too soon. The flesh slash gel in the leaves had a pain dampening effect he noted and hoped it didn't have any other less than pleasant effect. It lessened the pain in his muscles but the pain in his back was still present and happy to prove its presence by the random wave of burning pains that made him want to scream high and loud. He didn't even know how he could think straight with that kind of pain. He was your run-of-the-mill civilian but here he was. A different person or a different aspect of his personality came up, or both, in all cases he was changed, forever. It was. He didn't know how to feel about that. It was both good and bad. The next few hours flew by, the shade of the tree protecting him from the harsh ray of the sun. It was a good spot, not too cold nor too hot, not too much wind, and high enough to protect him against most potential threats. Liam couldn't move much if he did he risked reopening the wound on his back or even worse falling, which would at best worsen his injury or at worst kill him. So he passed the time by crafting items that will help him. He made several wooden objects, notably a spoon and many, many spears, learning about what wood seemed better or worse for this or that purpose. It wasn't his first time carving wood, it was one of his hobbies, and it was relaxing. Distracting. Even if anybody could make pointy sticks, but he made better pointy sticks. Then he also weaved various plants, at first, he simply tested which one was better for what, which was good for paper, string, row pizza tirat. Once that was done he made what appeared to be a cover, and the start of clothing, notably a band that protected his back. He never did this before but it felt as if, for comparison, someone was relearning to ride a bike. Liam knew of dozens of ways to weave plants into various things, from clothing to furniture, and what were each technique's weaknesses and advantages all of this thanks to the engrams engraved in his very being. Since he was going to live on the tree for some time he was going to make it as comfortable, and safe as possible. So sleeping at the mercy of the elements and alien wildlife was a big no. Liam was like a child, 
at least in terms of understanding this world, and he was aware of it. He needed to learn, he would evidently make mistakes which he already did earn a nasty wound, he would stumble, he would need to take risks, make difficult choices, and be resourceful and quick-witted, or he would be swallowed whole by the strange environment that inhabited Pandora. And so the day continued on, he also started to make a ceiling by using the branch above him. He then ate some more alien aloe vera to reduce the pain in his back, before falling asleep under the mesmerizing sunset of Pandora. A proto-blanket protecting his body was made of wide leaves tied together with strings of grass weaved together. This might have been harder than the first, he barely slept. Between the strange sound of animals, the odd position of his body, the various bugs flying around, and the wound on his back. The pain was at the forefront of his mind, the constant tingling of his flesh healing with the random wave of pain that came just before he managed to doze off, and the movement he made when he touched his wound kept him awake. Only at the end of the night did he finally fall asleep. Chapter 4 Recovering Day 3 In the morning on the Great Plains of Pandora Fuck this shit, Liam yelled more out of shock than anything the muscle in his arms taut, holding one of the wood spears he made yesterday. He didn't have to wait long to test their effectiveness. Embedded halfway through the spear was a flying creature the size of a turkey, it was of a vibrant purple, and it was a sting bat. Even stabbed through the chest with red blood spurting out. It was alive, jerking around, wings flapping uselessly, mouth full of small needle-like teeth aggressively snapping, screeching, and the barb at the end of its tail trying to stab him in the face. Liam woke up not even minutes five minutes ago, and the first thing he saw was that little shit flying straight at him, as such he took one of his spears out. More of a prevention than anything but this creature kept flying in a straight line and impaled itself on it without him doing anything. Liam stayed in place and waited this way for half an hour. Until the sting bat finally stopped moving, its eyes half closed and body limp. Liam shook the spear to see if it was really dead. He sighed. Finally, it was dead, he slowly brought the carcass to him. Just as he was going to take it off the spear the body spasmed. Right after, a high-pitched screech escaped its throat and its bladed tail sprung to his face, missing his left eye by a few millimeters only thanks to his reflex. It cut deeply into his left eyebrow, just as it did that Liam's palm met its face. A crack was heard. The skull caved in, the eyes popped out and the small carbon-reinforced vertebrae of the neck crumbled under the strength behind the hit. This time killing it for good. I, uh. What the heck was wrong with that thing, he thought, flabbergasted by it all. Then he felt a stinging sensation on his left eye, accompanied by blood trickling down onto his face from his left eyebrow, there was a numbness around the wound like that of a bee sting. It was venomous, but the venom was to Liam nothing more than a bee sting. Great, it was a good way to wake up after a horrible night on an alien tree with barely any sleep thanks to another way worse injury. The said injury that was starting to close, one-fourth of it was now covered by dark scabs that were already falling to reveal scarred skin and the muscles in the middle were rapidly healing. He touched his left eyebrow, this was likely going to scar. Not that he particularly cared though now that he paid attention there was the start of a beard on his face, hair growing on his head, and also his chest. I will look like a caveman if I don't already do, he remarked, he was also filthy covered in dry blood, dirt, and remnants of sweat. He yawned quite loudly and focused back on the creature that he slapped to death. He took it off the spear, the body was still warm, and the smell of blood was strong, he turned it around studying the physiology of the thing. It was different from anything he saw, he didn't know how he was going to prepare but he would try. Liam wasn't going to cook it that much he was sure, making fire on the branch of a tree was not the best idea. At best he was going to cure the meat he could get and cure it with the help of the sun, maybe also using some salt. Or he was going to straight up eat it raw, he was oh so fucking hungry. It was maddening even if it hasn't even been that long. His incredible regeneration needed a lot of fuel and a diet composed of plants wasn't going to cut it. 
Eating raw meat could be bad but anything he could eat here could be bad and potentially deadly so whatever. Taking in a more appropriate position on the branch, biting his lips at the pain from the movement. He placed the sting bat on its back right in the middle of the branch, then took out the seashell knife. It wasn't his first time preparing an animal he killed, he did rabbit, chicken, duck and turkey at the farm of his grandfather. But here he didn't have the same tools, and it was a freaking alien bird bat thing. He wasn't going to touch any of the organs, only the limbs, and muscles surrounding them, those were the ones that interested him. And to be fair. It was kinda all there was to it. The following event was him carefully and methodically cutting around the articulation of the six limbs, cutting the membrane for flight, then the skin around the body, a little bit of fat, tendons, veins, and nerves until only the bone could be seen. All of it he did with a calm face. And the bones were blackish, reminding him of graphite, he simply twisted them one by one, and the limbs came right off. It was incredibly easy for him but that wouldn't have been the case if he had the strength of a normal human. Each of the limbs was then placed in his inventory, he knew thanks to this that the bones had a lot of carbon in them which explained their color. His attention shifted to the two strange tendrils that were growing from its chest around the holes the creature used to breathe. At the end of each was skin closed into the shape of virgin, cutting one open he saw small pink tendrils covered with tiny white hair. Ah he uttered, recognizing what those things were. Those were the neuronal tendril thingy at the end of the neural cue of nearly every creature such as the tall blue cat people aka NA6 from Pandora. He would like to say he couldn't make any hasty conclusion, but he was 99% sure he was on this particular moon in this particular sci-fi movie he saw when he was 12 years old. The thing was, he didn't remember much of the movie besides its incredible beauty the one-dimensional evil corporate humans, and a crippled human soldier named Jake betraying the evil humans for a blue alien chick. And that those blue aliens were called NA6 and were spiritually and biologically connected with the flora and fauna and also a sort of deity vaguely similar to Gaia in concept. And that he was soon going to watch the two at the theater of his town. Until this happened. All of these thoughts were interrupted by his stomach grumbling putting Liam back to the reality at hand. Storing the rest of the bat's body in his inventory, he took one of the legs. It was around the size of a turkey leg, with one swift move he peeled the skin right off till the start of the talon. The pink raw flesh with blood was far from enticing, he hesitated, but ultimately bit it and started eating. It was not good, to say the least. Yet it's raw, what did I expect? But that could be worse. Day 4. Liam woke up in the middle of the night, again thanks to his back injury and a nightmare of the moment when he climbed the tree from the great ostropede but in it, his spine was cut. Opening his eyes he saw something that will forever be in his mind. A giant swarm of sting bats, some up to three meters in wingspan, were flying in the far distance the sound of wings flapping, screeching, and short clicks echoed in the air, while their bioluminescent bodies covered half of the sky. They are eating everything like a locust, he let out horrified as he could see from up here a herd of tall six-legged horses being consumed alive by the swarm. He didn't move, transfixed on the ongoing feeding frenzy that nothing organic could survive. Even members of the swarm were not spared from being part of the feast and a third of it was self-consumed in a cannibalistic frenzy. It was madness, the only thing he could do was not move and wait and hope till they fly away, as far as possible. And they eventually did, and he could finally calm down. Nothing could go against that but bombs and fires. Day 5 Finally. Finally, I can move. Ah am I back. Fuck, Liam cheered, then cried in pain before swearing. It felt so good to be able to stand up and not keel over from the pain he forgot for a moment he still was very much injured. It was just closed leaving a 50-ish centimeter long scar running diagonally along his back but inside the flesh was still regenerating and the flesh tender. Same for his left eyebrow, it scarred as he anticipated but it was barely noticeable and didn't impede the supercilium from growing. The one thing he was glad and surprised by was that he didn't get any infection, this was thanks to his superior immune system and that his body was 
inhospitable, so to say, with bacteria, viruses, and parasites of all kinds. Another thing he was happy about was that Pandora didn't possess mosquitoes or flies, or at least ones that were interested in humans. There were still plenty of chitin-covered critters, such that during the night he saw bioluminescent wasps the size of a sparrow flying amidst the plain, those were hellfire wasps, not that he knew their name. For him, they were just biggest to not be stung by. Calming down he sat down, his stomach grumbled and he extended his taking the piece of sting bat's jerky meat seasoned with goat horns, the plant. Far from being good but infinitely better than raw meat, the seasoning is mainly the cause of this better taste. The herb had a slight hint of curry too. This meat didn't come from the one he killed two days ago, it was already eaten. It was from yesterday, two of those bats attacked him at the same time. One swift spear strike at the head followed by a second on the other bat and both were dead, this time he double tapped to make sure they were truly dead, however. Free meat, it was that, well until more than two or three come, and then the table will be turned, he only had so many hands. This was why since he now could move he was going to build a nest where he slept, an idea he got when he saw the swarm and realized how vulnerable he was. And it could be beneficial. This nest was based on weaver birds' nests but adapted to humans, a type of bird that didn't exist anymore in this universe. The next 20 minutes was him thinking about how to build it, with the knowledge of architecture he possessed from the engrams and the new ways his mind worked it wasn't hard to exactly visualize a first schema and further elaborate and modify it to suit his needs. At the end of the day he had mostly finished. It formed a protective sphere of woods and grass carefully woven together and attached to multiple branches with ropes, two entrances slash exits one below and another above, both with no doors at the moment. It was far from being good in his opinion, there were many places to improve. He was a perfectionist in some aspects. While at it he also finished the bed he started some time ago. There was also the possibility of carving the trunk for him to sleep in but Liam needed better tools than what he currently has. Punching worked but could break fingers, he knew he tried and that's why a 6 cm fist mark and fissures in the bark were behind him, his three broken fingers with the help of splints were healed in less than a day. The most abnormal part for him was how breaking them didn't hurt as much as it should, and he lacked the fear of hurting himself if that made sense. He worked with speed and efficiency. The resources in his possession he collected before he was attacked only helped, but he was running out of them. In the same manner, if he was running out of water, aloe vera, tomorrow he will go down the tree. Ah! It won't be easy. I have so much to do, Liam mumbled, eyes gazing sadly upon the mesmerizing sunset of Pandora accompanied by the millions of stars in the clear sky of any pollution from the interstices of the branches, and woven plant fiber. A deep feeling of homesickness in his heart, he must have missed his aunt's birthday, and he wondered how his loved ones must feel. All of his thoughts were soon eclipsed by his falling into a deep dreamless sleep. Chapter 5 Exploration Day 6 A human could be seen slowly and carefully climbing down a tree, Liam sighed to himself as his bare foot touched the grass and fresh soil. Walking on the ground after nearly a week of being contained to a branch was strange, breathing in and out he moved around the tree. His eyes stayed longer over the hole made by the great ostropede claw before focusing on the plain surrounding him. The first order was to find water, food could wait as he had all of it in his inventory, to avoid having it stolen by an animal and he saw where he could get some but that would require him to hunt. Liam chose the direction opposite from the hole in the tree. He was going to use the tree and the area surrounding it as his home base for the moment and the foreseeable future. Whom I will need to put up landmarks or find ones, the human thought while walking, the possibility of getting lost was not out of the equation. He didn't hold any attachment to the tree or what he built on out but getting lost was always bad. The human then passed the next few hours exploring, collecting various plants, notably the Pandorian aloe vera. He saw six-legged horses in the far distance and various alien birds. He collected a hundred or so kilos of fresh clay, something that he needed, mostly to begin metalworking. 
the clay was at the root of a tree next to the deep and large entrance of a grotto leading to the unknown depth of Pandora, a small part of him was urging to jump just to see what would happen but he controlled it. All around the plant life was lusher, in great contrast compared to the savanna-like environment around. It made him think of those same grottos on earth that sometimes housed swarms of bats or flocks of small birds. This was a worrying hypothesis, and very likely the truth, the swarm he saw sometimes ago is living here. This was bad but he could hear the soft runoff of water, which was excellent news there was liquid water, well that was what he hoped for he know it's acid, and another thing that picked his interest was a strange and unknown element in the clay. He remembered something about a precious metal tied to the plot, it was called unobtanite, unobtanium, or something, a silly name and the reason why he will call it Pandorium, in all case it was important information to know where it was and a supposedly precious resource. He was going to come back later with adequate equipment and preparation, this will be dangerous, but if it doesn't take risks he will not progress. And that was the opposite of what he wanted, stagnation was a death sentence. Looking in the sky Liam saw the position of the sun and decided it was time to step back to the base, he did go quite far and was a little tired, his thirst and hunger were satisfied by what he had in his inventory. Something's wrong. He instinctively took one of his spears out, one as long as he was tall and ending with a sharp stone while at the same time, he took in a defensive position as he heard the rustling of grass from his right, then his left. It was something he thought of as possible but had nothing to do with it happening but brute forcing his way through. All plans crumbled the moment they became effective, after all. Calm down Liam, Liam thought his heart pumped more blood in his body in a strange mix of excitement and palpitation. Instincts and muscle memories he never had on earth but are now a part of him being the guiding force behind his calmness and confidence at this exact moment. His facial expression hardened and he focused on his senses. He heard the very faint sound of paws hitting the soil and stomping on vegetation. The two creatures were encircling him, one smaller than the other. This standstill continued for what felt like an eternity until one acted. Having had enough of waiting, the young and inexperienced male viper wolf hidden in the tall grass growled and took its chance. It ran and leaped at the human from the back, ma wide open showing rows of sharp teeth and fangs ready to shred and tear apart Liam's neck. Liam spun on himself, ignoring the slight pain from his back that was not fully healed yet, the spear in his left hand gaining momentum as he did so, this was followed by his left arm flexing and the spear was thrown right at the young viper wolf. The spear flew through the air, and the viper wolf that decided to attack could but make a strangled whimper mixed with a bark. The spear penetrated one of its opercula and then its ribs missing its heart by a few centimeters but not everything around as the stone head broke apart. The power of the throw was still enough to let the damaged spear piece through the viper wolf belly by half a meter before finally stopping, effectively skewering it as the dying animal fell to the ground bleeding profusely. A strangely emotional howl of grief followed and the bigger one remaining slowly walked out of the tall grass four meters away from him, it was a female, it was of a deep yellow, one meter, three ft3, tall and 2 meters, 6 ft6, in length. An impressive animal, it was muscular, lean, and ready to pounce at him at any moment. And it was glaring at Liam, its gaze was far from being even remotely sapient, yet he could however detect vague emotions close to sadness in its four green eyes. It was sad but he didn't feel compassion toward any of the two, and why should he? Would you feel compassion toward something that wants to reap and eat your entrails, preferably while you're still conscious. Maybe some would but Liam wasn't part of those. Things trying to kill him didn't sit right with him. Sadly for the female viper wolf, the only chance it got to kill Liam was when it was with its cub and even then it was informed, now however, it had no chance at all. The female knew it, its instincts conflicted, on one side it tells to run but on the other, it yelled to kill the creature in front of it at all costs and it was backed by what the creature just did. The same instinct pushed the duo to attack Liam, and this same instinct won. Hey! Then so be it. It's its choice even if its behavior is strange, the human thought calmly but with alertness, as he saw how the viper wolf body language changed to something more aggressive and threatening, 
a position only a cornered animal will take. You never underestimate a creature backed against a corner. Never. You destroy it before it fights back, well at least in theory. A spear in all points similar to the one he threw earlier appeared in his left hand. The viper wolf didn't wait and directly attacked, Liam didn't stay idle, the spear in his hand was thrown immediately with deadly accuracy, this time it had more power as it was not thrown in the heat of the moment. The viper wolf didn't have the time to dodge, the spear moved faster than its eyes could perceive, and even if it had the capability it couldn't have dodged. The spear lodged itself right in one of the beast's opercula and continued its course as it flew right through its belly from the inside, deeply embedding itself in the ground, trapping the female viper wolf. However, it wasn't dead and wildly trashing, growling, snapping its jaws. It was a pretty disturbing sight. Another spear appeared in his left hand from his implant and he walked carefully toward the female viper wolf, with one single thrust he perforated its brain case, killing it for good. He did the same for the smaller viper wolf, letting them suffer more was simply cruel and pointless, as well as a waste of time. Guess that's what I'll eat tonight. May you two become something smarter and have more luck in your next life if you have any, Liam mumbled, taking out his two bloodied spears he stored them, the smell of blood was heavy in the air. He studied the two corpses, they were ugly in his opinion, crouching in front of the smaller viper wolf he gripped its head, the body started to slowly but progressively distort then it was sucked into the inventory. It's amazing. The level of ingenuity and manpower used to design this device. He was fascinated by the implant, he didn't directly have the blueprint of it but with everything he knew around he understood how it functioned and what is probably needed to create one. Someone else will also be amazed, shell-shocked, or whatever they will feel about this piece of technology that would not be dissimilar to magic but never would they truly appreciate what was done behind it to make it happen. Then he did the same to the female viper wolf, this one took more than two minutes to be put into the inventory. The shape, size, mass, and density of an object he wanted to store affected greatly the time needed to store it. And it didn't stop time. Cracking his knuckles Liam's grey eyes fell upon one of the two puddles of blood left from the viper wolves' bodies, he was thinking about what he just did but it was life, some died while some survived. He wasn't going to let himself die for some alien hexapod mutts. He then looked up at the sun hand shielding his eyes he noticed he was getting short on time. He didn't have a watch and from what he knew the day and night circles were far different than Earth but he should have a good three hours before the sunset. Jogging back a dozen kilometers without pauses to his base, he arrived with a body covered in a thin sheet of sweat thanks to the intense ray of the sun, his breathing slightly ragged and his body still ready to do another dozen kilometers. My stamina is insane. Now. I will need to bleed the bodies and skin, butcher them, cut an area of all grass, and then light a fire before dinner. And all of it while being careful of any fucker that might want to tear me a new one. Seem easy enough, he thought with sarcasm, but it was needed as the rest of the day passed without a hitch or problem. The reason? Any creature that might have been a problem either fled or was eaten by the swarm of sting bats, or was too afraid to remotely approach him and the tree as it reeked of his smell and presence. Preparing the two viper wolves was not easy but a great learning experience, he tried as best to not damage the hide and mostly succeeded while he skinned, he would need it. The tendons and bones too will be of great use. As usual, he kept the internal organs such as the guts in his inventory for later use, such as using them as future fertilizer. A waste of food. It disheartened him, but he couldn't thoroughly clean those types of organs and it was an unnecessary risk to eat those parts. Same as for the damaged part of the hides but he preferred those minor inconveniences over being injured because he wanted the cleanest kill with the less damage possible. And not forgetting that most of the internal organs were ruptured, skewered by the spears, and as such not exactly good and safe for consumption. Chapter 6 Bye Bye Stone Age Three days later. Day 9. Should be hot enough, Liam thought. In front of him was a primitive clay forge, within it was a ceramic crucible that contained molten tin and copper. It was a slow and tedious process of breaking stones, melting everything, 
waiting till it cooled down, taking the copper and tin of what was melted, and rinse and repeat until he got something usable but thanks to this he got a kilo and half of bronze. It's not much in his point of view but that's a start and he still has more stones rich in copper and tin, sadly he didn't find iron in any substantial quantity to be useful, he could make a nail, and this iron could basically be considered steel. He picked the crucible by its handle with a multi-layered glove made of sting bat's hide, and carefully poured the molten alloy into a clay mold. It was in the shape of a tear-shaped blade, he was casting a spearhead. Spear, a category of weapon he loved since he was a kid, not only did he find them cool but also because factually spears are if not the best handheld edged weapon in mankind's history. They could also be used as a ranged weapon in some cases and the body of the spear could be used as a quarterstaff. Really sticks with pointy ends were that let humanity conquers the world and each other. And with his strength a spear with metal heads of any kind will do serious damage, he only needed to get better at wielding the weapon itself. Not that this was unique to spears, for him wielding a fantasy type war hammer was even possible. However, the weapons he wielded had more chance of breaking than anything else, weapons made for average humans were overall unadapted for him. A bronze spearhead was a very good start and he will do more than one spear, it could break and he was going to throw them. He won't stop himself from using his inventory to the fullest of his capabilities. Now Liam needed to wait for it to cool down, he was casting metal there was no need to repeatedly beat it with a hammer. Turning his head, his stomach grumbled at the sight of the viper wolf's meat smoking above a small fire in a small makeshift smokehouse made of clay bricks, stones, wood and large leaves. Way better than sun curing and there was no chance for his food to be stolen. All the grass around the tree was cut, to avoid some fiery accident. Speaking of fire making, it was surprisingly easy to him, it was made even easier to keep it alive with an excellent fuel in the form of a type of wood rich in carbon. Eating his fill, which was quite a lot, and he still felt he could eat more. Liam put an uneven ball of raw copper and tin in another ceramic crucible and then in the forge for another casting, now he needed to wait until it was molten. Then he simply sat on a pile of dirt in front of the forge, his specimen implant glowed for a brief second and a piece of pearl white wood appeared in his left hand, he also took out his trusty black seashell knife and started to carve the piece of wood into the handle of a knife. The blade was going to be one of the female viper wolf's fangs, they were long at least 20 centimeters, 8 in, serrated, and oddly metallic. At the moment the one he was going to use was cleaned of the blood vessels, nerves, pulps, and the like. The other body parts of the viper wolves or anything from animals he killed, he was going and planned to use couldn't be, or more appropriately shouldn't be used right after the kill as they could rot and cause other problems later down the line. It's a generality but one that must be taken into consideration. The most evident being the skin of animals and the long process needed for it to be turned into leather. It wasn't a game with materials that magically transform with the push of a button, it was real life, his life. It put things into perspective how easy life was on earth, every little convenience such as food in the supermarket to a green lead garland for example. This random and mostly useless item came from long and complicated chains that led to others long and complicated chains for its creation and then to be sold. Humanity was like a superorganism one with some little self-destructive tendencies but still. And he needed to recreate everything from scratch it will be. Hard. He was freer than he ever was here, but freedom came at a cost. Finished. Hmm, maybe I'll carve some animals in it after I polish it. Maybe one of those hexapod wolves with a regular wolf, Liam thought, it was simply an aesthetic touch but it was good for his mental health. Storing the handle in his inventory he focused back on the now molten bronze. He had work to do. Two weeks later. Day 23. Liam's left hand was deep into the soil, his implant humming as the ground was slowly getting absorbed within his inventory. He was finishing digging the pitfall for a particular creature he grew to hate more and more. He was going to kill the great ostropede by his own hands he promised himself that and he was going to hold it to the end. However, he wasn't going to play fair, he was going to stack all the odds in his favor. 
Taking his hand out of the dirt he shook it and the thrum and glow of the implant receded, he had a sort of overheat, he couldn't absorb dirt indefinitely, as far he knew he could take two tons, and two tons out before needing to let his survivor implant cool down. He wasn't dumb enough to test the upper limit, not that they weren't in built safety but it was still dumb to test something like this here. In the wild of an alien world. Whipping the sweat off his forehead, looking up at the position of the sun, the gas giant right next to this site slowly but surely became familiar and he didn't know how to feel about that. At the moment, he was only wearing a pair of pants, and as such dirt covered his bare muscular, and tanned upper body. His waist-long brown hair was put in dreadlocks themselves put in a ponytail, his beard was shaved and all in all, he tried to take care of how he looked to a certain degree. He still looked like a caveman but what could he do but accept this fact? It's not like there was anyone to judge him, it's not like he would have cared either. At his waist attached to his skin belt was a small ceramic pot full of glowing worms he found underground since he had started a farm. Earthworms, even if glowing and probably deadly for human consumption, should prove helpful for improving the soils. Or even use them as bait. Shaking his head Liam looked proudly at what he did, a 6 meter, 20 feet, deep and 8 meter, 26 feet, long by 7 meters, 23 feet, large rectangular hole in the ground, a smaller hole in it that led to the outside and woods with bricks supporting everything in place, it was a pit. A trapping pit to be exact, one he could jump over with ease, his body being superior in all points to any Olympic athlete seen in the history of mankind. He was inhuman in those aspects to put it simply. The only things he lacked were their experience and deep knowledge about their own body's limits and capabilities. He was still learning and discovering new things every day about his body capabilities. Muscle memories and instincts also helped. He wasn't risking running on the roof of the pit and falling in it while he played the living bait. Even with nothing in his inventory, he wasn't particularly lightweight. A bronze ground tamperer appeared in his left hand and he compacted the dirt at the bottom of the pit until all of it was hard and flat. Crawling up through the tunnel he ran back the ten or so kilometers of distance to his base, his bare feet leaving deep footprints with the inventory weight. There had been many changes too, one of the most noticeable and permanent ones as he was continually working on improving what he had instead of being content and getting complacent. It was a brick well closed by a trap door leading straight to a water table two dozen meters below and it was right next to the tree. When he discovered it he was euphoric, to say the least, and felt a bit dumb that what he was searching for was right beneath his feet. Crystal clear drinkable water at the bottom explained the tree and how vibrant it was since the first day he was here it never rained once, not that he was an expert on trees even less on alien trees. The only thing missing was a piping system with a water pump to have a semblance of running water but that was more of a luxury than a true necessity for his current lifestyle. But he will do it. Depositing all of the dirt, stones and gravels each on its separate pile, he quickly cleaned himself, ate, and drank. He then took what he needed for a camouflaged roof and other miscellaneous materials to satisfy his perfectionist side before he ran back to the trap pit. Two days later. Day 25. Liam was checking if everything at the pitfall trap was ready, he was wearing a cuirass armor made of bone, hide, wood, and bronze that protected most of his back, and a bronze helmet that also partially protected his nape without impeding his movement. Arm guards were made of wood and bones with one having a random carving of a panda, and a pair of pants made of viper wolf hide with some protection in the form of bronze plates protecting the major artery of the legs and that was essentially it. He didn't wear shoes as he ran faster without them, it felt more natural too. Wearing armor resonated strangely good with a part of him he didn't know he had and felt just like your everyday clothing. All in all, it was light armor and won't stop even a bear from mauling him to death if he doesn't punch the bear to death before. Metaphor aside, it was more here to protect against indirect hits from the great ostropede. The type of hit that practically made him a paraplegic and would have sealed his fate to a long, slow and painful death. Everything seems in order, he thought, as he just finished checking everything. The pit was nearly invisible as he camouflaged the surroundings similar to the pit trap's ceiling itself. 
Doing some jump tests over the pit just to be sure, Liam then jogged to one of the spots where the grate is trapped should be. He studied the alien bird, where it moved during the day and night, what it ate and slept and its behavior and patterns, even if the last few days he has seen some minor changes in these patterns. All from far away without getting noticed, not that it was hard, the great bird lacked eyes and was mostly unaware of its surroundings as it was the strongest animal in a 50-kilometer radius, and one of the strongest land, period. As such a healthy adult of this species had nearly no natural predator. Two hours later, hidden within tall dry grass was a human, Liam took out his sling and a small ovoid lead pebble. In front of him was a field with tall bushes full of black star-shaped fruit, and around 100 meters, 328 feet, away his target was eating from one such bush with the help of its massive claws. Putting the lead pebble into the pouch of the sling Liam stood up and started spinning the sling, it rapidly became a blur to the eyes. He was putting just enough force and speed to reach the sling limit only a little less before it broke apart. His ethereal grey eyes focused on the great Ostraped who was more of a dot from this distance, but a dot he could see in clear detail. It was a long shot, but one he trained himself to be able to do, a feat he wouldn't have been able to accomplish before. 3. 2. 1. 0. And fire, he thought, fully concentrated and focused, the sling was ripped apart cracking the air as if it was thunder like a whipwood and the pebble was hurled into the air with an even louder crack. All of his body flexed as a mere second later a squawk of primal rage was heard, the lead pebble having perforated the membrane of one of the great ostropede's back wings. It was scanning its surrounding wing flared in aggression. Hey, son of a bit asterisk H. Do you remember me? Come here, he screamed at the top of his lungs and instantly turned back and sprinted to where his trap was as fast as his legs could carry him. Chapter 7 Vengeance A man wearing light armor could be seen running away from a five-meter tall pissed-off bird. Pure rage was visible in the three remaining eyes of the great ostropede, rage from this insolent pest trespassing in its territory and both occasions injuring it. Not forgetting the instinctual need to kill the human. It clearly remembered Liam. It's catching up, fast. As I supposed, Liam remarked, a part of his mind worried and terrified about the insanity of what he was doing while another part enjoyed the flow of pure adrenaline that was flowing through his bloodstream. Deep footprint marks were left behind by each of the human's steps, the wind whipped against his face and his spring between each step increased as his ears picked up the rapidly approaching great ostropede. It was faster than the first time, or it wanted to kill him even more. Weaving in the tall grass he jumped over a small six-legged taper-like creature, it was a taperus. Small, docile even to humans, slow herbivorous creatures, they were the perfect prey and by Liam's experience their meat tasted like a strange and unique mix of chicken and venison. A dozen seconds later the taperu squealed in fright as the clawed feet of the great ostropede missed its head by a hair's breadth. Ignoring the six-legged taper the great ostropede pursued Liam, occasionally emitting a sharp and shrill sound that was only amplified by the crest on its head. The pursuit continued for a quarter of an hour, time was meaningless to Liam. Only taking deep regular breaths, ignoring the slight ache in his legs running and dodging the occasional hit mattered, anything else was but a useless distraction. Not like his adrenaline-fueled brain could have cared about much more either way. Rapidly approaching the pitfall trap he remarked he was going to have to jump it diagonally thanks to the wood pole he placed as marks, meaning a longer jump. The hair on his neck stood up as a swipe of the great agitropede claw barely missed his neck, shredding a big chunk out of the hide protection for the neck and he felt pain as the claw nicked a part of his skin drawing a bit of blood. A few more centimeters and his head would have flown. This spurred him to run with even more vigor, right before he walked on the pit's roof composed of branches, leaves, grass and a bit of clay he pushed as much force as he could and jumped. The feeling of being airborne was short-lived, landing on the other side his feet dug deep into the dry soil leaving a trail and a small cloud of dust and leaves. Catching his breath he looked behind and a large borderline maniacal smile found its way on his roguishly handsome face as the great ostropede was one foot above the pitfall. Asterisk squawk. 
asterisk. A surprised squawk escaped from its beak as it was taken aback falling metaphorically and literally into a human trick one more and final time. Falling forward, its momentum stopped any possible attempts of escape. The thin camouflaged roof broke apart revealing the 6 meters, 19 FT7, of air below. Gravity took effect and the great ostropede fell, its speed and weight made it land hard on the compacted ground leaving a large cloud of dust that was immediately blown by the wind. Its left knee was bent the wrong way, the skin shifting in its shape as the great ostrape desperately tried to stand up. Repeatedly failing. Pain, incomprehension, panic and fear extinguished the rage it had a second before. In an instant their place switched, it was tricked again but this time it was the last. Liam was surprised by how well the bird was after such a fall. It only had visible from the outside a dislocated articulation, one that crippled it. A death sentence in the wild. But compared to, for example, for an animal of the same overall bulk as a giraffe, the result after such a high fall with such speed and force would have been way worse and bloodier than just a dislocated knee, tears in muscles, and tendons. It proved how terrifyingly resilient the giant bird was. Yet it was enough. The trap worked, he never thought once it would have killed it either. It wasn't made with that intention in mind, otherwise, it would have been deeper with bronze and wooden spikes at the bottom. A wave of relief flooded his mind at the realization he had successes doing this impossibly reckless plan without much of an injury but a small gash in the back of his head and some scraps in his bare feet. It worked, he did it, but he didn't cheer yet, you mustn't sell the pelt of the bear before killing it. The great ostopede while wounded was perfectly able to defend itself and kill him if he messed up. And no small part of him enjoyed the show, this creature had tormented his mind for what felt like an eternity and caused him physical trauma that only increased the first point. The soft orange hue of his specimen implant glowed brighter in response to his emotions. This feeling however was ignored as Liam wasted no time and didn't want to risk anything. Desperation is a double-edged sword that led down to dangerous prospects. He took out a 2.3 meter, 7 FT5, long spear entirely made out of bronze, a spear alone regular human wouldn't even be able to wield effectively but it was perfectly adapted for someone like him. With a grip strong enough to break bones on his spear he took on a throwing stance similar to a javelin thrower, muscle flexing. His eyes locked onto the head of the great ostropede. It was heavily moving around forcing him to orient himself as to even if he missed the spear would hit one of the breathing holes, operculum, around the base of its neck. Grunting he threw the spear, driving as much force and power as he could. His hate for the beast only added to it. The air whistled as the bronze spear left his hand and flew through the air faster than normal human eyes could perceive. The great ostropede dodged, causing the spear to miss its mark by milliliters but still cutting through the only good eyes on the bird's left side. It continued its course by perforating the thin flap of skin of the operculum. And like a hot knife through butter, it speared through the chest cavity shredding an air sac, a lung, the secondary heart, then the gut to get out on the other side and continue to dig in the ground for two times the spear length. Blood spurted from both ends in abandon. Liam from above stared at the damage he caused, slightly stupefied, his gaze transfixed on the bloody hole where he could perceive some of the organs, the rapid beating of the main heart was for him to see. He did this. It was gruesome, extremely perturbing, sickening even yet he was about unfazed as one could get, and this was the most perturbing to him. He changed in ways he would have preferred not to, but that's life and whining would be of no use. This didn't stop him from bringing another bronze spear from his inventory. At the same time, the great ostropede froze, its brain slowly processing what unfolded before it truly acknowledged it was going to die, the wings on its back weakly flared and it emitted an impossibly high-pitched screech amplified by its crest. A cry it could only do once in its life, it signified its imminent and inevitable death or a great loss, in all cases the one emitting it was doing an act not dissimilar to suicide. Torts and Gaik, an extremely rare event, that was how the NA6 of the Great Pandorian Plains called it, the last wail or cry of a tsaltsping slash great ostropede and the last sound one will ever hear if too close to the epicenter. 
a cry that will resonate far and wide in its territory and beyond. Filled with despair and resentment, the cries also meant it failed to protect its progeny. Liam clutched his helmet, his spear escaped his grasp and tumbled on the ground as a silent scream of agony left his throat, falling to his knee he instinctively stored the bronze helmet and tried to muffle the sound by putting his hands against his ears. It was ineffective, his mind felt like his head was split apart, and boiling acid was poured right into his brain, the capillary in his eyes popped one after another reddening his vision, blood trickling down his nose soon followed by his ears leaking blood. Right after this, he could only hear a low whistle mixed with white noise, and his eardrums busted. He needed to do something, his bloodshot eyes fixated on the great ostropede suicidal cry. A dam inside him broke, and his implant glowed brighter than it ever did. While his pain-riddled mind, fully focused on the slowly dying bird, all the frustration and tumultuous emotions he bottled up since his forceful arrival exploded and the tight hold he had for the last few weeks on his rationality slipped. All hell broke loose, like a rabid animal he lashed out at the closest living being to him, the great ostropede, and also one of the greatest sources of his suffering. He wanted the pain to stop, it was the only thing on his mind. Rhea, Liam yelled, something raw and primal then jumped from where he stood with no care for the hide and latched onto the head of the bird. Its two remaining eyes were as bloodshot as his and ready to pop at any moment with its eardrums also busted and blood leaking from every orifice, never once did the screeching stop and it was felt by Liam's body rapidly heating up. A fist was raised in the air, then brought down onto the wide open goat-like eyes of the bird making it explode, another first followed with even more force, a crack was heard, then another and another. Liam continued to pummel the head of the great ostropede venting all he had kept bottled up inside in a show of extreme violence. At some point, the screech stopped as his fist broke the skull and pummeled the brain, and the bird stopped moving, it was dead but this didn't stop the bloodied form of the human as he continued to punch and punch what was once a head, uncaring of the pain in his hands. Yet after long minutes each punch progressively lost in aggression and force until they ultimately stopped. He was breathing heavily, catching up on stamina. I want to go home, Liam said, his voice lashed with weariness and containing a certain hollowness, he was mentally drained. His hearing was coming back as his eardrum healed but it was not enough for him to notice the tone of his voice. A headache was also present but manageable enough for him to ignore it. Looking down at his hand he saw the skin on his knuckle partially shredded, they were swollen, bruised and covered in his blood mixed with blood, brain matter, bones fragment and flesh of the great ostropede. He blinked in confusion as clear droplets fell onto his wounded hands. I'm crying, he thought, chuckling at that revelation, a bittersweet feeling in his heart. He felt better, lighter in a way, it was strange. He was both sad and happy. Standing up he hopped off the bird's head, the skull was split open, the crest shattered, and the smell of blood was thick in the air and the only thing he could smell. He wasn't horrified by what he just did, he knows he should to at least a degree but he wasn't maybe too mentally exhausted to truly care. And letting all of his emotion go and venting everything out was freeing. Now he needed to take care of the body, not wanting even amid his current state to let it go to waste. Then his gaze fell upon the claws of the bird protectively laid against its chest. From a sort of skin pouch reminding him of what marsupials had, he saw it before but shrugged it on alien biology and didn't think much of it, apparently, he should have as a black ovoid shape mottled with blue spots was poking out of it. Chapter 8 Loss and Gain An Egg, Liam thought in disbelief, the egg was poking out of a sort of pouch and seemed perfectly intact. An idea flashed in his mind, he was going to try and hatch it. At best he got a partner pet mount and at worst he got fertilizer for his plants. He never tried to tame the animals of this world, first, it wasn't going to be like the main method in the game where he knocks them out and force feeds them their favorite food while they are unconscious. Second most creatures seemingly wanted him torn to shred and in their stomach, one of the rare exceptions to these rules was the taperus. The problem was, even if he managed to tame one, which would be fairly easy. What was the point? 
if it was for using them for labor like horses, he was both stronger and faster than them without the need to be trained, so it was pointless, the other option was to use them as a food source. For that, he needed a breeding pair, if not multiple, and invest time and resources he didn't really have all of this for minimal if not negative gain throughout a long period of time. And in both cases he will have to protect them 24 sevenths otherwise they would be eaten by a predator. It simply wasn't worth it. And when he took an endeavor like this he took responsibility. However in the great ostropede case or wolverine bird as Liam called it. It was worth a try, he may hate the beast but he also respected it and it was sad to let the egg here. It's kind of fucked up though, Liam remarked he was going to raise the hatchling after having killed the father or mother. Walking around the huge claws, a shudder went down his scarred spine at their proximity. Phantom pain washes over him for a split second. He took out a dagger with a viper wolf's fang for a blade and delicately started cutting the pouch open, the inside of it reminded him of soundproof foam, it explained how the egg was intact. Putting the palm of his left hand against the smooth eggshell he focused on his inventory. The biology of animals on this moon never ceased to amaze and surprise him, the latter point leading to an event such as the suicidal screech. While he waited for the watermelon-sized egg to be stored in his inventory he looked up at the sky and if his face wasn't covered in blood and grim the rapid paling of his tanned skin would have been noticeable. All around in the sky, he saw black-purple spots flying, they were sting bats, forming each a swarm of thousand individuals and all those swarms formed one bigger than he ever saw. So much so that they blocked the sun and the world darkened. It didn't take a genius to understand why this was happening, the screech woke them up, it was the middle of the day and those giant psychopathic bats with literal pea-sized brains at the earliest and latest were out late in the dawn or early in the twilight. Fuck, he swore, it was bad, extremely so and even more considering two dozen bats dived right where he was a while he was internally urging the speed at which he was storing the egg while gritting his teeth at the increasing headache. Storing it was a delicate process not helped by the thing in question being as large as his torso. It could store living beings but only if they lacked a great deal of sentience and were immobile or if he had access to cryopods. What was he doing out of greed and stupid? Maybe, probably, but he didn't want to lose the egg not after everything he had undergone and it would leave an unpleasant aftertaste in his mouth. He would have killed the beast and gotten injured for literally nothing, it would be a loss on all points. He didn't want that, he hated losing as childish as it sounded. One bat chirped and recklessly plunged at him, its maw full of sharp teeth wide open, it slammed against the claw above caving its skull and dying on spot. Another followed this time weaving around the claws, thrusting his dagger he stabbed the bat in the head killing it. He then flicked the dagger of the body and blood. Another flew in followed by two others, one screeched next to his ears making the newly regrown and sensitive eardrum ring painfully while trying to claw and bite at his armored back, thanks to whatever deities those little shit were beyond red root. It barely leaves any scratch marks on the bronze cuirass. The egg finally vanished into his inventory, it only took seven seconds but that was a time he didn't really have and Liam beyond pissed grabbed the bat by the upper jaws, uncaring for the small cut he got from the needle-like teeth, and then he slammed it against the claw behind him, crushing its spine and insides. Bloodied dagger in hand he jumped over the great ostropede arm, slashing the wing of an approaching one making waver and fall, there were too many of them. He threw the tooth dagger he held in his right hand at another bat, the force of the throw still enough to kill another one behind and cripple a last one on its fall. Three bats, one dagger. After that, he covered the short distance between him and the hole he dug to walk up in less than a second. Inside he tore off the wood support and backed away as it collapsed, crushing three more sting bats and sealing this exit with a heavy dust cloud, only one left to go. Using his implant as a flashlight he arrived on the other side and did the same as before sealing himself 6 meters, 19 ft7, under. There were not a lot of places but enough for him to sit, his back against a wood beam. Now that he was in a safe place he reviewed what happened, it was all his fault yet at the same time it wasn't he couldn't have predicted that, in all cases, he could and should have done better. 
It also was a reminder that the control he thought he had was illusory. The bats at the moment were surely feasting on one another and his prize he refrained himself from punching anything out of frustration. Anger was still present. And this fucking headache was not helping him in the slightest. He couldn't do anything but let it happen, it was life. Slowly breathing in and out he calmed down a bit and focused on his inventory where the egg was put in stasis where all biological activities were slowed down to a crawl, and it was fertilized from the information he got in the scan. Fundamentally he didn't lose much, he gained in fact, the hide and meat of the giant bird were just that, meat and hide, but the egg if he got it to hatch and raised the baby to full maturity. This made him slightly giddy at the idea to ride and command one such creature. But it was for the future. A skin gourd full of crystal clear water appeared in his left hand and he poured it on his hands, cleaning them, the swell was already gone and his skin and muscle fibers slowly regenerated. In one or two days they will look as good as new. He drank the rest before taking another one and pouring it down his head, laughing in contentment feeling the pain of the headache lower a bit. After eating at least a good kilo of smoked taparoo's meat that was marinated in various aromatic herbs. After finishing eating he dozed off and fell asleep, all mental fatigue hitting him like a truck. Sleeping while in extreme pain was something he was accustomed to. A bronze dagger was tightly kept in the palm of his hand and his armor was still on. Day 24 Liam woke, and his mind cleared the smell of earth and blood prevailing in the tunnel. His hearing was back and what a joy it was to not have the continuous buzzing and ringing noise of broken radio in the background. Moving up to the lower exit leading to the pitfall he started to dig his way out, adding wood beams to not get buried alive and five minutes later he was happy to see it was the middle of the day. His eyes landed on a skeleton, the great ostropede, the bones nearly cleaned of all things remotely fleshy, blood soaked the soil, and was accompanied by smaller half-destroyed sting bat skeletons. Might as well use what's left, Liam said, his hand trailing over the bigger claws of the right arm, it was needle-like, sharp, and longer than he was tall. He observed this bird sharpen its own claws against various stones, and overall take great care of them. It was a highly intelligent animal close if not superior to crows in that same department. Twisting the base of the claws it came right off, there was a bit of blood, holding it high he remarked how light it was, for him that is. He then collected all of the others, even from the feet and legs. Those things might as well be made of steel, Liam thought on his way back to his base while he fiddled with a small hook-shaped claw from one of the two proto-back wing fingers. He couldn't conclude without further information but the main element in the claws and their concentration made him think with the data he had that those things were some kind of biologically made steel, somehow. It also meant that the great ostropede had a way to get iron. He supposed that when he observed but it was more of a dumb hypothesis and for it to be the actual case. Well considering everything from this planet with a spine had carbon fiber reinforced bone it might not be that crazy. Not like there is some kind of brain juice that gives biological immortality. Anyway, he wasn't a biologist but that didn't stop him from acknowledging how insane the biology of Pandora was and both marveling at it or hating it depending on the situation. The rest day went over with Liam going and coming from his base to the pitfall recuperating a big part of the giant bird skeleton, two bronze spears, and a toothed knife. He wasn't going to forget about them, the spear in particular. Bronze was a pain in the ass to get, losing this much was a no in his book. The day was shorter, not a strange occurrence quite the contrary, the day and night circle of Pandora was chaotic from an earthling point of view, to say the least, and this without taking into consideration the seemingly random solar eclipse by the gas giant. And even then he found it truly magnificent, a sight impossible from Earth. Even a clear night sky was something you wouldn't see unless far from human activities but beauty and danger and danger more often than not come hand in hand. This held true even more in this alien world. So being active during the night was his sight, even if marginally better than a human in all aspects, was still limited and this is without considering the frequent swarm of sting bats. Thought sting bats as dangerous as they were forget about you almost instantly if they lost sight of you. It was almost comical. Up in his treehouse, 
Liam was whistling the aberration theme while working on a collar, a little thing he decided to craft where he would put trinkets related to events and important things to him. Tokens, and memories. The egg was in a big satchel made of cords filled with warm moss, it was attached right to his side in a way his body's heat will radiate on the egg. A very crude way of incubating an egg, one he wasn't even sure if what he was doing was working, either way, it was the only way he had at the moment. The time it will take to build an incubator and aliment it with electricity will be superior to the time the egg can stay in stasis by at least a factor of five. Chapter 9 First Contact with the Natives That indicates it's spoken in NA6, I hope it doesn't bother people that the dialogue with NA6 in their tongue isn't written in NA6 but it's severely lacking in words compared to English. I don't know it, and all the translators I found are trash. Have a very pleasant day. It has been nearly a month since Liam killed the great Ostropede. He counted the days, he was at 56 days and it would go beyond that, keeping count kept him grounded in reality. His current memory stopping from forgetting to miscount. And that's why there was no random object painted with his blood on it and with a name such as Wilson, then followed by him talking to it as an actual person. He was extremely lonely. He missed his home, his family, and his friends that much he knew, but he was not insane, not miserable enough to go down to that level. He didn't wallow in self-pity at his situation, and neither was he looking to blame any higher being for responsible for it. Or some COSMical event that he was unlucky enough to be caught in, either way, it was out of his control. And worrying about aspects of life you cannot control in any way shape or form is a rabbit hole that led to many unpleasant things. A type of thing he preferred to avoid at the moment. The sky was clear of any clouds, the warm rays of two of the three suns bathing the great plain, and walking along a path of dirt in the tall alien grass were Liam, who was coming back from a rather successful hunt. He was proud of himself to have finally managed to cleanly kill one of those strange paranoid deer antelope-like animals, otherwise known by humans as hexapedi, shy and wary creatures that ran away from anything and everything at any signs, even the wind. Very elegant too, and delicious. Hunting for his own sustenance was something he found he loved to do, not the act of killing the animal, but the thrill of hunting, joy at a successful hunt and there was something else something unique compared to buying food at a supermarket or killing at the family farm. And it tasted better. Opening the 413 FT1, meter giant door made of clay, wood, thatch, and stones, one similar in many ways to an adobe dinosaur gateway with a grunt he closed it right after. The dry ground below showed trails of dirt and a lack of vegetation due to it being open and closed regularly. One door that no regular NA6 and even less normal human could open by themselves. All around the giant tree where his nest-like house was were hundreds of tree trunks with clay in between one another and stone served as a tall wall encompassing his entire base, protecting against most creatures. There also were hidden trap doors connected to the outside in case of urgency where accessing the main door wasn't an option or in case of sting bats swarm or even possibly stampedes from various animals. It was his approximately safe-ish haven. The death of the great ostropede was soon followed by an explosion in wildlife, not surprising considering the aggressiveness and overpowering territorial instincts of the murder bird. One thing he was worried about was if another of such animals were to come but for the moment this worry seemed unfounded. He was still mentally, and physically prepared to face another one. Because life never misses a chance to fuck you sideways with a cactus, that is what he learned even more when you act rashly without thinking things through, so better be ready when it happens than not. Taking out the dead hexapedi from his inventory he placed it on a stone slab with residues of dry blood, the body void of any injury but its head where a hole that let Liam see from the back of its head to where once was one of its four eyes. One clean throw with a bronze javelin to the head from 190 meters, 295 feet, was all it took. The critter didn't see it coming nor did it understand it was dead before its brain was already skewered. A knife materialized in his left hand and he started to properly prepare the carcass, all the while he was whistling something that didn't have any particular meaning. His whistling was answered to by a happy chirp from a hole carved in the trunk of his tree that was covered by many layers of ropes and leaves. 
Queeb. Yes, I'm back, he stopped whistling and said, with a slight smile on his face, another happy chirp followed in response. It was the egg or more precisely the chick that was developing within its confine. It had only been five days since it started, and before that, he was starting to doubt if he messed up and killed the developing fetus by accident. Incubating chicken eggs with a machine specially built for that and doing the same with nothing on a murderous alien version of one, not that chickens didn't have a murderous streak themselves. He was more surprised that his idea even worked so far. And since then he couldn't store the egg in his inventory, which was an excellent piece of news but also annoying as it forced him to leave the egg alone while he was out doing various things like hunting and gathering resources. About an hour and a half later, the corpse was butchered properly, organs that he deemed unfit for consumption such as what remained of the brain, and the genitals, and most of the bones were going to be burned to ash to be used as fertilizer. After that he did his usual routine, eating way more than what a human his size should be capable of, then purifying more metals from stones he picked up by using a less primitive furnace than before but far from what he needed to really work effectively, he was also working on a blast furnace but one thing at a time. Lian finished placing the last ingot of bronze in a storage box made for that purpose, one of the many for the various metals he got. He cracked his neck and gazed upon the sky, it was getting dark. Smelling himself he frowned in disgust, he stunk like a rotten corpse, seven days without taking care of one's hygiene while being active around 80% of the time with his routine do that to you apparently. Anyway, he stripped himself naked without a care in the world storing everything on him in his inventory. Not like there was anyone to see. He was going to clean those too, and also see if anything needed repair or to be replaced while at it. Walking up to the bronze head of a shower attached to a mostly underground piping system made of bronze and bamboo-like plants connected to a reservoir for rainwater and the water table below. Using a water pump connected to the pipe system he waited as the water was slowly and painfully drawn before the icy cold water flew in abandon on his body, drenching his messy hair, regrowing beard then down his broad shoulder, chest, abs, and everything else. The cold barely bothered him, it was pleasant in fact. I can say whatever I want but damn do I love my physique. I did a good job with the character creation, he thought with plain and obvious narcissism and a hand running over his abs. Truly. It was not pleasant to acknowledge this due to various circumstances but he preferred this body over the one he had for 24 years. It was a strange feeling, to have a new body, and become someone different yet similar. He is faster, stronger, smarter, more resilient, more agile, taller bigger in various aspects, better looking and in possession of extensive knowledge in various fields some not even conceivable due to the technology gap to his earth. There was no comparison to what he was before. Stronger physically and mentally. It was factual and he was a man who leaned toward this over anything else, and this facet of his personality seemed to be even stronger here. The only reason he was still alive and will continue to do so was this. Besides, he would have died in not even a minute with his old body on the beach thanks to Pandora's less pleasant atmosphere for normal humans. He materialized a soap bar that was made of animal fat, hardwood ash, and a plant that smelled like lavender from his inventory and finished washing his body of grim, dirt, dust, blood, and other unspeakable that wouldn't go with only water. In the middle of the night, Liam was rudely awakened, by an unknown scream attaining his ears one of evident pain and distress that was disturbingly human-sounding. He was alerted and confused by it. He delicately put the egg away from his body, the chick inside still asleep. Good. Putting on his light bronze armor in record time, a helmet on his head with two holes that only let his piercing gray eyes be seen. He climbed down the tree, his gaze was on the sky, and then the great plain to look at any would swarm before it fell upon two tall figures. One slower than the other getting dragged by the one at the front and behind them were one, two, three no five viper wolves pursuing them. Are those NA6? Shit. And they are going to get killed, he said in a voice with mixed feelings. He was not pleasantly surprised by their sudden appearance but it was to be anticipated that at some point he was going to meet the native. 
the first impression was the most important he was strong, stronger than an adult and a six by a lot. But not impervious to a volley of arrows and hundreds upon hundreds of other ways that could make him depart from the realm of the living. He needed to thread on this pass with extreme care if he didn't want to become a porcupine of arrows or a slaughterer of tall blue cat people. He was beyond pissed at that, he would have preferred this to happen later when he was better equipped and actually prepared for that meeting but when life throws lemons at you, you make lemonade or squeeze the juices back in its metaphorical eyes. Down in the Great Plain Tuti was breathing heavily, the cool night air of Pandora was like fire to the exhausted cells of her lungs but she continued to run to the tall tree. Stopping now would mean an inevitable death. Behind her holding her hand with her bloody ones was Myrug, a young male her age, thirteen Earth's years, one she knew since before both could even speak. It was his, no, her fault for this situation. All because of a bet she made that he couldn't hunt alone plain Nantang in NA6 or plain Viper Wolf for humans after the light went dark and in their territory. It didn't go well, as anyone but they would have guessed, it turned for the worst oh so rapidly but alas for both of them. Foolishness is always rewarded by great pain be it emotional, physical, or both. Then all of a sudden her heart felt like it stopped and her pointed ears flattened, at the sight of a great wall made of trunks, her foggy mind filled with panic didn't notice it until now, then she saw a strange and tall door. A door she knew both could never open, so alone even less so. Looking behind with horrified eyes she saw the gravely bleeding myrock, claw, and bites mark covering most of his limbs a miracle he was still capable of running. However, he was incapable of forming coherent thoughts, head muddled with pain and body exhausted. I will be fine. Run. Away. Please. To T, Myrock tried to speak but it was feeble, barely a whisper, yet still audible to the NA6's keen sense of hearing. He wanted her to abandon him, let him be used as a diversion while she ran and survive. No. We will survive together, Myrock. Hold on, she responded, lying to him and herself tears trickling down her cheeks, not moving, not wanting to abandon him, then before her horrified eyes a viper wolf, the biggest of the five, pounced at them with ferocity. Her brain couldn't process what followed, a small but burly figure, around the size of a preteen for a NA6, covered in strange shiny clothes she had never seen with what looked like a spear cut the head of the beast clean of. The head flew while the body fell with a heavy thump blood spurting from the neck while the headless body twitched uncontrollably. This instantly alarmed the four remainings, it was the pack leader. Get the fuck away M.U.T.S., the figure yelled, a voice deep, clearly male, adult, powerful, and booming in a language neither of the two N.A. six understood and loud enough to make them flinch in pain. It was effective as three of the intimidated viper wolves scampered away, their conflicting instincts screaming at them, but the side for survival was stronger and they ran into the tall grass to hopefully never cross paths again. While the fourth and youngest of the pack was momentarily stunned. A time that was used by the figure who took a knife from his belt and threw it into the young viper wolf's forehead, killing it instantly. The figure moved to the corpse spear in hand he calmly picked up his knife before sheathing it in its scabbard, and slowly approached the two teenagers. Tuti pleaded, terrified beyond belief by the figure, stopping herself from instinctually hissing at their savior. I don't understand you. You probably don't understand me. But don't worry I understand what you want and I would have done it either way, Liam spoke in English, voice as soft as possible which sadly didn't work with his already deep voice and his helmet slightly altering it. Chapter 10 Playing Surgeon Tuti was scared, no, terrified of the creature in front of her. Liam perceived that easily even if she tried to hide it. Her body language, each twitch of muscles, the vein around her neck indicating an increased heartbeat, the tail, and folded ears, and even how the bioluminescent dots on her changed in intensity all were red flags. But the most evident was her eyes on him. Full of fear, fear of death, fear of him. Despair mixed with hopes and so many more. Never before has anyone looked at him this way, it was unpleasant, strange but ignorable and she just avoided death, 
a traumatic event so he could understand. But that didn't mean he liked it. He was far from being friendly looking too, his helmet vaguely shaped like a skull, cold grey eyes, his voice and how he decapitated a viper wolf and headshot another with a knife. And compared to a NA6 thin, ridiculously tall, and elfish frame, he was extremely muscular for them even if his armor hid most of it, all in all, he was pretty intimidating. Even if he was smaller. Another thing he remarked was how both looked, even if they were of another species they looked like teenagers, they were kids, even if they were both taller than him. One boy and the other a girl, both wearing the bare minimum of clothing. Two kids with one exhausted and the other exhausted while weakening as he slowly bled out, he couldn't get a good grasp of the injuries but he needed to act and act fast or the young NA6 would die. Doing simple hand gestures he conveyed to the girl the general meaning of what he wanted her to do and by the look of it she understood, running up to the heavy door he pushed it open while the girl moved the boy. Liam was aware of what he was doing, the potential danger involved in saving them, but also the potential gain of doing so the latter per his meager knowledge about NA6's general peaceful ways outweighing the first. It was a gamble, but one he would have had to do at some point anyway. And that without forgetting an important fact, he wasn't heartless enough to let people, be they human or NA6, die when he could save them. However, he was no suicidal madman such as a self-sacrificing righteous hero or a martyr for the weak, poor, and defenseless. His life came first and foremost before all as selfish as it sounds, he was a survivor. Not like he ever thought of himself as a saint. The two NA6 didn't magically pop up either, from their apparent young ages, even if he overestimated their strength, would always be inferior to his. It means a tribe, group, clan, or whatever they are called for NA6 was within the reach he often moved when collecting resources and hunting. From the direction, they came from and if they moved in a roughly straight line. There should be a group of NA6 in the general direction of the giant grotto. While the grind in his mind shifted together he took a large cover sewed in a patchwork of sting bats hide from a wooden box and lit a torch for him to see better. Then opened boxes, willing various objects out of his inventory such as a stash of pink aloe vera, a saline solution in an opaque glass bottle, and more. The two unknown NA6 didn't need to know that he could magic things in and out of existence with the glowing prism embedded in his left arm. It was common sense, a resource he was slowly but surely running out of. Place him here, Lien said in a serious voice, nearly making Tu Ti, who was carrying the other NA6, jump out of her skin. Everything around them was unusual but she ignored it, more important things were on her mind. Not understanding his words but still what the figure wanted she carefully placed Myruk on the butchering slab making the wounded teenager groan weakly. Tuti was uncertain, exhausted, afraid, confused, and many more but at that moment her training as a Tsgrarum kicked in. She was no stranger to the wounded and the ways to tend to them be it healing or reducing their pain before their ultimate journey to the embrace of the All-Mother. Liam placed all of what he picked up on the stone slab and observed the NA6 teenager's injuries. Damn. Those are nasty claws and bite wounds but nothing that seems immediately life-threatening, Liam analyzed with his barebone knowledge of NA6 biology but even it was evident nothing vital was touched. And he felt a weight left off his shoulder at this discovery, the kid will survive the night. He was thankful that the viper wolves tended to play with their prey because otherwise, neither of the two would have even reached the wall of his base. Myruk was breathing heavily, delirious, unfocused eyes looking at everything but saw nothing other than vague shapes, beads of sweat all over his body, deep gash, scratch bites, and marks all over his legs, the furry tips of his tail missing, bitten of by a viper wolf. And his left hand was mangled beyond recognition, blue skin pierced by bones and his thumbs hanging only by a thread of skin and all of it was profusely bleeding. Liam was conscious that if it was him from before he wouldn't be this calm, at all. Now was the hard part. The current situation was way beyond his domain of expertise even if he now was essentially a polymath, not only that but this was an alien, even if technically it was him the alien in the equation. The best he could hope to do was to slow or stop the bleeding, disinfect the wound as best as he could, bandage him, 
and maybe suture them. He could only do first aid, so it won't be pretty. Tuti didn't stay idle, she grabbed various plants Liam placed and started to grind them to paste with the mortar while singing something shamanistic similar to prayers, a string of words coming back with a name he recognized as Iwa. She was praying to her goddess. The fact she helped surprised the human, she could do whatever mystical things she wanted as long as it actually helped. He took note of what plants she took and ground, however. He learned through trial and error what plants could be used, but for him a poisonous plant that will cause someone else to puke their organs but for him, it will cause a negligible stomach ache for the day. And that was without taking into consideration that a plant could be harmless to humans but deadly to Na6 and vice versa. Here she used the pink aloe vera and two other plants and he was certain it was to reduce the pain and put the teenager to sleep from what he knew about those plants. So it was better if she did this, as she should be more knowledgeable on what are the medicinal plants of the Great Plains and how to take care of the wound of her kind. She was very young but age can be misleading and the time was not to doubt. She fed Myruk the paste of medicinal herb by delicately lifting his head while still muttering prayers, the effects were immediate as his breathing became better and his expression became peaceful and serene if a bit strained. Liam focused on the mangled hand, the thumb was as good as gone and most of the hand too, he put a rope and a stick right above the wrist, a makeshift tourniquet. Tuti, even if afraid of the figure was going to stop what he was doing as it was not how her mother thought her until she saw how the bleeding of her friend's mangled hand virtually stopped as Liam tightened the rope. Never had she seen such a strange method used before, she decided to trust him, if she fought him for what he was doing he would have knocked her out anyway. To put it simply their way to heal was based on various concoctions either of plants or animals organs, sometimes a mix of both. Then there was the use of incense various rituals to get rid of evil spirits aka disease or parasites, sacrifice, songs, and more. Sadly the results of such methods were varying, with most ending up on the negative spectrum. Life even for the native on this enchantingly beautiful moon was harsh and unforgiving. The next day, late in the Pandorian morning, Liam was awake, he wasn't fatigued one bit as he was awakened after having slept enough time he needed less sleep than a regular human. He stayed all night surveying the NA6, mostly out of a healthy dose of paranoia, while preparing himself and thinking of plans for what was going to follow. He was not happy that this was forced upon him. He also learned the name of his two temporary guests, the girl had said the name of the boy while she prayed, and the boy while in his during the operation and after in his sleep. Speaking of, the girl stayed awake until sheer exhaustion caught her, and she fell unconscious in the middle of another prayer. Quite an impressive show of will in his opinion. She was strong. Hearing a groan of pain Liam lifted his head, putting the knife he was cleaning back on its sheath his gaze fell upon a very confused and rapidly waking Myrock. This confusion was rapidly cleared as fragmented memories of what happened slammed into his mind. Liam's slightly bored and amused grey eyes met the yellow ones of the rapidly panicking teens who were gradually coming back to their senses. The air became tense. Lucky him what made his friend was still in effect he was only getting a percentage of the pain. Myruk was covered in bandages most imbibed with red blood even if recently changed. The wounds were in grand parties disinfected by Liam's saline solution, and half of them were sutured. With the mangled hand, Liam did what he could try and salvage as much as possible but without training in the field of medicine besides first aid, adding to the lack of modern equipment, convenience, and medicines. He was forced to amputate the thumbs, and half of the end digit of the pinky finger with 2T accord first, ANS without considering the potential damaged tendon, nerves, and muscles of the hand he couldn't do anything to help. He tried to lessen the damages as much as he could. But at least there was no more bleeding, and low risk of infections if taken care of properly and the hand wasn't entirely amputated. This lack of fingers was a problem he could solve down the line by making prosthetics for Myruk if given the opportunity in the future. He had plenty of knowledge on how to do that from the various engrams, be they from the game or not. This means he could easily design such things as high-tech hand-slash-fingers prosthetics. But without access to anything advanced, it will always be worse than biological. 
and Liam already had done more than enough. Before Myruk tried to do something immensely stupid another groan, softer and more feminine was heard and his gaze moved to his chest where he was met with an awakening to tea. His expression and realization as to who was sleeping on his chest were hilarious to Liam who stopped a laugh from escaping him, they were no really different from humans in that aspect. Standing up to T smiled but looked over sadly at Myrock, and she hugged him with tears in her eyes. As the two cried their hearts out Liam smiled while he felt a pang of hunger and decided to cook. Standing up without attracting any attention, he came back with a ceramic cooking pot, three plates, three wood forks, a kilo of marinated taperu's lard, something akin to potatoes, various herbs, and water. Never has Liam's attention strayed far from the teens for more than three seconds. He knew they aren't dangerous, but he didn't know them, or how NA6 this age really behaved, or NA6's behavior in general for that matter. Myruk and Tuti both never saw any humans at all. They know of the general physical characteristics, the five's finger, lack of a tail, no neural cue, and a skin color completely alien to them and also a greater pilocyte. The human has strange haircuts on his chin, cheeks, around the mouth, and on his chest, arms, legs, above the eyes, and more it was quite puzzling to them. Another thing was shouldn't sky people need to have a strange device on their faces? Maybe their savior is a different breed of sky people, or maybe it was false AMD they didn't need that, who knows? But their savior had a strange prims like object glowing in his arm, it looked more like an integral part of his body, sky people also have that apparently. Stories of sky people or demons were shared through stories from other tribes at the yearly meeting of the migratory clans of the Great Plains or when trading resources with other clans. Depending on the storyteller the stories were often more than not grim, and unbelievable for most of the NA6 flying metal birds capable of raining fire down and destruction on Iwa, insanity. Unknown to them, they were lucky the RDA didn't see or found anything of significance in those wild and dangerous plains. But one thing was certain for the horse clans of the plain, humans existed and you needed to be wary of them but the NA6 held the belief to only judge one own action, of course, that was only theory and mostly for other NA6. The two teenagers were incredibly curious about these sky people. And everything around them only fueled their curiosity, there was much strange contraption but none was remotely similar to the horror the stories told. It was relieving. I I. I'm infinitely grateful. You have saved me, no, us. You saved us. I cannot express how thankful I'm to you, sky person, our savior, savior of our foolishness. I will forever be in your favor, I swear this on the All-Mother, Myruk spoke, voice hesitant, ears showing mixed emotions, mostly shame and sadness at his state and the implication but his gaze never faltered. Chapter 11 Sending the Kids Back Home After the honest and heartfelt words of Myruk Liam stopped what he was doing and met the gaze of a teen, then he looked over the two quizzically, and simply nodded. He understood the general gist of them being grateful to him which felt nice, not gonna lie but it was forced upon him, not helping them was bad for a lot of reasons, and besides this he understood nothing of what they said. It was good, what he feared didn't happen, the boy, in particular being irrational and blaming him for whatever reason didn't happen as it would force him to do things he wouldn't like. It was his life here the most important, and if the kid ever so dared to blame him, Chances were Liam would have put the kid back in his place. He wasn't going to fold backward and let someone spit at him for no reason, the consequence be damned. Liam then pointed a finger at himself and said, presenting himself with a smile, Liam, my name is Liam. Liam Cram. Learham. Learham C. R. Ham the name of our saviour. I'm to T. T. E. Tusna and this is my dearest friend Myruk T. E. R. A. A. K. A. Tuti repeated his name excitedly then pointed at her and the other teen. All the fear from yesterday was gone to the excited teenager, Liam was far less scary without that bizarre headpiece and also not looking like a wild animal ready to tear you apart. It was a strange name but what does she know about Sky People's culture? From what she could see this Sky person and his home was already totally different than what she ever saw. 
In the first place the concept of a stationary home was entirely foreign to her but that is what makes it so fascinating. Why would Liam Cram limit himself to one place? Liam proceeded to correct her pronunciation of his name until she roughly got it right and he also did the same for both of their names until he got it right. He was trying to learn their language, it was a must. This was what happened while he cooked, he talked to the teenagers asking for the names of various objects and actions via mimic. It was a moment of sharing between two entirely different yet similar species in many aspects. It was pleasant in a way to be able to communicate with others, even with the language barrier, and not humans. They were sapiens just like humans, they were people, even if there was an undeniable indestructible barrier due to them being of different species. It was weird for Liam, never would he have thought two months ago he would speak to aliens, and himself be the alien of the situation. It also made him remember he was far from home, as an alien in another universe, and that he lost everything but he shoved those depressing thoughts aside. The moment the food was ready and served, Liam had the bigger portion, the NA6 were even more grateful to their savior, and the food was delicious, one of the best meals they ever ate. Something made with ingredients they usually consume but prepared in an entirely new and unique way. It made Myruk temporarily forget about his crippled hand, sadly it was only temporary. Speaking of hands, the two ate with their bare hands, and when they saw Liam eat with these strange multi-pointy-ended wood objects they realized he had given them one such thing for that purpose. Though it was a bit too small for them to use and using this new alien utensil was impractical at first. But even then it was instantly cleaner and easier to eat the soft and succulent meat with the melting alien potatoes than making mushy and messy with their hand. Liam finished first and as always never stayed idle. He rapidly looked over his egg hidden in the tree to see if it was fine then burrow a plain slightly damaged two-wheeled wood cart half full of dried grass put in a way to something akin to a mattress big enough for a NA6 to fit inside. As to why he made a wood cart when he had an inventory. Simple to carry more things and it was easy for him to drag with his strength even if it was full. Though it's limited because it needs a pre-designed and predetermined path otherwise it became obsolete. Finishing his plate Myruk really started to feel the pain of his injuries, the mixture that 2T had given to him was wearing off, mostly purged by his body. Noticing this she took the leftover from the mortar and gave it to him, put a bit of water from a jar, and gave it to him. Alleviating the teen's pain. The three suns shone down on the base, and Liam's face suddenly hardened, it was their time to go, doing various gestures and even drawing Stickman on a piece of slate with a natural piece of chalk he collected from the coast. The message got across and they understood, they needed to get back to their clan fast, and not abuse their host and savior's generosity. They must be worried sick looking for them. And they will be punished by the Oloiktan for their foolishness. Liam was also on the same line of thought, all other possibilities of why they were running away from viper wolves in the middle of the night with no weapons. And how both acted didn't hint at anything but them being teens having done dumb shit such as going out in the middle of the night in a plane full of dangerous beasts that won't refuse two free blue snacks, and it's what would have happened if he didn't intervene. Dumb shit with consequences, which angered him to no end but he kept it inside and didn't lash out if he learned the reason why they were in this situation he wouldn't have either. He was better than that, that wasn't the intention of the teens to cause him problems, it was he who decided to help them after all, and it gave him a good head start in his relationship with the local native if all things went right. But being forced into a situation by the consequence of stupid action done by other people completely unrelated to you in any way shape or form was quite high on the list of things that pissed him off royally. He just was good at hiding it, even if his implant constantly glowed slightly brighter than usual. Liam put on his light bronze and leather armor, without a helmet having learned that it scares them quite a bit, not like it would stop an arrow as long as he was tall, and equipped a small wrist crossbow on his left wrist. Nothing powerful and mostly a prototype with barely 5 meters, 23 feet, of effective range and a wood magazine above consisting of 15 small wood bolts freshly coated in a temporary paralyzing mixture from the venomous gland found in the tails of sting bats. Nothing deadly. 
It was far from being the most effective or powerful of ranged weapons that much was obvious but it worked and was quite unremarkable with just enough power to kill most things around his size and weight if hit a vital area unsurprisingly enough. And speaking of effectiveness he took a war scythe out of his inventory, not the one that is used by the Grim Reaper of course as that was a silly, and ineffective weapon with the only purpose of earning oneself a swift death in any real life battle. So in a way it indeed brings death. The war scythe's pole was made out of charcoal black wood where Lien carved various animals from Earth's past and present and some of Pandora, at the end of the pole was a sort of bludgeon made of bronze. And the blade, it wasn't per se a blade forged from any metal, it was one of the great ostropede's claws, extremely sharp and hard, capable of cutting through a heavy layer of bronze plating with ease, for him that is. And what a scary thought it was. The weapon for him was no heavier than a butter knife is to a regular man, enhanced strength was terrifying, even more with weapons. He named it Cleaver, for one simple reason, he was bad at naming things and it cleaved through flesh and carbon reinforced bones powered by his strength with barely any resistance. Not like a normal bronze spearhead didn't either but it had a high chance to break or chip, and it was not as strong in that aspect either. Bronze was good excellent even in many scenarios, and had various advantages over steel but not in the weaponry department and the claw was bona fide biological stainless steel. Anyway, Liam walked up to them fully equipped with the cart at the front for the struggling teens, 2T helped Myruk onto the cart even if it evidently displeased the teen. He even tried to play it as if his injuries were nothing and he could walk just fine but he was shut down and put back into the cart by the worried and angry girl. Technically he could walk if he ignored the pain for at least several and also most of the injuries he had would reopen and which could lead to infections, infections that could also lead to the loss of his legs or worse. Either way, it was a stupid idea. The three, or more like two with a dead weight, moved out of the base, Liam closing the heavy door behind, passing by two piles of unrecognizable bones. The corpse of the viper wolves, or what little remained of them. The wooden wheel crushed them as they advanced, the direction being pointed to Liam by a fidgeting to T whose mind was more preoccupied with her teacher would shout at her and as such didn't pay a lot of attention to what the weapon Liam had outside of the strange weapon being incredibly beautiful. Pretty much unaware of her surroundings, which caused Liam to wonder how she survived till then. It was silent outside of the sound of the wind and alien cicada. Now that she walked Liam could but notice that the native was freaking tall. She was at least a head and a half taller and the adult NA6 should tower over her. Surprise surprise. I was right, Liam thought as the direction was the same as he predicted, not that any Tom, Harry or Dick couldn't have deduced this. They continued to follow the path for a good hour, not encountering anything worthwhile, no suicidal sting bats only two crimson or Ross, four-legged birds they were next to a small bush that as soon as they saw them they ran as far and fast their biology possibly let them do. An hour later Liam suddenly stopped pushing the cart and frowned at three shapes in the far distance rapidly approaching their position. Six-legged horse with three blue people. One on each. And a six. A rescue team? Probably, Liam remarked, mind going over multiple scenarios and how he will act and react in accordance. Pointing in the direction of what he saw he grunted quite loudly and made known what was approaching to the two brooding teens next to him who instantly perked up. Myruk spoke and from the tone, it was the voice of someone who was praying for their father not to beat the shit out of them after having caused a car crash with the sole family car while drunk, underage, and without anyone's permission. As the rescue team of NA6 slowly approached them Liam studied while tensing up instinctively and the air became heavy. He was ready to attack, defend himself, and run at any given moment. All were male and riding dire horses. The one at the back was an old NA6 but without any apparent wrinkle, a dagger strapped to his torso, and at his right was a young man with a spear and the same dagger as the elder. Finally in the middle was a middle-aged NA6, he was visibly the leader, wearing a left shoulder pad with intricate but barely noticeable jewelry and a long bone piercing horizontally through the middle of his cat-like nose. All looked at Liam, then at Tuti, and then at the bandaged NA6 in the strange wood contraception, a NA6 they were looking for. 
various emotions were on their faces. From confusion, anger, sadness, worry, and even hate. The older male talked to Akwe, the leader, both of whom had never seen a sky person, but both were smart and experienced enough to not act rashly as from what little information they had they instantly understood the grand line of the situation. This man, this sky person, a creature they never saw, was wearing garments reminiscent of the fierce warrior of the Tippany clan but of an unknown material, a weapon on his back of the like he never saw, the blade like to the deadly claws of a Tsaltsping, great ostropede. Creatures feared but also greatly respected, it was known for some time that one recently perished, and for him, the human must have found the body and made a weapon out of one of the claws. Just as he would have, however, there was no envy or jealousy in his heart. It was the All-Mother's will. This man before them wasn't an enemy, he wasn't the same as the demons depicted by the words of the mouth. He wasn't their enemy, neither of his clan nor the people. Akwe could see that much through those lonely and wary alien grey eyes. There wasn't any malice toward them, just wariness as it should be. It was strange that this sky person was alone, however, but what does he know? The man wasn't looking for conflict, he was here to let the children he saved be back to their families. Any other possibilities were fallacies in the Oloiktan's mind. Son! How foolish of you, Akwe thought saddened and disappointed while his gaze fell upon his injured son, clearly wounded from an animal, his heart sank at the sight of the crippled hand. At least he was alive. Then all of a sudden the hot-blooded young hunter next to him, unable to contain himself, roared with clear disgust, and hate oozing at the human. Chapter 12 Gladius Before anyone could process what was said and do anything Thswaran on his mount was already on his way cutting the distance between him and Liam in the blink of an eye. The NA6 wanted to kill the human who in his mind mutilated and kidnapped members of his clan, he was going to free the poor traumatized teenager from this monster. Fuck, Liam internally swore in frustration a part of his mind telling him I told you, grabbing the handle of his war scythe he moved away from the cart, as the madman apparently gave no attention to the wounded inside which only furthered the human frustration. The muscular six-legged horse, with on top a nearly three meters tall blue man wielding a spear that might as well be adjusting spear to a human, was intimidating but Liam was deathly calm, confident even but a part of him was still nervous. He was faster, stronger, smarter, and had better weapons than the NA6 charging at him, this compensated for his non-existent experience in an actual fight against an admittedly experienced cavalier while he was on foot or in any death fight with a fellow sapient being at all for that matter. Liam didn't have the time to think of an elaborate and peaceful way to solve this problem and the NA6 would neither understand nor have listened to him if they could communicate. His grey eyes followed the sharpened stone serving as a spearhead aimed right at his armoured chest. With this force and momentum, it would skewer him or at the very minimum break a bit more than some of his ribs, his bronze chest plate wasn't magical. Both of those were unacceptable outcomes. But he didn't move, shocking and horrifying nearly everyone but the Oloik Tan who, even if beyond enraged at his hunter and his inability to stop anything, thought this comparatively small sky person had balls of steel in the NA6 equivalent or was plain insane, likely both. Even he wouldn't stay rooted on the ground with such confidence, borderline arrogance if he were in this situation though a great part of him was also appealed by the potential death of the man, his voice was loud as he yelled out but his orders went unheard and it was too late to stop what was going to happen. While the young hunter sneered victoriously at the demon petrified in fear at his might too clouded by anger to perceive anything more, Liam without wavering swung his war scythe to the side, a simple movement with a clear lack of mastery but with strength beyond what a creature his size behind it should naturally have. The two forces collided, and the blunt side of the curved blade slammed against the pole of the NA6 weapon, nearly crushing the young hunter's hand missing the thumb by a few centimeters. Liam felt the shock transfer from the pole of his weapon to his hand and then his arms, forcing his position to move ever so slightly but he held easily. It was a wee bit painful. The next instant the primitive weapon of the NA6 broke in half. 
the butt of the spear whipped against Tsuaren's back with a loud crack causing the Tsuhalo with his mount to be forcefully and violently severed. This resulted in the young hunter falling from his mount who immediately neighed and escaped, while for Liam the spearhead aimed for his heart saw nearly all its momentum cut short and it was harmlessly flung into the distance. Before the NA6 brain registered anything with the shock caused by his mental link brutally severed. Liam aimed his left wrist at the future position of the falling young hunter's shoulder. And with a flex of his pinky finger, a barely audible click was heard and the string of the wrist crossbow propelled a small wooden bolt. The next instant the NA6 slammed on the ground and painfully gurgled out incoherently, Deme Ayurg. Arafe. Tswaren's head was spinning, a stinging sensation on his left shoulder as he, unable to catch his breath lay in shock on his chest. Then all of the pain racking his body slowly and unnaturally started to fade away into nothingness just as his entire left side was getting numb until he couldn't move or feel anything on that side. And it was spreading. Panic was rising but he couldn't scream for help or run he was physically unable to, and as such, it created a vicious cycle. The NA6's green eyes frantically looked everywhere for a way out until they locked onto the grey one of the demon. Terrified as you should, the man thought his gaze filled with a quality it never had before. It was cold and simmering with anger, this was a new experience. One experience he didn't like but one he was sure was only going to be the first of so many more. The eyes of the downed NA6 when he met Liamone were not of hate or some self-righteous bravado but of terror as he realized that he was at the demon's mercy. Fear of death, fear of Liam. This time it didn't bother the man, in fact, a part of him strongly wanted to kill the NA6 right here, right there, and right now but he won't, he can't. To his great displeasure, a thought that would have horrified him if the situation was different. Doing so will lead to catastrophic consequences for everyone, taking out any possible degree of control of the situation. The current situation was already bad enough as it is. Lucky you, your clan mates are here. If we have the pleasure to meet again I will kill you, Liam whispered with an almost animalistic growl to the NA6 whose eyes turned to pinprick out of instinctual terror only a prey would have when faced with its natural predator. The implant glowed brighter but was unnoticed as it was hidden by layers of tissues and armor. Then he took the small wood crossbow bolt out, it was still in one piece, and cleaned the wound with a piece of tissue and saline solution in his satchel. Again no need for any of these blue people to know about his inventory. Standing up Liam turned around, smiling at the teens, then his face became unreadable as he observed the two other riders, searching for any sign of aggression. The two faces showed several degrees of shock, and shame at what just happened but neither drew their weapons, which was a very good sign but ultimately it was their failure to not handle their people adequately, not once but twice. And it will happen again. It was inevitable, likely not from them, but problems like that were but a taste of what was to come. Of course, most NA6 will be hostile toward him, he was human. With the horrors a good portion of what his species down on this moon had done to the native, but he didn't come here because he wanted. He didn't do anything to warrant such plain aggression and attack on his life. It was unfair but it was life, crying wasn't going to solve anything, however having to take the brunt of consequences from others' actions was getting annoying incredibly fast. And speaking of humans, he was conflicted on how he should act when he was found by them or he found them. But it was a question for later. If it were someone else, that poor soul who only wanted to help would have been killed by a xenophobic maniac with a hate boner for humans. Both species indeed shared many similarities. Let's say that he didn't have the best impression of the NA6, the one who failed to kill him in particular. Teenagers and children could and should be forgiven as long as the mistakes were in the realm of the reasonable but for adults. It was a different and much more complicated story. That's how Liam saw it. Finally, he walked away ignoring the voices behind him, he was not in the state of mind to stay one second more with any of them. But it wasn't bad, he decided to see the glass half-filled he showed himself as someone willing to help but also as someone that was far from defenseless, will not hesitate to fight back, and is capable of showing mercy and restraint. 
It wasn't the peaceful ending he had hoped for but it could have ended oh so much worse. Three days later. Still no other blue cat people in sight today. That's good I guess. I can work in peace. Liam thought, audibly cracking his neck from left to right before sighing, he was working on the head of a pickaxe. He was using the steel from one of the claws mixed with a bit of iron, and an even smaller amount of copper. A loss of a claw maybe, but it wasn't adapted to be used as the head of a pickaxe. He was hammering with force and precision while the steel was red hot against a bronze anvil until the shape he desired was attained. Forging was relaxing, just like cooking, and seeing your work take shape before your very eyes was even more satisfying, and gratifying even. Each clank of metal against metal as he worked like a human forge hammer given form was like music letting him think of something outside of his situations and the future. Finishing after cooling the metal in a big container of water he verified that there wasn't any crack or problem all over the pickaxe's head doing various tests at the same time. Nodding to himself in satisfaction he put the handle, a good hit with the palm of his hand to put the head and the handle together. Spinning the pickaxe like it was but a pen someone would flick around to test if it stayed in place for a short time. And also because it was kind of fun. And a bit dangerous but that was a minor detail in the grand scheme of things. After he cleaned and stored everything in its designated place. A minimum of order was necessary, humans were chaotic creatures that thrived in order and he was no exception to this rule. Taking a cold shower that washed away the grime from the last few days he put on only a clean pair of plain plant fiber woven pants and walked to the egg, freezing momentarily as he heard a soft crack. A large grin immediately found its way onto his face. He pushed the protective cover of ropes and hides aside, and his grin grew wider like an excited child about to open his Christmas present as cracks were appearing on one side of the egg. Yes. I did it. Ah. Calm down, Liam. It isn't born just yet, he mentally cheered before calming down, but trepidation and excitement were still in his heart. The intense but pleasant glow of his implant also betrayed his current state of mind. Whistling softly, Liam didn't have to wait long for the chick inside to excitedly call back to him. The encouragement of its father spurred it to put more effort into escaping its calcium prison. This exchange continued for at least half an hour until an orange beak followed by a small navy blue roundish head with orange stripes. Four round eyes observed their blurry but slowly clearing surroundings for the first time, desperately searching for its father. Hey behind you lil buddy, a gentle but deep voice called from behind, this instantly calmed down the hatchling who happily chirped, but it was still confused as to where its father was. The voice was familiar, reassuring and comforting, it recognized it. Looking for the source it forced its small neck out, next was the end of its two prehensible neural cues that were attached at the start of said neck. With one final push, it broke free covered in whatever was supposed to be in an alien egg. It clumsily tried to walk, turning around it was met with Liam whose smile only widened, immediately abandoning walking it crawled enthusiastically toward the human using its arms which were at moment entirely clawless. Liam with rapt attention observed the newborn murder bird clumsily approach him, and when he saw it was starting to get exhausted he entered the hole in the tree. Hole that was several meters above the ground. Putting his back against the dry sapwood, he delicately picked up the newborn, it was the size of a turkey but it was so weak, so fragile. And it was starting to shiver, it needed heat. Placing it in his lap he took a piece of plant-woven tissue and started cleaning the hatchling who stopped shivering thanks to the warmth of his body. It stared up at him with unblinking curious eyes, a gaze entirely different from its true parent. It was how a puppy will look at his owner, but more intense. It was hard to describe, the main aspect behind it was love, trust, and attachment. Hmm. I need to think of a name for you, how about Gladius? Do you like it? Liam asked looking down at the alien bird who didn't understand anything but chirped happily anyway. Gladius it is then. Not very original but had, the human said, and got another chirp for an answer, this one with evident fatigue. It used a lot of energy to hatch after all. He didn't know what sex the bird was, 
was it male-female, hermaphrodite, or something else? He didn't particularly care for either of them at the moment. Not like Gladius would get offended if he misgendered it. It huddled even closer to Liam, the small vestigial wings folded on its back, then one of its neural cues as if it had a mind of its own snake toward Liam's left wrist who was looking at the scene with great curiosity unsure of what he should do. Pink tendrils waving in the air covered in short pure white follicles emerged as the skin protecting them unfurled in a similar way to a flower blooming, and then they touched the cold metal of his implant. Chapter 13 First Tame Liam did have a sense of touch on his implant, it was comparable to a nail but muted and different in a way clearly not organic. It was unique, and perturbing at first but he got used to it rapidly. It was an integral part of his body, where most of his consciousness resided, if it were to be greatly damaged he would likely fall unconscious for an undetermined period of time until it self-repair, or if the damage were too severe it will outright kill him though damaging it in any meaningful way was far easier said than done. Tech problems needed tech solutions or a lot of explosions or a lot of raw kinetic energy or being thrown into the Sunday. So Liam, even knowing it could be a potentially dangerous decision decided to take the risk and let it happen. He observed as the tendrils of the hatchling neural cue touched his implant. At first, it tickled then he felt a barely noticeable prickling sensation as they spread like roots and arrived at the frontier between his skin and metal. His pupil suddenly dilated to their utmost limit as an alien, bordering on the disturbing sensation washed over the very edge of what he supposed was his mind or something close to that, he will go with mind for the moment. The first time he was aware of his mind, the deepest part of his being. It was strange neither particularly painful nor particularly pleasant. It was a new sensation altogether. The implant and the hologram above it brightened, and pre-programmed protocols were launched to protect the engram matrix of Liam from any potential corruption or damage. As one might suggest it wasn't designed for this intended purpose but it was not rigid. Then Liam felt a connection, a mental one. The hatchling jerked slightly before looking up at him. He felt curiosity, intense raw happiness, and a deep sense of trust a feeling of safety with him and of storage? But all distinctively inhuman in nature, it was surreal, unnatural to his mind and perception of emotions but this feeling vanished as soon as it came. Those weren't his emotions, those were from Gladius in his lap, they were easily sorted from his own after this. To never be mixed again. He could read them, but it was only the surface, or more like there wasn't much more than that at the moment, it was not even two hours old. Through this link, Liam thought of it like sending a message on his phone but here he was the phone. He tried and succeeded to send vague messages that told the hatchling it was safe, that he was joyful about its health and proud it hatched safely. Gladius responded by doing repeated short low chirping, almost like the purr of a cat, and the wave of childlike happiness only intensified through the link which earned a chuckle from Liam. The implant suddenly flickered. Gladius froze before chirping joyfully and Liam instantly understood what just happened, the hatchling fully submitted to him of its own volition. The implant acted on what it was designed for even if the situation was new, binding Gladius to him by means Liam wasn't fully aware of and a part of the implant he truly wanted to learn more about. So much potential. So that's how I do it. But it is far from easy, many conditions are necessary. Condition only a controlled environment can give he remarked, very pleased with this discovery. It opened many possibilities. Liam tamed it, only its death will separate it from him, or if he decided to sever its connection with the implant, which would not end well for the great ostropede. However, it was vastly different than in the game but with some common points. In the first place just like various species of birds on earth, Gladius had fully imprinted on Liam, even before it hatched. It was one of the man's objectives, raising an alien murder chicken only for it to turn on you and rip you to fleshy ribbons was less than an ideal and all things considered. The nature of those differences will need testing but not now, Liam could feel the fatigue of the hatchling and it will need to grow first too. Being hasty could lead to premature death, newborns are fragile and need care. Incredible, Liam thought. It was fascinating to see it slowly fall asleep, 
how the mind became less and less active until it became nearly silent, it was as if a tumultuous sea calmed until small waves remained. Soon after the tendrils moved back into their protective flap of skin at the end of the neural queue and this strange link was interrupted but in its place a link of a slightly different nature that went unnoticed until now made itself known. He could barely feel any of the alien emotions now which made him breathe a sigh of relief he didn't know he held until now, it was a fantastic experience but one that made his instincts scream in discomfort. After all, a human wasn't a NA6, there were many similarities. That was a fact. As strange as it was but some biological barriers simply cannot be crossed. However, other alternative paths can be found just like what happened. Closing his eyes Liam was aware of the general location of Gladius with the implant. He had feedback through the link on its general states from which he supposed was from the hatchling nervous system, then the most important part, he felt a degree of control he didn't know the extent of over Gladius. But there was a distinct feeling of familiarity, as always, even then it felt extremely odd to have all of these new senses. Some he was sure weren't in the implant's original design and most the fault of this moon's unique wildlife biology. With those thoughts, he soon followed and fell asleep, but still ready to jump at any moment. Early in the morning, he was awakened by a chirp, and groaning, he groggily opened his eyes, and right in his face was the double-ended tail of Gladius. Moving it aside he stretched cracking most of the articulation of his body at the same time attracting the attention of the bird. Buddy, you're hungry right, Liam cooed as he felt the hunger of Gladius while he scratched its head making it chirped purred and flare its wings in excitement. Picking the hatchling up securely in his arms Liam jumped straight down, landing softly on the ground, as he did so a chirp was heard. He placed Gladius on the ground and it clumsily stood up before it walked around falling beak first two times before succeeding. Then it waddled behind like a duckling following its mother, a murder duckling but a duckling nonetheless. From Liam's understanding, Gladius species was mostly frugivore, but that was from his understanding and not the absolute truth. That's why he was going to see what Gladius would eat, better be safe than sorry. And so the following hour passed with Liam finding what Gladius ate to finally end with a mixture of strange-looking fruits seasoned with iron powder. He fed this to the hatchling until it fell asleep. At the same time, far away in the Great Plain, under a white and tall teepee built of hides from various animals held together by branches and bones. A symbol in the shape of a dire horse head seen from the side was painted on a wood sign. The scent of incense was thick in the air. Various candles were made of hellfire wasps' wax. Inside a young NA6 lying on a bed of grass, it was Myrock, sweat covering his body, a strained expression of pain on his face. Above him, an extremely aged female NA6 covered in various tribal jewelry, one of such representing her status as the Tsahik of the Olangi clan on her forehead, she also wore around her neck a knife with the blade made of the first dire horse she bonded with. Her skin was also scarred, each telling a story. She was slowly chanting prayer while scrutinizing the wounds with a sharp analytical gaze and acted with experience and precision faster than her appearance might suggest. Next to her Tuti, the Tsakaram, the sole student of the older NA6 was preparing medicinal paste not dissimilar to what she did at Liam's base but with more ingredients. Tuti said, voice filled with sadness, regret, and guilt to Myrak her lips pursed, ears flattened. The wounded teen responded in kind, and with a weak smile, before she gave him what she just finished concocting, the effect just as in the sky person's demure was nigh instant and Myrak rapidly fell into a deep sleep. Sighing to T looked up and was met with the severe gaze of her teacher, words went unsaid but the teen knew how disappointed her teacher was in her recent actions, and justly so. The Tsahik was not at the camp when the two teens decided to go out in the middle of the night. At that moment she was coming back from her yearly spiritual voyage to the Utral Yak Si, the tree of divergence from the deep below of Iwa. The tree of voices was where all the clans found in the Great Plains communicated with Iwa and their ancestors. The most sacred and important place for the horse clans of the Great Plains. When she learned of what her great-granddaughter and the youngest son of the Oloik Tan did, the damage it caused, and the consequences on both of the young NA6, 
she was less than pleased. Furious beyond what she has been for the last 90 Earth years even but she didn't show it. Keeping a calm exterior was a must for her role in the clan. The voice of a male was heard, worried but strong, recognizing him that Zahik turned from the sleeping teen where her gaze had softened to a quay where it became grave. He is fine, a strong but foolish young man he is. He will heal that I'm sure of, and soon be able to walk as fine as he had before. However. His left hand. And if the lost child didn't intervene, the Tzahik didn't finish seeing a quay tense up at the mention of his son's hand and the sky person. The lost child was what Morelli called the sky person or Liam Cram, she didn't explain why she called him that, even when asked. Confusing greatly the ones in the known about the human, but there must be a reason. When she climbed back from the sacred hollow, the location that gave the safest path to the Utral Yak SI, she was utterly silent and stayed this way until she arrived at the temporary encampment of the clan. Something that rarely if ever happened. Then she and the Oloik Tan discussed the recent events, and what should be planned for the future. One that seemed to be far from easy or simple. Their migration was already delayed by a few days, Myrock injuries being the reason. A fact understood by all. A selfish choice from the Oloik Tan puts the clan at risk, in particular, because of the Rytus, Sting Bats, Yerap, Storm, at night during that time of the year. The Tzahik asked with a frown, a movement of her hand and her student understood she needed to leave. Even if incredibly curious she did so without rebuttal, Tuti knew better than to anger her great-grandmother further. The Tzahik's opinion of the human was fundamentally different from anyone else who knew about his existence. Her deep connection with the All-Mother was one of her greatest pride. The aspect every Tzahik thrived for in their entire lives but her last connection to the Tree of Divergence was the most intense of all, she passed out and nearly died. It was the first time she heard Iwa with such clarity, a voice a mere elderly NA6 like her cannot comprehend the grandeur that is the billion years old consciousness of a planetary all-encompassing super-organism that was their All-Mother and Goddess, Iwa. Through this short but intense discussion that Tzahik interpreted fragmented pieces of memories from both fauna and flora, some of sights, smells, fears, pains, touches, hungers, life, death and so much more that couldn't be described by words. All were related in some shape or form to the sky person Liam. And even if it were but glimpses, broken and for most difficult if impossible to comprehend she knew that this being was more, the All-Mother was observing him, she was curious. He could defeat with only his wits and body a creature that would need the collective effort of an entire clan to kill. But he was lost, alone, learning, growing, improving, far from his species and as such a lost child there by the way she called him. And he wasn't an enemy of the people, he saved two of the Olangi from certain death and did beyond by sheltering, healing and feeding them before guiding them back to their loved ones. Risking his own life. Swaran Tea Afud will be exiled from the clan. Only your words can change his fate, the Oloik Tan said somberly, be it a NA6 or a human attempt at the life of one's own savior be it oneself or of a member of the same clan. It was one of the worst crimes one can commit, even if born out of misinterpretation. Actions always had consequences. Then let it be so. His life and future will be for the All-Mother to decide and no more for the Olangi to cater to. Actions have consequences, she said with firmness, but sadness was in her aged voice. It was a death sentence, but the rules of the ancestor must be followed. It was thanks to them they survived till now and for the future. However, both knew it was going to steer unease, particularly for the closest to the future exiled hunter but what must be done must be done. Chapter 14 Pandora's moody weather. Two days later. Liam stared at the waist-height hatchling who just woke from its sleep after eating at least two kilos worth of food, and it stared back at him curiously. Gladius pecked not so gently at the feet of the workshop where Liam was working until this exact moment when he was rudely interrupted by the bird. He was working on a minor part of a fabricator that would help for the overall stability, 
well the term fabricator might be inappropriate considering the one he was building was incomparable to its 21st century counterpart. Evidently, the one from the game wasn't the same as the one translated into reality, but it was still vastly more advanced, versatile and adaptable than the 21st century one. The only real point in common was the name and their general purpose of making stuff. The problem however was that at the moment he could but do an extremely Basta asterisk diced version of it. One that was needed to do the real deal, however. Tools needed to make tools themselves needed to make tools. And he lacked resources notably a lack of silver, diamond, lithium, iron, and more, and in tools too, particularly of high precision as they are needed to produce highly processed material and components. Not forgetting that he also lacked fuel adapted for it. He had a small stock of coke, not the drink, he made that out of charcoal, itself made of heated carbon-reinforced bones and woods, by heating it extremely hot for long periods to get something as close to pure carbon as possible. In other words, thermal distillation but coke was only for forging steel as it burned extremely high, he needed something like petroleum here. And it will need to be refined too. Something he lacked. He lacked many resources which was also why he was working on going into the giant grotto and hopefully finding some of what he was looking for. Hey buddy, it isn't food you know? Stop, Liam said amusedly to Gladius who instantly stopped moving. Storing the metallic contraption otherwise known to him as the piece A068B will go above A070C and at the left by 70 degrees up of A069B. He hummed pensively at various names of the piece and the many more that needed to be made before concentrating on the link between him and the alien baby murder chicken. Sit, he sent mentally commanded, it was more of a feeling mixed with intention than coherent words or sentences, just like he did unconsciously before when speaking. Though doing it consciously seemed not particularly harder but it was just strange, it was like a new metaphorical muscle that was used for the first time. Gladius did just that and sat while observing him with its four big round eyes. In his left hand, a palm-sized fruit appeared, it was black with some blue hue, nothing exceptional about it if not its shape being a strange but homogeneous mix between a pineapple, a banana and a lemon. And it tasted like pure and high-quality apple juice. Gladius caught the fruit thrown into its beak, it crushed then swallowed the to messily eat whatever mess the hatchling let fall to the ground before looking up at Liam patiently waiting for more food. Liam continued to give the same type of fruit until Gladius stopped asking, a session of head scratch on the ladder and Liam was testing what he could make his not so feathery buddy do. It was a hatchling, not even half a week old at that, and it was visibly bigger than when it hatched not much but that's that. Still it was a baby which means nothing extraordinary will come out after such a short time. Well in Liam's perspective that is. Gladius was extremely obedient to him, with the capacity to communicate with it even if it was by unusual means being key to it as the hatchling had a rough understanding of what father wanted. The hatchling was smart, smarter than one might expect but it could only understand very simple commands such as, sit, stand up, stop, and follow me. All things considered, it was beyond exceptional what just happened, all of it done in a mere hour which would at a minimum take days if not weeks, and this to near perfection. And it was but the start, though more complicated command will entirely depend on how smart Gladius species can actually get. From his observation he would guess around that of a crow, he wasn't an ethologist, even less a xenoethologist. Something can be absolutely obedient and do what it's asked with all its heart and soul but if it can't understand what it was asked to do, to begin with, it won't go far. There was enormous potential, and Liam was sure his choice of not making an omelette out of Gladius was the right one. With this, he also got information on how to tame other animals, the part where he took care of the egg and made the chick imprint on him being the most important part to him. Building trust in a bond was key. Trust, unfathomable and absolute trust or close to that, something that was impossible to get unless in very special circumstances. At least that's what Liam presumed, and frankly trying to play with his mind on something he didn't trust himself and adding that the creatures would be 99% of the time plainly aggressive to him didn't seem to be the best of ideas. 
thought the possibility of forcing the taming process was here but with the wildlife general behaviors around him and the condition of the creatures needing to fully submit to him it seemed very unlikely to work. Feeding the exhausted hatchling until it fell asleep again Liam continued to work until the last of the three suns disappeared from the sky of Pandora and he stopped working. The irregularity of the day and night cycle was quite annoying as it could screw him if he wasn't careful, not forgetting the occasional eclipse be it total, partial, hybrid, or annual, and likely a dozen more as there were more celestials bodies to be taken into account than the good old Earth, Moon, and Sunday. He ate as per usual at least one kilo of meat this time it was from the hexapedi, and he also made salted French fries out of a potato-like plant that he cut and then fried in animal fat. His diet was less than healthy, constituted of protein with protein and supplement of fat. Dangerous to even suicidal for a normal man but he was far from being normal. The fact he ate so much was and still is strange to him. Though it makes sense considering how absurdly strong and active he was. Anyway, he slept near the base of the tree in one of the carved areas, Gladius was peacefully snoozing next to him, head on his lap and splayed in such a way that made one think as if bones were a foreign concept to its body. The hatching was like a dog, a puppy, a strange thought for an animal that will rival a giraffe in size and puts to shame a swan and a cassowary combined in sheer aggressiveness for anything it doesn't like. High-pitched squeaks echoed in the Great Plain. At first it was more than a dozen but it soon demultiplied and the sound of wings beating the air rich in xenon became louder and louder almost to the point of being deafening. In the middle of the night, Liam as the light sleeper he has just got his sleep cut short by a cacophony of screech resonating, it was irritating to one's ears like chalk scraping on a blackboard. The strange dream he just had where he walked on a dead and corrupted planet was rapidly vanishing from his mind as he pushed the sheet aside to look outside. His eyes gained instant clarity at the sight, dark clouds covered the sky, and below was wave upon wave of sting bats flying like an unending tide. The humidity was high, higher than usual, a distinct difference from a few hours ago, and the smell of ozone was thick in the air, his hair instinctively standing up. Liam had a bad feeling about what was going to come if the literal tide of bats wasn't a good enough indicator. All of them were flying out of the ground specifically from the various caves and grottos that led below the plain. Liam saw one of the bigger swarms of alien bats flies off the closest grotto to him. Then there were lightings of purple and white zipping and crackling through the dark cumulonimbus, their light almost blinding and the sound of their roaring thunder only delayed by how fast the sound could travel through the air. This was followed by lightning slamming from where the sting bats flew out in swarms the billion jowl worth of energy transferring from one animal to the other killing hundreds upon hundreds but it had barely any effect on their number. Liam's eyes widened in shock as the lighting hit the ground and half a second later with half the speed was sent back with a dulled light at the sky frying hundreds of bats as it did so too. This cycle continued as electricity rained down to only be sent back all moving faster than his eyes could perceive, only the return strokes were visible and wearable as thunders slammed against his eardrums. It looked like a war between the earth and the sky, and how it was naturally possible was extremely fascinating. His mind immediately went to the unique metal he found there. But it wasn't the time for that. Gladius was awakened by it too and cowered behind Liam, while panic was rising in its being. The man sensing it through the link frowned, right they needed to move, immediately. He didn't want to try and see what getting struck by lightning felt like and he supposed neither did Gladius, considering it will very likely kill the hatchling. He was surprised when the hatchling made a sudden neural link with him via the connection to his implant from one of its prehensile neural cues. Liam felt a short prickling sensation around the implant, and his grey eyes dilated. The man looked down at his tame and its emotions, as different as they were from human ones were crystal clear to him. Gladius was afraid, and he reacted by sending emotions telling the hatchling that it was safe. It had mild results as Liam wasn't certain himself but Gladius visibly calmed down and that was good enough. Taking the bird below his left arm, keeping the neural link in the process. Liam picked a cover made of plants with hide sewn together and he jumped down to the ground. Holding tightly and securely he landed softly even if he was pretty heavy after all, a sting bat. 
closely followed by four more flu lo not seeing the two as food as they severely lacked in cerebral capacity to arrive at this conclusion then they noticed something shining, the anvil and attacked it with abandon. The only reason this aggressive species, even more so in this biome, with a total lack of self-preservation, were still thriving was their prodigious mating capability, that would rival mice, rapid growth rate mixed with an omnivorous diet from, nectar, fruit to Na6, and human alike. Though they were at the base of the food chain, even if they were also capable of hunting in a big enough swarm most of Pandora's wildlife, making them a keystone species as seed dispersers, pollinators, prey, and predators. The sound of thunder in the air only amplified into Liam's horror, the thunderstorm rapidly gained in power, the winds starting to pick up, nearly blowing the cover he was walking under. Suddenly Liam hair on his neck stood on end, Gladius' fear rose by several folds. He instinctively crouched, there was a blinding light from his back end. Crack boom! His ear rang at the sound. The highest branch of the tree was slammed by lightning, however, it didn't break nor took fire. Then Liam gnashed his teeth in pain as a tingling and sharp sensation flowed in the sole of his feet, then his leg until it dissipated around his navel. It was very painful, but incomparable to the great ostropede cry or having his back cut open. Temporarily paralyzing him as it caused every muscle on the way to briefly and painfully spasm before regaining his full motor function and this encouraged him to move faster. Arriving at the trap door he opened the heavy wood panel with his right hand while still holding the plant sewn cover and entered the hole in the ground, the roots of the tree visible inside and glowing, brighter than ever before. Liam realized that the tree had redirected a big portion of the electricity into the soil, a very conductive soil now that he thought about it, or it was the roots or both. It wasn't the time to idle on the unique alien flora biology or soil composition. Fuck, he swore as he closed behind him, and walked farther, the air inside was hot and electric but it was better than outside in the middle of one the highest class of thunderstorms. In front of him, one of the roots glow brighter. His eyes widened as he thought it was going to explode but it dimmed and the next instant he felt a painful shock similar to needles pricking his nerves through his feet. It was the same sensation as outside but less intense. Not even half a second later the muffled sound of thunder echoed. The current was somewhat constant, making it harder to move but far from impossible. It only stopped when he neared the end of the tunnel. Sitting down, back against a wood beam. Liam breathed in and out trying to calm down his sizzling anger. Images of the chaos and damage brought down by the thunderstorm upon his base kept flashing in his mind. While he could stay underground and wait, just like after he killed the great ostropede. The neural link with Gladius curled in a ball shivering was what snapped him back to the present at his hands and let him have a breather. Petting the bird's head with his right hand, sighing Liam slammed the back of his head against the wood beam and then groaned. Right. It's just material lost at worst and most of what was truly important is in or durable enough. But. Arg. Fuck it's still my shit, Liam rationalized, but with clear frustration as anyone would have in such a situation. Gazing at the roots in the distance they slowly dimmed as they discharged most of their energy through their surroundings. At that moment he couldn't help but think that he would need to build an underground base in the future. Chapter 15 Unpleasant surprise. Standing with a sleeping Gladius under his left arm Liam gazed upon the damage of the thunderstorm. Taking a careful step from the stone around the trap door to the muddy ground. His legs still hurt slightly from the electricity that had coursed through them last night. But besides this minor inconvenience, he was uninjured same goes for Gladius. It had also rained during the night, a fact that both brought joy and anger, mostly anger. Rain was rare up until now, that much he could tell from how it only rained once two weeks ago and it was a mere drizzle. Here it was a downpour, the tunnels were even worse but the water could go through various holes that went deeper. It was where he got his clay and the soil down was not as impermeable as the one above, so it was absorbed into the ground, mostly. As such the water level never surpassed his ankle. But it was still dangerous and as soon as he remarked what was happening he used his inventory, even though there was the neural link and gladius under his right arm. Taking pebbles, wood, 
and other trash from his inventory he made for the both of them a safe area in the form of a pile that put them above water. He was electrified enough for the night. He didn't sleep and neither did his tame who only did so when it couldn't hear thunder anymore which was an hour ago and just to be sure if the thunderstorm really stopped Liam waited a bit more until he decided to go out. He counted how long they stayed underground so he knew it was the day. And that brings us back to the present. It's not as bad as I anticipated. It could have been way worse, Liam mumbled, his voice seemed to wake up Gladius, noticing that Liam placed the hatchling who chirped and instantly started exploring around waddling in the mud happily. Puddles, mud, branches and mutilated corpses of sting bats were strewn everywhere from his base to way beyond it. It was a horrifying and apocalyptic scene, to put it mildly. The number of bats who must have died should easily count in the several thousand, most being gruesome, some to the point of what remained of their body to be spread over several hundred meters. Not that Liam felt any pity for those creatures who by the way, he hated with a passion, now even more as he would have to clean up. He also hoped that this put a dent in the bats' population. The stench in the air was horrendous a mix of earthy muddy water with blood and guts while amid the source of those smells were small vibrant green dots. Seedlings from hundreds of different species of plants were growing from the catastrophe and the dead, it was poetic in a very morbid way. Nature in all of its beauty. Aside from this, the wall of tree trunks he built was leveled at various points by either the wind, water from the rain, or both the gateway was damaged but overall in good condition and his smoking house where he stocked and preserved most of his meats, fruits and vegetables, was all but gone with what it contained. As he continued to walk around and take on the damage in more detail his brow furrowed more and more, and his workbench was broken with the bronze anvil slightly melted to the side. The forge was not doing so well either but it needed to be remade either way so it wasn't really a loss. The start of his farm was now more of a small swamp, the little number of plants still alive were stored in his inventory to stop them from drowning any further. The well to the side of the said farm was in good if not excellent condition as he built it for it to endure but the piping system connected to it was not so lucky. Clay and ceramic containers were either cracked, broken or had fallen and spilled their content, mostly food condiments. Only the bigger ones containing salt or other more heavy objects remained in good condition. The various metals he had were stored in wooden boxes such as bronze, copper, tin, steel, gold, iron and aluminum in descending order of quantities were mostly untouched if slightly melted off for some but that detail was unimportant. Other boxes filled with soaked coal and coke, only needed to dry, maybe another go under high heat and be usable again. Most of his leather was gone or too damaged to be usable, the structures made to treat them had the same fate as the workbench. It was the same end for various other resources of animal origins that were outside. The remaining claws of the great ostraped were in his inventory the same goes for the pieces of the fabricator, his armor, tools and various weapons such as his war scythe cleaver. There was no real limit to the size of what he could carry as long as he waited for it to be stored, only weight was, which was why what he was doing ultimately limited how much he could carry at all times. But only a fool wouldn't carry the most important and necessary object with him at all times with such an option available. And he wasn't in the game, losing his stuff if he died was quite low on the priority list. RESP awning was not possible, there wasn't a certain homo deus behind him that will revive him again, again and again. If he dies then that's the end, well maybe not truly considering his situation but he wasn't going to test this frivolously suicidal theory. All in all he didn't know if he should laugh or cry. Most of the work he did during his time on this moon was swept away like it was nothing as he was forced to stay underground completely powerless. Sadly frustration here was unneeded, unhelpful and counterproductive. Though it didn't stop the feeling of the likes to exist, he wasn't an emotionless robot but this little setback wasn't going to stop him, far from it. The worst was that he thought of the possibility of a sudden natural disaster knocking up at his door. But the only preparation he could do was to have what was important and fragile to him and have a safe area, a shelter, and it's also one of the reasons he dug a hole leading to the outside of the wall. Now. Approaching the tree Liam took in more detail. It was alive, 
it was damaged certainly but only some branches, most of the leaves and flowers were gone but budding leaves could be seen all around its crown even from down here. Also, the branch where his treehouse was simply gone. Where he didn't know probably kilometers away and he barely slept in it anymore anyway as Gladius couldn't be taken up there. That didn't mean he was happy about this discovery though. Damn the tree was hit by lightning at the bare minimum seven times. How the fuck is it still standing, he thought completely puzzled and shocked by this, he knew what a tree struck one time by lightning on earth looked like from up close, keywords being on one and earth. It brought a worrying possibility, the tree, particularly the species of which this tree was part of had adapted to this environment and was the only tall and tallest tree in the Great Plain as far as he could see. It wasn't a coincidence it survived the night, it was adapted to survive this kind of hazard which means they were common enough for evolution to kick in. I will need to move. But not now, Liam said with a deep frown mind working on how it will be a headache to move everything, first. I need Gladius to be big enough to move and also find an acceptable area. The following days consisted of firstly cleaning up the carcass of sting bats, Liam taking meat and part of their body that were still usable as he hated wasting resources be them of any origin. What couldn't be used was simply burned to ash, ash that had been used. Letting half a ton of sting bats remains to rot outdoors and on the ground was stupid at best and at worst could lead to diseases, parasites and attract unwanted animals, these kinds of things. And the smell. The little flood in his base was short-lived too. The water was absorbed by the dry soil and the new plants growing from it. He fixed his walls in record time as it was just some trunks that were pulled out, nothing was truly destroyed. He remade most of what was destroyed too, notably his workbench which he upgraded to help in more meticulous work, and as well as a better, bigger, more resistant forge that could handle higher levels of heat. He worked fast and with terrifying efficiency. Presently, it was the middle of day 69 and Liam was silently creeping between tall blades of grass toward his next meal, his eyes focused on a boar-sized six-legged creature. It has navy blue leathery skin, six stumpy legs ending with three clawed and finned paws, four nasty-looking fangs out of its big triple articulated jaws, and finally, five pinkish frills flaring outward from its rump like a peacock would. He called it a peacock listro for the simple reason that the animal's general body shape reminded him of a listrosaurus, without the cuddly factor and the ability to do backflips on command. It was one of the recent animals that migrated here after the thunderstorm. After this storm things changed, it rained at least two times a day in the vast majority of the Great Plain. Liam supposed it was the start of the rainy season or something close to its equivalent. And honestly, while it was good for the biodiversity it was a new uncontrollable factor that caused problems as the rain was both a boon and a curse. Mostly a curse when you don't have an effective way to stop water from infiltrating everything. At least the mosquito equivalent of this moon didn't like his blood which was another story for poor Gladius. The rain modified not only the flora and fauna but also the Great Plain topography. Streams were formed and concluded in rivers, themselves fusing into one bigger. All were shallow but it was still a drastic change to whatever he saw of those familiar planes. A bronze javelin appeared in his left hand, as Liam took a throwing position, arm straightening, and right as he was going to throw his weapon something happened. Liam paused as the clear water of the stream his prey was drinking from broke and a squeal of surprise mixed with agony echoed startling a dozen of four-winged featherless flamingo-like creatures, tetrapterons, all of who promptly flew away. A fish, at least 3 meters, 9 ft 9, long fish with a body shaped like a torpedo, 4 red eyes, and covered on dark brown heavy plates that contrasted deeply with its vibrant yellow bioluminescent part. It looked like a mix between a sturgeon, a pike and a bit of Dunkleosteus. A dinochthoid, a subspecies to be precise. It's an exclusively carnivorous and extremely aggressive aquatic animal capable of living through dry seasons in a way quite similar to the now long since extinct lungfish of the earth in this universe. It would dig itself into the ground and then encase itself in a protective cocoon of mucus before entering a vegetative-like state where nearly all of its metabolic function slowed down to a crawl until it rained again. 
If no rain were to come it wouldn't be a problem as they can practice auto-cannibalizing and eat their flesh to wait even longer. The fish's jaws clamped tightly at the throat of the peacock Listro drawing copious amounts of red blood. That's my new little shit, Liam thought glaring at the fish that was slowly dragging his food into the river. Unhappy and quite furious about this sudden turn of events he threw his javelin with deadly precision, the power behind it being just enough for it to not be lost two meters deep underground as it had happened before more than once. As the javelin flew through the air, the 30 meters, 99 feet, of distance traveled in the blink of an eye. In his now empty left hand appeared his current favorite weapon, his war scythe and he ran straight at the fish with murder in his eyes. The javelin reached its target first, impaling the head of the squirming peacock Listro ending its gurgled squeal of agony for good. The fish, uncaring why there wasn't any struggle, took advantage of this as it started to drag its dead prey with even more vigor behind each movement of its large front fins but Liam had already arrived and his scythe raised high the polished claw serving as a curved blade gleamed ominously under the sun's light. With one powerful swing downward the blade stabbed through its armored cranium with ease, the fish jolted before it jerked around erratically. Tail slapping the ground with enough force to split a man's skull as if it was mere tofu. It never let go of the dead animal within its jaw, in fact, it bit even harder and its bioluminescent skin became a flamboyant red. Liam stepped to the side dodging a tail slap, war scythe in hand he repeated the same motion this time the fish went completely limp, and the unarmored sides that had changed to red as if a flip was switched became a dull gray. He still stabbed it in the head four more times for good measure. You never know, animals are tenacious, even more here. He noted that it had bright blue blood like octopus or horseshoe crab interestingly enough. Two for the price of one. Wonder how they taste. This fish in particular, what would be best, leaf grilled, marinated, or... So many choices. Liam said with a grin, his stomach rumbling in agreement. Flicking cleaver in the air the blue blood was thrown on the grass, he looked around him to see if anything was threatening his prize. There was nothing aside from the other side of the river where a herd of 57 elephant-sized dimetrodon-like animals could be seen peacefully grazing the vibrant grass trimming with life. It was a magnificent sight but Liam didn't delude himself, those won't hesitate one second to stomp him to death if he were on the other side. Dragging the two corpses away from the riverbed he started the lengthy process of storing them in his inventory. His body and mind as always were on high alert, he was vulnerable while doing so after all. An hour later he was back at his base and his smile vanished when a pleasant surprise greeted him in the form of hoof prints and four-toed footprints around the muddy trail of his gateways. Gateways he could see someone had tempted to open and failed miserably. After all, when he was out he locked it from behind with tree trunks from the inside. He modified the gate the same day he gave the NA6 kids back to their clan. The footprints were of one NA6 and one dire horse that he could tell from their shape, an arrangement, it didn't take a genius for that and he could tell that they ran in panic. This pointed to the NA6 panic being tied to the sudden burst of fury he felt from Gladius around an hour ago but at the time he simply thought that the baby great ostropede must have seen a creature that wasn't father such as one of those twelve-winged butterflies and that as it dared to enter its breathing space and must be exterminated. Apparently, he was very wrong. Chapter 16 Professional Egg Stealer Breathing in and out Liam calmed the bubbling emotions raging in his mind mostly anger at whoever tried to enter his base, his property while he was away once more anticipation and paranoia proved to be fruitful. ANA6 could have entered and stolen, or killed Gladius, or stolen his resource if not destroyed what he rebuilt. It would have been bad in all cases he could think of. The mere idea was enraging and put together with the last few days, even months. All of this caused him to be on edge, to say the least. He considered himself someone cool-headed and composed even before having his body switched and his very being changed on a fundamental level. Yet he had limits, ones he was far from reaching but if how he killed the great ostropede was an indicator nobody wanted to be in his close vicinity when it would happen. Well, he wasn't a wild animal, even when he snapped he stayed mostly conscious of his actions as he pummeled the alien bird to death. And he was in mortal danger 
his body was in fight or flight response, the first was prevalent and he did what he did. Anger was bad, a problem he was aware of but it was comparatively better being rightfully angry than in plain depression or feeling despair, as long it was directed and focused. But valid reasons to keep the ember of his anger kept on falling on his head, he didn't want to tempt Murphy but it could always be worse. It was more of a coping mechanism than anything, one Liam was perfectly aware of but one that worked nonetheless. I might be overreacting. I likely am. They arrived in the middle of the day, Liam thought, calming himself, observing his surrounding he moved to a patch of dirt with grass growing, crawling through a hole he could barely fit through, one tunnel's entrance. Tunnels that might need revamp in the way of needing some traps just in case some native gets too curious, some along the same design as narcotic trap wire should do wonders to unwelcome guests either if they have good or bad intentions. In the first place walking through those tunnels for them when their adults are on average taller than the tallest humans is going to be a bit challenging. But prevention is better than cure. Then again, I don't know how NA6 interact with one another or are their cultures for that matter and neither do they know how humans interact with one another. It's a clusterfuck, he thought walking in the dark and damp tunnel, slightly hunched over, his implant serving as an improvised flashlight. Honestly, it was empty though and meaningless the only option was to find this mysterious and uninvited NA6. Hearing happy familiar chirps from behind the wall made him smile and come back as he snapped out of his internal brooding. Moving through the tunnel he noted how a part of it was still flooded and that bioluminescent plant-mushroom hybrids were growing all around, there even were some kind of small pinkish killifish swimming in the still flooded areas. Likely from eggs laid there before, the movement of soil was probably at fault too. They weren't unique as he detected via his implant that there was a lot of thing in the soil, seed, spore, and fish egg to various other animals' eggs. But those went mostly unnoticed the same for microorganisms as they continued to live on for a more or less long time unless they immediately died as what was stored was put in a sort of protective bubble. It separated them from the void of the subspace that was his inventory. Also, the reason why more delicate things don't break or plants don't instantly die but keeping them for a long period still kills them, eventually. The degree of awareness for something to be storable was still unknown but at least it must be less aware than your run-of-the-mills alien arthropods and more aware than alien microorganisms. The rules behind what can and what can't be stored were a bit fuzzy but that's why testing was for. His inventory was his most versatile and arguably most powerful tool. Understanding it was the bare minimum. At the moment he hypothesized that it mostly depended on how much it was conscious, how potent for lack of a better word was its engramic matrix, for whatever it truly represented, and how much it physically could move. All of it was ultimately only suppositions drawn from his knowledge of the techgrams, engrams for extremely advanced pieces of technology that could nearly pass for magic, mixed with his own intuition so he thought it was bound to evolve. He was pretty much blind and could only poke around and see what worked and what didn't. A very common occurrence here is how he missed the internet. Exiting the tunnel Liam was met with a very excited baby murder chicken waiting for him, Gladius had grown quite a bit. Now the chick was reaching up to a bit more than the middle of his abdomen and the claws from its two three-fingered hands were growing, but at the moment on each digit, they were no more than six stubby black dots than anything but it was a start. Ow who's my adorable murder chicken it's you? The man cooed while scratching gently behind the start of one of the neural cues like one would scratch behind the ear of their dog if the purring and feeling of commencement was an indicator Gladius liked it. Liam stopped as an idea struck him, grabbing one of the ends of the neural cue the pink tendrils of nervous fibers shot out and weaved in the air before quickly coiling around his implant. A familiar prickling sensation later and his pupils dilated covering most of his grey irises. Closed his eyes he focused on the mental connection with the implant and focused on Gladius' mind. Conveying feelings was easy, teaching Gladius' words and their correlation in simple actions as well. However, more conceptual notions not directly in the shape of raw emotions were a bit more complicated. Liam knew it was mostly born out of his inexperience about this aspect and that Gladius was not human and not even a month old, still a baby, a big murderous one but a baby nonetheless. 
It wasn't like the NA6 where they became one in mind and body to whoever or whatever they do that's a halo with, the connection between neural cues. Thought this was traded off by this link he had with his tame. Open mind memories, he sent, and what he got was a confused four-eyed gaze from Gladius before the hatchling opened its beak and he got grey-purplish images of Gladius' favourite fruit and a sensation of hunger. Right after the hatchling closed its beak in confusion as Liam mentally let it be known with amusement and a mental deadpan it wasn't what he asked but if it understand what he wanted it would have more food. He tried several other words and emotions probing here and there, but none really worked, which showed on the hatchling as it grew frustrated, nearly looking as if it was going to cry which made Liam feel bad. Frustrated, right. He felt like an idiot having missed the obvious. Anger desire death enemy ran anger, and here the result was what he wanted, it was like using a very advanced virtual reality but with some very vague and diluted sensation. It was of Gladius being awakened from its rightful rest by strange sounds coming from the big moving thing that was the exit slash entrance. At first, it thought it was father coming back but as it happily waddled closer it realized it wasn't. The voice was different. Liam notified it was the NA6 language even if distorted and different as the memories were not heard with human ears so if the one was female or male he didn't know. Its waddling became extremely aggressive as it shrieked something that promised a slow and gruesome death but to Liam it was cute. It was followed by a panicked yelp combined with a neigh whistle like sound and the sound of hoof clopping on mud before ultimately silence came back. Then a wave of smugness from Gladius and at the exact same time the connection broke and Liam took lungfuls of air as he was unconsciously holding his breath until now. H-A-A-A. Okay, so it's possible. But erg. It's disorienting guess my brain isn't truly wired for this not that it matters. He mumbled, massaging his forehead in vain to get the new but slight headache to go away. Queeb. Yes you did good buddy. Liam responded with a chuckle at the chirping Gladius made it known it didn't get its food, the man gladly gave various fruits from his inventory he collected along the way to his base. But each fruit was earned by playing or doing what he asked. Which was around 50 kilograms, 110 pounds, mostly berries and also nuts all gathered in this short time, proving how fertile the lands were. He tested all of them before to see which was good or bad but he knew it wasn't the most useful of action as what can be deadly for one species is what is needed for the continual survival of another, such as the joy of the unknown. Though he still avoided giving the one that made him feel queasy. Gladius' nutritional need aside from this discovery of the ability to access the memory of his one and only tame, thereby everything he could tame had a lot of potential, the first thing that came to him was scouting. Just like a scooting pet or familiar from an RPG. It was an exciting prospect and quite frankly a necessity now that he thinks about it. It certainly can't be one of those suicidal little shit, he thought about the potential choices while walking to the butchering stone slab. The dead armored fish was plopped on the slab and he started to cut its head off with a utility knife made of one of the smaller great ostraped claws. Hmm yeah those featherless flamingo eagle birds should do omnivorous and excessively more intelligent than those bats, not that it's particularly hard to beat them in that department, he thought of the tetrapterons while he started to fillet the fish, pleasantly surprised by the lack of fish bone. And also how the pure white flesh was quite similar to squid at least in taste and texture which brought new ideas about what he was going to cook, squids were one of his favorite ingredients to work with. Any way to get his future scouting partner or partners, a simple plan if that even be qualified as that formed in his mind on how he was going to steal, no, permanently borrow without permission some tetrapteron's eggs. He studied the newly arrived wildlife enough to be sure of where they nested and that the tetrapterons were nesting at all for that matter. Day 71 Shining under the sun's Liam in his full bronze armor was threading around a tree of the exact same species as the one at his base but this one was but a hallowed husk of what it once was a husk of a tree still taller than the redwood Hyperion by a good 10 meters, 33 feet. The fact it was this intact was puzzling with how often thunderstorms occurred or it was why it was in such a state. Either way, it was of no importance. The gravity of Pandora is 20% weaker than that of Earth pushing the limit of what was thought biologically possible on the old blue planet. 
and this species of tree tanking dozens of lighting strikes are not even close to the tallest species of tree on the moon and that by quite a significant amount. A simple small triangular wood and leather shield with hints of bronze was strapped by a piece of leather to his right forearm while on his left forearm was his wrist crossbow. His armor was nearly hermetic to any potential harm that might arrive at the meat bag inside that was Liam. Above the sound of cawing could be heard as the three dozen figures of four-winged featherless birds in most shades and colors from light purple to royal blue with the occasional orange to almost black. He wasn't exactly sure if they even were of the exact same species or if it was a particularity of theirs in any case they were quite beautiful creatures if a bit vicious looking. His line of sight while limited by his helmet didn't bother him, he already memorized multiple paths to climb and to go down. But he knew it was still limiting and will prove to be an inconvenience. The option of falling straight to the ground has been taken into consideration and from a certain height judged as acceptable. While climbing a redwood-sized tree in full armor sounds incredibly silly and stupidly dangerous, still, the case is straight up impossible if you weren't passed beyond what was humanly acceptable in strength, endurance, and speed. His armor felt like regular clothing, its weight was barely noticeable to him. The only annoying aspect was that it made him less agile. And Liam didn't have much other option unless he wanted his flesh lacerated, fingers bitten off, eyes eaten out and other such joyful-sounding potential injuries that no sane man wanted to live through. He didn't doubt one second that those usually shy creatures will lose it when he takes their blood and flesh encapsulated in calcium right in front of their four-eyed gazes, or even before that as some were already warily observing him. Some animals on this moon would do far more for far less. And if someone were to try stealing what was his he would act this way too. Well let's go. No risk taken no reward earned, Liam said to no one but himself as encouragement and started to climb, his boots with hooks for better gripping strength. Not forgetting two pieces of modified claws from great ostropede vestigial wings serving as climbing pikes that could hold his weight and some more but just to be safe he had four more, one set attached to his hip and another in his inventory. He was a professional after all, he came prepared though if it was enough he wasn't sure as he needed to take his weight plus his inventory into consideration and potential hazard. Chapter 17 Unexpected but expected an uninvited guest Climbing in all of its forms before had been something Liam was never really a fan of, the first time he did rock climbing when he was 13 years old an accident happened and it resulted in his pelvis breaking in four. This let him know the joy of being bedridden for weeks in constant pain while not on painkillers and after there was the joy of needing to relearn how to walk normally while otherwise being forced to move around in a wheelchair unable to have any real freedom for the next six months. Fun. Though it was quite different here, being physically able to do feats that he would have never thought he could do such as doing a double backflip on command, one finger handstand even if he fell a lot at first or bending metal with ease changed quite a lot about how he saw the world and lived in general. It gave confidence, a sense of safety to a certain degree but not arrogance, at least that is what he thought, as he knew more than anyone that he is not even remotely close to being unkillable, the long diagonal scar on his back being proof of this fact. Humans themselves are already capable of extraordinary feats and for him, those possible feats are only amplified and expanded. He could beat all sports world records with ease if he ever wanted, aside from gymnastics or others that needed a stupid amount of flexibility. Evidently, he was strong but not to the point of him stopping a tractor trailer truck dead in its tracks but smaller vehicles depending on how fast, how heavy they are, and on what ground he is on that Liam possibly could. Climbing a dead tree even this tall was not hard physically speaking, it was more on the fact that the tree was more of an extremely smooth pylon of dead organic matter that had nearly all other holds such as branches and holds mostly gone, the possibility of random holes due to mold or rot he couldn't see. And also the tetrapterons flying around. Planting one climbing pike after another he lifted his body, spiked boot stabilizing him as he carefully climbed all his senses focused on what he was doing and his surroundings. One of his objectives was 80 meters. 262 feet 5, above the ground in the form of a blackened branch leading straight to a hole in the dead tree, hearing the distorted eagle screech mixed with crow caws informed him that his presence has been detected and is not welcomed. 
one of the tetrapteron that was flying in a circle finally decided to get rid of the strange shining humanoid creature, a creature that felt off, and one that was climbing to their nesting place. Diving silently its full wingspan of 1,5 meters, 4 feet 9, wingspans of four wings spread evenly the alien bird rapidly gained in speed and momentum its sharp claws at the end of its talons opened to tear flesh apart. Then it hit, claws slamming against the creature's shining head. The impact was violent, destabilizing Liam who was in the process of setting his left climbing pike into the dead trunk nearly making him lose his grip and almost causing him to slip on his footing. It was more out of the surprise than anything, he didn't hear the tetraperone until it hit the back of his helmeted head. They were very silent flyers. Growling in annoyance Liam moved half-consciously half-instinctively by slamming his climbing tool against the tetrapteron scratching and clawing at his helmet while it was cawing aggressively. The short surprised and pained squawk accompanied by the familiar squelching sound of metal hitting flesh followed not forgetting the one of bone cracking was a good indication it didn't take the hit very well. The weight on his head was gone and with a now bloodied climbing pike he continued on. The dead tetrapteron plummeted ungraciously through the 40 meters, 131 foot, of air before it hit the ground and tainting the vibrant green of the grass red. There was silence in the incessant cawing and screeching which Liam took not of it he didn't stop in his endeavor, climbing the tree at a speed of more or less 2 meters per second, 6.6 feet s, time was of the essence. He was soon interrupted by the metallic clink of stones hitting his bronze shoulder pad, this was followed by more projectiles hitting him as the tetrapterons picked up stones, sticks, and fruits and more as they started pelting him with those. They are smart. Good but quite annoying and dangerous here. Normal reaction considering what I have planned. I suppose, Liam thought, his breathing regulated he was happy about their show of intelligence even if it was admittedly not the most effective on him. However he never stopped progressing as the flock of alien birds got more and more agitated, never stopping pelting him with what was light enough for them to carry and throw. One like its predecessor seeing the armored creature dangerously approaching their nest dived at him this time at the exact moment he was stabbing his climbing pike higher in the dead hardwood, it attacked his other hand with only a real hold on the bark. The one that dived first had little success as Liam, even if surprised by this sudden change of behavior, was aware that they could try doing that again, his hold never wavered. The courageous tetrapteron got its body crushed by the shield as Liam slammed his right arm on the dead trunk with the bird in between. This was but a short interlude as finally, he was at arm's length of the blackened branch, Testing with one foot he remarked that compared to the rest it was mushy and covered in a grey moss mold-like thing that would have smelled fool if there wasn't the wind and his helmet in between. It was the same colour of the bark in a way he couldn't have told from below and now it was the only way up or he needed to go down and climb from an entirely different side, it wobbled, seemed thin, and clearly a hazard to climb through. Internally cursing as the distance was larger than he would have liked but close enough to not be a problem he took a deep breath calming his beating heart and hammering in his ears. Adrenaline coursed through his veins aplenty. Internally cursing again for his lack of sanity he swiveled himself to the side and at this exact moment five small screeching bodies decided to slam into his back causing him to half scream half curse. He was destabilized, but he still managed to jump, leaving a climbing pike behind. The feeling of being airborne when nearly a hundred meters above the ground was one of the most terrifying moments of his life but also one of the most exhilarating. This feeling, however, was short-lived as he directed his jump toward the rotted area trunk but it came back right after as to his befuddlement he traveled through it as if it was a paper wall. What he was met with was a spacious hollow cavity with wells of sunlight from holes above and tetrapterons resting on sort of alcoves or flying around. However at that moment, he could care less twisting his body in the air, he instinctively oriented himself and planted his right climbing pike on the wall of the tree slowing down his short but very dangerous fall to a stop. Liam stayed like that for half a second, one hand holding his entire body weight while his brain rapidly processed what just happened, he sighed in relief not noticing the grin that had appeared on his face. He ignored the echoing screech AMD took out a new climbing pike from his inventory, he then exchanged the one he used to stop his fall as it was too damaged for the one on his hip. 
planting both he finally stabilized himself and observed his surroundings. Eyes trailing over every nest, old and new he felt his grin widen as he climbed around shoving or killing the occasional tetrapterons that got too close or attacked him. Yes, they're eggs. I didn't do that for nothing, he cried out in joy and relief. This insanely stupid gamble and equally stupid actions of his proved to be worth it, he wasn't even 100% sure if he was going to find something or if they were going to be eggs, or if those birds laid eggs at all for that matter. Though nothing has hatched yet so no crying for victory as all of what he did might still be pointless. A bit of realistic pessimism here and there keeps you grounded and never hurts. Storing the three bright slightly transparent orange and perfectly round eggs in his inventory, his gauntlet not bothering the action. He noticed that they weighed the same as those of gooses. He also noted that of the three only one was fertilized, the scan of his implant only confirmed it. He wasn't disappointed by that discovery, far from it, it meant omelette was on the menu. He would have felt hunger at the idea if the smell down here wasn't so horrendously puke-inducing in a way similar to a henpen that wasn't cleaner for months but ten times worse as the air was hot and humid. He didn't know how he could live through this smell, the helmet helped but not by much. The man didn't waste time idling on the smell, he moved around multiple nests, most empty. He slapped the occasional tetrapterons aside as he ransacked three more nests full of eggs, stealing the nests themselves right after. Nests that sported some similarities to the part he bulldozed through to enter the tree by accident. This led to multiple possibilities as to why this is the case but the most likely was the tetrapterons cultivated or made this substance as a sort of glue or building block. He also lost one more climbing pike to two tetrapterons cutting down his stock of six from when he started to a measly two. And that's when Liam decided that with five fertilized eggs he had enough, he was greedy but not that much. He pondered shortly where he should exit before deciding to climb down from where he was, not wanting to test his luck any further than that. Once he had climbed down to the very bottom of the hollow tree where the ground was mostly made of guano, bones, and other remains he couldn't and didn't want to distinguish. This disgusting mixture reaching up to his ankle was the source of the smell that made his stomach retch in disgust but it picked his mind's interest as it potentially could be used as fertilizer considering it might be similar to guano, the white gold, a potent fertilizer. But it's neither the time nor the place, Liam remarked, walking through it carefully to not slip or if there are potential holes at random places or if it was deeper. His boots sadly were not hermetic enough and some of the mixtures infiltrated within to his great displeasure but he didn't complain, steel pickaxe materialized in his left hand he started to literally dig his way out of this place. One hour later he was looking down at the 30 meters, 98 feet 5, a void separating from the ground from his new point dug straight from the hollow of the dead tree. This made him realize why he didn't feel the tree was that hollow and that he couldn't have really dug his way into it from the outside at this height in the first as he would have been constantly harassed by the tetrapterons and a plethora of other problems. Climbing down was easy as all tetrapterons were too preoccupied with looking at what was stolen and covering the damage in the paper wall covered hole of the trunk he traveled through. Nothing attacked him on his way back likely due to the smell which he was both thankful and annoyed by. He was a bit weary from his little climbing experience so him not needing to uselessly kill anything that suicidally threw itself at him was always a bonus. As soon as he arrived he verified his traps and took a two-hour shower where he rubbed himself off the grim, a full body wash to get rid of the smell and he succeeded but he knew he would need several more to be really rid of it. He didn't want to go into one such tree where those creatures nested ever again but the differences between wanting and needing are vast. This was followed by him cleaning and checking his armor and equipment, they needed to be taken care of if he didn't want an unforeseen event of them breaking at crucial moments. Even more so with how he brutalized them daily. The following week passed without anything extraordinary happening, he worked more on the Basta asterisk dyes fabricator, the usual hunting and what came with it, and resource collecting each day to achieve a set objective. The most important task was finishing his incubator for the tetrapterons' eggs, it was dug into the ground in a way it stayed hermetic and no water infiltrated, an area impenetrable by sunlight too. Far from the tree and any of its roots, same as other aspects of his base. 
it was a natural and dangerous lightning rod might as well not let everything close to it like the first time, so he moved most of his stuff away this also led to an increase in his wall range and the need to build abodes, wood and stone structures to protect everything that could be protected. The parameters of this primitive incubator were controlled to a certain extent, them being degree temperature, humidity and aeration. If they ever weren't right he simply stored them in his inventory. It was easy to monitor the fetus's development with their eggshells, the opposite of Gladius' egg which was so opaque and dense that even with the bright light trick he couldn't see anything inside it. And all seemingly developed well with their kidnapper's meticulous care aside of course from his first blunter where he killed one by overexposure to the suns, reducing their number from five to four a blunder he was displeased of but admittedly this was why he took more than one to begin with. In the morning, the closest sun was shining upon the Great Plain, and Liam was currently underground following his new routine. A routine that consisted of checking the few traps within the tunnels of his bases which was followed by him checking for footprints or the like all around his base and if the wall held well as well. Footprints and the tracks they made suffered from the fact that they didn't survive long in the kind of environment he lived in and he wasn't the utmost expert in them either. But he didn't find anything related to them however at various other places he found unnaturally placed bones close to what looked like buried campfires, he found two of such places and they were quite far from his base and one another. The most notable find in them was close to one of the rivers where he hunted. A bone of an unknown animal showed the carving of a big six-legged creature, a thanator, one that almost looked lifelike, there was depth, shadow, and a sense of motion. Changing your angle of vision also changed what was shown to a degree giving it life. The almost because of the long cut straight in the middle. One he could recognize as a mistake of inattention. One that pissed off the carver greatly, a feeling he could understand. Investing time and energy into something to fuck up at the last second was very, very aggravating. Clearly, nothing you would think people with a round Neolithic level of technology capable of, then again art and technology are not forcibly mutually inclusive and it was an alien world. It was exceptionally good carving nonetheless, better than what he could do from an aesthetic standpoint which was logic. And he preferred function over form but he wouldn't say no if both are met if possible. And that made him curious about who made it and the technique used. Anyways. He was currently staring at the snap string, broken ceramic container until his gaze traveled to the tall blue dangerously skinny narcotically induced unconscious body barely fitting in the tunnel, the body was splayed in a way that would suggest panic and dread before ultimately falling unconscious. Liam's facial expression rapidly shifted from anger to disappointment, to pity before ultimately shifting to a unique mix of the three but with cold shimmering anger at the forefront. Far from home it seems and you surely don't seem the type to make art, he said all emotion muted after having turned the unconscious body around and recognized the face even if the cheeks were sunken, lips busted, various scars that weren't there before, and his left ear cut from the base. Chapter 18 Doing What Is Necessary Swaren's mind slowly came to consciousness, though fuzzy and incoherent, his body worn out and starved. The NA6 mind cleared further as his only good ear flicked at the soft sound of something scratching against something. Feelings of his weakened limbs slowly came back to him and with it, the pain, one in particular around his neck, wrists, and feet, his eyes snapped open and he immediately tried to run away as far as possible but it was impossible. His back slammed against the pillar to which he was bound, trying to get up again he failed, his feet tied, arms twisted uncomfortably with his wrist clamped down, the bound on his neck was tired to something behind keeping him grounded for good and each movement slowly choked him. His heart hammered in his chest as his feeble muscles fought in vain. His eyes filled with terror darted everywhere looking for a way out one that didn't exist. Walls were all the NA6 could see until his eyes locked onto the demon's almost unnaturally grey ones. Next to him was also a small creature sleeping peacefully in a ball. A creature that was both familiar and alien but his mind was not in the place to care about this detail. Ah, you're finally awake, the demon said coldly as he stopped sharpening his strange weapon, a war scythe not that the NA6 could know. Then he spoke again slowly standing to his full height appearing taller and more intimidating than any human should have the right to, 
not that the new of any other human, you're scared? Don't look at me like I'm the monster here, or the word should be more apt as it is somewhat close in meaning right. You came here yourself. The source of so many nightmares, pain and horror he lived through far from his clan, and his family since that event where he failed to kill him and was exiled, forced to cut one of his ears as a mark of his crime for his exile, his thoughts were muddled by fear and hate. The human spoke in this same strange language of theirs, but this time daring to use a word of the people within, the voice sounding muffled. As the demon moved closer Tswaren's despair and effort to flee kept on increasing, he tried to speak out threats and hiss but what came out only incoherent sounds came out. Crouching down to meet the eyes level of Tswaren the demon blinked, his two cold grey eyes seemed vacant for a split second before a hopeless sigh escaped his lips. A bone knife, his bone knife appeared out of thin air in the demon's left hand causing Tsaren to reel back in shock the terror he felt until now amplified even further at the sheer impossibility of what just occurred. They were wrong, the Tsahik and Oloiktan were wrong, he was right whatever this creature did was not normal, nobody should be able to do this. And whatever he did to help the two youngsters were not out of good intent. You can't understand my words and wouldn't if you could in the state you are but I still wanted to tell you this, or maybe it's to myself. I was going to help you, you have lived through some shit recently I can see that, I pitied you even if you tried to kill me once. I was going to help you back into full health, how I wish it was to be the case but, the demon trailed off his voice getting lower and lower almost turning into a growl, flicking the dagger a purplish liquid fell. Poison, one made of a mixture of berries, one that wouldn't have killed me but. There shouldn't be poison if your intentions were to ever be peaceful in the beginning, not that intruding into someone else's home armed in the middle of the night is ever good, he spun the knife into a good handling position one normally would take for a short sword rather than a knife. I truly don't have any desire to do this, but I'm selfish and my survival comes first before anything else and you're a threat. I would have left you be but you had to do this. You brought this upon yourself, the demon continued, each word getting colder, more frigid than the last even as he clutched the handle of the knife hard enough to cause the wood it was made to start splintering. The demon moved again, Swaren's eyes filled with primal terror zoomed toward the bone blade as it was oriented toward the right side of his head. The realization of his situation finally hit the NA6, and all he could feel was true despair, anger, and even regret, however, it was too late. Tears started to trickle down his sunken cheeks as he tried and tried for the umpteenth time to struggle, stand up, and run away. But all it did was tighten the rope that bound him even further, as Liam had intended for it to do but the NA6 even if ignorant of this fact still kept on thrashing around as the ropes literally strangled him. All the little rationality left and slowly slipped into mindless hysteria. A flash of hesitation passed through Liam's eyes at the scene unfolding before him for the briefest of instants, before his right hand shouted out, grabbing solidly the NA6 forehead, ending all the struggle as Tswaren froze. Unable to move, instincts screaming in disarray. Keeping eye contact with the NA6 Liam's face hardened as the hold of his left hand on the dagger tightened further. Breathing calmly Liam acted, with one swift, clean, and strong motion the blade stabbed with laughable ease through Tswaren's skull, there was a sharp pain the NA6 felt before his world, fear, and despair disappeared all at once. The blade stopped halfway in the skull as the curved tip poked through the other side of the cranium. Rapid and effective, no need for more pointless suffering. Taking out the dagger Liam kept eye contact with the now dead dulled eyes and their unmistakable frozen terror in them for a time until he manually closed them. His hand holding the bloodied dagger was steady as his gaze moved to it and he sheathed it back into the leather strap around the NA6's chest. He didn't feel guilt, remorse, or the need to throw up at his action, he only felt as if a metaphorical weight was lifted off his shoulder yet he wasn't happy nor did feel any kind of real satisfaction at the NA6's suffering, terrified gaze and death which he was extremely relieved for. The opposite in fact. And one of the reasons as to why he didn't immediately kill the unconscious NA6 after discovering the poisoned blade. A sort of twisted sense of curiosity for this exact purpose and the response he got was mixed and made him learn a lot about himself. It was easy. 
too easy. Perhaps due to my hatred toward him or the rational need to get rid of a threat or that he wasn't human or all combined. But doing this and taking the life of someone shouldn't feel so easy and normal, Liam thought, puzzled and mildly horrified by his own train of thoughts and how he should feel about this. It was off-putting, inhuman to some degree, this apathy, desensitization to the act even if it was someone he hated. Maybe the NA6 word held some inkling of truth. Liam didn't know if he always was this way or if it was from the moment he arrived or a mix of both. It didn't matter, however, as it was him and only him at the end who choose to do it. But ultimately if what he did was good or bad was subjective and depended on more factors and points of view than one can count, the NA6 was depressed, sick, injured, starved, and past the point, one would call the breaking one, but why was he in such a state? Liam could have helped the NA6 but he didn't, he wasn't going to save someone who tried to kill him for no reason, and very much in the middle of trying a second time, it was asking for a third attempt, one with a greater chance of success. People when set on one thing don't tend to change that easily and Liam wasn't patient enough for those people to change even less when it directly put himself and what he held in extreme and immediate danger. Cowardly to a certain degree for some but Liam took this as being rational and not being a naive moron, not everyone can be changed or even want to. Or even deserve such an opportunity. Sighing pensively about all of it, it was life he supposed, he would have killed someone at some point and he surely will need to do so again in the future. He just hoped it won't happen much, it felt casual and it shouldn't be but it was. From another point of view, it was good in fact that he was calm and that his first kill was in a controlled environment but all of it didn't equal him liking it. Hearing Gladius chirp and arrive behind him made him blink, he scratched the back of the murdered chicken's head until it made a purr-like sound. It was curiously looking at the corpse but lost interest pretty fast, completely different than prior when he dragged the unconscious body and had to forcefully calm down the bird or the NA6 would have been killed right away. We can play after I take care of this. Liam said, and Gladius tilted its head to the side. Even if the little guy passed most of its time either sleeping or eating due to it being so young it still needed plenty of mental stimulation. Something Liam was happy to oblige when he could, but something Gladius didn't really understand. It was mentally exhausting at times but something he was also glad. He severely needed those times of relaxation. One right now would be good. The following hours passed as Liam dug a hole far away from his base, he had already incinerated most of the body and crushed what survived the heat to avoid any would-be scavenger from digging it out. Not born of his respect for the dead, this one particular, but to get rid of any would-be physical evidence. No one could directly link him to him having killed the NA6, or if they do he can lie. So he didn't fear any retribution and it was obvious from how this NA6 acted that he was alone in his physical condition wasn't a good enough indicator. Why it was the case Liam wasn't sure and didn't exactly care all that much, exile being at the forefront, adding that one of his ears was cut and cauterized and the tip of his neural cue was cut or bitten off. And in the middle of regrowing, which meant it truly wasn't him with the horse. Exiled conceivably because of him well that must have been how the NA6 thought and what did it earn him? Nothing but suffering and death, and only the last Liam was partially responsible as it wasn't him who searched or even truly wanted to kill the NA6. However, Liam felt freer as the one who was lurking around was finally dead, if it was the one who alarmed Gladius he didn't know. But surely the possibility of there being more NA6 out looking for him for whatever reason be it good, bad, or neutral was clear and the reason why he will keep the traps all nice and ready. Such as the still unknown bone carver, it didn't seem like the kind of thing someone in despair and starving would do in his past time. Day 79 Liam was moving along the Great Plain at a pace one would consider for an Olympic marathon but for him was a simple jog. He was roughly half a kilometer from the shore and two hours and a half away at the same speed he was moving from his base, so approximately 25 kilometers per hour, 15.53 me slash h. This was without the pause to drink, eat, and take a breather. 
he was exploring to find new areas of potential interest notably but not uniquely easier access to the cave system below the Great Plain than the giant grottos as they clearly were not the safest place to use for cave diving and why he still didn't explore them. Not that cave diving on Earth was ever safe, to begin with, even less so on an alien moon with a penchant for fauna and flora affected by gigantism. The potential of getting lost however was minor in his mind as he could locate himself thanks to his link with his tame but he didn't use this as a crutch as even then his sense of direction was extremely good. In front of him was the spot where the shore and the plain met, growing out from the gravel beach and sea he could see a series of small high islands void of any visible life that formed a sort of archipelago where the sea water surrounding was shallow but from the look of it was but temporary as tide even if different from earth existed hers. The thing however that truly picked his interest was the yellow ranging from bright yellow to pale almost white yellow stone that was everywhere from around ponds and thin streams of boiling turquoise water to the column of stone emitting steam. Turquoise water that was denser than sea water. A hot spring or some sort of shore thermal vent. And sulfur, a lot of it to boot, Liam thought, eyes narrowing as he carefully approached one of the smaller islands, not forgetting to put on a pair of boots and gauntlets. This part was nearly connected to the gravel beach, his nose wrinkled as the distinct smell of rotted egg wafted over him thanks to a sudden shift in the sea breeze. Indeed it's sulfur, he remarked with a smile appearing on his face at this confirmation. He absolutely needed it and as soon as that thought passed his mind he felt the ground rumble, he backed far away knowing what was going to happen. And just as anticipated from the pond he just moved away a highly pressurized jet of steam and water high into the clear blue sky, the remnant of the heated air washed over his face with no consequence besides the unpleasant smell and that it was slightly irritating to his eyes. A shower of extremely acidic and boiling water was the last thing he wanted, the chances were it wasn't going to kill him at all unless he took a dip directly inside one of the ponds and stayed inside for some time. Chances he didn't want to take. But just the idea of chemical burn and third-degree burn from scalding hot acidic water was a good enough deterrent for him to tread with the utmost care and avoid the deadly turquoise water at all costs. Steel pickaxe appearing from his inventory with a mental command, Liam switched it to his right hand and tapped with the metal tips one of the knee-high pale yellow stone columns, easily breaking it from the base while he held it in place as he waited for it to be stored. This procedure was repeated a dozen times over the various variants in the color of the stone that contained Liam noted that there was a variation in purities depending on how intense the yellow was, the more intense the color the purer the sulfur. But they were usually too close to the sulfuric water for his comfort. It's not like the purity was even a problem to him, processes to purify it existed at worst it cost time. Prime materials are rarely if ever found pure depending on what it is and pure doesn't mean better either, it always depends. Now he had the last missing pillar of the triad to make black powder aka gunpowder. Not that it was the only use for sulfur, far from it but he always had an affinity for explosions, in video games that is, but that still counts for something considering the new reality he is in. Chapter 19 Hatching Several days later Hum this should do it, Liam mumbled as he put the final touch on a fist-sized ceramic ball closed up by a wood cork, and a fuse, it was a grenade, a very primitive one. He had managed to make around 40 kilograms, 88 pounds, of gunpowder in this short time frame since he got his sulfur, the only thing stopping him from making more was his current lack of potassium nitric aka saltpeter. It wasn't a problem just that he would need to get more from the small cave near the area where he got chalk. He didn't collect that much of it at the time because he didn't know when this would come into use, and he lost half of it in the big thunderstorm anyway so he would have required more either way. Speaking of loss he put every resource sensitive to the Wii of Pandora's random weather into their own receptacles with the right condition to be stored. The recipients were then put into big clay boxes plated with wood planks and reinforced with even more clay and stone then put right underground into a safe area. Far from the root system's electrifying effect when the tree was struck by lightning or the powerful wind or water rain down like the flood or the three combined. Now that he had explosive and flammable stuff this was even more of a necessity. Quite a time-consuming side project that was still ongoing and that in concept will likely never truly end. 
you never have enough resources and as such never have enough storage. The only way to access them was via a trap door situated right below his cabin still in the process of building, more precisely next to his bed, if a pile of animal hides and makeshift pillow of gladius counted as can be called that. Still more comfortable than branches or the hard sapwood of a tree though. Back to the present, he wasn't at his base, preferring to not test explosives in his own house, because that's what he was going to do. A small rectangular piece of metal attached by a cord through a hole to a neatly carved flint appeared in his left hand, a flint and steel. One piece each between two fingers he flicked them together close to the fuse, a spark was created and the short piece of rope was lit. Liam mentally counted as he threw the grenade in the sky with the right amount of force for the lighted fuse to not fizzle out. As his internal countdown reached zero, a quite loud bang resonated, and a small ball of fire vanished as sound as it appeared. Small creatures scurried or flew away at the explosion. It was weak, he noted but still extremely dangerous to whoever was in its radius as it was still a grenade, and quite loud maybe not enough to effectively pop eardrums but enough to stun someone or cause chaos. A far cry from other grenades he had the inner workings of such as one that when detonated formed a small gravitational singularity that could either depending on the mode chosen attract or repel omnidirectionally everything in a set area with a very dangerous amount of force. Yet he couldn't do much in terms of pure power but increasing the quantity of gunpowder inside as such the size of the container at the moment, most complex explosive compounds were needed for that and for them he needed more equipment he didn't have for the moment. However, the problem at the moment was the method of lighting the fuse. They aren't really of much use in direct confrontation if they stayed like this but it was normal. He only did this to test how powerful they were and the quantity needed for a given explosion to not waste gunpowder. And to make shit blew up too, but that was just a bonus. Bullets and guns were still in progress as he wanted something functional that wouldn't blow in his hand or not work at a crucial time. Explosions are good controlled and focused explosions are better. All of his inner thoughts were interrupted by a shift in the mental link Liam suddenly felt Gladius become agitated, one that quite confused him for the briefest of moments. His mood flipped in a second and without much more thought he ran straight back to his base in less than half a minute. Seeing nothing around the base that indicated the passing of people Liam relaxed slightly but the crescendo of agitation from his tame told him something was happening and he had an inkling of what. Running straight at his gateway he jumped, hand latching on the side of the big structure he lifted his entire body weight with one hand and flipped himself in the air. His little climbing experience in and out of the dead tree was a real eye-opener on what he could do and so he did train and explore a bit on this aspect. Though he was far from remotely being skilled enough in parkour and acrobatics considering he never did this kind of thing before, his body's natural instinctive movement, general awareness, sense of balance, and speed let it be fairly easy to do what he just did after a few trial and error, however. And it was awesome to be able to do this and to feel so free. The lack of fear is the true factor here, it's insane how much it changed things. Landing softly within his base he ran straight at Gladius who was glaring at the door leading to the incubation room, its long biometallic claws scraping loudly against one another. The juvenile great ostropede now almost reached his shoulder and had started to show some change in color around its crest taking on a deeper brighter orange with deeper dark blue color and a bit of light blue along the double-ended tails. But it wasn't the moment to admire his tame, Gladius looked behind while the man hastily passed right next to the bird a reassuring scratch below the neck instantly calming the murder bird down and he entered the incubator room. Walking over he saw the four slightly transparent eggs, more particularly the chicks inside trying to break free from their prison, his presence and the low whistle he was doing serving as an encouragement to the four. Liam patiently waited, implant lighting dimly the room, one room where an incubator lay and another where he put various things he didn't know what to do with such as the carved bones he found in a halfway done bone structure found in the belly of those armored fish. His wait was not long as one chick finally broke free from its egg, it made a low-winded chirp as its proportionally big fully developed eyes opened and stared at everything before locking onto him with roughly the same gaze Gladius had when it hatched. Then another broke free and did just as the first then a third and a fourth all hatchlings in a short period as if they were waiting for him to hatch, which might just be the case. 
he brought a basket filled with soft material from inventory and crouched down in front of the four observant hatchlings. They all tried to move in his direction but each failed spectacularly in their own way, it was adorable even if just from the egg he could see the serrated teeth in their beak. There were new details he couldn't have noticed while they were in their eggs, first was that two had the nub that looked like the start of a horn, and another was their colors, each sporting a small but distinct difference in color. One had a deep red on its back and tails, another was of various hue hues purple and blue, and the two others had this small horn the great difference being that one had a small paler yellow on all of its four wings and the last had a deep forest green around its four pairs of eyes slowly fading at the breathing holes at the base of its neck. Deciding to not waste more time and officially tame them he picked them delicately in the middle of the basket before putting his left hand in the middle of it, the four chirped and huddled toward the wide open palm looking for heat. Each moved toward one finger, except yellow and green who pushed one another for the ownership of his thumb. Baby animals were nearly always adorable. Liam studied their body and found the start of the neural cues, the pair grew out of their chest and nearly as long as their own body, bodies that were no bigger than your average newborn goslings. With the utmost care, he grasped one of the green hatchlings' neural cues, it squeaked chirped attracting the attention of the others. Liam swore he saw a kind of envy in their gaze. The small tendril touched his implant, his eyes dilated and he got a glimpse of the newborn pure mind who just as Gladius did instability submitted to him, and a new link was made until death set them apart. The shift from the juvenile great Ostropede told that it felt it as well. Your name shall be Orion, he named the green one through the connection, then said Hatchling barely holding on to awakeness fell asleep wings grabbing his index finger. This process was repeated three more times, the red one was named Mary, the blue and purple one Septon, and the yellow one Oxidon. The four cardinal points, Orion, Green, for East, Mary, Red, for South, Septon, Purple and Blue, for North, and Oxidon, Yellow, for West, all from their Latin counterpart or more precisely the first few letters of the dead language words. And the batch was half male half female, the one with a horn being the female, a piece excellent of new. He knew this aspect instinctually which put the question on what Gladius is in that aspect but that was one for another time. Biology is complex with more exceptions than rules, like a certain language, why would this differ from the biology of another world? Liam was now realizing he couldn't move all that much without waking up any of the hatchlings for two good reasons they were cute and letting them rest was of utmost importance as they were just born. Three of his fingers being held hostage by the newborn Tetrapteron, his thumb grabbed by both using them as some sort of pillow or heat source, likely both but with an inclination toward the latter. Fuck. Day 93 Jogging in the vibrant green Liam was on his way to his base, buckets filled with a fluid of plants origin in his inventory. If a comparison could be drawn then it would be the equivalent of the latex produced by rubber trees to protect themselves from pests and bacteria and also help heal potential wounds. This latex-like substance of a bloody red was bloodletted from a small purplish thorny tree with human-sized tear-shaped leaves, quite the distinct difference from the milky white latex milked from rubber trees. The method to collect it even if he named it bloodletting from the very dubious and counterproductive method used to cure various illnesses in ancient times was essentially the same as the one used to get latex from rubber trees. This bloody latex has the potential to be used as a replacement for Earth's natural rubber, further testing will be needed to see how to process it effectively but the potential was there and something he needed as well. He needed a lot of things. It's a material used nearly everywhere for its various unique combination of properties ranging from flexibility, good heat resistance, high tensile strength, water resistance, and so much more. It was understandable why he would like and needed to have such material at hand. He suddenly stopped moving as the chopping but the muffled sound of rotors entered his ears, his heart beat faster into his chest, his mind working into various possibilities as he snapped his head into the direction of the origin of the sound. Then he saw it, roughly 200 meters, 256 feet, above and away from him, an engine with two tilt rotors, an elongated airframe, a cockpit on each of its sides was a missile pod, rear cargo doors open with machine guns poking out. 
Attached to the middle of the landing slides was a long cable at the end of it was a great ostropede, a small one but definitely bigger than Gladius. Likely unconscious instead of dead from the careful strap and position it was in. It was an aircraft, one his first thought, if bizarre, was that it was primitive on multiple points and could be improved with enough time and resources but this thought was dashed as soon as it came. People, Liam mumbled, eyes focused on the aerospatial SA-2 Samson, he didn't know what he should do at that moment, not that any of his actions would have resulted in anything worthwhile the aircraft has it passed by him and was already shrinking in the horizon. At the same time in the aircraft, the humans inside were joyfully talking about their successful hunt and capture of this living specimen the Samson was carrying. Look at the size of these things. Imagine the damage it could cause if it reaches you. Luckily nothing good ol.60 calories in the noggin can't fix even if it needed freaking to, Ethan score by a man in his late thirties exclaimed as he put himself next to a two meter, six feet six, long metallic claw. It was answered by eye rolls or cheer except for one. I really think I need more sleep. It was just my imagination, Miguel spoke under his breath shaking his head in amusement at the sheer impossibility of what he just saw. Taking off his helmet and putting it aside he scratched his bald head in annoyance. A forceful tap on his shoulder and he glared at the blonde-haired woman behind him. Her eyebrow was raised and he sighed before saying what he believed he just saw to his fellow SEC ops. Of course a man wearing some sort of medieval armor in the middle of fuck all nowhere on Pandora, while you're at it why not had he come from an alternate universe? It totally makes sense but please don't stone yourself outside of the base K, the blonde woman answered with unhidden sarcasm but in the end, it was a mix between worried and deadly serious. Chapter 20 Tsumong It has been two weeks and a half since Liam saw the aircraft, there wasn't any human that came or anything human made he saw during those. Not for lack of trying but at least he had a rough idea of where one human settlement might be from and the direction the aircraft was moving. The fact they took a young great ostropede didn't bother him, he wasn't going to play the moral high ground in that aspect and he didn't know why it was taken in the first place but even if the naive part of him wanted it to be because it was injured or something he knew better. It wasn't the case. It was sad and needlessly cruel but it was life. The luckiest, more adaptable, smartest and strongest in whatever category needed to have more chances of survival. Something quite clear to him. And the humans themselves, if they truly became aware of him which would happen, unless he hid in a hole for all his life which he wouldn't and couldn't do unless he was ready to forsake everything and live for how long he has a caveman. The dissecting table for him was the most likely and if he messed up, it was very delicate and very, very unpleasant to think about. Depending on how interesting he was, which he was plenty, to say he was the most interesting thing that has ever happened to humanity wouldn't be far from the exact truth. He had a wealth of knowledge, his biology, and his unknown origin. One of the three would be enough to put a target on his back but the three at the same time. It's a matter of time before some part of his obvious uniqueness is known, such as that no human should be here breathing the air of Pandora like this for the most noticeable. It will cause the utmost interest of a spacefaring civilization between its members over who possess him, be it alive or dead, it was a terrifying prospect and quite possibly an inevitable objective of those as of yet only hypothetical but very plausible threat. At least that's what he thought but generally being pessimistic with the higher UPS of humanity tended to prove more often than not to be the absolute truth, as cynical as it sounds. Particularly when money is involved. Even more so considering the movie, one of the people in charge decided to commit genocide on the native not that it is uncommon in human history which is a worrying fact in itself. And unlike the movies, he wasn't certain if the NA6 had plot armor or if the humans were incompetent to the extreme. And he didn't count on it for his future survival. The only good thing was that for a spacefaring civilization on the technological aspect they didn't seem that advanced if the primitive aircraft he saw was their average and what he remembered from the movie. Yet primitive or not he wasn't rocket or orbital bombardment proof as is. The future promises to be interesting. Sighing with these thoughts about potential Liam connected to Septon, the juvenile tetrapteron was resting on his head. 
The three other tetraptorons were currently flying around Gladius who was playfully trying to catch them, the four tetraptorons started to fly after barely a week and a half of them hatching. The lack of feathers that needed to grow was the main factor for their early flight plus their natural biology, accompanied by a healthy and adapted diet and their link to Liam resulted in them growing fast. He didn't want perfect little pets that acted cute after all. Not that there wasn't some of that as companionship was needed but he didn't risk his life and killed multiple wild tetraptorons and caused so much damage for simple pets that serve no purpose besides being pretty on his shoulder pads or parrot what he says. There were tools in a certain sense as any other description of them will be unsuitable, no disposable ones, he was investing in them and was attached to them as one would to their pets. They are far from being risk-free to get either but that didn't change the underlying reason for him having hatched them. Gladius in that aspect was different as it was unplanned but regardless, he treated the four tetraptoron just like their murder chicken elder, he fed them the best kind of foods, food adapted to his knowledge toward their best development and need. This wasn't the only thing he did, training in all forms was just as important. Nothing hard or dangerous for them because as if a toddler can become crippled because of excessive exercise so would the five of his young tames. This was for later when they are older. Which also comes with armor, mostly for Gladius but some bit and piece here and could be down for Orion, Mary, Septon, and Oxidon. Most of what was done was mentals, be it an enrichment with contraptions made of simple mechanisms and puzzles that force them to use their brains, of course of all that was mostly on Gladius, it was the oldest and most developed. The others were too young to truly understand, but they were plenty of progress. Honestly, the absolute trust they had in him plus the link made it simple to train them, a link that was shared between them two from various experiences and memory dip, however, it only told the general location and moods which was still a very big advantage giving inherent coordination between everyone. That brought the idea he was the heart and brain of some sort of mini hive mind and that was slightly strange to consider if a bit of pudding. Particularly with the knowledge of what element can potentially become in some of its forms and that his implant fused with his very flesh ran on that element by means he wasn't sure but the forefront hypothesis was that it used its growing capabilities in some shape or form with his biology to keep everything working. This aside, the future possibility of this small flock was high beyond scouting they could for example be used as bombarders. Making specialized explosives and teaching them how to use them as possible. Eyes dilated and closed Liam focused on the link and with what he learned got glimpses of Septon's recent memories of its little hunt. The four could fly for at least half an hour straight and quite fast at that which would only increase in the future. The feeling even if Basta asterisk diced and not real of flying was difficult to describe aside from a sense of freedom, it was an exceptional feeling but it wasn't his. Memories are fallible, and inexact most of the time. The brain filters the important of the useless parts constantly, and they are susceptible to change from the owner's perspective to Liam's own too. It wasn't a computer he was connected to but a being of flesh and naturally carbon-reinforced bone. Not only that but they were from another species that saw and felt the world completely differently than he did. Liam was aware of this and every piece of information he gained was taken with a grain of salt, that didn't mean they weren't clear, just that they can be potentially misleading in theory. Here what he was seeing was a NA6 carving something on a viper wolf skull. The NA6 was a young male, and next to him was a dire horse sipping the nectar of a flower, there was a basket on each side of the six-legged horse of which bones, a bow, and a battle staff were poking out. Fucking finally! That was you, the bone carver. And likely one who tried to open the gateway I suppose had. Interesting. I hope he isn't as xenophobic as the one I disposed of, Liam thought, taking a deep breath as the physical link was gently broken and a piece of meat was given to Septon who caught happily at the free treat. Since his four birds could fly he made them scout during night and day all having a shift to rest, play and eat even if the latter more often than not happened while scooting. He gathered information not only on the topography, and movement of the fauna but also on the NA6 group even if technically speaking they are also part of the fauna. They were few and far in between, the ones he saw with his own eyes were from very far away, and in a group of at least 50, a small clan he guessed, 
the others were during the night through the eyes of his tetrapterons where and these ones moved at minimum in groups of two. He used Orion to track the small clan and he found an area that safely led to the underground, the sacred hollow unknown to him, it wasn't that far from him compared to the area he mined sulfur. It was however hidden by dense vegetation within the entanglement of roots from a very old looking lightning rod tree and currently where the small clan rested. Yet he needed to learn, got more acclimated with the native to not get shot on sight, and what better option than a curious and lone NA6. And even with his tames he needed someone to talk to in a civilized manner to keep his sanity in check, he could actually build a radio with what he had and try to communicate with humans but that was simply too dangerous to do so. And there was a high chance it wouldn't work either way as he doubted there were humans close enough for his DIY radio signals to be captured or other unforeseen circumstances stopping the signal such as the unobtanium slash pandorium. And so the next few days were focused on tracking the bone carver, now that he had a real sighting all came down to predicting the NA6 movement which was fairly easy when you have a starting point, the air advantage and know your target general interest. When Liam found the NA6 again he sent a message in the form of a piece of white paper fiber with an extremely detailed drawing of the entrance to his base. The NA6 reaction to Mary flying above him and dropping a small cylinder of wood containing the drawing on top of his head was hilarious. This wasn't Liam's intention but the young bird's own machination, apparently they shared this same animosity with anything non-him. The outrage of the NA6 having himself be attacked by a young tetrapteron then the surprise at the clearly handmade object, followed by puzzlement as he fumbled around trying to find what it did until he uncorked it by mistake and saw the paper which was followed by shock, fear and then curiosity. The bone carver after that started to move toward his base, as Liam intended. It was better this way than him scaring or causing the NA6 to react aggressively by him randomly popping up. This led to the present situation, the NA6 atop his dire horse, his left hand millimeter away from grabbing his battle staff behind him as he gazed warily and with the utmost shock at the sky person walking confidently out of the giant door. A human, one without those strange metal bows without string that kill, strange devices on their face, those same clothes yet made of plant and animal hide, and with no other humans or metal birds clothes in the sky. Far from any of their settlements and all alone. It was sad in a way. The NA6 didn't even know this place was built by sky people, the first time he thought it was an area abandoned by an unknown group of NA6, the sound of Gladius's scream having made him think that it had become the nest of a great ostropede and that he awakened one of its young. Also why he ran as fast as he could at the time. The most dangerous aspect of great ostropede besides everything else was their sheer aggressiveness, something multiplied when with their young. The shock of the NA6 only grew and with it came fear as from the same door a great ostropede came out, a young one only a head taller than the human but it was growling and glaring at him, then he noticed four tetrapterons flying around until a green one landed delicately onto the man's right shoulder. Fear that vanished to be replaced by great confusion and befuddlement as the young great ostropede aggression dissipated when the human scratched the back of its head. The small glare from the human at the five of them and amused smirk didn't come unnoticed and puzzled the NA6 further. Welcome to my humble dwelling. I'm Liam Cram, a human from a very faraway place. I steered you here as I simply want to learn, about the people, Liam's voice and his body language were friendly. At least Liam hoped it was perceived as such by the NA6. The point wasn't exactly to be understood in words but in intention a thing that will prove to be unneeded. There was a pending silence, the NA6 processing what he was seeing, such as the young great ostropede demanding even more head scratch, the way the tetrapteron on the human shoulder seemed jealous, and the three others that landed at the top of the gate and then his rough understanding of what the human just said. Then his eyes widened as he remembered the words of the Tzahik from this small wandering clan a dozen days ago. It still didn't explain what he was seeing and the sheer impossibility of it but now he had an idea. The NA6 decided to trust his intuition, there was a lot to gain and little to lose. An opportunity like this wasn't going to present itself again, maybe he will even be able to help his clan from the harassment of sky people wanting to steal what they prided themselves in. Dismounting his dire horse, leaving his battle staff and bow on the horseback who refused to follow him, 
staying rooted in place, its instinct stopping from approaching a certain bladed bird. But no matter, it was a human even if he was the supposed lost child, his attention was mostly on the great ostropede, he only stopped advancing when the big bird started to growl at him. Which was immediately calmed down by a simple glance from the human to his surprise yet again. I salute you Liam Cram, I'm of the Anure let it be. I accept, if what you want is learn, I can do, but trade it will be. For request of your I request learning equally about your own people, the now named Sumong spoke calmly in broken English, with a very heavy alien accent, to the shock of Liam. And so a deal was sealed. Chapter 21 Humans Make No Sense The last few days since the agreement between the human and the NA6 have been very enriching for both parties. Su Wang asked Liam after he finished explaining in half-broken NA6 language half-English the grand line of modern human society on a chalkboard placed in front of the giant gateways. Understanding of modern society at least from Liam's understanding as a cook in his mid-twenties in a well-developed country was far from being truly accurate and he didn't consider everything as it was too big and complicated but even then it shouldn't have truly shifted in its essence here, power, and self-interest. Liam thought an answer as he translated what was just asked. It's pronounced Mane dot. Liam corrected the NA6, an action that both did at various intervals, then the human paused thinking of a response. It was a strange concept to NA6, even if they do trade, it was more along the line of bartering from material objects to knowledge and nothing remotely close in importance to humans in day-to-day -day life. It's a concept based on the belief of a thing holding value a value that lets people exchange goods and services. For a price, Liam paused frowning as he switched to his very bad NA6, after a long moment of thought the NA6 responded with a scowl, focusing on getting angry, his mind going over and trying but failing to comprehend as he remembered stories and even one of the experiences of his own clan with them, he knew they were lucky as of yet it was only curiosity toward their creations. He could see the use of such a principle but if it led to the current situation and great tragedy it might as well be a curse hidden as a gift. An unneeded one at that, the people didn't need any more curses from the sky people and the way the lost child spoke of it showed he didn't want it here either. Which was strange but welcomed. Liam was strange for a sky person, it was clear he was apart from the others, a pariah maybe. He didn't dare to ask why the human was here all alone living by his own mean as it would be inappropriate. Su Wang couldn't understand why any sane individual would want to live this way, to let themselves suffer, it didn't make sense, yet who was he to judge? If only he knew it was only barely a fraction of the very tip of the iceberg. This was how they proceeded to learn, asking questions, doing what amounted to lectures, and overall socializing between two alien species. It was always outside as both the NA6 and his mount were scared of Gladius when Liam was here and terrified when Liam wasn't. There were several ground rules, no stealing between one another, no entering the base without Liam being present, no killing one another, and other such guidelines that were more born of common sense for both best interests more than anything. For Liam, it was relieving to have someone to talk to, even if not human, and need to be on guard to a degree. This deal they made let him learn a lot more important and useful information on the NA6 culture in general and their way of thinking than Tsumong on humans from him. As far as Liam was aware if a NA6 knew of the existence of social media such as Twitter or TikTok, what is a country, etc. it wasn't going to change much besides maybe granting confusion. And the more complex aspects needed to be severely dumbed down. Not that Tsumong was particularly stupid if a bit slow at times in Liam's opinion but he didn't know how to count past 16. This number 16 coincided with the number of influential and important NA6 clans, the Omatakea, the Tipani, the Anure, the Takamai, the Kakunan, the Rei Tanu, the Holanta, the Leona, the Meltkayana, the Terji, the Niov, the Olangi, the Huiatokea, the Mangquan, the Tomakat, and last but not least the Mysterious aggressive and dangerous almost psychotic ash people. Each with its own specialty. The number past this did not even exist in their language as after that it was considered a bunch, it was based on octane instead of a decimal as they possessed 16 digits instead of the 20 for humans. 
they only know how to count all of these digits. No concept of math besides the barebone basics of addition and subtraction, none going above 16 obviously as everything above was just a bunch, they didn't even have a shred of a written language. As primitive as the NA6 may be on the technological aspect, this lack of anything noteworthy on that aspect was puzzling for Liam. Su Mong was shocked and then frightened to learn how complex mathematics was, even if it was only the basic of multiplication and division that Liam taught. Liam didn't give the NA6 the information on for example various human wars or various ideas such as water poisoning or other such things that could be a problem later on for himself. His self-interest came first and foremost. The man wanted to stay neutral as long as he realistically could while not passing for a threat to be rid of until he was prepared and knew where he was roughly in the timeline. Not that he knew a lot but some key events such as the paraplegic guy arriving, and the destruction of multiple kilometers high trees that forced hundreds of NA6 to flee their now destroyed ancestral home. Liam learned a lot, particularly about how most NA6, specifically the Anu Ray. Su Mong's clan saw the world and what it represented for them, all were connected, and all were borrowed to be given back once the time had come to die. And they could be brought back to life by their hands and craft in the form of art, be it tools, artifacts, or simple home decorations. All with meaning and reason behind it. Every life has a start, a place to be, and an end. They live in symbiosis and harmony with their environment. Only taking what was strictly necessary. Taking more would go against their very being as they damage the tapestries of life. It was both alien and familiar. Alien in the sense it was real here due to the NA6's biology letting them connect to the deeper level of the flora and fauna and familiar with the concept of being one with nature by various means. It wasn't a foreign concept to humans, it was simply faulty and flawed for humans to attempt this as even without their chaotic nature and ever-climbing ambition his species simply lacked the biology to do as NA6 does and have a symbiosis and harmony with their environment. It made both humans a more successful and less successful species in a sense. Or so Liam thought as they always were exceptions. Another point that made this possible was Iwa, their goddess by her vague yet grand but also humble descriptions. The All-Mother, Iwa, all born of this earth are connected to her, being so old and wise none close to equal could begin to comprehend, caring and compassionate yet cold and ruthless, present in all life and death. Liam wasn't quite sure of how he should think about this being besides prudence as he knew she existed in some shape or form via the little bit he knew of the movie. And a being like this existing here isn't fundamentally revolutionizing with him walking around. One definition that could potentially describe Iwa from Liam's understanding and plenty of extrapolation would be an all-encompassing living being on a planetary scale where a central mind resided and everything else was but cells of a greater whole connected to her with those various whipping willow glowing trees were NA6 connected to. And humans were considered foreign bodies within, explaining how the wild animals acted unnaturally aggressive to the point of uncaringness for potential death or mortal injuries when in close proximity to him, the sting bats or ridi in NA6 being a bit of an exception as that kind of behavior was normal to them he learned from the native. It was understandable why the NA6, who held the highest of respect for Iwa, considered her divine and mystical in various ways and that their religion and spirituality are in big part centralized on this being. There was a lot of rationality in those beliefs, it was very down to earth, as bizarre as it sounded from his general understanding of religious or spiritual belief from humans on earth where madness ruled at various levels of intensity. Not that humans needed those to act this way. But again this was only from one NA6, one he didn't exactly trust so it was a bad idea to consider him and his knowledge as the norm and hope all were similar. Crazy zealot NA6 must exist as if the one that tried to murder wasn't an example enough and simply difference appearing. Then there were the three laws of Iwa. First, you shall not set stone upon stone. Second, neither shall you use the turning wheel. Third and last, nor use the metals of the ground. The translation from NA6 to English was not exact but that was the gist of it and there were several interpretations, which all could be shortened to you shall stay as hunters gatherers to not damage the environment. The punishment was unknown, if any, 
as those rules might not even be directly from Iwa but if they exist, and from how old they presumably were they must have been at a point in time where NA6 or another humanoid sapient species had a civilization. And this hypothetical civilization was brought down eon ago by probably some horrible war, disease, climate change, or again Iwa herself which as horrific as it sounds, was again understandable if he put himself at her place, an alien and extremely old mind connected to all life on this moon. It was like having a cancerous part and deciding to cut it off and start anew. Again all was hypothesized upon hypotheses and only one possibility between an infinite more was right. Yet it made sense to a degree and explained the harmony between NA6 and their environment. Because the possibility it was another alien species was just as possible. And humans broke all of these rules and him as well depending on the interpretation, it would at some point inevitably happen either way. But balance seemed to play an important role, so the rules should be more akin to suggestions and less in excess, are a real threat and disturbance to the ecosystem which was ultimately still very vague and subjective. It wasn't all, as he learned what he was called after he rescued the two children and why the NA6 called him it translated roughly the same in English apart from child as the word in NA6 also hinted toward orphan and he found it depressingly fitting. Tsu Wang who told him this didn't know why he had such a title as it was a Tsuhik, a sort of shaman most of the time a female, a male one in this case, and the one who told him but apparently the Tsahik seemed confused as well, to the point of not even knowing what species Liam was. But like all things with NA6, it must have a deeper spiritual meaning he didn't really grasp at the moment due to a lack of information. Liam suddenly stood up, eyes widened, puzzling the bone carver who the human was teaching how to make porcelain, one of his tetrapteron alerted the human of something close something that wasn't a threat to him or his own if only a trespasser but a threat to something nonetheless. He informed the NA6 causing even more puzzlement however Liam didn't wait as there wasn't time and ran at the opposite of his base faster than a human should ever be. What, as the NA6 realized what Liam had informed him, he felt his heart drop but that didn't stop him from already running after the human, and to his shock, he was marginally slower. A dire horse could be seen sipping the nectar within a beautiful yellow flower while in the distant sky, the closest and most massive of the three suns was setting. The surroundings were starting to show their real bioluminescent color as the night was establishing itself. Four dozen meters away was a 3.5 meter, 10 feet 5, long predator lurking closer, its hairless tapered body built for speed hidden within the tall blades of grass. A slinth or T-Sumra depending on either English or NA6. The silence was broken by the sudden cawing of a tetrapteron flying above in a circle, this caused the dire horse to stop feeding and look warily around until his four-eyed gaze fell upon the slinth that was lurking. The horse like a deer seeing a speeding car in the middle of a highway froze as the slinth knowing it was seen, abandoned all stealth and ran at its immobile prey, passing from 0 to 95 km per hour. 59 me slash h, in but an instant. Closing the distance between the two yet again as its face split open revealing fanged jaws ready to envenoming and shred the dire horse's flesh a voice was heard and the whistling of something was in the air. Hey, Liam shouted as he finished mimicking the motion of picking something up on the ground with his left hand taking out a sizable and jagged stone from his inventory that he directly threw. The slinth instantly slowed down as its head snapped in Liam's direction. Small eyes locked onto his mildly amused grey one, its quadri-articulated jaws stretched wide open with the four bright orange chitinous-like flaps flared out in hostility. Then the stone that was thrown earlier hit the fastest land predator of Pandora Square within its maws, the stone shattered into two sharp pieces and many smaller fragments just as sharp. This stopped the extremely venomous animal dead in its tracks causing it to ragdoll with its momentum in the grass past the still-frozen dire horse, six limbs tangled as it trashed in agony, and an ungodly screech escaping it. The two biggest pieces of stones ended with one perforating its palate stopping at the carbon-reinforced bone as it shattered further the splinter digging into a very sensitive sensory while the other one lodged itself deeply in its throat causing great damage in its wake. It didn't have the time to process further what was happening as Liam was now a dozen of meters away and a dagger made of great ostropede claw was thrown from his right hand. 
It flew faster than an eye could blink the blade stabbed through the right of the Slintha's head before stopping as the handle kept it from flying out of the upper right part of the skull, the creature had a short seizure before its body went slack as if a puppet had its string cut off. I... I thank you, for saving my Polly, dire horse, dot, Tsumong said shell-shocked as he finally arrived behind Liam standing way above the human. He had seen what unfolded. While the death that occurred was a tragedy the death of his faithful steed would have been far worse. Not all lives were equal or had the same value, but each was important in its own way. Liam nodded at the NA6 before walking toward the corpse, checking if it was truly dead, picking it up over his shoulder he walked back to the NA6 who was reassuring his horse that only now unfroze kept his wary gaze on the human, and then dead slinth on his shoulder. The human spoke pointing at what he was carrying while at the same time, Mary the one who alarmed him landed on the top of his head, glaring dagger at the NA6. Chapter 22 Diving into the Abyss A few hours later within the night of Pandora was a lit campfire, above it was a thin, flat and large stone. On it was deboned slinth ribs slowly cooking, bones here tended to give an aftertaste of ash, something Liam wasn't a fan of. Question, can I ask about why you are here? The Anure do not reside in those plains right. Why are you here alone? Liam asked in broken yet nigh perfectly pronounced NA6 to Tsumong who was sitting in front of him carving one of the Slintha's bones with a knife with a pensive expression. Hmm. You are correct, friend. My clan resides in distant lands, arider than those plains during drought. Close to it is a sanctuary of the dead where animals in their old age migrate for their last time, the NA6 answered, speaking slowly for Liam to understand. Even if the human had extreme ease to learn the language, it simply clicked in his brain, and words he didn't know in sentences were instinctively given meaning within the context of what was said. Something not impossible by how his brain is now and the implant capacity to translate any spoken language known to man. The word friend pleasantly surprised Liam, apparently having an aerial eye on the creature of someone as you knew something will go wrong and saving it out of your own volution will bring amity to yourself from the owner. Maybe the fact the owner was sane, rational and benevolent helped too. And simply being civilized worked when faced with such individuals. And now that Liam paid attention the NA6 seemed more relaxed even if he knew of his abnormal physical capabilities and didn't speak about it. A fact about him that wasn't hidden and went simply unsaid, no one is forced to tell everything about themselves when meeting strangers. It is indeed unusual that I'm this far. I'm on a pilgrimage in search of materials that will allow me to create half of the heirloom that will immortalize my bond with my mate, Panu. She is doing the same as me in another faraway land, his voice got lower and longing could be seen, indicating he was completely head over heels for the NA6 woman a sight that caused the human to snort in amusement. A sort of spiritual journey. Seems a bit of a chore though. An awfully dangerous one at that, Liam internally remarked but didn't voice it out as Tsumong and his mate surely were aware of that and it must be part of this action in the first place. But it didn't change the point of it being needlessly dangerous to the extreme, and A6 are very much not exempt from not being considered prey. Liam nodded positively at the query of the NA6, not within, it is integral of my body part just as tail is for you. I can do this, Liam explained vaguely before pointing his implant at the wall behind him, a soft but quite strong beam of white light was emitted, not surprising the NA6 as Liam had done so a few times before. Yet there still was a flinch and rapid blinking of eyes with the sudden light, a detail that didn't go unnoticed by Liam. A reaction to sudden light? Possibly due to a more nocturnally adapted sight. Then a caw was heard, the light cut off from atop the wall Mary, the red tetrapteron landed on his bare wrist, the sharp talons grazing against his skin but there was no reaction from the human. One of the young flyer neural cues moved and the white furry tendrils connected to the implant. The human eyes dilated to an impossible degree one that would have disturbed humans and made them think he was extremely high and could hear inanimate objects speak. Liam said, his tone indicating he will not tell further and how Mary was proper to fly away being an indicator. Tsumong understood, there was more to it evidently but it didn't mean he was entitled to know it, 
at the moment he was too focused on the fact the lost child could do something akin to Tsahalo and connect to the life of Pandora, it explained why four Tetrapteron and a great Ostropede lived with him in peaceful coexistence. Dreamwalkers or avatars as the sky people called them let them connect to the flora and fauna yet never a human in the flesh to his knowledge did, but again this was a strange and unique individual here, one that by all means broke common sense. Why these animals were with the human he didn't know and didn't truly care. What mattered was the harmony between them. And Liam showed a lot of care, more than the average NA6 toward their pets, not only that but also a degree of respect toward life, if of a drastically different nature, and also the people. The man knew a lot and was carrying even more, that was obvious from the last few days. After this, a silence took place with only the sound of insects chirping meat cooking, and of the fire crackling. The occasional time when the meat was flipped by Liam until it was cooked then two porcelain plates were brought up from the side with each a pair of bone knives and forks. Sumong was quite confused at first with what was given to him to eat, the material of the plate was the one the human spoke to him but the object itself was bizarre, then the few creatures painted on it, were all completely alien. At first, it was a little dot then strangely shaped but simple creatures, followed by more complex ones more varied in shape and size, then more and more as from the branch of a tree they exploded out in number. The NA6 noticed multiple ones next to the sky people looked vaguely like them, some even having tails. It's just a sketch of the tree of life, Liam clarified, which only amplified the NA6's confusion as it wasn't a tree but now that it was mentioned it looked like the branch or root system of one spreading farther and more diverse from the trunk, the point of origin. A fascinating and new concept to explore. As the night continued and everything was eaten with the humans eating at the bare minimum two times more than the NA6. Su Mong threw something at Liam who caught it mid-air, it was an eye with a slitted pupil, carved on a cleanly cut-off bone. So it was what he was carving, Liam thought while studying it, it was simple yet many aspects with details told the contrary. The eye was similar to the eyes of the creature carved in the first bone he found. It was even more impressive considering from what he noticed NA6 have less fine motor control of their hands, not forgetting that they have marginally larger hands in the first place. It was very insightful to be able to discuss and learn, friend. But I will need to go. When the first sun rises I will continue on my journey, the NA6 spoke and Liam nodded, it was good as much as talking to someone was positive and learning a must having someone close he couldn't fully trust was limiting. The NA6 finished pointing with his four-fingered hands at the carved piece of bone. Far away at the same time in the Resource Development Administration Extrasolar Colony 01, otherwise known as Hell's Gate, more precisely in the quarter of the person in charge of the Avatar program. Dr. Grace Augustine is a tall woman with short auburn hair and brown eyes. Said person was on a chair currently drinking Lost Abbey Cable Car Creek poured in a mug, her eyes trailed on the new report from one of her team. Placing her mug she massaged her forehead as she looked around a big hollow screen giving video of Pandora's wild and untamed passage with her soothing music playlist. One of her ideas, getting clips from the Samsons used for scientific missions and one of the reasons she discovered so much of this moon's flora. An idea that was also exploited by the RDA to her displeasure because those videos were pricey back on Earth. But again both gained so she didn't complain even if she was pretty open with how much she loathed the RDA. Her eyes bulged out and she spat her drink as on the corner of the screen she saw something that by all means shouldn't be possible. It was one frame. One that should be utterly impossible by all known metric of humanity. In fact. She refused to believe it even as she paused the video with a tap of her finger, moved back by a few milliseconds, and zoomed in. Even then she still couldn't believe what was on it. She didn't drink enough to be the effect of alcohol. What in the actual fuck is that? How is that possible? Grace screamed, her eyes locked onto the armored, clearly human figure, the eyes behind the helmet of a gray silvery shade naturally impossible to occur in humans and in the middle of a plane with no breathing mask. She turned off the hollow screen, then turned it on again, then off then on. It was real footage, she knew as it was given to her first. 
it was impossible yet it was real. This needs to be kept under wrap. As long as possible. I need information on who and what this is. As if I didn't have already enough shit to deal with, just a few months and new members will arrive, she thought, her expression hardening while her eyes locked on the coordinate shown on the hollow screen. The next morning, it was day 111, and Liam did his usual breakfast rich in protein, quick but intense workout, an overall aerial check in a 20km radius from his base with his four tetraptorons confirming that the NA6 of the NUA was indeed not here anymore, or anyone else for that matter. Progression was back on the menus. Liam munched on a piece of spicy jerky as he finished his 200th lead shotgun slug one bigger than advised above his Basta asterisk diced fabricator. Gunpowder meant firearms, and firearms he did make with adapted bullets, of course, he wasn't exactly familiar with firearms as where he was from it needed a permit and there were multiple legal factors involved to get one. He did go to shooting ranges a bit when he was a teen but it evidently didn't make him an expert marksman or a firearms expert in general. That in no case stopped him here from crafting them, and no small little thing either as that would be useless against whatever was big enough to pose a threat to his continual existence. So he made shotgun, multiple shotguns to be exact. Not modern ones as he couldn't do them but antiques ones if put UT to date with his current resources available. Something close to a sawed-off shotgun to be precise. Each with only two shots before needing to manually reload, their only purpose being to kill or mortally injure whoever enters a 15-meter, 50-feet, radius of him. A regular or even trained human firing with one of his revamped boomsticks would risk the barrel caving their skull at worst and at best breaking their wrist or knocking them out cold with the recoil which is logical as he wasn't as limited in that itty-bitty tiny detail that is the recoil of a firearm thought it was very, very loud. Oxiden, come to me girl, the man said as he saw the bird arrive from its flight to the cave, connecting he smiled as there was no one, giving the tetraperone its due in the form of a prime piece of meat. The next half an hour consisted of Liam checking if everything was in place from the traps still in place to the food for everything and once he decided it was good he straight up ran to the only safe access to the underground of the Great Plain. This led to the present, Liam dressed in a light armor of majorly bronze, steel present in more vital areas, a helmet that let him have most of his sight, and his inventory had all that he thought was necessary. Such as food, water, his war scythe cleaver, various throwable and not throwable weapons, tools such as pickaxes, climbing pikes, ropes, and more, bandages, papers, makeshift pens, a first aid kit that consisted of bandages, sewing needles with thin disinfected string, and bottles of saline solution. A small bundle of bloody red thread made of this latex-like substance he found weeks ago attached to his waist, his own Ariadne's thread but less magical sadly. He fastened it around a root before pushing the deep blue bioluminescent Portuguese man of war-like vines aside with his right gauntlet hand and immediately the plant latched onto his limb. We will see who drags who, Liam thought with a lifted eyebrow instead of panicking. He wasn't even surprised as the vine tried to drag him up, probably to eat him or something, he took a fistful of it, and dragged it down with one good yank. Tearing half-offending vines that blocked the entrance with it. More of it, he mumbled, it was more of a jungle than a cave, he took out a scimitar, the blade made of great ostropede claws reason why it was this kind of weapon, was it didn't have a name as of yet. With it in his right hand carefully treated as he hacked at the vines blocking his pace, his boots stepping over the short blue grass dotted with the occasional fern or alien flowers as he did so. Those vines were everywhere, the place was very spacious, and only the area being inclined downward indicated a sense of direction as vines obstructed sight. He continued forward, moving carefully, tapping the ground with the curved tip of his scimitar to avoid potential accidents. Pitcher Plants giant fucking pitcher plant, he mumbled in disbelief as in the distance he noticed a dozen of on average 5 meters, 16 feet 4, tall purple pitcher-shaped leaves. From their bioluminescence he could see the shadow of small animals within, one was even humanoid, a NA6, a young one from the size. And wasn't that an unpleasant and tragic sight? 
his head snapped in another direction as squeals of agony and terror resonated, they originated from a creature the size of a big dog that looked like the hybrid of a goat and a hedgehog if they had copulated. It was completely ensnared by the vines and getting dragged to one of such pitcher plants. Not only that but above within the crevice of the moss-covered stone above dozens of dark blue hellfire wasps flew out and repeatedly stung, scratched and bit the poor creature until its movement and squeals came to a definitive stop. What followed was the unconscious or very likely creature being dragged up within the giant pitcher plant, after this beautiful flower-like structure blossomed all around the thin roots of the carnivorous plant and the alien wasp dug in their nectar. All of this happened in less than ten seconds. Ten seconds was all it took. And it indicated that the fate of the NA6 within one was sealed long ago, it said the theme of this place was an extremely dangerous one, a fact that wasn't hidden. Chapter 23 Oil Weaving carefully within the vines Liam suddenly crouched dodging swarms of hellfire wasps flying about, they didn't hunt for themselves to eat, they chased animals pushing them into the vines for the giant pitcher plant to eat, then nectar will be given. It was a very interesting part of this ecosystem for sure, those hellfire wasps might potentially mean honey or an equivalent but it didn't seem worth the risk to get. If there was something at all to get for that matter. The blue vines were interesting too, their extreme elasticity and resistance being at the forefront, essentially they were colonies of smaller peculiar half-plant half-animals small organisms that grow around a silicon-based thread they seemingly produced, very similar to hard coral in principle but it's this very interesting instead of limestone. When in contact they acted in a way similar to jellyfish's tentacles dragging prey, but instead of venom it was a sort of odorless acidic or alkaline glue. Horrible in the way the skin melted and fused with the glue causing a great amount of pain to anything entangled, as such he didn't test on his skin. His scimitar didn't like it either but the corrosion damages were grossly superficial, yet it didn't do anything to his bronze armor, which meant it was quite a unique substance that probably reacted to carbon or iron as the only point in common between his blade and animal was this. It was an ecosystem working like a sole organism of which he was right in the middle. Either way, he continued to go into this underground jungle, the air was humid and quite cold. The red bobbin of thread at his waist was used by a fifth as he regularly put wooden paw, cut the thread, and fastened it around before continuing. It didn't matter he had more of this red thread. The more he advanced the deeper he went and the less of those carnivorous and blue were seen and the vegetation, if that could even be called that, took on a dark greenish light purple the ever-abundance of natural bioluminescence giving light comparable to a twilight sky. At this point the ground had more roots than ground, it was a mess of roots of all sizes entwined together. Living in between were the rare sleeping sting bats, strange spider space huggers look alike, 3 meters long, 9 ft8, centipede, strange vertebrates similar to geckos if human-sized, various flying insects and jellyfish-like creatures such as a deep purple sphere with tentacles and four leaves-shaped wings to float on about the hot air current coming from under. The air was breathable to him, not that he had anything to remedy it if wasn't the case besides getting back to the surface as fast and carefully as possible. It was without saying extremely dangerous yet he continued to go down, the red thread continuing behind him. The sound of wind echoing in a sort of low constant hum as if something gargantuan was breathing could be heard as he gazed upon dozens of boulders floating below, roots in no way large enough to support them, those roots came from below growing outward. Approaching one of those floating silvery large pieces of stone the human walked and looked around, before picking a fist-sized rock that he stored, implant analyzing it as his eyes widened ever so slightly as it was pure pandorium slash unobtanium at its core beside the outside where it was a mix of mainly titanium and platinum with a dozen more minor and unimportant element. This entire thing is made of that metal, Liam mumbled, this metal was mostly unknown to him besides its unique magnetic property, as much as it was valuable as a resource for its nigh infinite potential and using it was completely worthless to him at the moment. It was the case for one simple reason, his forge couldn't melt this magical metal as of yet, he couldn't begin to melt tungsten which admittedly need 3400 C degree, 6152 F degree, quite a considerable amount of heat so the most precious thing about this stone he picked up for him currently was the titanium and platinum. Two he was more than happy to collect, 
they offered many new possibilities the first being for its similar strength to steel, corrosion resistance and lighter even if the last part was quite unimportant on a personal level. It meant better armor and new alloy for a variety of uses. The second platinum had use for making electronic components such as wire and also laboratory equipment, very useful as well. He picked and mined pieces of rocks, choosing the one with more of the two precious metals as he climbed down from root to root stone to stone, red thread, and wooden pole following him behind. Water, he internally remarked as the sound of waterfalls started to enter his ears advancing on he stumbled upon a thin stream plunging from one floating stone to another, streams that grew bigger and bigger as more of them fused together the further they fell. However they weren't only of water, Below the colorless liquids was a black substance that was moving excessively slower, approaching one of such streams he tentatively dipped a long stick before taking it out and observed with unbidden befuddlement the black tar-like substance steady dribbling back into the stream. His grey eyes followed the origin of this stream to see it came from the same roots he climbed down, now that he paid attention all where those streams started knots of roots dug in. Finally, his curiosity won over and he took a glass bottle he filled with the help of a stick of black liquid. The sweet smell of it was overpowering nearly everything else. Storing the bottle he let his implant scan it, it was akin to heavy crude oil with its general composition and viscosity, but distinct differences could be made such as the presence of pandorium particles, complex molecules likely responsible for the smell, and various microorganisms. Crude petroleum is the product of those plants, Liam said out loud baffled but extremely pleased with this discovery, and so he continued to move downwards sampling resources as he did so. The darkness was in fact a gargantuan lake of pristine clear water that turned at minimum 40 meters, 131 feet, deep into this same black crude oil that absorbed all light and it was of unknown depth. There were no waves or water movement except for the crude oil rippling exactly every minute. As if it was the beating of a heart. Gigantic roots grew from it, giant purple algae flowed peacefully accompanied by blizzard half-transparent ray-like fish, silvery floating boulders and stones were everywhere, some of the biggest forming massive floating islands on the water similar to icebergs or small hills. They were full of lush flora with strange flowers adapted to this sunless environment, from glowing fungi like to multicolored floating flowers anchored to the ground by a single thin strand of fleshy tissue. The overall blackness of what was below the water contrasted deeply with the all. And he was currently walking on one that was connected to a fissured wall of the cave by as anyone could guess, roots. They seemed to hold everything together with the pandorium slash unobtanium here. A fissure that was out of place even from afar, the long white vine being also a major reason he saw it, it wasn't the only one, just the closest and easiest to access. And he was curious. Liam's eyes suddenly narrowed and his body instinctively tensed up as he heard the faint sounds of clawed feet getting closer all around him, from his left, right, behind, in front, and above. I wondered when this would have happened, Liam thought, frowning ever so slightly as he roughly estimated their number just from the sound all around, they must be easily a dozen if not more. Then the shape of viper wolves came into his sight as white bioluminescent patches sparked alongside their lean dark blue body, they didn't seem to be the same species as they were at the bare minimum 50% smaller, they didn't even reach his knees. And it indeed was the case, those were Leucomelas viper wolves, a subspecies of the common viper wolf. His war scythe appeared in his left hand as he stood to his full height, chest pumped up and eyes full of composed alertness as he kept eye contact with the one in front of him. An error on the human's part but one he couldn't have predicted. This viper wolf closed its eyes and opened its maw wide, a second pair of legs spread in an instant and the world for the human became white as a flash of light with enough lumen to blind a Na6 was emitted right at his eyes. Shit. My eyes, he swore at this, he didn't expect this kind of attack at all. Repeatedly blinking his eyes were filled with a burning sensation, he could barely make out distance, color, and shape, his heart beat faster in his chest yet he stayed composed if pissed off. At the same time the pack of Leucomela's viper wolf pounced, two of them maw wide open they bit at the human armored ankle, not doing much but annoying the human further. It resulted in one getting kicked so hard its head snapped backward with a loud crack, 
the other bisected from shoulder blades to the pelvis, its guts spilling everywhere as the still cognizant upper half fell into the water two dozen meters below. It was only the start, two jumped on his back as he wildly hacked the air with his weapon, growling in irritation Liam grabbed behind him the raging animal catching what he assumed was a paw. His grip shattered the bones while the viper wolf yelped in pain before being thrown randomly with extreme prejudice, it hit two others approaching hexapods wolves killing the three of them simply with how much force was put behind the improvised living projectile. It was a massacre, the scent of blood and ruptured organs replacing the sweetness in the air, yet the viper wolves kept on coming, suicidally throwing themselves at the currently blind as if in a frenzy. A big male jumped on Liam's head furiously scratching and biting as the human shot randomly with his wrist crossbow in front of him, the poisoned bolt hitting one into its belly halting in its track with the sudden pain, the cocktail of toxins taking care of the rest. Go to sleep, as those cold and calm yet irritation-filled words a closed armored fist flew through the neck of the one latched on him. Blood trickled down his armor as he killed more and more until nothing came back, yet he stayed vigilant. Blinking more the burning sensation finally started to recede as he could see again even if blurry and there were white spots here and there but it was rapidly getting better. All around him were bodies, organs, and blood splayed. He breathed and something unexpected happened again. What, was all Liam could think of as the rapid, almost buzzing sound of flapping wings entered his ears, and a red arrow-shaped creature zipped right at him and entered his sight from above. The next thing he knew was pain. A needle-like shape speared through his armor like it was tin foil, the buff coat in between not giving much more resistance then came to his skin followed by right pectoral muscle, it continued on as it passed in his flesh and tissue between his ribs, to finally perforate the upper part of his right lung. F.U.C. Arg, he shouted, pain and anger mixed together, but he reacted extremely fast. He let go of his war scythe to grab the thing stopping it from goring him further and it instantly emitted high-pitched squeals as the needle inside suddenly pumped venom akin to tetrodotoxin. Right after a creature landed next to him, red in color, headless with a praying mantis posture, its two hooked front limbs waving in the air as it silently and gracefully walked with its four clawed feet toward the squealing thing embedded in his chest. A slinger is two individuals of the same species living as one. A silent, extremely dangerous predator, not the biggest or strongest but one of the most successful thanks to its unique hunting tactic. The main body and the head, with the latter being shot from the former and that's what happened and now the main body was following the squeal of the head embedded in Liam's right lung as it was blind without it. Fuck you, Liam screamed with blood and literal venom coming out of his mouth, implant glowing a bright red, the continuous sharp pain or pieced lung not stopping him in the slightest from acting as he materialized one of his shotguns out of his inventory and shot point blank the slinger's head. The deafening boom of the shot echoed far and wide as the head exploded into bloody pieces and bits that flew everywhere, the proboscis was all that remained intact and it was still deep into his chest. Taking it out would be a bad idea, it would aggravate the bleeding, and there was his armor in between anyway. He coughed more blood-filled venom, his body working on purging the foreign substance, breathing heavily from his one good lung, his overly dilated half-blind eyes filled with adrenaline locked onto the confused main body that was no more than a red blur to him. Fuck you, he said, gasping for air and the pain, holding the shotgun with one hand he aimed and pulled the trigger, a boom echoed again, the recoil barely affecting the human. The main body screeched incomprehensibly as one of its middle legs with part of its chest was blown apart. Should have aimed for the head, he added as the empty shotgun was stored to be replaced by another fully charged one, and he shot again and again, the first blowing more of the main body chest, and the last ending all of its screech once and for all. Chapter 24 The All-Mother Liam's head was spinning, a feeling of unnatural fatigue right hand over the right of his chest where a deep throbbing pain resided. He picked up his war scythe, storing it in his inventory before walking toward the fissure pushing the vine aside, nearly falling in the process thanks to a dead viper wolf he didn't see. Smart enough to do that but not enough to aim at my head, he thought of what just happened with a bloody sneer before coughing blood and venom, the taste of his own blood mixed with the acrid one of venom far from pleasant. 
the feeling of the thing stabbing in his lung moving as it happened only amplified it. It clearly was premeditated to some degree, the viper wolf's pack was immediately followed by this red creature or it was the sound of battle or the smell of blood that attracted it. Either way, it was of little importance now. But a very good reminder of how dangerous this moon was and that preparation as good as it is, isn't an indestructible shield against the unknown. The idea that he was going to go in and out of here injury-free never once crossed his mind, it was a ridiculous thought as proven by what unexpectedly happened. Coughing blood for what felt like the umpteenth time Liam noted with slight worry how his body started to feel sluggish but not too blood loss. The wound in itself wasn't mortal on the hemorrhage aspect but the venom was a problem. Hurrying himself he stopped just a meter away from truly entering a massive room of which he could glimpse what was inside and would have appreciated its sheer spectacularity of it all in other circumstances, however, he recognized what it was. Above growing from the cave ceiling toward the ground was a massive willow tree, pearl white bark contrasting deeply with the darker shade where a lightning bolt scar split it in half. The roots of the tree were of the same color as the regular white bark spread all around connecting floating stones together and dove in the pitch black crude and odorless oil rhythmically pulsing oil they plunged in. Above they formed an entire natural structure from bridges to platforms of which one massive one rested below the inverted tree. Each of its sinuous branches supported several hundred ethereal pink tendrils lighting the room like a natural chandelier, their light continually reflected by the precious mineral within the wall. Thousands of small jellyfish-like creatures drifted within the air as if swimming, wood sprites or adokyrina. They were seeds and so much more. A tree of souls, a Nutrea Makri in NA6, from Tsumong's knowledge about the horse clans, this one should be the tree of divergence, supposedly only these same migratory clans knew where it was. Well, now he knew as well. A tree growing underground wasn't the craziest thing he saw even if it was high on the ladder. Even more considering he currently couldn't see particularly well far away, so at the moment it was even truer. Yet an undeniable pressure and presence were emanating from it but he could instinctively tell this place was safe, safer than the outside at the very least. Fuck does it hurt like a bit asterisk h, Liam thought while he took off his helmet and gauntlets and unclasped his chest plate. The front part was taken off carefully as the back part fell, clanking loudly on the ground. His buffer coat was also rid of but he hissed in pain as he took it off feeling the proboscis shifting inside his lung with the movement. Then he sat, his back against the oddly smooth white root behind him. The thing embedded in his chest with blood was all for him to see, a bottle of fresh saline solution, uncorking it with his mouth he quickly rinsed his hands before pouring all that remained on his wound. Teeth grinding together at the cold feeling washing over the wounded area and the pain that came with it. His eyes focused, blurry sight over the foreign object in his right lung he grabbed the part poking out, and with one swift yet careful and decisive motion, he muffled a groan of pain and took it out. It felt oddly relieving amid the pain. Thing is at least half of my forearm, he mumbled in slight disbelief at the roughly 20 centimeters, 8 in, long proboscis. If he wasn't the way he is both internally and externally this would have impaled him all the way through even if he had stopped it. Another fact he remarked was that the venom didn't even come from the pointy end either, it was dozens of pores in the middle. Right after he started his last coughing fit, blood and venom were expelled from his right lung like someone that nearly drowned until all was gone, it was excruciatingly painful yet very relieving to be rid of. The wound was deep, he could see his ribs and lung amidst the blood a perturbing sight now anchored in his mind but nothing vital was hit so it was always that. A few centimeters to the left and it would have been his heart, however. If it was luck it didn't hit there or bad luck he was hit at all he didn't know and it wasn't the time to dwindle on that. Another bottle of saline solution was brought from his inventory with a soft fiber tissue, the process of cleaning the area was hard, and the numbness of his limb didn't get better, now they felt like logs and it didn't numb the pain at all. In fact, it seemed to progressively amplify it. The good thing was that it only truly did that, a horrifying end for whoever got shot and then eaten alive while losing all their motor control and with pain multiplied tenfold. The next part was the hardest, disinfecting needle and strings. 
good thing he was preventive enough to have put the string in the sewing needle's head already. Because when you need it generally you aren't the ablest to do this delicate sometimes nigh impossible task. It wasn't pretty, two dozen stitches a majority going too deep and all irregular, he nearly lost the needle inside his wound too. The only reason it didn't happen was he got hold of the string otherwise getting it out would have been complicated and agonizing. After this, he cleaned again and bandaged this part of his chest. The fatigue had gotten worse and worse, he knew it wasn't a good idea to let it win but he couldn't do anything to stop it, and moving was an even worse idea for evident reasons, not that he even could as his limbs were numb to the point of walking or holding thing was a titanic task. Fuck. I'm insane. But it was worth it, he couldn't but thought, schadenfreude at his self-induced predicament, even speaking was hard now. He was in such a pathetic state that anything could kill him right now, yet he felt safe here. It was puzzling. It was the Venom Plus having to go down here, the fight with the Viper Wolves pack even if fairly easy, then getting gored like a shish kebab, and having done an emergency heavy surgical operation on himself without anything to numb pain. Banging his head against the root he breathed out painfully, his tired gaze followed the wood sprites elegantly floating about in specific places, blocking entries and exits many of which he never knew existed. One even landed on his implant before following its brethren. I will take a nap, stay safe in the base, he sent through his link with his tame, it was accompanied by a feeling conveying he was fine and so he closed his eyes. Sleep came soon after even with the pain, the strange blanket growing out around him soothing him. Liam opened his eyes after what felt like an instant to an alien sight and his body and mind feeling just as alien as how he was used to. A very familiar yet fundamentally different situation, but he didn't panic, his mind felt clear, clearer than it ever was before and ever than he thought imaginable. He couldn't panic the mortal bodily function for this to happen currently lacking. He was floating in a fetal position within a fourth-dimensional prism his mind could only perceive as its three-dimensional distorted yet clear shadow. Hundreds upon hundreds of hexagonal metallic particles orbited at speeds varying from slow to the point of appearing immobile to superluminal, they moved in a chaotic yet perfectly ordered and calculated path as if they were a swarm. He directly saw both his wrist, and the lack of any implant on his left wrist was immediately remarked. The next was his tan skin or current apparent lack of therefore instead it was a pale bluish translucent film that carved out the shapes of his every muscle were defined, he could even feel his shoulder length hair as if they were fully functional body part instead of mostly keratin threads, each and every million of hair follicles from roots to tips were floating in the air as deep underwater behind him. Yet they weren't really hair at the same time, they as well were no muscles, tendons, bones or any real tissues be them dead or alive, the only aspect that had a resemblance to a human's biology were veins or nerves pulsing with energy to the beat of a non-existent heart. He moved each of the five digits of his hands with curiosity. Instead of any would-be vital organs in his chest, there was his implant, five purplish threads connected to it. His tames he instinctively knew, and they were currently all in a deep sleep. And it was only the surface the first layer of this state of being. At a moment he remarked that the bluish film shifted to his tanned skin before glitching for lack of comparison back to its transparent form in a never cycle, at some point, his hand might appear normal and at another, he could see through them. There didn't seem to be any patterns. He put himself in a standing position, feet not touching the metallic ground, staying afloat within the soothing and protective embrace of the prism as if it was an egg. He observed his surroundings with wonder, below and above him if this notion even applied here. Metal and metallic root-like structures pulsed with electric blue energy, element he instinctually could tell, and it flowed to the rhythm of his heartbeat. Hum is this where my engramic matrix resides? Fascinating, he asked no one, his voice having a deep ethereal note to it. Yet an answer still came from behind him. If by engramic matrix you refer to the beginning with no ending that is the mind and the ending with no beginning that is the soul and the spirit existing since the dawn of time then your words are partially correct, strange little one of strange origin so farther away than we can begin to fathom, a voice consisting of untold amounts yet functioning as one spoke, one distinctively feminine in essence, young but old, harsh and loving, 
quiet and loud, no small amount of surprise and curiosity. Were within, even shock. Liam's ethereal body snapped in the direction the voice and new presence came from, his eyes currently made of pure blue energy widened ever so slightly at what he saw, it was as if reality suddenly shifted. An invisible wall cutting reality and gluing two contracting parts of it together, one of metal and technology beyond what any species within this universe could comprehend and the other of primordial life, of both good and bad that this aspect of infinite potential brought. A body grown from the wood in the vague form of a female and a six yet different, legs fused at the knee transforming into a trunk, two long arms ending in roots instead of four digits, hair similar to the tendril of the tree of souls, her body made of white bark, a lighting strike scar along her chest. Her face as hauntingly unsettling as beautiful had unknown glowing runes, two normally placed glowing eyes, and four smaller ones on her forehead, the one in the middle bigger by a small margin. Iwa, Liam thought his first guess, which came out as a mumble to his surprise, his lips not moving a fact he didn't notice earlier, but he stayed deathly calm, his gaze fixated onto the wooden N.A. six woman's eyes who only smiled gently at his instant vigilance. Partially correct little one, we are Iwa yet we are not, we are but a smaller part of a greater whole that is perceived as me by my children. We are known in this time as the, she spoke approaching the invisible wall, this earned an immediate reaction from Liam, metallic roots pulsing with elements started to grow all around the prism in a protective cocoon. We do not wish you harm little one, we cannot do so presently here in this state even if we wished so, this place we and you are in the very surface of the sea of soul of the great plain. This is but a reflection, a dream, of we and you are on the first layer of my deepest being, we suppose. We are confused. This has never happened before. This is unprecedented to my knowledge, little one you are a very curious being, even more than we imagined, this seemed to grab Liam's interest, stopping him from forcefully waking himself up by tugging on one of the threads connected to him. Liam stared at the being that apparently was both Iwa and not Iwa, mind racing over what was said and the current situation at hand that he was face to face with a being considered divine. Now he could understand why to a deeper degree, this was the tree he was physically right next to. Greeting all mother. On what points is this unprecedented, he spoke, choosing to be polite and formal to this being even if he had the feeling she wouldn't remotely care if he were to insult her. Everything. You can hear me clearly a feat only possible to the most gifted of my children, little one you are an enigma to me, a lost child from unknown origin, body, mind soul, spirit, will, emotions, knowledge, actions, goals, purposes, and more than the language we are using to communicate to you have words. We do not expect answers from you as you do not have one for them all and we are not ought to know them all. Yet one must be answered. Do you seek to harm me or my children, her voice becoming frigid, her expression cold, this caught Liam off guard but it didn't affect him in any deeper aspect if caused the element to pulse brighter and the metallic hexagon spins faster. There was a silence then Liam spoke, voice unwavering and true, No, I do not seek to harm the All-Mother or her children. But I did, do, and will continue to do so. I'm as you said and how the people call me, lost and a child searching to survive and if possible find a way home and say my goodbyes. My life comes first before all and I will do what I must to keep it even if it aggravates you or anyone else. The sliver of the all-mother nodded her expression softening and a smile graced her face of white bark seemingly pleased with the answer if it was how she felt or a mask, Liam didn't know but he seriously hoped it was genuine, then a small frown made its way on her feature, again with a hint of surprise. It is time to depart, soon you will awaken, little one. May we and you meet again the process to do, of which you know and have experienced. Farewell lost child, and so after those last words from the All-Mother the dream ended. Chapter 25 Fabricator Wood sprites covered the entirety of Liam's body as he breathed slowly, but it wasn't only that, pink tendrils growing from the roots protectively ran against his skin, in more concentration around his implant, his head, and back. His eyes slowly opened, pupils dilated, vision blurry but rapidly becoming clearer. 
his mind focuses back to reality, going back on what just happened in this strange dream, rapidly realizing it wasn't a simple dream at all. The sudden awareness of something watching, hearing and so much more is as present as ever. I just spoke to the blue hippie's tree goddess, Liam was still processing what happened, the dissonance between how he felt in the dream and presently, he remembered feeling cold and calculating, mechanical even. No pointless illogical emotions and their constant presence that override his decision, the emotions were still there just perceived differently. It felt so wrong yet so right at the same time and it informed him of his true nature to a degree. And I wa or a part of her but also her as she referred to herself, or more accurately the spirit soul mind of the tree of divergence a being so alien to him yet so clear to understand, a fact that seemed even unusual to her. She wasn't a goddess, nor a divine being was what he understood. Neither all-knowing nor all-powerful yet nigh omnipresent here. Still. She is the most powerful purely biological being or beings on this moon and wise beyond measure and human comprehension, she was not an enemy nor an ally. This could change and will but in what way he couldn't truly predict at the moment. But she knew how unusual he was, she knew more than anyone else outside of himself and he was far from knowing or understanding everything either. After all, she must have sensed him appearing out of nowhere on this beach, seen him use his inventory, and knew of his links with his tames. It was worrying to know she knew but what could he realistically do? He already presumed as such that the All-Mother knew, it was just confirmed now, the good thing was that his mind was protected to a point he was only in danger if he truly earned the rage and hate of Iwa and she purposefully worked to end his life. All things considered, it seemed difficult to earn that from the tree goddess unless you purposefully go look for it. Liam sighed, his eyes trailing down his body, they widened as he finally noticed he was covered in wood sprites, and as if on cue they all floated away. Then he felt a prickling, almost painful sensation similar to ants crawling and stinging as the thin tendrils covering most of his skin above his nervous system disconnected and disappeared into the ground, tiny droplets of blood trickled from the prickling wound before they closed a few seconds later. This was fucking weird, was the first thing that came to his mind, all of those tendrils that were all over his exposed body, mostly his back, chest, arms, and neck, and luckily only that. Moving each of his fingers he smiled, testing further with arms and legs his smile grew, and he was back at full motor control. And his eyesight was as good as new. However as soon as he tried to stand up a tang of pain shot into his right lung and the area he was stabbed, and he now finally paid attention to it as well. The yellowish bandage around the wound was caked in dried blood, taking it off the area of the wound, of course, the bandage sticking to it more than necessary. Not that bad but definitely could have done a better job, he mumbled after observing the wound. He took a clean tissue out of his inventory and proceeded to clean the roughly shuttered wound, it wasn't very big and should be fully healed in two to three days leaving behind a barely noticeable scar. Rebandaging his chest he suddenly felt intense hunger, so he ate in the same spot. Picnicking under the tree of divergence was quite a pleasant experience. He finished it with a smoothie of this same pink aloe vera-like plant that alleviates pain, a medicinal plant from the Anure NA6 knowledge was called pale and it was pronounced paywall. Putting his armor back on he stared at the slinger's proboscis covered in dry blood on the ground, a scowl finding its way on his feature as the last few words of the fragment of Iwa came back to him full force. The venom that put him to an almost delirious sleep. Fucking bit asterisk H. He wasn't pleased with this very likely scenario, but he was calm and reasonable enough to understand. And he put himself in this situation first, she just profited from an opportunity he so happily gave. She had a hand or whatever her equivalent is with the gargantuan pack of flashlight viper wolves and the slinger. It was to communicate with him, assert his character, and if he was an immediate threat, a logical and sound decision. It was the only way as otherwise never would he have slept here or let that connection ever happen. That didn't mean he was happy, not that he truly was in the first place about all of this, if the deepest part of his being wasn't protected he was quite certain the goddess wouldn't have had a problem scheming through his mind or alter part of it. Even if he didn't know much about the psychic aspect of things he knew enough that it can install loyalty and obedience, 
because he could do that himself under precise circumstances. He didn't doubt one bit she had this capability as well and plenty more with extrapolation from manga, novels, comics, and series. It would be strange otherwise that the hive mind didn't have mind-altering abilities. Using human or NA6 standards of morality on a being such as her was simply foolish beyond belief and quite possibly insane. And the reason why he didn't do this. Being wary was of the utmost importance, but that didn't mean she was some evil mastermind, she was only trying to survive and flourish from his meager understanding. Not that it excused anything either or that she potentially tried to mind control him. The lack of information and understanding of Iwa's thought process was a problem he couldn't remedy for foreseeable without more direct interaction. The objective of keeping the balance and not destroying the biosphere was evident but everything else. Not so much. Why is it always so complicated, Liam whispered, if only everyone was friends with everyone or reasonable but that wasn't how reality worked and so it wasn't simple. He put on his armor back armor that will need an upgrade or a totally new one. Looking around he observed the tree, he could still feel this presence, it was weird particularly how he felt looked back at that. He compared the scar on the divided trunk with the one he saw on the tree woman in the dream, ironic considering the frequency of thunderstorms here. And it signified the tree was from the surface and somehow ended up down there. She wasn't immortal or impervious to harm or at the very least this part of her a fact to keep in mind if ever need be. Or she could change her appearance as she pleased. Anyway, it was in the worst case scenario and something he didn't want to do. He stored the proboscis focusing on something else. Approaching closer he appreciated the sheer beauty of the tree, the present he felt before stronger than ever. He looked down at the pure black odorless oil where the roots dipped in, greedily feeding upon it. Materializing a small glass flask in the palm of his left gauntlet he took a small sample. Hey! Curious! It's like the oil from before but extremely dense, compressed to an absurd degree even, oh so that's why it stays this way. It's the molecules of pandorium inside, Liam thought his excitement back, it was easily fifty times denser than the heavy crude oil he already has, which itself was already a few times denser than water. A wood sprite, the seed pod bigger than the other, landed on his left hand as the flask vanished in his inventory, the human observed it but his eyes widened as it stopped moving, flopping dead on his wide open palm. Instantly his heart rate increased, he thought he messed up in some way and killed it but right after it moved again before flopping again, it repeated this one more time before he understood why it, or more accurately she was doing that. Who do you think I am? A bird or your delivery boy, he asked loudly while staring at the tree, the feeling of the stare receding with his own, but he still took the wood sprite that became inert not before putting it in a bottle, then the bottle into a box before putting everything in his inventory. The next few hours consisted of him going all the way back to his base, the climb back up took most of the time as he did regular pauses to not worsen his healing injury, he was also very alert, ready to shoot at anything. He also did collect more resources but only on the red thread way, there was no need to take more risk for now. And so he was now in the middle of opening the trap door leading to the inside of his base. The first thing he was met with was Gladius, as soon as he took off his helmet the great ostropede jumped at him in a way similar to a dog that didn't see its owner after a long day of work but ten times more excited, soon followed by the four tetraptorons joyfully cawing. Ow! Calm down! I'm fine, it's just a scratch, he said as he took off everything until he was only in a pair of shorts to check over the wound again. The suns were shining over his base and work needed to be done but first a cold shower. Day 125 Since the first dive in the cave after Liam had healed back into full health and as such has gone back two more times into the cave each time finding new things. In the second dive he discovered an entire room full of quartz crystal that was covered in moss not far from the entrance. Quartz being themselves extremely useful in its raw and refined form, to say he was pleased with this discovery would be an understatement. He found this crystal cave because he fell inside by accident, the tapping trick with a stick wasn't enough, he thought there wasn't empty air below him and he walked over, gravity doing the rest. 
good thing that falling into the equivalent of a two-story building was barely an inconvenience, outside of a dislocated shoulder that was immediately put back in place. The third dive was more eventful as he met another pack of Lucomelas viper wolves, he didn't fall for the same trick and they were promptly disposed of. The first time he didn't get their bodies the same for the slinger, the plant life and wildlife had consumed it all. Anyway, these subspecies of viper wolves have a very interesting pair of organs next to their hearts, biological batteries with a power source consisting of nickel and hydrogen. Said biological batteries were connected by specialized insulated tissue to the organs responsible for the flash of light. In and of themselves they were not exactly useful as organs as a rule of thumb did not function very well outside of the organism they should be in. But here parts of it were, these parts were small and X-shaped in appearance with pandorium slash unobtanium within, it was inert and served as a mechanical and magnetic filter that let only hydrogen through to recharge the organ. A marvel of natural biological engineering, if it wasn't I was creation, at least in design as it was still extremely slow to recharge the batteries even if there is more than a thousand times more hydrogen in Pandora's atmosphere than the one of Earth. But still, it opened many new possibilities as otherwise making effective and reusable batteries was going to take a lot more effort and resources he didn't have such as lithium. Other than that he got more resources he already knew were in the caves and he was currently using them as he worked above his workbench. With a makeshift, if very precise soldering iron in hand, he worked on what looked like a transistor because it was the case. Eyes focused Liam worked, it was the hundredth of the day, and the fabricator was soon to be done, now he had fuel for the miniaturized electric generator, but still, the hardest part was finishing the circuits. An impossible if inhuman task requiring degrees of precision only machines gave but he wasn't normal was he? The fabricator was akin to a 3D printer in many aspects as such it needed an integrated computer to be operational and operated. It was very similar to the stereolithography plants within the manufacturing complex of Hell's Gate in function. The computer didn't need to be very powerful for the moment but it also mustn't be the size of an entire room or burn when on or consume too much energy or be too affected by moisture, or by heat, and a dozen more of or with themselves more or. A lot of conditions had to be met. Computers are delicate and complicated to build. Particularly from scratch. He will do it even if he will have brute force his way through or cheat. And so five days later down in a small underground room completely isolated from any environmental hazard. Soft red light from bioluminescent flowers bathed the room with their hues. Liam was below an excessively blocky and massive machine of metal, bare back against the slatted ground he was using his implant for more light, hand, and most of his body covered in grease he switched a thin cable for another. Smiling at that he pushed himself away and back up. Test 19, short circuit at B651K has been solved due to dust particle and too high voltage. I hope you work this time, he mumbled to himself as he pressed a button, a valve opened giving way to a metal cylinder. Implant against the opening he poured refined heavy oil directly from his inventory until the cylinder was filled by a third. His implant glowed brighter as he brought it up close to a short of the keypad, instantly he felt a connection to it thanks to the sensor specifically made for that purpose. It was hard to describe but it was similar to a smartphone but more direct and visceral but also void of anything that living beings possessed. It's a tool after all. Multiple specialized compartments opened with a PSST, placing materials such as powdered gold in one until all had what he needed was filled he closed them back with a mental command. Mentally choosing what he wanted to do, his implant and brain compensated for the primitive computer of the fabricator keeping a constant flow of information and directive in a way a human shouldn't be capable of. And he was perfectly aware of that, but he wasn't at one or two newly discovered weird aspects of his being now was he. He couldn't send much data, for now, or it would overheat or randomly crash the fabricator both leading to internal damage in the processor being annoyingly difficult to find and even more to fix if possible at all depending on the extent of the damages. It was very impractical but baby steps were still steps toward success. The machine soon wired life, green lights at its base changed the red hue, then a loud sound of an engine came with ventilators both drowning the room in their noise. 
he waited for the next half an hour keeping his implant stable, excitement growing as nothing seemed to go wrong. A beep and click were heard as a metallic lead opened, almost water-boiling temperature air wafted over his face but he didn't care as his eyes locked onto what was within, a miniaturized golden frying pan. IT worked, finally. Ha 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 ha. Yes, he laughed in pure bliss at that, it worked. The fact the machine shut down right after didn't take him out of his high, and neither did Gladius peeking its head in curiosity before imitating his laugh. Chapter 26 Searching for the Cryptid and Explosion It was early in the morning at Hell's Gate, within the cafeteria or otherwise known as Hell's Kitchen, people of all backgrounds were talking and eating their breakfast in their respective groups of acquaintances and jobs on the long linear table. Grace I don't want to bother and I know it's not really the place nor the time but... Are you all right, Max Patel, a brown-skinned man of Indian lineage, asked quietly with worry as he placed his tray right next to the woman he just spoke to. There was silence as the female xenobotanist slowly looked up in confusion at that question, and she simply nodded a yes before taking a sip of her hot beverage, something akin to coffee but from one of the native plants, and extremely toxic to NA6. I'm worried for your health grace and lying won't work, makeup, and acting might hide most of it but your brain waves when you use the link unit don't. And I have known you for years. Something is clearly bothering you. What is going on, he asked further, wanting to have an answer that seemed to annoy Grace. She sighed with clear fatigue and resignation and she let go of the mask before her friend's face. No. You're absolutely correct. I have been avoiding it. It's just... You know fuck it. In two hours come into my private quarter and I will explain everything. And it's good you asked, thank you, she spoke, voice serious even if exhaustion was ever so apparent in it. And so two hours later Max stared at the hollow screen in front of him with confusion at what he was seeing, and it was the image of a human male in armor. Yet in the middle of the plains of Pandora, staring right at the Samson with an unnerving gaze. Ha ha ha, this is edited. I didn't know you dabbled in this, Max laughed due to the sheer impossibility of this image being real but deep down he knew it was and yet he still denied it, right? Right? Grace. No, Max. I wish it was the case. It's a real image, one from the raw footage of the mission that led to the accident with the great ostropede. She paused letting what she said sink in, the accident that led to 17 death and 57 injured due to the animal waking up while in transport on the ground and emitting deadly acoustic vibration far too high for the human ears to perceive before it was ultimately put down. Max breathed in and out trying to calm himself, Grace simply tapped on various screens showing proof that backed up what she just said, she let him think and draw his own rational conclusion from the data she gave. Specimen Unknown Man Temporarily classified as Homo Zeno sapiens, sex male, age unknown, height unknown but calculated at between 190 to 210 centimeters, 6 feet 23 to 6 feet 6, with a muscular physique, exact time of the sighing, 1558, March 2nd of 2154, location of the sighing, Great Plain and its exact coordinate, the various images that were taken from the recording. Rough reading of his pupils that clearly indicated the armored man was indeed human, with the five digit on each hand and the tan skin only adding to this fact of him not being a NA6. A very strange human, the lack of a breathing mask on Pandora was the most evident and with the unusual, almost freaky eye color. And that he was alone in said plane, seemingly being in perfect health showing how even more peculiar he is. The most shocking part was accepting that this wasn't someone brought here by one of the ISV Venture stars of the RDA even with his total absence within the data record and he was way too old to be one of the very few babies born in the base. Ho how is that possible? Is this an old pet project of the RDA we weren't informed of or something entirely different, he asked in disarray, hands clutching the desk to the point of turning his knuckle white. Oh. Now he perfectly understood why Grace acted strange. This isn't from the RDA, Max. I would have known. It's too big to hide, not worth it, 
and would have broken a dozen of the UN's laws. I already searched everything available within my clearance and from the deceased Dr. Victor Monroe and Dr. Rene Harper's reports. I would have gotten some scrubs of information, tidbit, anything, but no, Grace reaffirmed the reality, denying all possibility of the RDA involvement. Nothing, no mention of genetically engineered organisms based on human DNA outside of the Avatar project, organs and body parts transplant, and other unrelated projects. We need, no we must make contact with this man or whatever the fuck he is as soon as possible before anyone else. She pressed further her point to Max who only nodded numbly still processing what all of this might mean and how it changed a lot of things. And so a plan that was already in Grace's mind for some time to locate and possibly communicate with this strange human was set into place. Meanwhile, for the person they were looking for. Day 135 What did you find buddy? Liam asked with a lifted eyebrow as he stared at Gladius digging up with its claws on the ground below a dead tree. They were out to collect more of this red silicon, a substance he had found away, by accident with the fiber of the giant pitcher plant and oil to make a type of grey-coloured polymer. He used them for the base of electronics and so much more. Quite a valuable resource to him, he was interested in growing those trees. Currently, the two were out of the base and quite a bit of distance from it. Gladius being taller than the human by nearly three heads and the massive metallic claws made it that this was relatively safe. Not that 100% was ever guaranteed in the first place. Gladius was immensely delighted to be able to out as now it can be with father a lot more. Liam was more than happy with that, and one of the reasons he had put in Gladius a leather armor with bronze plates to protect its vitals and vulnerable areas in case of a sudden fight and it gave a fantasy sci-fi vibe to his tame too. He healed fast and visibly didn't get infection but that wasn't so much the case for his tames. Gladius proudly showed what it found, in its beak, it looked like a truffle in shape but the color had a slight metallic tint seen through the soil covering it. The young great ostropede gobbled it up with gusto before plucking another one and giving it to the human. So that is where your species get iron. Normally, he mumbled as his implant scanned it within his inventory. The thing was not apt for human consumption at all, just a bit of this single piece would cause extreme iron poisoning. He dubbed them with this discovery, iron truffle even if no point was it a truffle. Of course, food being poisonous or inedible by the use of common sense never stopped humans from trying them, and he wasn't exempt from this rule. Though with how much iron was in there he didn't think it would taste very good, well in its raw natural form that is. S.Q.A.W. He was brought out of his thoughts by Gladius gently bumping its crest against the titanium reinforced outside of his chest plate, another truffle in its beak, and with Link Liam clearly understood his tame wanted to share its food. He refused the generous offer to the short-lived disappointment of Gladius as it soon realized it could eat more and as such the truffle disappeared in its belly to never see the darkness of the soil ever again. Hmm, it's going to rain, or maybe a potential thunderstorm, Liam internally remarked as the distinct smell of ozone entered his nose and the shadow spread over the entire area he was in. Then he gazed up. Or not, he trailed, eyes widening slightly as floating in the air were hundreds of jellyfish-like creatures, their bodies averaging at the size of small whales, the bells serving as gas sacs around 15 meters in diameter. Their purplish membranous flaps along the side of their elongated bells undulated as they swayed within the air and rode along the cloud. Their tentacles averaged at less than half a hundred meters, some being far longer and seeming to crackle with electricity, those creatures are called medusae or in Na6 depending on the clans either Psipha or Lionata. And their general appearance reminded him of some smaller creatures he saw floating out of the cave a few days prior, most of them getting eaten by sting bats while doing so may be related in some way. Then a dozen closest to him suddenly veered toward his location, Gladius noticed that first growled in a mixture of aggression and apprehension. Thus informing Liam as well if the sudden shift in the link wasn't enough. Of course, that was going to happen. Can't be left in peace for more than five minutes, he thought with a scowl of annoyance under his helmet, because why would they let him be? 
not particularly wanting to know what would happen if those tentacles were to grasp him or one of his tames, he acted. Mind going over possible scenarios he mentally commanded Gladius to calm down to then call all the tetrapterons back to the base and to fly low. The small group of giant floating jellyfish approached fast, Liam knew he could escape but not Gladius and so he faced them. A compound bow materialized in his left hand, he immediately switched it to his right hand as an arrow with a uniquely shaped bronze head took its place. The bow was one of his first projects after he got his fabricator up and somewhat running, even if it wasn't a perfect machine still as of now. And he didn't have all the resources in the world to do everything either. Speaking of that, it had consumed quite a lot of resources, titanium in particular, of which most were recycled as he did several attempts from several blueprints he doodled on pieces of paper until he had something he was satisfied with. And this was Sagittarius V1.3. Having the engrams, all the underlying components, and functions in his head behind them was good but adapting them to his needs was better, and also harder challenges like this were something he particularly liked if not adored. He didn't become a sous chef in a one Michelin restaurant at such an age by pure luck or with some powerful connection, after all, traits like being able to adapt and hard work were very important, vital even. That much was obvious. Even if luck always played a major role in every aspect of life. The compound bow in question would be considered utter trash by any humans and not much different by an A6 standard. And he could care less about their standards as only his truly mattered. For multiple reasons, first, it was heavy for what type of weapon it was, being 9 kg, 20 lb, while being made of mostly titanium. The second reason was the strength necessary to even be able to use it was already way past the limit of Olympic athletes, its maximum draw strength while not risking damaging it was around 100 kg, 220 lb, which meant he could go a bit higher. In any case, it's an insane amount of power for its size. A miniature ballista. The third one mostly for the NA6 was the size of the bow. It was too small and as such unusable outside of for kids but those wouldn't have enough strength to use it anyway. And that humans didn't use bow the same way NA6 did, this detail mattered as well. Of course, this was on purpose, the bow was made by him for him, he is stronger than the regular man by an exceptional amount so he wasn't going to use the same weapons. That would be stupid to do so. Delicately notching the arrow on the string, he then drew the string by half its max length, feet stable and position acceptable, he aimed. Not a very hard task considering the target's size. He let go, and an audible whip of air was heard. Boom, he murmured a smile of anticipation forming as the arrow zipped through the air and five seconds later hit its mark, piercing the Medusi's gas sack. The results were explosive, way more explosive than he ever anticipated. It was shown by an ever-expanding smile, eyes almost sparkling in excitement at the beautiful sight. The bell-shaped gas sacs were filled with none other than pure hydrogen gas produced by the digestion of their prey. It's an extremely flammable substance, one of the most flammable in fact, and as such can potentially cause explosions. Even if pierced nothing grave would have happened to the Medusi or so normally as the arrowhead was to put it simply a grenade filled with gunpowder a bit of crude heavy oil, small glass beads that would shatter into small shards, scattering everywhere in the would-be wound. Also not forgetting the bronze shards. A very nasty arrow for whoever survived it. And it was not even the strongest he could craft with his current resources, he had three made with the little amount of oil he collected at Tree of Souls with other chemicals to make something similar to RDX, a chemical used in C4 but more potent. They are specifically designed to damage or cripple large rotor blades if his estimates are correct and if the one accidental test on a poor that exploded into bloody smear dire horse was to be believed. Paranoid, maybe but better than in a cage if things turn for the worse, he was going take full advantage of the fact that they didn't use any kind of hovering technology. Or also shooting in the wide open gate on each side of the vehicle or the missiles. What he was seeing was a giant bluish ball of flame that stayed briefly in the sky like a fourth sun and sent shockwaves in every direction, blasting the other close uncontrollably, one was damaged, 
the bell tore at the end and it comically spun into the air like a deflating balloon while glowing bright purple. A rainbow appeared for the briefest of moments giving an inkling of what was inside them. The fact it was paired with electricity made him think if those sometimes just made themselves explode by accident. The long tentacles of the one that was shot flared a bright purple as electricity hummed violently outward to disperse into the air and what tons worth of gelatinous flesh remained as they fell limply toward the ground. Then the sound of the explosion arrived, causing Gladius to flinch in surprise and then caw in jubilation at what father just did. Liam didn't stay idle and began to move with Gladius following him but there were still four more that pursued them, it took the human two more shots and as such two exploded Medusi for the last one to abandon the chase. Surprisingly enough. Smart jellyfish, he said aloud, clearly pleased by the lone one moving away and the swarm of gargantuan gelatinous creatures that kept on floating away not going after him. His attention then shifted toward the tentacle that had fallen, they were still writhing on the tall blade of grass with the occasional burst of electricity. Approaching one of the smaller and inert ones he threw a stick at it, not having any reaction he threw four more, then poke with a long stick for a good minute before ultimately deciding it should be safe enough. Cutting a part of it with a dagger he studied the piece of gelatinous yet dry flesh. Storing it he was disappointed in some aspects by it but pleased in others, the electricity was produced similarly to an electric eel with specialized muscles slash organs so it was quite useless for him. The interesting thing was its visible resistance to its own electrical power one that should be enough to kill a human nearly instantly from simple skin contact. And at the center was a long and thin structure comparable to a cable, it was composed of hundreds of interlocking smaller cables themselves made of thousands of wires made of a material akin to graphite. Let's say these floating electric bombs had a new someone to worry about. Chapter 27 Who Want Turrets? Day 138 Time passes so fast. Liam mumbled under Gladius' tail, he was awake for at least half a minute staring at nothing. It was all so insane to think about even after all this time, the possibility all of it was a dream or anything remotely similar was long since gone. It was his life. It was one of such existential crisis moments you have just after waking up. Blinking Liam pushed the tail aside without waking up the great ostropede, it was still dark outside he remarked. Then there was the problem of his legs being taken by the four tetrapterons, Mary and Oxidon on grasping his left and Septon and Orion on his right, all respectively taking half of his leg with how big they grew while not even long ago it would have only been the finger of his hands. Hercules, he thought as he ultimately decided to wake everyone up with a mental tug of the lynx, three let go but not Mary. Snorting in amusement he stood up, either way, he had things to do. Walking to the kitchen of his small house, small as in only composed of three rooms, the first entrance led to the kitchen, the second was way bigger leading to his bedroom and the third was the attic. It was made of wood, clay and stone. Pretty cozy if unremarkable on its own outside of it being on Pandora. It was only the part above the ground, the top of the iceberg, more than 90% was underground, where he stocked most of his properties and crafted most of them as well. Oh, he preferred to be in plain air but being underground had its charm as well such as better safety for his possessions, he was still salty about the thunderstorm weeks ago. He didn't particularly like losing as childish as that may sound. A headache that was to do and still is considering there are many things to take into account for it to be usable and not collapse for X, Y or Z reasons. The underground was of solid stone most of it impermeable but still. He couldn't dig too deep or in certain ways overall a pain in the ass so to say. He even built himself multiple small wood elevators where he lifted himself up and down, not true ones running on electricity as it's a luxury, an unnecessary one that cost more than it was worth. Opening the upper door of a metal box half his size that emitted weak green light Liam got his face blasted with cold air, scratching his beard he picked a bottle of fruit juice, then a large mushroom salad and meats. It was a fridge and also a freezer connected to two dozen self-recharging hydrogen batteries, otherwise named SHBV 1.5, in a protective box on the roof. Those batteries, 
even if calling them generators would not be inappropriate either were overall not extremely powerful when not fully charged but they were consistent as long as there was hydrogen in the air, they would function, perfect for low consumption equipment that needed to be continually alimented and why the fridge was connected to two dozen of them. Better than an aeolian or a solar panel as one was worth nothing without a lot of wind and the other was productive. At only precise times of the day. Hydroelectric is out of the question as well as the evident lack of a flowing water source and they most likely will be gone in a few months if not weeks. He did make a portable electric generator that ran on fuel for various tasks but not a centralized electric system for several reasons, risk of accident, the cost to have it function, and this base was ultimately temporary. And it is expensive to do in the first place. Closing the fridge he drank the entire bottle before storing it in his inventory, giving a piece of meat to Mary still grabbing his leg he whistled and the three other tetrapterons flew in, which was followed by Gladius poking its head through the door. Too big now to go in further to the bigger alien bird's dismay. A few hours later, far in the plain next to a recently born shallow river. Liam placed on a dead trunk an auto turret with a magazine on its side full of 50 rounds of neatly arranged advanced rifle bullets, equal to 0.3 calories bullet, and it that can shoot 4 rounds per second. The turret was small, barely reaching his midsection if on the ground, fixing each of the metallic claws at the end of its three movable feet Liam inserted five self-recharging hydrogen batteries from his inventory in their respective place. His implant flashed with a mental flex and the turret word to life as the mechanism responsible for the aim of the barrels shifted up. His glow didn't cease as he connected to the auto turret in a way not dissimilar to two devices via Bluetooth. Nevertheless, it was unique just like how he connected to the fabricator, it wasn't all machines but only the one he crafted with that small electrical component letting it happen. It had more potential use as well, and it also made all of his machines made with this unusable by anyone else. Mentally fiddling with the internal parameters he chose the necessary condition to be shot and to not be shot. It was simple in principle but not easy in action as there are many factors besides the current technical limitations of the machines and programs. The turret could turn in almost all directions and had three hidden cameras that nearly gave it 360 degrees vision for major blind spots, everything directly below itself. Those cameras served as anyone could guess its sense of sight by detecting shifts in temperature and movement, giving that information to the miniaturized computer of the machine. The last one was a simple recording function connecting to a small memory chip that also stored all the turret data and algorithm. And will also be used for image recognition in the future. The memory chip was in a black box of sorts, and the most important part of the machine as data was irreparable, also the reason it was greatly protected in a box made of a titanium alloy. With this, the auto turret could detect and shoot what it perceived as a target with exceptional accuracy, not deadly as it didn't know what vital area to aim at but put enough bullets and anything is going to die, if it doesn't work then that means there weren't enough bullets. Simple as that. It was a wonder of technology for what he had on, so something far from perfect and the learning algorithm within it that will need to learn a lot. An algorithm, an advanced one but not even close to a real AI. It reacts to stimuli following its parameter to AT and doesn't act or adapt on its own. For an AI a far more powerful computer was necessary An AI, true ones with sentience and even sapience, was a touchy subject he preferred to delve into when things are somewhat settled. Those advanced lifelike AI imitations of engramic matrices mostly come from the tech gram such as the tech creatures he had the inner working of and they use a language that reminded him of DNA but without its flaw. If he was a programmer or simply worked with computers all that much before all of this happened he would be literally mentally blown away by it, yet he still understood the sheer adaptability and potential of it, to a large degree but he didn't, couldn't truly understand its true nature as trying made him feel headaches. Something that shouldn't be possible with his current understanding of reality. He seriously doubted it was made by humans and for humans, the likely possibility was that it was transhumans in origin, Homo Deus being the sole possibility. A language that also reminded him of those strange scribbling in some of the game's notes, all tech-related ones as well. That potential and adaptability are only truly shown by tech as well, 
it was a language deeply connected with the element after all, but still replicable to a lesser degree in other machines and that's what those turrets had, with a bit of binary behind as well. Anyway, a lot of progress needed to be made as the one from the games worked so well because it was within the arc where everything was chipped with some form of microchips and overall a well-oiled machine, most of the time, sometimes. As per usual it also meant he wasn't limited in number or bound to any rules for them to be modified at his will such as doing a mounted shoulder turret, but his resources, imagination and time were limiting factors. He could do everything at the same time, sadly. The future heavy auto turrets won't be limited to advanced rifle bullets. Another aspect it has was a sensor serving as a key part of its system that detected his implant so he wasn't shot and emitters sending a particular electromagnetic signal from a device in the form of leg bands that would be put on his tames. The turrets at the moment were incapable of telling them apart from wild animals. Quite the significant problem if he wanted them at his base. First one. From here nothing seems amiss, Liam said before tossing a stone up in the air. The machine instantly locked at the stone, low rhythmic bip were heard for one second and then three gunshots echoed in rapid succession. Three bullets flew of which the first hit their mark, blasting the stone in two pieces and the two other bullets continued on their journey to land somewhere and not hopefully on something or someone. Nodding pleased with this result he walked twenty or so meters away, put his left palm in a way it faced the grass and brought out a blood-soaked organ originating from a viper wolf that was comparable to a liver in its function but also a part of the digestive system from the numerous butchering he did. It fell on the ground, the nauseous smell directly entering his nose and spreading in the air, a bait. It was the first of four turrets, he was placing them to train the algorithm and test them as well. All will be placed in mapped and fully known areas to not shoot NA6 or cause the anger of a herd of big herbivores. After all those turrets were different than in the game and preventing any potential malfunction or error was a must win preventable. This was what the next two days partly consisted of outside of his normal very, very active routine of collecting resources and crafting, as he had tons of other projects he worked simultaneously on, such as a better forge that could melt pandorium slash unobtanite as he supposed it could be used to replace black pearl and so much more. What was that? Liam said coldly with a furrow of his brows, Mary sitting on his head cocked its head in curiosity at the blocky pixelated and greenish image shown on the small rectangular screen in Liam's right hand connected to a small titanium box by a thin cable. It was the footage from one of the turret's cameras, the last few minutes of it to be exact, this one was placed not far from where he bloodletted the trees that produced this red silicon-like substance. He was exclusively going over the one when the turret reacted to something entering its range or slash and shot as he wasn't going to go over nearly 40 hours of footage. His implant glowed slightly brighter and he commanded the video to move backward, zooming the image of what looked like a smaller version of the helicopter he saw a few weeks ago. His expression hardened, mood switching from curiosity to annoyance but also increasing worry and a strange feeling of palpitation in his chest. Breathing calmly he let the record play again, the auto turret hidden below a tree instantly locked onto the drone a second later and rained down hell from below. A salvo of bullets blew its entire left rotor blade to bitterness, instantly causing the flying machine to spin uncontrollably downward as it couldn't hover anymore. It then continued its fall, getting shot five more times, causing more damage such as the destruction of the mounted rifle then it disappeared out of view falling on the leafy crown of a relatively tall tree. No need to panic, chances are it's completely unrelated to me. Even if slim. And who am I kidding? It was gunned down by me either way, there will be consequences, he thought, but the gut feeling the drone was here because of him didn't go unnoticed and ignored, you don't ignore those things. Particularly here. Switching back to the drone, even with the bad quality he could see the presence of cameras on it, a pair of thin metallic multipurpose hands, and a small mounted rifle bellow. It wasn't a war machine that much was obvious from how it was shot down by the auto turret with laughable ease, its metallic armor was thin and light and didn't give much if no protection at all against his bullets. Its exact size was unknown but he estimated around a meter in length and two in diameter with the rotor blades, it was a scout or something with a similar purpose. 
It explained why it was taken down so easily. Go scout there with Septon. Be careful as well. I will prepare and arrive, he didn't even need to command the tetrapteron resting on his head to connect its neural cues with his implant for it to do it. Such was how deep their connection between them and all of his tames as well were. It was an incredible feeling, to put it mildly. Mary right after getting what it must do flew toward the window and opened it with trained ease, the tetrapteron then flew toward Septon who was also arriving. The two connected, sharing information about the sacred and very important mission father just gave them, and how important it was for the two of them to do it to perfection. Disappointing father was after all the gravest of sin even if they didn't know what it truly meant or was. They simply knew it was bad. Chapter 28 A Wild Human Within one of the many laboratories of Hell's Gate, Dr. Grace Augustine was analyzing fresh samples from a recent Avatar expedition where she collected fragments of the deepest root of quite a massive tree. Her face was serious if fatigued, not letting any outward emotion if a bit of childlike curiosity and excitement as she increased the rendering of the microscope if the very advanced machine would be named by its function, at her right while sipping her favorite alcohol from her mug. Life was excessively more stressful recently with Quaritch pushing her with her team to find a way to get the Omatakea back in line and do something for the blue monkey to fuck away from the unobtanium, Selfridge on his side didn't help either, in fact it was him pushing it the most and it pissed her off on a fundamental level and hurt just as much. And it wasn't even her job. She wanted peace or at the very least not straight out hostility and was working toward this but she couldn't do much as she was banned from even approaching home tree and approaching NA6 of the Omatakea would put her avatar at risk. The relationship with the clan and the RDA since the shooting two years ago at her school passed from very bad to catastrophically bad. It was born of a conflict where a small group of young hunters, a part of them her student for years, of which one was the clan Oloiktan's eldest daughter were in discord with the RDA mining activities and recklessly decided to set a bulldozer on fire, giant machines made of several hundreds ton of metals with the sole purpose of terraforming everything in their path. And it escalated into the school where this small group took refuge while she was in the middle of a class with a dozen NA6 kids, then the SEC ops arrived and the shooting happened. Luckily she got all of the kids out before any of them got injured or worse, killed in the crossfire, but the group of young hunters wasn't so lucky and they all without exception were killed. She lifted her head hearing the door opening behind her, as she was turning around and on her way to politely tell whoever entered to fuck off somewhere else then fuck some more but stopped herself when Max and Hollow Tablet in hand walked in a deep frown on his face. One of the drones we deployed last week was shot down. Look at your tablet, Drone 5. He announced the news that puzzled him while informing her to look at her hollow tablet, but she did as asked swiping a finger over the holographic skin a menu appeared, it showed seven 3D models of drones. Of which five were grade, completely lost or out of service, the first, second, and third destroyed by several thunderstorms, the fourth fried by a medusi, and the fifth taken down within the Swiss cheese that was the great plain expensive underground by a small group of sting bats. It only made the two fully functional ones left glowing bright green and stood out. But the ones taking her full focus weren't those two, number five was red constantly beeping showing it had taken critical damage but was still functional. Hey, another one shit, this soon after three was lost. And shot down you said? By one of the local NA6 clans, you mean? I knew it would have happened. Is that this? she asked. Stopping the rising frustration at the news, Max shook his head at this. The Great Plain wasn't exploited or very much studied either for several reasons even if there was the presence of plenty of unobtanium below it from the various satellite scans of the moon geology. The short answer for that was money, it wasn't profitable enough for the effort and resources required, simple as that. The long answer was the sheer complexity to get it and for the same reason, they couldn't build a long-term habitable base suitable for a large population. The geology of the Great Plain made it not worth exploiting compared to where the main base is currently established. The RDA couldn't change this aspect without a great amount of terraforming, which they didn't want to do, unlike the forest. 
It's easier to turn to cinder a patch of trees than to stabilize an entire area worth an untold amount of matter on hundreds upon hundreds of hectares. And the forest had a higher concentration of unobtanium to begin with, anyway. Adding to that the yearly Medusae migration, the powerful thunderstorms, and swarms of sting bats that could put to shame the long since extinct desert locust rendering flight very dangerous if next impossible at times. Because of all of this, the autonomous scooting drone's lifespan was extremely short, a fact that was taken into consideration before they were deployed by a Samson in the Great Plain but one that brought great frustration each time one was reported missing slash destroyed. A valid reason was needed for her to have those drones as well, even if they are disposable, she was still a civilian even if a very high-placed one, the reason she gave was a scientific expedition done remotely via drones to map the plant life of the Great Plain during the rainy season. And it was the truth, partially that is, she was greatly interested in this aspect, it was something that didn't happen on Earth anymore due to acidic and radioactive rain. And it must only have got worse since she left the planet. As such she didn't, couldn't ask for more as it demanded direct authorization from Parker Selfridge as he was the highest ranked individual and had more power than her even in the Avatar program, to her great displeasure and chagrin. He gave her eight and that was it. No more no less, not as much as she would have liked but at least she got something without resorting to other methods. She was still happy with this either way. Those eight drones had the purpose of fine combing a 200 km zone of the coordinate of the sighting, each had a predetermined path to cover a maximum amount of terrain where a human, as strange as he was, would likely be found by following four specific conditions. A place to have a shelter such as in trees or caves a steady supply of food, a water source, and a safe-ish area without too much activity from wildlife and NA6. It reduced the range to investigate drastically but it's still a considerable area to go through. No. I don't think so, watch N5S last second before going critical. This will explain better, he said, trying to keep his calm, somewhat succeeding. If it was excitement or worry she couldn't tell. Grace lifted a quizzical eyebrow at Max's words then she viewed it, her slow eyes widening fixed in disbelief at the footage of the drone getting shot down, that in itself wasn't why she reacted this way but the familiar sound of gunshot entering her ears was. Instantly anger and confusion flooded her system as the immediate reason for this dreadfully familiar sound was that someone from the RDA sabotaging her but it vanished as soon as she rationalized it. It made absolutely no sense for someone to do this. Why shoot down a scouting drone of one of the science teams? There was no point and even if the military part and science part mostly didn't really like each other it was, to put it mildly, incredibly stupid. Barring the fact it was nearly a thousand kilometers away from Hell's Gate and that she knew Selfridge, he wouldn't have done that and neither would Quaritch, he was a war veteran, a psychotic piece of trash maybe but not some petty little boy. To sum it up, it wasn't the RDA's fault, something that sounded wrong. The upper camera on 5 at is still function ah wait what was that, Max interrupted himself mid-sentence sending the live feed of the drone to Grace's hollow tablet. From the other side, a red four-winged creature landed on the branch above, a tetrapteron both scientists recognized. One visibly more muscular than any Grace ever saw, be it in video, photo or in person via her avatar, and she didn't miss to point that unusual aspect out. The red tetrapteron then left the camera site to fly all around. It confused both at first before they realized something it was. Studying the drone, strange but not unexpected, they were recorded by one of the xenobiologists as extremely intelligent and curious, similar to one of the last living members of the Corvidae. Unlike the other members of their clade such as the sting bats famously known for flying straight at Hell's Gate electric barrier or the turret or the rotor blades of helicopters, all cases ending with dead alien bats. Funny or sad, when it's two or three but not when in swarms of thousands. Another of such creatures arrived, landing atop the damaged rotor blade, this one with blue and purple accents over its body and just as muscular for their species as the last one. They aren't wild. Wild animals don't look like this. They look trained, Max stated the obvious before posing a question, are they some kind of NA6's pets? 
likely but that doesn't answer the fact the drone was shot down by some kind of firearm. Unless it's a NA6 that did this and those two are his or her own, she whispered the last part as such an act from a NA6 was grave, contradictory to their core beliefs but there always were exceptions. It made way more sense that some NA6 got their hands on a firearm, and learned from seeing it used by humans how to use it than someone of the RDA having personally shot it down. Still, the possibility of the one who shot it down was the one they were looking for was just as likely him having firearms wouldn't be the strangest of his characteristic, they didn't know anything about him outside of the sign he was a clearly genetically modified human. If human at all, the possibility of him being an unknown alien species while a silly idea at first glance was terrifying if it come to be the truth. Every piece of evidence needed to be taken with a grain if not multiple grains of salt before she could even begin to draw conclusions. The two tetrapterons flew all around, cawing as if communicating, at some point to her shock interlocking their cues, a shock that puzzled Max until she explained both were male. Then the two alien birds disappeared from the limited line of sight the camera gave. Immediately Grace decided to send another drone to this location to have a better view of what was going on, she wasn't going to let this chance go while something that blatantly unusual just happened. The closest scouting drone, N4, was 90 kilometers, 56 mi, away but it's a short distance for this machine and with the path chosen it would take 40 minutes top. The blue and purple tetrapteron came back two minutes later, something akin to a glove of leather and plastic with long polished metallic and serrated claws fitted on its left talon. Is this? But no. Yet it. It's him, a trace, but how, Grace thought excitedly, hard pressed to make sense of what was unfolding, the strange gauntlet fitted on the bird's talon clearly forged of metal and an unknown polymer dashed the NA6 hypothesis aside. A gun was already stretching and so the only remaining one was the unknown man they were looking for. Max on his side was fully focused on the tetrapteron actions it tapped against the metal with the claw of its gauntlet talon against the drone, he remarked the separation of one of the metal claws was oddly similar to a metal saw, his mind slowed down to a crawl at that, not wanting to believe what the bird was trying to do until it did it, right in front of the camera as if taunting him. The metallic cover leading to the drone's internal circuits on the top was cut open, and with it came an audible shriek of the cheap metal that made up the drone's armor being sawed off to be peeled open. It was followed by the bird using this same talon but with extreme delicateness as it unplugged one cable at a time, each cable leading to one or multiple of the drone system to shut down until nothing remained. Grace, we lost it as well. The bird. Eviscerated and then disconnected it. Max informed in disbelief, snapping the said woman back to reality but what he said didn't ruin her mood it did the opposite. It's him, Max. Those two are his, there is no other way around this I don't know how, why, when, or what. But it's him. It's the guy we are looking for and we must be close. Now we just need to manage to establish contact and hope he is friendly, she suddenly spoke with certainty saying out loud what her colleague thought's too low. Chapter 29 Teenagers do be teenagers. Liam cautiously approached the tree, Septon with its multipurpose gauntlet flew down landing on his armored shoulder connecting with his implant and giving information about the last five minutes. Fuck. I should have put the turret elsewhere not like I could have known a fucking drone of all things would fucking fly above and get gunned down and it's a drone with a 5 printed on it meaning there are multiple of them. Not that even without this I would have thought there were more than one, he concluded, he wasn't particularly angry, more like resigned and planning on what to do next. The human organization or a part of it with a name he didn't remember was looking for something in this planes, if it was him or not didn't matter at this point. Either way with the presence of drones, traces of his presence, or even himself would have been caught. He was going to have to communicate with them, it only advanced the inevitable, and it was both terrifying and exciting, even when that won't be in person. Human interaction was still human interaction. Around four months and a half he was here, all without any of this type of interaction, he wasn't naive enough to think what he had planned would have good results but he had the right to hope it would. And from what he remembered in the movie there were good and very, very bad humans 
very black and white views of things in this movie, good things there were pretty color. It will be different here to a degree as life was infinitely more complex. Liam understood this, basing his future on this incomplete snippet of facts wasn't the smartest thing he could do but there weren't all that many other options. A pessimistic but realistic view of things. It was inevitable that it would have happened and he didn't want and couldn't realistically run away unless he built a spaceship and that was quite impossible for the moment. Even with Tsumong's overall information on the clans and moon, and interesting areas of significance like the Aramalusing aka Hallelujah Mountain, the knowledge still was essentially very bare bone. Tsumong for all he was, wasn't a geographer. He didn't stay idle while in though. Climbing up the tree was as easy as breathing in lungs full of the toxic atmosphere of Pandora for him and in five seconds he was face to face with the disconnected drone. Good the little guys are smart, he internally remarked, sending through the link that they did a good job. All of his tames were exponentially smarter than their wild counterparts, close to sapiens in fact if he were to take a guess, but one distinctively different from humans as his influence and training didn't change their base genetics and most primal instincts. From his inventory he took out a fabricated sniper rifle the same as the game but with some minor differences such as a trade from durability for a higher caliber of bullet and as such more power. Durability is useless if it can't do what it was made for, to kill. With this, it brought his number of handheld firearms to five this weapon that could shoot something akin to 0.5 calories bullets, the three sawed-off shotguns, and a semi-automatic pistol that was made to test the fabricator effectiveness more than anything but dangerous nonetheless if shot in the eyes of anything with carbon-reinforced bone. All of this without counting the turrets and other things was still very expensive in gunpowder and various metals used to make the primer, case, and bullet, but something worth it is shown by him not having gotten eaten by the slinger in the cave. Switching the rifle to his right hand he put his left armored palm over the drone and focused on it, the implant hummed as space all around the machine slowly distorted. A few minutes later and it was in his inventory, same for the sniper rifle simply out in case a sting bats decided to be suicidal today. The drone was made in great parts of an aluminum alloy very resistant to corrosion and very light but in counterpart, it gave not much real protection. There also was a lot of plastic and a miniaturized computer at its core that deranged everything. There were a lot of parts that could be reused. His eyes suddenly narrowed as Mary informed him of something approaching in the sky, a particular shift in the link from the tetraptoron let him infer it was another such drone, one approaching fast. Time to move, Liam mumbled before jumping down, the roughly seven meters of air that separates him from the ground not stopping him one bit from doing that. He fell from higher on multiple occasions after all. The feeling of weightlessness was short-lived as he landed on the grass, leaving two deep footprints on his boots made of titanium alloy, waterproof treated leather, and polymer. His current garment was of his old armor pant, gauntlet and helmet but with a few pieces of his new still-in-progress armor, such as the chest plate. It's a homogeneous mix of riot and flak armor with the emphasis in mind being on the head, neck, crotch, back and chest, the last two parts with an inbuilt bulletproof vest without limiting speed and mobility. It could take small to the middle end of medium caliber bullets without a problem and even bigger caliber depending where it hit, as again limits such as how much it could weigh were set way higher. So he didn't have to compromise resistance for weight. Of course, a rocket hitting him square in the face from one of these helicopters he saw would likely kill him or any weapons designed to go through a reinforced vehicle as what he has surely wasn't so far off what the RDA could do but if he was in those situations then that meant he would look for it. Well, it, was the first design with no fancy technology as of now, an air filter and infrared sight for the still uncrafted helmet were still planned. Technically he could do much more but it cost way too many resources and for nothing truly worthwhile. He needed more time, and resources to create advanced designs of everything for it to work basing himself off the tech armor tech grams. So no power armor for now sadly. Looking back at the tree he thought of something, fetching a dagger out of his inventory. He flipped it before grabbing the handle midair and began carving a message in the tree's bark. Hiding, at least totally, was but a losing battle. Maybe it's a mistake, maybe it's not. 
starting with diplomacy should help even if admittedly it wasn't his forte. A bit more than half an hour later a drone with a four painted in washed whites below arrived decelerating it passed from mechanical and perfectly calculated movement to something clearly directed by a human, an inexperienced one by how it wobbled. Only the stabilizing program stops it from crashing on something. The drone flew all around the tree searching for the disconnected N5 but there was nothing, the branches were still there if very damaged, and the spindly tree's crown showed damage to the drone passage as well. Thorn metal pieces and glass fragments could be seen amidst the grass. It was the place. Strange. Is this the wrong tree? Grace wondered as she piloted the drone around it with the help of her hollow tablet until one of the lower cameras fixated on something on the ground attracting her attention. She was alone in her office Max having moved back to work while she was in the middle of her pause missed how her eyes almost comically widened at the camera feed. Footprints, she whispered to herself, inching the drone closer while she launched various scans. Each and every one confirmed what her eyes were seeing there were deep boots marks of only one origin possible. He was there and took the drone after having it shut down. But why and how, her question wasn't long-lived, just above the camera showed her writing, English writing carved upon the bark to her shock yet again. I apologize for the material damage I inadvertently caused, I hope this primitive machine didn't hold much value. I'm Liam Cram, a human, the one saw weeks ago, and whoever may be reading this may know that trying to find, capture, or attack me will have severe consequences on our future interactions. I will soon communicate to you through the device you are using to read this message. She was silent for a long while, longer than she would like to admit but this short and admittedly hurriedly carved message told a lot, answering questions but birthing hundreds more for each. Such as he knew English and knew they spoke English without any prior contact. He is aware, she said, keeping on reading again and again trying to find some other meaning but all she could see was immense bluntness, the apology felt almost sarcastic too not that she cared that much outside of it giving a bit on his personality. The unknown severe consequences mentioned which she was certain wasn't a bluff and would have made others flip in outrage or scoff at the sheer arrogance of such statements. Even herself in other circumstances would have laughed at that if she didn't know how little she knew about him how everything about him was shrouded in mysteries. And she felt those words held but the truth, mostly, for the drone was primitive compared to what existed as it was a model more than a century old, cheap to fabric but effective, and for the warning. It had the underlying meaning of someone that will not back down if push comes to shove. She didn't have anything nefarious planned, if that was the case SEC cops would have already found him. Whatever he is or his goal all she knew was that she was certain he was going to change how humanity shows the world, be he dead or alive. Such was how much of a unique occurrence he is. The RDA messing everything up and making him an enemy was the last thing she wanted. Having peaceful interactions with individuals from Earth and of extraterrestrial origin wasn't their strong point, it's a company run by money and power greedy for more money and power, ultimately nothing new. But it's the most powerful company in the entire existence of humanity, and Liam Cram was a way to both boost those aspects to an unprecedented level. Something Max didn't seem to grasp like she did or he didn't want to, she wasn't sure. And they will, inevitably, learn of him and do everything to have him, maybe not Selfridge directly but his superiors who he will obey the order of doing this, like the corporate dog he is. Having peaceful connections before this was needed. It was a headache-inducing future but one she decided to partake in. The part of him being human was to be verified as she held great doubt, even if it walks like a duck quack-like and looks like a duck then it's a duck, but here. There were reasons to doubt the validity of this measurement as any answer was hard to accept such as their absurdity, they were on the same page of conspiracy theories. And this told a lot of someone like he too needed to go to make sense of things. I need to warn Max. She mumbled with a frown, Liam's words of communicating them were both nerve-wracking and exciting, it was an entirely new being. Comparable if not more than her first time meeting the NA6 and it won't even be in person. Eyes focused on the screen again she blinked before almost jumping out of her seat in fright at the sudden jump scare, right in front of the main camera was a viper wolf, 
growling in curiosity. And this was one of the last few minutes of its life as another viper wolf, this one from above jumped on it and the rest of the pack followed, they decided it was now their chew toy while Grace could watch as another drone was destroyed this time however she could care less. There still was one drone left. At the same time far away from Liam's base, farther than the human ever moved past there was a massive lake, almost a small sea hidden by lush and dense primeval trees. Its crystal clear water with such depth only darkness could be seen in its middle, there was the occasional giant lily pad-like plant that could rival small ships, and strange animals that were a mix between turtles and platypuses swam their bodies forming small islands and from all around were stream connecting forming small waterfall as they arrived their ways along the various rocky slopes of black marble. Sitting on one such slope and facing the was a young male NA6, his left hand even if covered by a long sleeve-like cloth didn't hide the missing three of the first digit and the horrifying scars. Fiddling with a flat pebble in his right hand he turned his head and a roguish smile formed as a female NA6 of his age arrived behind. How was the gathering with Omatakeas and Tipanese Tsahik and Tsakaren? Anything interesting? Anything new? Myruk asked to T, throwing the pebble at the lake not bothering to look back, his ears letting him know the stone bounced ten times, nearly breaking his record. Do you remember when my great-grandmother and I a little later fell into a trance a few eclipses ago and I couldn't talk for a few sunrises? It was Iwa. She was speaking but not to us, we only managed to hear the broken incomprehensible echoes of the conversation if what I understood from the Tsahiks is correct. Hard with how they love oh so much to play mysterious, Tuti answered as she sat next to her friend using his shoulder as a backrest to stop a giggle from escaping because he instantly tensed up. He got himself back together, tail almost wagging, and gave his wild guess of a certain human being the reason for a psychic pulse only sensed by the most attuned NA6 with the all-mother sensed. I don't know my rug, I'm just as lost as you are. The all-mother messages are simple yet complex and this one didn't seem like one. Great-grandmother proposed this as well to the two other Tsahik but the idea was dismissed by them rather aggressively, particularly the Omatakeas Tsakaram. They have different, more violent relations with the Sky people, we are blessed to live the way we do, and the mention of who and what was the lost child. Shocked, disappointed, and angered them, she finished on a confused note, not really understanding how Liam was the reason for such reactions. There was a long silence between the two, the sound of water flowing and wind echoing until the male teenage NA6 burst out in righteous outrage. What? But he saved us. He isn't the same. Who do those they think they are, putting her palm over his mouth she quoted down his outburst. Tuti said, understanding how he was feeling as she felt the same. Then a smile found its way on her face and she proclaimed, You're right. And from what Dad told me we are going to ride after most of the Fsafa, Medusi, have made it and the path chosen is close to our savior house, Myruk trailed off, a smirk growing. And the two set themselves on meeting the humans again, of course not like the first time, so not on a hasty decision without preparation but teens even if of another species were still teens, and teens weren't known for their great wisdom or sound decision-making capabilities. Even more when fueled with emotions not forgetting that NA6 had a far wider emotional spectrum and more developed empathetic ability than humans. Both a curse and a boon. Chapter 30 FaceTime Day 142 Liam had been more active than usual since he got his hand on the drone, it was a very important moment for him, one unplanned like many things here but he wasn't the worst at improvising. He didn't know how he could be this way stoic and composed in the face of everything but he didn't complain, quite the opposite. Having a panic attack or worse a mental breakdown was a death sentence. There was no sight of flying vehicles or drones from either himself or his four tetraptorons which prompted him to believe it wasn't the military part of the human organization, it was official he existed and dozens of searching teams would have come and found him immediately. Satellites were present, he knew because he could see them with his naked eyes in the sky. They looked like little metal shiny dots among the stars and constellations and these shiny dots from humanity that can do space travel won't have any problem scanning a little patch of grass in its every minute detail. 
Either way, it was to his immense relief as even if it was the good guy part of the organization he wasn't going to be a good little alien and let himself be taken and manhandled to be studied like a lab rat or worse. Evidently learning more about this body was a must but that equal letting himself be violated. In the first place he reckoned a baby had more chance of winning a first fight against an adult than an adult against him in the same circumstance. He didn't know much about fighting, he is a cook transformed superhuman polymath engineer but he still knew weight played a pivotal role as anyone with two brain cells would. He was stronger than he looked, a scary thought as he knew he didn't look like the weakest of guys in the first place and he was also way heavier. On average he used half of his inventory even if half of the said weight was negated the rest of the weight didn't vanish, it was equally distributed all over his body. He punched hard and fast technique or not, it wasn't rocket science, a more apt example would be warping technology. Taking the drone apart and modifying its core component was a walk in the park, parts of it were quite advanced like the microchips that were its computer which didn't hold any data but the base programming of the machine that had the command of sending every data it got constantly. The integrated lithium battery connected to internal extremely effective solar panels that could be folded in and out was also fascinating if infective but had the merit of being mostly heat free. But it was clear as the day it was made being cheap and easy to produce in mind. Anyway, most of this didn't matter as what interested him was the radio transmitter and everything related to it, the frequency of the radio signal used was the most important aspect. The rest of the drone was worthless outside of being recyclable and it also gave him ideas to do similar devices. However, not this type of big ugly clunky piece of tinfoil serves as a drone. He got the name of the company Resource Development Administration as well or RDA for short from several of the components as well. A name that didn't scream danger at all. He also didn't fiddle with the drone without a minimum of precautions precautions that in big part consisted of a copper box that itself was in a bigger copper box all of it 20 meters underground. It's the deepest part of his base, all of these precautions were just to be sure if it were to send signals while he did tests none would slip out there by putting a red flag to where he was. The signal should be strong and clear enough here, Liam mumbled while lighting the modified remains of the drone. The drone had a camera and a microphone, what it lacked was a screen and a speaker, he essentially transformed a military scouting drone into a phone. He was sitting on a smooth stone, his back facing the void of a cliff that led straight toward the sea a hundred meters down where jagged rocks were gently washed by the calm wave of the sea. It was a picturesque place, something abundant on this moon. This place wasn't chosen because of this view, well partially because but mostly because it's high, far from his base, and there wasn't any pandorium slash unobtanium in the ground. This was an important detail, it didn't take much of a genius to realize that the super metal capable of strange partially breaking regular laws of physics with its magnetic feats, might disturb radio waves to an unknown degree. He was wearing comfortable clothes made of interwoven plant fiber threads and treated leather. A plain brown pair of pants and a grey short-sleeved shirt that was half open and overall didn't hide much of his developed musculature. Not that it was easy to do unless he wore extremely baggy clothes. And why would he? Every bit of joy, even if slightly narcissistic in origin, was to be taken in this beautifully dangerous hell hole of a moon. He also wore fingerless gloves that extended into bandages put in a way that his implant was hidden. Maybe not the most useful act as again it will be discovered, Tsu Mong, Iwa, and the two kids and their clan knew of it but it cost nothing to hide it and avoided potential questions. No armor of any kind as well, it was completely unneeded, ridiculous at best with the only purpose being to be intimidating, something stupid to do through a video call. And his current best armor was almost done and something that didn't need to be disclosed until necessary as well. Other than that he slightly trimmed his beard for something less cavemanish and braided his shoulder-length hair into a Viking-style braid, nothing differing much from how he usually was but a little more care was put in as if he was going to a job interview or video calls he got familiar with during a certain pandemic. He still looked wild but that was more on how his facial features were, let's say not the softest as far as he could tell, but still better than looking like a caveman that didn't know basic hygiene. Liam with a deep feeling of trepidation pushed a button of the drone transformed phone turning it on. 
No connection to his implant was made, he didn't know what machines they have, and his distinct signal from his implant, even if technically not in the electromagnetic spectrum, might still be traceable by them. It's not because their drones and helicopters were far too old-fashioned for a space-faring species that everything will be the same. No chance was taken. And there was no way for him to turn his implant off unless he killed himself anyway. Placing the phone on a tripod he shifted the camera for it to face him, his attention switched to a small blocky screen attached to the side and waited for it to turn from a blank grey screen to a low-quality live video of whoever he was going to talk to if the device on the other side let it happen. Liam waited, his eyes progressively going over Gladius barely three dozen meters behind the camera point of view and he smiled amusedly. The young murder chicken of doom was doing basic arithmetic in the form of a puzzle to get to a fruit paste seasoned with an obscene amount of iron powder. And he waited some more, oxygen landed right in front of him with what looked like a coconut but with long spines in its claw, then the three others arrived, waiting. Blinking he understood what the four tetrapterons wanted and grabbed the dry fruit by the stem he placed it on the ground and put pressure on the top with his thumb the result were instant as it split into five clean pieces filled with a deep blue flesh that smelled like raw acacia honey. A few minutes later a green light blinked over the phone, signifying a connection was established and Liam who was hunched over scratching the back of Orion's head noticed that but he waited a bit more to be sure it wasn't an error. Fucking finally. I knew it would be long but it was nearly five hours. Did they miss my message, he thought, eyes slightly narrowing, heart beating increasingly faster, his sudden shift in mood not going unnoticed by any of his tames. Gladius in the middle of a midday sunbath woke up and the tetrapterons tensed up. Grabbing the red cap over the camera lens that blocked every visual input he spoke in English, his voice deep and composed, greeting to whoever may be listening to me. I'm Liam Cram and I would like for you to connect a camera, and microphone for us to communicate with more ease. I modified your drone to do so. After those words, he took the red cap off and didn't have to wait much longer for the screen to come to life and the ecstatic face of an auburn-haired fair-skinned middle-aged woman with a NA6-like necklace and behind her was the face of a visibly scared chubby brown-skinned man. She seems familiar. Wasn't she an important character? And one of the good ones. I think. And I don't recall this guy, Liam thought frowning slightly as he vaguely remembered her appearance, a feeling of relief at this washed over him as it confirmed his earlier guesses and both didn't seem the military leader kind either. He didn't let his guard down, however. I can't hear you. Your microphone isn't connected, or on, or you are muted, he said blankly, not hiding his amusement. The woman was excitedly moving her lips which meant she was speaking but suddenly stopped at his words, embarrassed she nearly face-palmed herself. The one behind did however fully face-palm. Instantly the tense mood from the other side of the screen deflated, not planned by Liam but a positive outcome nonetheless. Clearly even in the future FaceTime calls were seemingly still too arduous of a task to do without any hitches, at least they weren't any filter here. Greetings to you as well. I'm immensely glad to finally be able to communicate with you. I'm Grace Augustine, a xenobotanist and the man behind me is Max Patel, a psychoneurologist. Who or what are you? How are you here? Are there any others like you? How did you manage to train tetrapterons, the newly named Grace Augustine asked, bombarding him with questions in a way a child in a candy store would but all said calmly with seriousness. A strange sight from someone who was a scientist, likely a high-placed one at that, and slightly perturbed as he felt like a new interesting subject that needed to be studied, which in all honesty he was but that didn't equal to him like that, or letting it happen on their terms. He needed to remind himself to be diplomatic. Calm down Dr. Grace Augustine, he said, stopping himself from adding a the fuck before the down and continuing on with an even voice that didn't accept no as an answer he proposed spreading his arms slightly, as for your questions, I suppose we could trade information and depending on what you and I have to give exchange should be possible. Does this seem fair to you? This offer also extends to Dr. Max Patel. It was the same way he treated Tsu Meng, if cordial, an exchange of knowledge. But since it was humans and not some naive NA6 here, 
not hate toward Tsumong but it was the truth in this aspect. He perfectly knew how suspicious he sounded. For all he knew she thought of him as an alien, which he again technically was and he wasn't even far from the truth either. She didn't have much other possibility other than him spontaneously appearing in this universe, something that she evidently didn't think of. There was a long silence, where Liam supposed they muted the microphone as he couldn't hear them, then the sound came back Grace spoke again this composed, I excuse myself for my earlier behavior. My friend and I accept your proposal. Good to hear that we are on the same pages, glad to be able to communicate with sane and reasonable, let's first place some ground rules, no action in any way done to harm me or what is mine, no telling others of my existence unless given my accord, no lying and other such commodity civilized individuals won't do to one another, Liam started right after, nothing outrageous. As long as you didn't mess with him or did something he didn't like he was overall a pretty chill dude. Fair enough. Mr. Cram, always a pleasure to have someone rational and reasonable in these fucking insane world. She said not so eloquently. And no one but us two of the RDA knows of your existence. We don't want chaos or endless violence born out of greed about your existence. We want to communicate with you in a peaceful manner and simply learn, she continued, sounding confident in her statements Liam felt she was truthful in all of them but her truth wasn't the absolute truth. I held doubt on the RDA part with only you two being in the know about me, Liam internally remarked but he knew it was mostly his paranoia speaking but he still listened to it. If there were others they weren't high placed and likely from the helicopter that was carrying an unconscious great ostropede but better being aware of the possibility than not. I can work with that, and you can drop the mister, Liam said, an almost roguish smile forming, he was greatly pleased and even more relieved with the turn of events. Bad luck and gambling sometimes brought positive results. Well maybe not rejoice after all, don't sell the skin till you have caught the bear, his grandfather would have said but from this little conversation, it seemed good. Chapter 31 New Armor I can work with that and you can drop the mister, from the hollow screen the man, Liam Cram said with a hint of relief and a smile forming. Max brought a chair and sat next to Grace waiting for her to respond to the barbaric-looking man, he seemed rational and all but it didn't change the fact he looked like someone who would kill you after a long session of torture for the smallest of reasons. Liam didn't inspire trust in him but judging only a book by its cover was illogical and Max was aware of this. It didn't change the fact that it was the case however as this man was very much dangerous, extremely intelligent, competent and unknown on every point. He reused the drone N5 to communicate in such a way it was compatible with a speaker and a camera on their side. In and of itself it wasn't impossible to do, those drones are made to be versatile but doing it while at the last sighting, he was in medieval bronze armor told there was something else. And this man could modify and create electronic devices by unknown means. Either he did it all on his own from the ground itself or was with others but the second option which was the more reasonable was funnily enough not the right one. He needed to talk with Grace about this even if he was certain she was aware of this. Since you asked multiple questions I will answer some of them as anyone would when learning of me and trust is something we need. Who, you know my name but that's all I would say for now, what, I'm human, as far as I know even if I'm breathing perfectly fine where I should not. How I don't know, I wish I did, and as you can deduce I'm alone, Liam let out, his voice getting quiet almost muted toward the end as he closed his eerie and ethereal metallic grey eyes and took a deep breath. Oh. Shit, Max thought, instantly feeling like the worst piece of shit seeing the man's body language changing for something that was but sadness and longing. The man was human. Grace on her side wasn't much better even worse considering it was her the reason for this reaction, this was someone who had lost a lot and endured a lot, and it was but a fraction physically shown that her gut told her making it even worse. She didn't know what he had lost or endured but it didn't change that he did, and she was right. Losing absolutely everything was something even the strongest of men and women couldn't simply shrug off. He didn't lie, the xenobotanist thought with certainty she was certain because it wasn't her first time seeing or talking to people that had gone through a lot, sadly. 
It wasn't acting on Liam's part and it changed quite a bit on the possibility of why he was here but it certainly seemed to be out of his scope of control. She herself is not exempt from such rules even if she knew she was blessed compared to billions of others and was extremely lucky to be where she was without having suffered. War, famine, diseases, pollution, depression and death were ever present on Earth, but to a lesser degree on Mars and the Moon because of their little human populations, only the richest were exempt from those problems, living in obscenity and perversion. There were reasons Pandora was such a sought-after paradise and why the RDA held an iron grip on it. Now I suppose it is my turn to ask one. What is the date and time? Liam asked with his composure fully back in less than two seconds as if nothing ever happened to begin with, his previous smile almost too white smile back on as well. The April 21st of the year 2154 and it is currently 9.56 p.m. and 54 seconds, Max answered on instinct to this question before ending up confused but it was short-lived as his mind caught up as to why such a question would be asked. And it was not pleasant. The man on the other side nodded pensively, then he asked another one, huh interesting. And how many drones were sent and what was their purpose if it isn't too much to ask? Eight, eight drones of which six are completely out with only N5 in your possession and N4 destroyed after it got your message carved on the bark of a young Octorus folliculus. The drone's objectives were to map the flora and to find you. A secondary objective that failed successfully, might I add. This time Grace answered, to prove she was truthful she showed her hollow tablet to the camera, which also had a miniature map of the Great Plain showing the two remaining drones' location. The man nodded again before looking up, frowning slightly at the darkening sky of the dusk that was progressively getting filled with dark clouds. It was sadly time to go as doing a call in the middle of the night was both dangerous and impractical. And the weather didn't bode to be pleasant either. I think this short FaceTime call may need to come to an end, the night and a thunderstorm are coming, Liam announced, not sounding the most pleased with this, reluctant even, I reckon a time should be chosen to avoid this type of problem of me waiting for five fucking hours. Right. N5 was active for several hours, Grace thought regretting having used her avatar today as it would have given the three of them way more time to discuss. But she couldn't randomly change her timetable. She had responsibility, and answering Selfridge for such change wasn't exactly the definition of pleasant. Evidently since I don't want to be discovered by others it needs to be a moment where one of you or you two are not disturbed by others to not risk putting me at risk, he explained further, blunt and honest a recurring factor with him it seemed. There was a moment of thought and exchange between Grace and Max that consisted of them going over the when this lasted until Liam, enough of waiting for the two was going to snap his finger in front of the microphone but there was a bright flash of light from the sky. Grace surprised by this immediately began speaking, in five days at 9p.m should be possib asterisk crack boom. Max flinched at the loud sound of thunder over the microphone while Grace stopped mid-sentence and immediately the screen turned black then the image flickered back with a distorted static sound the face of a very annoyed Liam that even with the quality of the flowery language receiving the weather didn't go unheard before it turned completely turning black. That was an interesting way to say goodbye. He should be fine. If he live there it won't be his first thunderstorm, Grace muttered merrily, slumping in her comfy chair hand going to bring her mug to her lips only ending disappointed by the lack of liquid life in it. It did go surprisingly better than I anticipated and I think you need to follow his regime my friend, she added snarkily, standing up yawning loudly, Max deadpanned her at this. The word better was very much the understatement of the millennia for a rational and civilized discussion with a being of alien origin unknown to humanity. And he might have reminded her that this amount of muscles wasn't ordinary by any means of the words, that this individual was surely genetically engineered but she still might be right and he might need to lose some weight. Blaming the lower gravity was an old excuse that didn't hold much value after years of use. Day 143 Liam was in his basement with a multi-purpose tool in and focused on his future helmet. Polishing a plate of titanium alloys he just added to the front part of it a piece that had multiple layers. After the outermost one he was working on was a thinner titanium plate hiding a layer of a non-Newtonian fluid made of polymer akin to Kevlar, 
then another titanium plate followed by the same material and another titanium plate. And it was one of the weakest parts of the helmet. Then the interesting part, an internal portion of the circuit that connected to his implant and ten high-definition cameras that had a night vision and thermal sensors functions switchable at will, all gave a nearly 360 degrees vision, in theory. Not full-blown 360 degrees as this helmet didn't let him see through matter. It was element and energy by five of the same self-replenishing hydrogen batteries he used everywhere and the new cables made of the big flying jellyfish tentacle graphite cores that had barely any energy loss due to heat with short distance and constant use. Logical considering it delivered a minimum of multiple thousand volt worth of electricity for an extended period of time. Why it was this way could be put to the very minute amount of pandorium slash unobtanium in their molecular structure. It was no superconductor at ambient temperature however, it was still slightly worse than silver in conductivity but he didn't have any silver adding that it could handle more heat than said metal. Why complain? Copper would work as well but why cut corners on such important things? It's asking for problems. Back to the batteries, sadly it was still the hydrogen magnetic filter bone from the cave viper wolves that was used but here it was sculpted to the shape needed as they needed to be inconspicuous and malleable to a degree, he still couldn't make this very important component as of now. He didn't even understand it fully too but that was more on the strange magnetic metal unknown property than anything else. The batteries were hidden and protected at the back and easily interchangeable for newly charged ones and with a command could be ejected. Let's say the Viper Wolves population underground took a hit, the funniest or most depressing part was that he didn't even hunt them and since running was not an option, with how hell-bent they are on finding and killing him killing them was the only option. Knocking them unconscious was basically a death sentence too. It was an experimental helmet that used designs found in tech the mech in particular, that consisted of being one with it as if it was an extension of your very being. Evidently, it was way simpler, modified to feed here, and worse in every aspect due to technical limitations and not vital at all for the rest of the armor to do its job properly. But a very important tool all the same. Electricity or not it will still protect him against most calibers of bullet his compound bow could still fire arrows through it so likely an A6 should as well but it greatly reduced damage in either case and it was from a close distance in a perfectly controlled environment. So in a real life scenario, it will be overall better, and in the first place, he wouldn't let himself be transformed into a porcupine. The front part could split open either to show his face completely or simply have two reinforced glass eyes slit that let him see. It was designed for complete protection so even those eye slit could be protected by another layer of titanium, normally it would remind him blind to the outside and exactly what the cameras are for. Let's test it, Liam said with childlike excitement in his voice, a great contrast with its timber, he was already wearing the interior most of the armor. A form-fitting bodysuit composed mostly out of nylon reinforced with an overall titanium chain mail, pretty much a reinforced scuba diving suit. Easy to put for him and even easier to get out as he could simply store it in his inventory. And also comfy as this point was just as important as anything else. Grabbing the helmet he spun it to be rightly oriented and put it on, it was snug and perfectly fitted for him. The world turned dark. Then with a mental command his implant thrummed, the filter in each side of the helmet activated and he saw from everywhere around his head all at once. Filter that could be connected to modified regulators and a tank for potential aquatic use. It was very disorienting at first, a normal human brain didn't evolve to understand this kind of sensory overload and that would have resulted in the individual having an epileptic feat before fainting, or entering a more or less permanent comatose, or if unlucky dying due to internal brain damage. But he was quite literally built to be able to do this, the survivor was different than the regular human so that is why he knew he would be disoriented at first and at worst feeling lightheadedness or a headache with potential ear and eyes, and nose bleed. And most of those symptoms will be after a long time of sinking with the helmet. He stayed still, and not even after half a minute, all started to feel normal. Too normal in fact. 
focusing on how in sync he was by using a microchip in the helmet for the purpose to treat and give real-time data to his implant of all the helmet systems he noticed to his shock that it was nearly 100% in sync with his body and mind. He predicted it would be around 60-70% to 70 at most, he might have underestimated himself, and he could guess the only reason it wasn't 100% was because of the helmet's limitation. This meant there was barely any delay, that all camera data were sent to him even if he didn't always fully focus on each, and why it felt so normal, natural even like he just gained many new eyes if comparatively worse than his real ones in all aspects but the capacity to detect thermic shift and a better sense of sight in the dark. It was something to be happy about that was certain but it was strange it didn't go as calculated either way and a point of study for later. That's still trippy as fuck. I can see my back and ass. I will need more time to get used to it, Liam said aloud, voice distorted and muffled by the helmet, making him soon even less friendly than usual. Maybe adding a microphone and speaker would prove useful as well. Opening the titanium visor for lack of a better term he could see normally again but the input from the cameras was still there in the second seat, no one would be able to sneak up on him. Moving around for some time he grinned, this was incredible. Walking up to a wood mannequin with a black and grey armor on, the rest of the sets he so eloquently called Titanium Seer V1 because of the helmet and that it was mostly made of titanium, exactly 17.365 kg, 38.3 lb, of it was put into it. Basically 50% of all his titanium. Putting on the armor Liam clipped each piece with the body suit and with one another until he was fully armored, from boots, gauntlet, shoulder, arms, legs, abdomen, and chest. It was a black armor reminiscent of Riot and Flak from the game taking the best of both worlds but also one of their main defaults. It kept heat very well, but feeling a bit hot and bothered was better than feeling a lot dead. This problem even if a small ignorable one could be fixed later down the line. And the armor itself could and will be upgraded. Picking up a bulletproof vest that was next to it he added it on top of the titanium chest plates with also an integrated bulletproof vest below. There never was enough protection. With the 40 kilograms, 88 pounds, of armor on he deactivated the helmet and jumped slightly before punching and kicking punching the air a few times, he brought up his war scythe and did swings of all types, did multiple one hands sit up on both hands, Backflip all of this for a good half an hour to test how he felt in the armor and his grin widened. Feel great, a bit hot but great. Can't wait to test it tomorrow down there because, with all of this, I'm freaking poor. Hmm, and it's 11.48am time to eat, tartar or barbecue. Why not both, he thought, also happy to now have a clock and a calendar of incomplete thanks to Max. He could track the time now having updated it after the meeting with the two scientists because, for the last few months, his implant showed nothing on that aspect, normal after all the implant can't magically know the time and date. Chapter 32 Second Face Time Deep within one of the caves of the Great Plain a black and grey armoured humanoid figure could be seen weaving between black branches, glowing purple particles flowed within the air emitted by crystal implants growing all around. Ten spots emitting a soft red light were all around its faceless head. The figure moved unperturbed and visibly unaware of what was above, a blood-red creature on four taloned legs, its pair of hooked front limbs waving in the air as it slowly and methodically towards its prey. Yet all of a sudden the armored figure spun backward, a complex metallic bow in his left hand appearing out of thin air that was immediately switched to the other hand then an arrow with a strangely shaped bronze head appeared in a similar magical fashion in the now empty hand. The next instant the arrow was clipped to the bow's string, the string realized back and shot. The arrow flew over the two dozen meters that separated the two in a second to embed itself deeply into the blood-red creature's chest whose reaction was to emit a shrill screech of pain and anger. Then its body flashed brightly with a soft boom and all of its action ceased before its legs gave out and it fell limply, crashing with a loud thump right in front of the armored figure. A smell of burned flesh in the air. Not this time around, Liam said, his gray eyes appearing as he lifted the facial armor plate that hid the reinforced glass eye slit and he carefully approached the down slinger, switching his compound bow for his war scythe, cleaver. The head wasn't dead 
it was trying to crawl away from the body in fact by using the strange flap of skin that looked like bunny ears but were wings and now used as improvised legs, the entire thing looked like the mix of a bunny, a mosquito, and a slug. Liam grabbed it by the proboscis and in response, it emitted a squeal of either fear, anger, or something else he didn't know. I wonder if you can be kept alive to have a safe supply of venom or it can simply be frozen and keep its effect, he wondered aloud observing the squirming and squealing head, he didn't feel any pity for it as by all means it wouldn't have for him and was on its way to shoot him. Either way you come back home with me, he added with a smirk and at the same time in his left hand a small red dart filled with a tranquilizer composed of a cocktail of plants diluted in pure water manifested into existence from his inventory and he stabbed the head with it. It froze then squealed and squirmed harder than ever in a burst of panic until the tranquilizer kicked in and it became slower and more silent until it breathed calmly and stopped moving. I hope I didn't just inject something that will kill it. Well, that would mean dinner and the dead body smells like cooked salmon. It would be good if it tasted the same even if it's quite a freaky creature. Creatures, Liam thought as he carefully strapped the sleeping head on his back, a living backpack made of half of one of the apex land predators of the entirety of the moon. It was a mixture used to let your spirit open up and let the words of Iwa flow through your spirit, he got this from Tsumong and this clearly was a hallucinogenic drug. One that was taken via injection, the Anure used sharpened bone covered in the drug to then poke themselves with it as they did not know needles. Other than that in big enough quantities, it affects many creatures, NA6 included a more or less intense soporific effect going from a sudden simple nap to eternal sleep, which pretty much means death. And funnily enough in it there was the use of sting bats rotten venom glands. It was time to climb up either way, he collected a good 5 kg, 11 pounds, of raw titanium which mean the process to purify it will reduce its mass by nearly two-thirds giving around 1.75 kilograms, 3.8 lb, of pure titanium, less than half a kilogram of raw platinum, same logic used here than for the titanium, 200 kilograms, 441 lb, of raw heavy oil and other less important resource. An above average collect due to the relative shortness of the dive, at this point, 3 hours, 10 minutes, and 36 seconds with a non-important amount of lower units of time, he was here mostly to test his new armor and the verdict was that having a 340 degrees sight even if not the best in terms of detail was a life-saving advantage. Literally. The rest of the armor was simply better in all points than the last one he had and the only creature here he was perfectly aware that could go through bronze was unconscious on his back. Though it didn't mean the proboscis couldn't still go through some of the more fragile joints of his armor and cause superficial wounds but again superficial for him didn't mean superficial for everyone else. And not having one of his lungs perforated a second time was always a plus in his book. The fact the area was rich in precious resources didn't mean there were tons upon tons of this precious metal on top of one another ready to be picked up. It was in pebbles, rocks, and boulders sprawled all around the giant floating stone made of pandorium slash unobtanium. Cracking his neck a satisfying loud popping sound was heard, he looked one last time at the body of the slinger, the wood shaft of the arrow was gone, completely splintered, and the arrowhead exploded inside instantly killing the body with the heat, shock waves, and shrapnel combined. Pointy sticks with explosive bits were scarily effective on fleshy beings. This one in particular as it covers one weakness of the regular arrow. If it doesn't hit something vital like the heart or cause hemorrhage by cutting arteries it won't kill quickly or kill at all compared to this one. Even if they hit the shoulder or the knee, having it blown off right after was a tad more problematic. It's a grenade attached to an arrow after all. The climb back was one of the easiest of the dozens he did, no viper wolves or sting bats attacked him even when directly confronted with him. They ran as if their lives depended on it, a strange sight for sure for Liam, he was so used to being attacked by everything and anything rather than the contrary, and what should be normal was perceived as strange. But he had enough common sense to realize this. It was the slinger's head, it was the only factor that changed unless the viper wolves and sting bats, in particular, learned self-preservation in this short time frame and it was understandable they would be created by the slinger's smell as he doubted any other factors were at play. 
Once he was on the surface he hurried himself back to his base as a thunderstorm was coming and the head needed to stay unconscious for ease of handling and transport. A few hours later the slowly awakening head was in a steel cage itself placed in an isolated room, Gladius behind that glared at it something that promised death, pain and murder while the four tetrapterons on Liam's shoulders and head didn't act that much different. They didn't like it. Something Liam already anticipated but could do nothing more than let them adapt, it was a problem as in the future they will encounter a lot more different individuals, and having them come would only help. There was also in the cage a bowl with raw meat and another with water, the proboscis was just to inject venom as below were four segment demonic looking jaws, something like a lamprey's non-existent jaw but worse and that could extend outward to scrape meat and flesh alike at least Liam assumed this was the case. This creature was strange. It has two neural cues at the base of its neck, the same as for the body and surely how they connected together, it was a strange creature and he would think of them as even stranger if he knew the two were related to one being the mother slash father of the other. It was an interesting creature, he doubted he could tame it, even less now, and didn't particularly have the present need to. It's utterly defenseless and its use didn't need it to be cooperative. That didn't mean he would treat it poorly, he wanted it to be alive and healthy after all but that wasn't a pet or one of his tames. It's an insult to even compare them as they were closer to family than anything else, he very much was aware they considered him as their father. He inadvertently got a viper wolf and sting bats repellent and that was what mattered. What was there to complain about? Things were going smoothly too smoothly in fact and that made Liam tense. A gut feeling told him the next few months will be unpleasant but that didn't stop him from profiting a little from this time for now. As much as the future was important, if you don't know how to appreciate what is good in the present, what is the point? Too much of anything is bad after all. The next few days flew by until it was the time of the second face time, Liam was pleased with the last even if it was cut extremely short. Mostly because of who he got to talk to and that they were reasonable though the part where he had a moment of weakness wasn't but that was life. He will need to get over it and he did a pretty good job until now but it might have proven advantageous as it made him more human to them, he didn't like manipulating others but that won't stop him from doing so. And it wasn't truly that here but gaining empathy, he abhorred having acted this way but he preferred to lean over the possibility balance of his continual existence. He would take advantage of this. If he showed he was a true threat he was damn sure Grace wouldn't hesitate to have him caged or worse eliminated, being good didn't equate to being stupid. Even if not for herself or Max as well just telling of his existence to the higher up of the local RDA would result in those two earlier problems. Destroying a helicopter? No problem if he took it by surprise and it wasn't kilometers up in the sky. A squad of fully armed and trained military? manageable if he goes for the kill and plays dirty. But the two put together and even worse an entire army of them even if small without more advanced troops? No way he survived to tell the tale. His physical prowess didn't matter against a hail of rockets and bullets. His future actions literally depended on the competences and whims of those two individuals, even if they didn't realize it. This led to the present. Day 147 for Liam or the April 26th of the Earth year 2154 at 8.55 p.m. Liam stretched on the seaside stone cliff, relaxing his muscles as he did so, he was wearing the same type of cloth as the first time but in a different color, the shirt was more on the blue side due to the plant fibers color used and this one glowed in the dark. As well as the same haircut and beard, it was annoying on several points to have them grow so fast but that was infinitely better than being bald or beardless. He brought N5, the drone turned phone, and a tripod out of his inventory, placing the two in front of him he turned N5 on and waited. Unlike the last time, he waited only around 20 minutes. Good afternoon Grace and Max, I suppose it doesn't bother you if I don't use your title. Liam greeted them with a courteous smile through the camera as he saw the two taking their seats, Grace looking pissed off about something. I'm sorry Liam, as for the reason for us being late it's... Let's say a greedy little fucker. And the doctor title is unnecessary, Grace said visibly calming from what this greedy little fucker had told to anger her. You don't seem to particularly like him or her, 
Liam said with a lifted eyebrow. Him, and indeed. Parker Selfridge is not someone I particularly like at all, nobody here really does but me in particular. He is a businessman at heart, something he lacks, and the one with the reins, she answered the unasked question of Liam with venom dripping out of her every word. Max next to her side at that, Liam wondered how many times a day he must have this repeated but formulated in different ways. But from the movie plot. Well, he didn't remember a guy named like this but this immediately put whoever this Selfridge was, he was now in Liam's radar to either ally with or to eliminate. I can't believe my first thought is to murder this man. And the fact I know I likely will if given a chance and a reason, Liam thought, as much as he wanted to be perturbed by this idea of killing a human, he wasn't. He told himself several times, his survival came first and foremost. He understood that she was biased against this man and for very good reasons, if the general idea of the movie was here. Speaking of that, it cemented the general idea of where he was in the supposed timeline if there was the paraplegic man yet, before or around the start of the movie which ultimately didn't give much but that was still this. On another note, Grace and I have made a list of questions for you. Correction, saying a book's worth of questions might be a more appropriate term. Most being from Grace, Max corrected himself, chuckling and scratching his short curly black hair in nervousness. Go on, so who's first to ask? Liam's words echoed and the xenobiologist was the first to ask, anticipation and curiosity in her tone of voice. This question might seem intrusive because it is, but how did you manage to tame a duo of wild tetrapterons and train them, she asked. Liam not being stupid and having heard the terms before whistled, the sound loud and clear. Not even four seconds later two tetrapterons arrived, one red and the other blue and purple. The hot-colored one landed on the man's head, and the cold-colored one on his right forearms, each of their claws against his scalp and skin but neither seemingly bothering him. You mean those guys, yeah? Well, I wouldn't say I got them grown up from the wild imprinting them before they even hatched is key. The local wildlife isn't very friendly to me, you see. The rest is self-evident, they are smart birds after all, he said scratching Septon's head playfully, the alien bird cawing happily while its brother looked wronged by the lack of attention, sadly the man only had two arms. His words while completely true were incomplete, imprinting wild animals of Pandora even before birth, if eggs gave a good head start but their natural instincts to kill the outsiders was extremely strong. As such at best it was stupid with the risk of injuries and at worse it was death. Grace could draw her own conclusion with those words by filling the gap herself or by asking more questions. Chapter 33 Capitalism Never Changes The call has gone up for several minutes already. Questions and answers flying from each side such as what is the state of earth asked by Liam while most of the man's answers were mostly reserved and very cutthroat, something Grace and Max understood. Something Liam didn't even try to hide either he didn't know them and they didn't know him, being frank here was good, necessary even. Lying about something that was going to be ultimately discovered was dangerous, but that didn't equate to revealing everything such as his interdimensional origin. Something he couldn't even answer and he didn't want to open this can of worms now either. He must gain their trust, and gain allies human or not so lying was counterproductive. Liam, have you had any contact with NA6, they are tall blue humanoids with four-digit, pointy ears, and a tail, Grace asked while bringing up a holotbalette with a picture of a female NA6 with human characteristics looking oddly like Grace and she was smiling with three other regular female NA6 two being teen and the third a kid in front of the camera. Right. There was this in the movie where they controlled those human NA6 hybrids by sleeping in those boxes. I wonder how it's done, Liam wondered briefly about the technology behind it as it could simply be a simple brain chip to a full-blown psychic link. This technology was mostly possible thanks to a controversial RDA scientist back on Earth, Dr. Cordell Lovecraft pioneer Shinnick researcher having used all animals for his research, the Dark Dream Project, humans, criminals mostly not being outside of the range of his experiment. 
It wasn't a bloodless or painless technology but nobody outside of the Dr. Lover Raft and a few high-placed individuals knew the extent of those two points. There was a question to answer, one that would have come. This wasn't trivial, his relationship with the NA6 was very important. Closing his eyes for a long second Liam spoke this time not in English to the immense shock of the scientists. He waited letting his words set in with a smile forming, he nailed the pronunciation this time, am still bad at the people's language, however. They are fascinating, some less welcoming than others but very interesting, they call me the lost child. After this, he waited some more until the xenobotanist replied, shocked and delighted, hungry to learn more, you are even better than some who spoke it for years, pronunciation is nearly perfect. This is incredible. It changes everything. How did you learn the language, did they teach you? What clan were they part of? Why such a title, what is the meaning behind it? How did your interaction with them go? Are you currently in contact with them? Max placed a hand on her shoulder telling her to calm down before she started asking even more questions, it was Liam's turn after all. One of the rules that were set at the start, was equal exchanges, to a degree of course as information was more or less precious to the individual in question. Max was more of a middleman here, truthfully, he was no expert in NA6 culture or alien biology outside of avatars and humans' brains. He had an interest in Liam's brain, how it was made etc. but that was not the place nor time and to let the man enter a scanner more than two calls are necessary. That isn't a problem Max. Yes I learned the language thanks to an amiable wandering NA6 with the same trade that we are doing, knowledge for knowledge but that is all I will say. For now, Liam said calmly, he didn't want to involve anyone else in this. To say it mildly clusterfuck and make it even worse. Grace nodded, calming herself down. This information opened many possibilities for the future of human NA6 interactions, all needing Liam as he was a third party to the conflict between NA6 and the RDA. She could only hope she could convince him to help, from what little she learned he wouldn't budge without very convincing arguments, and forcing him, even if she wouldn't do it either way, seemed to be the worst possible decision. The man was desperate and in depression to an unknown degree and as such quite possibly mentally unstable, no he was, he just didn't show it and betraying him will likely make him snap and she was certain in no way would she survive, it was a gut feeling coming from her most primal instinct, he was superior to them as confusing as it was and also mixed with common sense. A discussion she had many times with Max for the last few days, this man wasn't normal if man at all. A genetically engineered individual of unknown origin would be far from ordinary in all aspects imaginable. For explicable reasons, he was like this mentally, alone in an alien environment, and with the blade of the entire RDA and so much more above his neck did this. If he were to have been discovered by someone less altruistic than them, his future wouldn't have been nice. She couldn't even begin to comprehend the amount of pressure and stress he must endure. He was aware of his situation, he clearly didn't want to be here, but he was and fared much better than anyone else she could think of in those conditions. The fact he learned the NA6 language from a NA6 means he was a good person, even if she was not as well versed in the many clans of the Great Plains. A general rule NA6 made after what the RDA had done and is doing is to be extremely wary of humans, and some are sometimes aggressive to the point of going for the kill without hesitation. Such as the Omatakea. Liam speaking it to such a proficient degree showed he was taught extensively for at least months by the natives and no NA6 teacher will bother teaching someone who was a monster or who couldn't show potential in their ways or if they were forced and she seriously doubted he could do the latter as strong as he looked. NA6 and Avatar simply didn't play in the same league as humans in that department. A fact she could attest it was the difference between a full-grown adult and a regular child. I suppose it is my turn. I want to be sure, I have an idea of why the RDA is here but again I want to be sure, why is it here, and also since I answered one more how powerful it's actually, in the grand line as you clearly hate their guts. You're right. It would like to say the RDA is on Pandora to study the flora and fauna as well as learning from the NA6 but that would be a lie, 
she halted thinking of a polite way to put it while taking a big gulp out of a water bottle. The leading factor of it all is, I suppose you already guessed, resources, resources such as unobtanium. We are simply here to be a pretty little eco-scientist team to the media back on Earth, it's a company that works for profit and only this. It needs a nice image even if it's the most powerful independent company in the entirety of human history. From healthcare to the food and entertainment industry, most of the scientific research is not connected to any government, they control and find basically everything else under the sun. The sole reason Pandora isn't a rock void of life is a set of extraplanetary regulations set by the United Nations, Grace explained, she was furious, sad, disheartened and so much more. She truly despised the RDA and what she gave in general information, for very good and valid reasons. But it's nothing new as a concept to him, only taken to the extreme, and it was good to know the UN still existed but they wouldn't act much different from the RDA at his discovery. And he seriously doubted the one at the head of the RDA, if push came to shove, would bother to think twice before breaking some of the rules just for him, the UN not being exempt from this either. In fact, he was sure new laws would just be made for him. They make the rules and he didn't know how different they are from the one he was used to but they should be, in any case, way, way more corrupt. If the earth is as bad as Max told him a few minutes earlier when he asked, and it should be even worse currently, it wasn't his earth but that didn't change that it was tragic. A dystopian world one he was happy to not have been born on. The Moon and Mars colonies not faring that much better, exceptionally worse even from the little Max knew. Tragic but logical for Mars and the Moon to be worse than Earth in terms of habitability as the not-so-blue planet anymore needed to be cracked open for the playing field to be even. He hated politics and politicians in general, but that didn't mean all were evil pieces of shit and worse scums of humanity so to say. It's simply that the ratio of good and bad has always leaned toward the extremely bad end of the spectrum from any party, country, time, religion, and ideology. An aspect that must be even more pronounced here. Trusting that one, if he managed to contact one high placed enough, will do something other than lie and deceive him for him to end up under a scalpel or in a white room to be tortured or worse was pure unaltered madness and stupidity in its rawest form. There surely are exceptions they always are, but that wasn't worth the risk to find them, he hated to be put in that corner. The RDA was a megacorp controlling nearly everything, its influence over the entirety of humanity but humans he couldn't trust except for a potential few. His own species, more precisely the leaders were going to be his enemies, something he already anticipated as he couldn't see any other alternative now. If the occasion of communicating presents itself and it is safe he will still try but there weren't many ways out and his life mattered more to him than anything else. And for the metal. Makes sense they want it this shit is better than any superconductor known to humanity here, it's revolutionary. But can't they artificially synthesize it? I mean. It should be possible with enough research, I can already see several ways to go about it. Yeah no, I'm idiotic. Monopoly over it. A fucking course. Milking things as much as possible even when there are other alternatives, Liam rationalized, he wanted to be angry, furious but he only felt immense disappointment and disgust. That all sounds extremely bad, but I admit it's not surprising. At all, Liam said honestly, and both sighed at that. Any more questions you might have, Max, Grace, it's getting dark on my side. There is not much time left unless I want a tea summer reaping my gut out. This earned a snort from Grace at that and a confused glance from the person spoken to before she explained what a tea summer was, a slinth, the fastest land predator of Pandora and an extremely venomous animal that NA6 use the venom of to coat their arrows. Yes and saying the contrary would be the understatement of the century, but your safety is more important even if I don't doubt your self-defense capabilities, Grace said disappointed by the overall shortness of the call but greatly pleased by what was learned. That sums it up for today, when would you prefer our next rendezvous to be, Liam said, the red tetrapteron on his lap waking easily reading the messages of father through the link that it was soon the time to go home. I thought of a time but the next few weeks will be very hectic for the entire base. 
New personnel is coming to the base directly from Earth, some must already be in the stages of waking up from cryostasis. The only time Max and I have with certainty is May 6 and for the time it's yours to decide, Liam. Some will be added under my care and that will need my attention, Grace explained with a frown, almost upset, not a particularly new sight with how many times she was incomprehensible with how many reasons she had to be. Ah, is the crippled guy arriving with this batch? Or it could be another totally different batch for all I know, Liam nodded in understanding while scratching Mary's belly, his mind going over what was said. Around 3 p.m., I suppose after this one in ten days chances are there will be a long time of silence, right? This won't do, this won't do at all. Unacceptable even, the man said calmly, his left bandaged hand holding his chin with enough force to break a child's hand. I would like for you two to procure yourself with a device similar to those tablets you like to wave around or one that could be used as a phone, preferably inconspicuously, it is of little importance to me as long as it can send, treat, and recuperate data. As well as needing them to be new, disconnected from any of the RDA servers, or ever connected to those either. I want devices free of any external interferences. I want them to be on a particular frequency of your choosing but one unused, that doesn't risk getting found and that you will give me next time, Liam explained voice unwavering and a smirk gracing his roguish features. Chapter 34 Third Meeting with the Natives It has been four days since the call with the two scientists has passed and Liam's daily life hasn't changed. Wake up, eat, work, play with his tames, work, eat, train, work, eat, train, eat, sleep, rinse, and repeat with the occasional moment where he scrubs himself clean and other necessities. In an underground room with weak lighting, a man in only a pair of worn-out pants could be seen, a long diagonal scar running along the defined muscles of his back and a smaller scar on his right pectoral. And on, Liam muttered his implant glowing brighter as he connected to the device on a stone table carved directly from the wall. It was a small induction forge powered by electricity produced from a generator on the ground. A machine he didn't have a direct engram of, but that didn't stop him from crafting one considering he knew of them and that the concept behind them was understood to him, and it was pretty basic. There still were trial and error as he wanted the best possible from the available resource at his disposition and this was the result. He couldn't do so many things at once, he was a very busy man after all. He had planned to add induction forges to the fabricator in miniaturized form and the future industrial forge. A forge he needed and wanted as it would let him melt all types of metal up to tungsten, purify them, do various alloys, and more not an exact copy from the engram as there will be modifications where he sees fit. The copper coil didn't change outwardly but Liam knew it was working with the soft hum of the forge and the constant feedback from its systems to his implant indicating the rapidly rising hertz the number of times the current passed within the coil per second, rapidly passing from 0 kHz to 90 kHz and stop at 95 kHz. He took a crucible that had seen better days and placed a steel cylinder inside before placing the hole with the help of a tong in the copper coil cooled down by extremely cold demineralized ultra-pure water flowing within thanks to a pump at the back of the forge. In a matter of seconds, the metal started to glow a bright red, then shift to orange and settle on a bright yellow as it deformed due to its weight and its abrupt change from a solid state to a liquid one. Smiling at the positive result Liam waited a little longer to then rapidly pick up the crucible with the tong to not have the poor tool melt and he proceeded to carefully pour the molten steel into three prism-shaped ceramic molds. This is vastly superior in speed than my other forges, level of heat exponentially higher, with great ease, control and precision but only certain materials can be melted with it and I can't really refine much with it. And it's portable. Could be useful in case of an emergency repair, he said matter-of-factly. All in all pleased with this new addition. He didn't bother with this type of forge for producing his titanium and many of this metal's alloys, its lack of refining capabilities being at fault. Titanium, the way he wanted it to be useful, needed to be refined, a lengthy, time-consuming, and complex process, even more, complicated with the sheer amount of carbon on this moon. Also, 
the reason why it is so pricey even if it isn't as rare as gold or platinum. The induction forge could heat things well and fast but forging was more, way more than this and some metal to be useful needed to be treated differently, just like cooking. Such as titanium as otherwise it would be brittle. But titanium wasn't what he had in mind for now, mentally commanding the device to increase the frequency to 150 kHz, this being basically equal to 2500 C degree, 4532 F degree for whatever metal needed to be melted within. A clean crucible appeared in the palm of his left hand and the millisecond after a thumb-sized nugget of raw pandorium slash unobtanium. One of the purest he had, doing the same as for the steel, and nothing happened. He waited a few seconds, seconds that turned into half a minute, and still nothing, frowning he decided to progressively increase the frequency such as increasing the temperature until it reached around 2900 C degree. 5,252 F degree. Ah finally. Lower than tungsten and way lower than element but extremely hot to be used all the same, he thought his earlier frown disappearing, his grey eyes locked onto the nugget of metal that was starting to glow a soft red to rapidly shift from orange to a bright yellow. Hey, shit. This is bad, his eyes widened ever so slightly, as he got feedback that the hertz emitted by the coil suddenly went ballistic. He instantly shut down the forge but that was of little use as cracking with electricity and heat the piece of metal glowed ever so brighter turning almost pure white. His mind instantly caught up on what was likely going to happen, his body moving in perfect tandem with his mind, a thick hardwood plank as large and tall as he was manifested from his inventory in front of him. It covered his entire frame and not even a few microseconds later with a bang the piece of metal exploded into more than a dozen small fragments each at minimum three times hotter than lava into the air at the speed of sound. The crucible didn't hold them, and neither did the copper coil as it was shredded apart the water flowing out in abandon. One fragment smashed into one of the bioluminescent mushrooms above turning the room dark as all others connected popped like balloons, four others flew all around digging deeply into the wall two more into the induction forge, another one into the generator fuel tank setting it ablaze in a small explosion turning the room bright and the four last embedded deeply into his makeshift shield. Shit, Liam swore as he let the shield go, not waiting for the fire to get worse he ran straight at it, and from his brightly glowing implant moist dirt from earlier work this morning on his small farm above was poured down on the blazing fire while he held his breath. It isn't that the fume and gas would be mortal to him but it smelled and tasted horrendous when it wasn't an intentional explosion. The effects were instantaneous as the fire, while intense and bright, was small and couldn't resist its source of oxygen getting cut off and the temperature shock getting poured down on it, cutting all of its access to oxygen. A few seconds later and nearly a hundred kilos worth of dirt and all the flames died. That didn't go as planned. Maybe putting the pandorium into an artificial magnetic field wasn't the brightest of ideas or it violently changed its polarity when entering fusion or both. Or something else, he mumbled looking down at the red-hot shard of the metal embedded into the wood plank, if he didn't react fast enough this could have been in his head or chest. Mistakes were made and will not be repeated but there weren't that many other options for him to learn about this metal. Asking the two scientists was and still is an option but not the wisest one since he did want their trust and this metal is the main source of conflict between humans and NA6. Showing an interest in it this early was not good even if he doesn't need hundreds upon hundreds of tons of it. And it wasn't even sure they knew about its intricacy, and not forgetting that it must be highly protected information, probably not even here. If it was, they likely wouldn't tell him. There needed to be some tact. At least I know at what temperatures needed for it to enter fusion but that's the tip of the iceberg of what I need and, he paused, his eyes trailing over the destroyed induction forge and generator, probably will need to fix you too as well. Day 155 A few hundred meters away from Liam in half of his titanium armor, the upper body part except helmet because it was very hot today, and he was holding a roasted seasoned half-eaten sting bat's leg in his right hand taking the last few bites of it he cracked it slightly then threw it behind into the air. It was caught mid-fall by the glassy claws of Occident who immediately flew atop the base's wall to gorge itself with the remaining scraps of meat still attached to the bone. 
when nothing remained it used the top of the wall as leverage to crack open the bone with the earlier damage Liam had done and gorge itself onto the juicy bone marrow. While this was happening Liam worked on the turret at his feet, a daily checkup to see if nothing was wrong, and also to reload them if necessary. It rarely ever happened since having them constantly shoot whatever entered their radar was simply a waste of resources, and dangerous, and having to reload them every day was a pain. At first, it was the case but his training of their algorithms didn't stop after the drone incident. In fact, such accidents wouldn't happen anymore. He has a big enough digital database of the fauna to have targets put on exterminate and others on spare the life with a dozen other variables such as the presence of the pinging rings on his tames. He could also use them to shoot a target with his will if he was in a 100 meter, 328 feet, radius of the turret not due to the turret's signal limitations, but because it required he mentally aimed the turret if the target didn't correspond to the one put on exterminate and aiming like this was quite a bit more complicated when you don't have the turret or target in sight. He could also change their focus to a different target or stop them from firing. It was, strange, addicting in a way to be able to wield technology as if it was an extension of his body but again it was only the technology he created specifically to be used by him this way. It was in no way magical and these turrets didn't make him some kind of god or more resistant to a bullet to the head from a sniper kilometers away, or orbital bombardment. Their main targets, shot after 10 seconds of wait to avoid wasted bullets were viper wolves and slinths as the main targets and in some cases if alone or in small group sting bats. Herbivore being avoided as for most way bigger caliber bullets were necessary and he didn't want a stampede. Herbivores are way more dangerous than carnivores in his opinion, at least in his current situation and from his first day experiences. Having killing machines was fun and all but if there weren't any failsafe this could lead to grievous consequences if some natives became too curious and tried to poke at it. Or enter its 150 meters, 482 feet, line of sight for a bit too long. Or the earlier case of stampeding, his walls, while they are strong, made of clay, stone, bones, and wood, still wouldn't hold much of a chance against hundreds of enraged elephant-sized creatures. As if on Q3 dots entered his peripheral vision, he stopped all of what he was doing as his head snapped in the dots' direction, his pupils narrowed almost to the point one might think he had a grave case of meiosis. The three were farther down the plane, the bigger greenish-gray with six legs, he recognized it, it was a poly or in English a dire horse not that he knew of this name in that language. The two other dots were smaller, thinner, and bluer, these were an avis, one male and one female. Easily told differences by how one was less nude than the others. He wasn't surprised one of his tetrapterodon had noticed a big clan arriving from quite a few days away by foot a few days ago but he didn't truly pay more attention than necessary and that mining was out when a clan arrived and some areas became no zones too, he couldn't bother himself with every clan under the suns. If he investigated every NA6 clan big or small that moved in the plains he might as well abandon every other project he had and go play the hippie with them. Knowing their general migratory routes, where they are, where they are going, and how many they are good enough, that didn't mean he didn't search for more but even with eight pairs of eyes in the sky he was far from being remotely omniscient. Frowning he brought a spyglass from his inventory and looked through it, he recognized them, the two geniuses that thought going out in the middle of the night was a good idea. And they weren't far from another turret but that wasn't a problem unless he seriously messed up the programming and if it was the case those two would have been long since dead. The consequences wouldn't be as light as the drone. What were those two teens' names again, right the boy is Myruk and the girl is Tuti, Liam wondered, after a few seconds of internal debate, whether or not going to talk to them was worth it. But something made it all the clearer the answer was yes, Tuti was walking towards the turret, calling over her boyfriend, as he supposed it was what they were or at least the NA6 equivalent. Myruk approached dragging the reluctant dire horse by its leash and the two NA6 marveled at the turret turning all around it, sometimes poking it with a stick, or probing it with their fingers. Talking together enthusiastically as the barrel moved around, keeping track of their movement, the red laser tracking each of their heads caused them to laugh at each other over gaining third eyes. 
while in truth it was the auto turret's subroutine system running over and over to make sure that those two weren't to exterminate. The two teenagers were so detached from the world surrounding them that neither noticed Liam approaching and arriving right behind or Oxiden landing on the man's armored shoulder right after. I guess a demonstration as to why turrets aren't toys is needed. Even if they don't know what it even is, he thought with a smirk growing. The turret stopped moving all of a sudden, confusing the NA6 as the strange creature froze, then it flicked its head up and a loud bang echoed, loud enough to force the two to plug their ears folded backward and the dire horse drinking the nectar of a flower nearby jerked in panic. This isn't toy, dangerous. Why you two T and my ruck here? Alone, without adults, Liam questioned, middle amused but serious all the same after the two unplugged their ears and glared at the turret, his voice caused them to freeze. My Ruck, who was on his way to kick the hard metal feet of the turret with his bare feet. He froze at Liam's voice, but the momentum of the kick remained, he comically slipped before face planting in the grass. Tuti on her side slowly turned her head to be met with the head of the lost child then her gaze moved to his shoulder where a creature she only knew as shy and fearful glared at something behind her, the dire horse she immediately guessed. The lost child, and their savior, snorted in amusement before asking again, with one of his hair tufts above his eyes raised. And a hand scratching the bird's neck calming it down almost immediately. Chapter 35 Prospect of Prosthetic You can speak our language. How did you learn? Can you tell me who taught it to you, Tuti exclaimed excitedly, zapping the lost child's questions in her excitement while Myruk propped himself up and froze yet again at the realization the one they were looking for found them. Not only that but creep right behind them because they were focusing excessively on something new and strange but ultimately quite minor. The fact it could have been a predator, instead, one that could have killed or mortally injured one of them. It was a bone-chilling realization and even if Myruk didn't want to admit it, the words of his father were right, he was an immature, reckless and stupid brat that needed to grow up, and fast because the entire clan needed him to. But that was why he was here as well. Learned from a wandering artist in exchange for knowledge and for third times why here alone and not in clan? And no weapons too, tiny daggers don't count, the lost child asked for the umpteenth time a motion of his hand indicating the two to follow him, which they promptly, and happily did. The dire horse followed as well. I. We want. No. It's to warn you that the Tsakarams of the Tipani and Omatakea clans will arrive to meet and. Judge you, Tuti explained the grand line and Liam stopped walking for half a second before continuing. For what? When and where? Liam asked, his voice deeper each word leaving his lips to a point it sounded almost like a growl but it didn't register in any of the teens. He wasn't pleased with this news but again it was a future he fully expected to happen, particularly after his short and trippy mental meeting with the All-Mother. Actions and mistakes have consequences be they positive or negative. He knew of the Tsahiks and their students the Tsakarams thanks to Tsumong, how those men and women held an extremely deep connection with Iwa some in legend even capable of hearing her omnipresent heartbeat from anywhere. Words of his existence would have and have spread, if not by Iwa then by the NA6. A reality known since he saved the two kids, actions had consequences. Good one in particular but it wasn't the case here as even if he didn't save them the NA6 would have found him by tracking the two blood and footprints. To see your true nature, the lost child's nature, if you are evil and to be dealt with like the other sky people. Where and when I'm not sure but as soon as my great-grandmother, the Tsahik. And the two come out of the sacred hollow, Tuti let out, her tail straighter and ear folded. She was furious at the mention of some thinking of him being evil and needing to be slain like some kind of rabid animal. It was heartwarming in a way. Hey, can't say I'm surprised they think of me like this, not even angry. Unpleasant nonetheless, and sacred hollow, is that the name of the hole that led safely underground? Likely. Good thing I collected all the red silicon a week ago but traces of my passage are still there. And the tree will tell them as well, Liam thought, while the closed gateway of his base entered his line of sight. The teens moved fast, 
capable of keeping with his normal walking pace. By virtue of their longer strides possible with how freakishly tall they were, and they were taller than the last time he saw them. Even this young both were past the two meter, 6.6 .6 feet, mark by a head or two. Though they were featherweight and pretty much matchsticks so probably plenty weaker than the average trained human. And with this, he also learned to his pleasant surprise that Tuti was the great-granddaughter of Atsahik, a very good piece of news that compensated for the bad ones. She might even be the current Tsakaram, a very young one. Why she wasn't down there with the other he didn't know. He didn't want to use her O.R. Myruk either as the kid seemed pretty important himself with his seemingly son-father relation to the N.A. 6 with the nose bone, which was himself likely an Oloik Tan. The term use might be a bit much though, yet. There was no need to sugarcoat it, and if he could secure peace for himself then he would, even if it means playing the manipulator to get it. He truly hated politics in all of its forms but saying it wasn't necessary for having some sense of stability when in proximity to other powers was an utter lie. The meeting as well. Liam could foresee it would essentially be a political one of extreme importance where most of the odds were stacked against him if he didn't want to start a manhunt with him as the target, not that he particularly feared for his life but he didn't want to have his hand forced to be tainted with more blood. The Omatakea and Tippany were the most affected by the RDA with the first clan at the top in terms of violence received by said company. He didn't expect them to be friendly or reasonable with him for that matter, even if he was the lost child and they would connect to the Tree of Divergence, to learn more about him. Iwa was their goddess, and mother, not their master. Liam was certain she could with minimal effort make it be the case though, but free wills, or at least freedom of choices was of the utmost importance here. It will never happen unless they truly force her equivalents for hands like he suppose happened in the past. She wasn't an A6 or human, her goals, or more precisely the paths to achieve them, were unknown, beyond mortal comprehension. And he was sure he was within them, to his dissatisfaction but also a relief. He thought of her in a way similar to the mythological Gaia. Ironically enough, extremely powerful but practically never intervened personally due to personal beliefs and slash or interests. If Iwa wanted all the humans on Pandora dead, they would have all already been dead. She was the All-Mother, everything from microorganisms to the biggest of beasts was part of her, though ultimately the RDA would just have chucked one or two big space rocks in retaliation and all life on this ball of dirt would be gone. Anyway, he didn't know what she would divulge about him, but in any case, he could think it would be vague as NA6 didn't seem to hear her voice as clearly as he did. Liam wildly guessed that it must be related to how sensible they are to the psychic energy and a plethora of more factors. Overall, it was bad, very bad but not the worse it could get. He had a lot in his favor as well, such as the two teens and probably their families if they had some drop of honor of which he was sure they had in plenty and as such would back him up. There was also the Slintha's bone with the Anure symbol carved on it that proved one of them was friends with him and that he would be welcomed. Not forgetting his tames of which he could omit some of the truth of how he gained their loyalty and obedience. And finally, the seed from the tree of soul, but the last would either result in either immediate violence or peace, no in between. A risk he wasn't willing to take unless there were no other options left and it turned for the worst. Then violence he would give. He was kind to others and he will help if he can within reason but he lacked mercy when it came to matters of his survival. Thank you for warning me, you saved lives. I'm very grateful to you too, the lost child thanked and praised them and the words from their savior did have a big impact if how both immediately cheered was any indicator. Kids. They don't realize how important this is, Liam thought briefly, he was truly grateful to the two for this information but their acts of almost fanboyism in his presence made him slightly uncomfortable. Uncomfortableness he didn't show. But it was far better feeling slightly uncomfortable than them feeling fear in his presence, something that to a degree he reckoned they should. Even if he saved them, mended the injury of one, fed them, and gave them a place to rest, he was still a dangerous and complete stranger with unknown motives. If it was naivety, how an A6 thought, both, or something else he couldn't precisely tell. 
maybe he was just projecting how he would have felt in their place. And they were teens, non-human teens with worldviews completely alien to him. Does anyone know you two are here? To know if more will come, he asked, and Myrock answered instantly with a toothy grin that didn't hide any of his inhumanly long white canines, another fact he remarked NA6 seemed to always have white teeth, not that he was different in that regard. Yes savior. A group of hunters sent by father accompanied us here, we were safe while on our way and still are in your presence. Meryl, Artsahik agreed as well, we needed to warn you of what is to come. It was my... No, mine, and to T's idea in the first place too, Myrock said proudly waving his one good hand in the air. A detail that Liam noticed earlier, the kid only seemed to use his right hand and he even hid his left in a garment weaved of plant fiber. The lost child warned, confusing the NA6. The six-legged horse was left behind to drink the nectar from the field of exotically shaped and colored flowers. Arriving in front of the giant door Liam pushed it completely open without much effort in front of the amazed gaze of the teens. All were met with the great ostropede mentioned earlier, it was rolled on its back and sleeping like a log. At this moment three distinct reactions could be seen, primal terror from Tuti, astonishment mixed with fear and excitement from Myrock, and a deadpan from Liam. The human whistled but the great ostropede didn't react. A smirk grew on the lost child's face as he approached. To the growing horror of both NA6 who cried out for him to come back and run, of course, he ignored the two. Their voices were not able to wake up the sleeping bird either. With his left hand hidden by his torso Liam brought from his inventory an iron truffle. The scent wafted in the air, Gladius' eyes snapped open, and immediately after that Liam threw the truffle at the other side of his base. The murder chicken looked out in shock as the snack flew before scrambling on its two legs and pursuing the flying delicacy. This is Gladius, not worry. Gladius is good. I hatched it, bonded with it, same for this one, this one name is Oxidan and a few more. You can recognize them by jewelry on their bodies, he explained with a chuckle pointing a finger at Oxidan still perched on his shoulder and then at the bracelet on its leg. This snapped the teens to reality. A few minutes of further explanation from Liam later reassured the two that Gladius was not a danger and a good bird, as long as he was here and they didn't annoy it. Or that the great ostropede had a random mood swing but the last part went unsaid. He also briefly explained how he got his hand on the egg and that it wasn't earned easily. This is awesome, Tuti spoke about you hunting a saltspring on yours. I knew it was the truth. Can I pet, or even ride it? The male NA6 exclaimed, not even waiting for Liam to answer and as if all his fear was gone he ran, no sprinted toward Gladius right in front of Tuti's horrified gaze. The great ostropede noticed the NA6 and lazily, without much care, swiped its left bio-steel claw at him. It would have cut his chest open like a hot knife through butter and splayed his organs on the ground like the candies inside a broken piñata that is if nobody intervened. Father didn't order it to stop and the bird knew why, a lesson for the impudent lower being. So Gladius didn't put much heart into it, the blue creature wasn't even worth the energy, otherwise, the hit would have been fast, efficient, and deadly. Oxidan took off. Then the lost child snapped into action. He moved, and he moved fast faster than any hunters or creatures Tuti had ever seen as if he was the wind incarnate. She couldn't even tell how he moved from one point to another, only the deep footprint left behind in the compacted soil told he ever was there. Liam grabbed Myrock's shoulder and yanked him back before the claw eviscerated the teen. Relief flooded Tuti and Myrock blinked in confusion as the human let him go and he stumbled back to then be met with the narrowed silvery-gray eyes of the lost child. The human's voice then echoed into the NA6 ears, anger all too clear for the teen to hear, Myrock realized he might have screwed up big time, fucking suicidal little shit. No, and I forbid you to ever approach Gladius Star. This place is safe but it isn't your playground, you're a guest. Make sure to remember that, do not touch what is not yours without my permission. I I. I'm sorry, Myrock said meekly at the merited scolding, ears folded backward, tail between his legs, 
and looking at the ground as if to hide himself. The problem was he was taller than Liam and it didn't hide anything, it did the opposite in fact. But the human didn't feel any pity. Moran. Do you really want to get hurt that badly again? Tuti interjected, pissed off at her friend's actions, her first word low but not enough for Liam or Myra to not have heard, the human didn't know what it meant but surely something synonymous to idiot. No problem, I forgive him, just don't be moron again, this too goes for you, Tuti. You two are similar in many ways, a lesson for one is a lesson for both. Speaking of hurt, show me left hand, Myrock, Liam said calmly. Both nodded and Myrock did as asked without hesitation, showing his greatest shame. Liam then told him to sit and the inspection of the limb started. This looks bad but at least it healed well enough. Scars are better than necrosis of tissue or worse. Hum even if he is a little brat. I can help and it will help me as well. I will have done it either way but better to gain brownies points where I can, Liam thought while critically analyzing the left hand. Under Tuti's fascinated gaze he used both of his eyes and hands, asking Myrock at times to move the remaining two digits, the little finger and the annular to see if they worked. And also the right one to get a good grasp on how a healthy NA6's hand should be, from muscles, tendons, and bone structures. Liam brought a measuring tape from his inventory, using his pocket to hide how it magically appeared in his left hand. He took measures of both of the boy's hands. He wasn't using any conventional measuring unit but it worked just fine and was close enough to the metric system for him. If a humanity from thousands of years in the future was still using it, with slight modifications to fit their better understanding of reality, then there were good reasons for it to be the case. He was no doctor or biologist but that didn't make him inept in biology, more precisely a small part of it. Here it was the simple biomechanics of how the structure of a hand let it do what hands do, and a six hands being really human-like only helped. One digit less made it even simpler. Why are you doing this? It isn't for any further healing. Why, to tease curiosity won over and she asked. The lost child answered with a smile. Prusetetic? What an Iwas name is that? Some kind of food. Myrock let out in confusion. Liam said confidently, the smile not disappearing, it didn't help either of the two understand other than it will be important. Chapter 36 Private Comms Day 157 Sitting on a flat stone the fresh breeze of the sea in his beard and hair Liam was carving a piece of wood, one that was similar in texture and color to the highest quality white ebony. Various beautifully carved pieces of such wood could be seen next to him in metal boxes filled with clear liquid, a sort of glue that will protect the wood from rots, humidity, and other hazards. Each piece independently didn't look like anything as they were either part of a thumb or an index finger. Evidently, it was part of the prosthetic for Myrock, the wood shell to be precise, currently in the process of being carved to be treated, then polished, and treated again to then be modified again such as adding faux nails and grip pads. The use of metal being heavily frowned upon if not outright considered a capital sin by the NA6 means the outside and part that could be seen will be 100% non-metal, the inside will be completely different and was the more complicated and technical part. It will be a microcomputer connected to sensors all around that will activate the motor to move the titanium bone and tendon of the prosthetic digits following the muscle, tendons and bones movement of the left hand and left forearm. Ultimately nothing grandiose, it wasn't connected to the nervous system or anything. The fingers will grips, release, partially rotate L, extend each of the phalanx to a certain degree, and the like. Pretty much all of what those two digits if healthy and not missing could do. It will be powered by two small self-recharging hydrogen batteries while also being entirely waterproof, the last part was simple as the bone used had hydrophobic quality. The two batteries are designed to never work together as while one powers everything the other is recharging. The fact the outside was made of wood was a minor inconvenience that would affect its efficiency and durability but he was limited in the first place it was half of a hand that needed to be done, one that would be superior to the real deal in power but not dexterity. In any case, 
this wasn't going to be the last for Myruk as he will grow out of it. It was only the first one Liam was making, he was going to improve on his craft. And if he wanted to do a powerful prosthetic for the kid, the entire arm with the shoulder blade needed to go. Simple as that. A surgical procedure he couldn't and didn't want to do and doubted the teen would want either. Even if the idea of making a cyborg was exciting in its own way. Anyway, he started working on that right after the two left, the time passed talking with them was pleasant and interesting as his supposition of who the two were was found to be correct by him asking what is their clans and their status. Tuti was a Tsakaram, the student of the Tsahik, the Olangi clan spiritual leader and healer while Myruk was the son of the Olangi clan Oloiktan, the chief. The Olangi is one of the major clans in terms of cultural importance and influence. Liam was certain now it wasn't only a coincidence and luck that led the two to run at his base months ago, Iwa was involved in it, to a large degree. That he was confident of, maybe it was paranoia but there never was enough of it when the local omnipresent deity was involved. Even if said deity didn't hold any direct malicious intentions. He was an anomaly that appeared in her world by unknown means, investigating him in all aspects was the bare minimum. I think too much of this while I can't do shit about anything, it's unproductive, Liam thought his mind's worries segueing from the planetary hive mind to his own hive mind, focusing on Orion that was a good bit more than half a hundred kilometers away from his current location. He sent the female Tetrapteron, the calmest of the four, with the two teens to be constantly informed in real time. He gave them a few instructions too, Orion was not a pet and trying to play with it will end in the loss of fingers, and the teens will do the OK gesture to the bird when the Tsakarams were out of their cave, and a thumb up when they are on their way to meet him. And both took it as a mission to not fail at any cost, frankly, it was more to humor them than anything. Orion was smart, smart enough to know what it must do but it made things simpler. He sent Septon as well to cover the general area the Olangi clan took the camp and collect information. Cracking his neck, Liam stored everything within his hands in his inventory while data input traveled from the drone phone to his implant, it was time. He mentally commended the new metallic lid of the camera to slip open. His silvery-gray eyes instantly lock on the screen flickering to life placed right below it. Hum greeting Max, where is Grace? Liam asked curiously about the evident lack of a certain feisty scientist while his eyes studied the scientist's expression and micro-expressions. He noticed the man was slimmer as well, good for Max but unimportant to him. Micro-expression, Liam could notice most of them but was still unfamiliar with a lot, he could do such due to him perceiving the world slower virtue of him simply being able to think faster, better and, more efficiently. Adding to that his overall greater senses made this action even simpler. It was creepy, in a way. But very useful even if it needed practice. It didn't hit that much with the NA6 as he wasn't the most familiar with their expression, even if human-like so it seemed normal and they seemed to be not as slow in general, like cats. An apt comparison considering they pretty much were the mix of cat and elf with blue dye. But with other humans it was perturbing, many details he couldn't even have remarked before were plain for him to see now, from the micro-twitch of a muscle to the minute change in the iris of an eye. If his physical strength and a plethora of other characteristics of his weren't indicators enough of how far above he was from the average Joe, it was painfully obvious how inhuman he was. But it was because of this he was alive so he could but do one thing, embrace it as it would be this way, for whatever how long he will live. Only a suicidal idiot would reject who they are simply due to their own hubris. He was who he was, no matter what he might become or what he might have been, as long as he doesn't forget who he is. Max Patel's expressions were composed and weary. Liam could see traces of uncomfortableness, nervousness, almost to the point of fear, and a hint of anger but the last part wasn't because of him. A nervousness that was usual for Liam to see from this scientist, and easy to deduce he was the reason. Coughing Max waved in greeting before explaining the current situation at hand, making a snarky comment first. Thank you for asking, I'm fine. Grace is currently occupied with Selfridge and from what I got it's about a shift of personnel within the Avatar program. One that she wasn't informed about. 
why it's the case. I don't have a clue but the last time I saw her she was. Furious to say the least. Nodding Liam had already an inkling of who this sudden new personnel was for the Avatar program, the crippled guy. Speaking of said program he didn't know much about it outside of the fact there was a driver and Avatar, NA6 and human hybrid that were piloted by the earlier mentioned driver. And the one at the current head was Grace, Max was a member of the various teams she had under her wings. If he was in her place and something like this were to happen, he could understand that it might cause a few blood vessels to pop. Did you manage to do what I asked last time, Liam inquired, his implant hidden behind the bandages glowing slightly brighter. Max on the other side nodded before showing an old fancy watch with intricate if damaged Sanskrit carving, then a second similar one but without any carvings. This earned a smile from Liam who only inquired further, good. I presume the second is for grace, and might I know the frequency on which they are operating? And what can I anticipate they do? Straight to the point as always hey, Max mumbled under his breath and informed his interlocutor of every piece of information Liam may need. Such as the frequency, one taken from a destroyed link unit, the bed used to drive Avatar, a frequency that was locked and unchangeable. The link unit was destroyed years ago during a NA6 attack on the link shack it was, a type of infrastructure capable of housing humans light enough to be moved around by a Samson. And the functions of those two watches, they essentially were smart watches but with a tactile holographic function added on top, pretty a smartphone you attach to your wrist but with less power and memories. Ones to be used that needed the user biometrics such as face recognition, retina scanner, or the classic fingerprint scanner. From what Max told those were antique watches, at least 90 years old from an old long since gone company named Nokia, which at the mention earned a snicker and a moment of disbelief from Liam. Max didn't understand why there was such a reaction and decided to put it on the man not being the sanest of individuals on Pandora's surface. Something that was arguably true. Those two watches are Max's own, brought from Earth with the small amount of cargo allowed aboard the ISV. They are family heirlooms and as such held quite a significant sentimental value to him. All of their data was purged for what Liam asked, which he expected his gratitude over but ultimately it didn't matter as their data were copied on other devices. You can turn them on, Liam asserted calmly, his implant glowing brighter and brighter almost to the point it could be seen through the layers of tissue bandage almost. He was focusing on the drone phone, to use it as an intermediary. Liam's implant could only connect to machines made or modified to be connected to it but that didn't stop him from cheating such as presently. Using a tool to use a tool. Liam added the new parameter while keeping the last, having modified the drone phone for everything to go smoothly. He didn't like faulty tools or anything he deemed faulty for that matter, perfection was unreachable but that equate to not thriving for the closest to it. Max did as asked and waited in clear confusion. He didn't have a single clue of what Liam was going to do, or how, or what even if he had several guesses. Not for the fault of not holding on to questions, the man decided to play mysterious and said wait, you will see. A connection was made with the X-Drone N5 to the two smart watches, it was shown by a green beep at the right top, Max accepted immediately then five seconds later appeared a light blue downloading bar with a 3D model of metallic prism that had in its middle an ethereal core glowing an intense ethereal white above. It looked alien. All happened fast and without asking for any authorization of any kind for it to be downloaded. Or any warning for that matter. It simply did. Max's first thoughts were that it was some kind of malware and he was right to a degree if the growing smirk on Liam's face was any indicator. This is benign, it's just a software I developed. Though it's just the first version and it will likely need to be updated. And don't worry, it's not like there will be a point in me doing something that will damage or destroy those watches, Liam reassured, it was the truth even if he was essentially hijacking the two watches. I named it Overseer and it will be used for us to communicate with more ease from what we do here to pretty much everything a smartphone can do. I'm reformatting the watch for it to operate as I have intended, he added. Wait. How are you even doing this, Max said, flabbergasted by it all, 
his eyes switching from smart watches where the screen and holograms were ever shifting to Liam. Wait, he dismissed Max and like this nearly five minutes passed without him blinking as he stared into empty air, his left hand out of the camera's sight but the way his shoulder was oriented indicated it in his line of sight. His silver-gray eyes narrowed or dilated at seemingly random intervals but each corroborated to changements on the smartwatch's screens, and Max was getting creeped out due to how freaky it was almost like the various human-like robots back on Earth and he was also starting to worry but just as he was going to break the silence Liam blinked repeatedly before taking a deep breath. Then he said groggily, You are g sorry got a bit lost here in my thoughts. Be back in a bit. And the call suddenly stopped. Max blinked in incredulity as everything from N5 was cut off and the hollow tablet turned grey. What the actual fuck was that, Max thought he would have liked having the time to compose himself but the two watches screens started to blink and the call started without him accepting it, again. I'm back, my excuses for everything that happened but I never did that before, Max almost threw both watches against a wall in surprise due to the sudden appearance of two low-quality holographic 2D images of Liam that looked both in random directions and then his voice echoing in double. Hmm, the volume is a bit too loud and the hologram function is not quite discreet. Any questions you might have, Liam mumbled and asked, the volume lowering with the luminosity of the hologram while the one without the Sanskrit carving passed into sleep mode. No. And frankly, it's more Grace's thing, Max lied, something Liam instantly noticed but didn't point out as both knew the other knew. The scientist had so many questions right now but he couldn't ask any of them, it was like a block, a mental block. Understandable. Again, I apologize for what happened, and if any questions may arise do not hesitate to text me via this software. Goodbye, Liam said with a frown. If it was of displeasure, annoyance, or something Max didn't know but after he said his goodbye as well he sighed in relief. Maybe a genetically engineered individual isn't the answer as to what he is. Only a real life meeting will tell and if he is okay to be examined, the scientist mumbled, he felt drained of every bit of his energy. Unknown to him the microphones of both watches were still on and recording every sound. I think a bit of both, Max. Probably. I'm not even fucking sure myself, Liam thought looking down at his implant for a brief instant before packing everything up. His head turned to see a flock of Dorade Verde flying, chirping, playing with one another, and surfing the wind above the waves of the coast, sometimes scooping strange fish in their beaks. The next second a giant shadow manifested below them, then it breached the water's surface, a giant mouth full of teeth as long as Liam was tall anchored on a gargantuan mouth itself attached to a large head with one pair of black beady eyes committed but all seemed compared to its body. An armored muscular monster of a creature with four pectoral flippers that is similar and superior in bulk to a blue whale. A literal leviathan. The flock had seen it arrive and flew higher in response, nearly as high as the cliff he was on but that wasn't enough, the shark-like creature jumped out of the water. And it jumped high. Higher than its size and weight would let one thing almost flying and with a wide open maw it gulped a dozen of the Dorado Verdant before falling back with a gigantic boom of foam and waves into the sea. I want one, were the immediate words that escaped Liam's lips but it wasn't for now as disappointing as it was, he has more important things to do. Though the idea and want were here, it's not like exploring the depth of the oceans and seas of this moon won't be part of the future. It's just not for now and that's beside the point of managing to tame such a creature. Chapter 37 Lost Child Fucking bit asterisk H, Parker Selfridge the highest placed RDA official on Pandora, and a thin Caucasian man, cursed right after Dr. Grace Augustine left his office as he slammed his fist on his desk to wince at the sudden influx of pain from his hand. It wasn't even his fault if one of the scientists was idiotic enough to die in a mugging of all things, it's not like this brilliant scientist couldn't afford bodyguards, be they organic or not. It placed great doubt on this said scientist's supposed intellect. What does she want him to do? Magic the scientist back to life? Clearly, as of now, it's not out of the RDA capabilities with the recent research and success in digitizing memories and personality on physical copy called Soul Drive, 
the problem was it was still in the testing phase when Tom Sully died. And to save the billions that were siphoned in the investment of this dead man the RDA took the second-hand option, a crippled Marine, Jake, Tom's twin brother. Their similar genetics was the only reason. The sudden death and replacement of one of her future team members was the reason she was beyond mad which he found understandable but the way she reacted was still completely blown out of proportion in his opinion. But either way, it wasn't surprising for her, and there was something else that she seemed pissed off about before she entered his office. He knew her for nearly three decades, and even if he despised her he knew a lot about this woman for several weeks she had a sudden shift in priority. One she kept from mentioning. She had found something and he let her do as she pleased until he deemed enough time had passed and she showed results but it seemed fairly important. Though if this fairly important for her was the same for him he didn't know, she was fascinated more by alien grass than anything else after all. They did hold very different priorities, but alas for her he is the RDA administrator of this dirt ball full of savages. She might need another wake-up call on what was truly important and who was letting her do her research. You truly managed to piss her off right there. I think the only time I saw her nearly this peeved off was after the shooting of her school pet project or when you said her to fuck off after she asked you to help for some disease affecting the blue monkeys, Miles Quaritch the RDA security commander and Selfridge's right-hand man, an old muscular man with short grizzled hair and scars adorning his arms and side head said amusedly as he entered his boss office. Pissy scientist aside. Can I get an overview of the new recruits, the old colonel asked, earning an affirmative glance from Parker. He took his job relatively seriously, particularly about the lives of men and women under him. That didn't mean he will succeed in keeping all of them alive but that's part of the job, and death was low for those brave, insane, or desperate enough to voluntarily be dragged to Pandora by the RDA. The only way of effectively and reliably communicating with Earth is either by sending messages directly through the ISV Venture Star, which took an extremely long time due to the travel time of the spaceship, or the use of superluminal communications, a type of device that gives the middle finger to the theory of relativity as it permits information to travel faster than light by the use of an oscillating magnetic field but to send one bit it costs $7,500 and it's only three per hour. For example, a pixel of a random picture is 24 bits. While interesting it was a very invective device whose only real use was to send or receive extremely short encoded messages, such as emergency ones. And the reason why it was only now the new information reached Hell's Gate. Day 167 The last few days for Liam had been calm, he worked as usual, collected resources or created ones, and took care of his garden, and Thames not forgetting the slinger's head, which for the first five days after its capture refused to eat and lost a significant amount of weight but it slowly changed resulting in it now, while lighter than before not to the point of starvation. And it was less hostile but nothing worth noting. He crafted a lot as well, up to now he has a bit more than half a thousand bullets of all kinds combined, several dozen explosives from fragmentation, toxic gases and incendiary grenades, to more than a hundred explosive arrows. All of it is done through a slow and tedious process that will lead to many deaths but a necessary one. And it wasn't enough. Most of the earlier mentioned bullets were for the turrets and to have those arrows capable of blowing off the helicopter's rotor blades he needed the hyperdense oil found at the Tree of Souls down below. An oil he was certain to collect more another meeting with the All-Mother will be necessary, to avoid unnecessary problems. Iwa won't probably care if he took a ton of such liquid but the NA6 certainly will, friends or not. He already had an idea of what to bargain for, he didn't need this oil to power his machines truly, and if he wanted something really potent he would go for nuclear, it's a better source of energy. Though he neither did have uranium or thorium, or any other such material at his disposal, the regular heavy crude oil from the roots and the self-recharging hydrogen batteries would do for now. He wasn't powering an entire city after all. Some of his crafts were designed to be usable by his tetrapterons as well, four grenade pouches containing, well, grenades, the tetrapterons being capable of pulling the pin and dropping them from the sky. Or potentially even place C4, or something akin to that, 
and them off in the future, or even potentially extremely powerful EMP if he cracked the secrets of the Pandorium. Not forgetting a multipurpose pair of metallic claws that pretty much was a Swiss military knife. And for his great ostropede, a saddle was out for the moment, he wanted to grow and avoid potential injuries but adding one or two automatic turrets on its armor was already a possibility. Evidently, it was enough to defend himself against most NA6 clans and creatures of Pandora not enough for the war that is to come. Other than this he communicated with the two scientists on an almost daily basis thanks to the program overseer. For all of those days, there were no face calls, however, there were a few short voice calls and a lot of text messages. That was only received and answered when he wasn't in his base noting that his base wasn't the best location for long-distance transmission in the first place thanks to Pandora's soil. The program in itself was just like any group chat application from his old world such as WhatsApp but upgraded and pushed for maximum effectiveness and ease of use. As such it wasn't surprising it had access to everything of the watches and could use its recording functions without consent. He wasn't proud of this function, slightly disgusted even the name of the program wasn't chosen by pure hazard. But paranoia was of utmost importance and in general having a way to spy on others was always a plus. And he seriously doubted either of the two was naive enough to not believe or stupid enough to not know with all the clues he gave that he hadn't put in such measures. He asked them to give them blank slates for him to modify as he pleased. Anyone with two working brain cells would have, and to be fair the camera, microphone, and various other sensors such as the one to moderate the wearer's heartbeat were, while functional, in dire need of restoration. The image quality was trash and the range of the microphone for anything better than intangible white noise was barely around 2 meters, 6 feet 6. And also sometimes data was simply lost or corrupted thanks to various outside interferences. It was a miracle in itself that most of the two watches' original functions worked relatively fine, to begin with. And from what Max further said they endured a lot, one that by the scientist's words even saved his great-great-grandfather from a bullet to the heart because he forgot he left his watch there. If it was true or not Liam cared little, in all cases what could be taken from all of this was it made things easier for everything related to communicating with the two scientists though it could be improved on his side too, the drone phone was not good by any means, an ineffective design that will need rectification. Currently, Gladius had its two pairs of eyes hyper-focused on the ground where if you squinted and had a bit of imagination you could almost decipher Arabic numbers. The great ostropede caught in frustration. 8 multiplicated by 7 and add 7, it's easy, Gladius. You can do it, Liam encouraged his great ostropede who was evidently, in the middle of doing basic calculus that 99% of NA6 wouldn't even be able to begin to understand. What Liam was doing by itself didn't hold much value, Gladius wasn't going to be a mathematician or anything of the like. But it stimulated the beast's brain and it only cost the human a few minutes of his day, and being able to count was always a nice skill to have. Gladius suddenly tensed as input from the hive mind came. Fucking finally they out. I thought they died, its father said aloud, cracking his neck as he stood up, he had waited longer than he anticipated, not that he complained it gave him more time to prepare but it was stressing him for one of the reasons he just mentioned. Having them die even if it wasn't his fault was bad, unreasonable individuals weren't exclusive to humans so being blamed for such a tragedy wouldn't be out of his expectation. It was exactly the type of scenario he would expect to unfold. A few hours later within the Great Plain, flying slowly and close to the ground was a mountain banshee. A creature that in normal circumstances wouldn't be found here. Riding it was a female NA6, the Tsakaram of the Omatakea clan. Her face was calm, yet her eyes didn't hide the internal conflicts she was having since the Tsahalo with the Tree of Divergence. Many pieces of information, most fragmented and too complex or simply incomprehensible, were given a lot she couldn't even begin to comprehend. However, what confirmed was the supposed what of what was the lost child, an anomaly, an unknown, something that had never been seen before by the Iwa. Someone alone and lost who suddenly came into existence, someone young, barely older than an infant. It should be impossible, 
insane even but it was the truth. She suddenly snapped her head to the right as a blue and purple tetrapteron flew past her banshee at incredible speed, a speed that would have easily outpaced her mount at full speed without diving. Blinking in surprise at this caused her mount, seize, to grunt in annoyance and it brought her back to why she was here. In front of her eyes was a lush tree standing up like a sore thumb within the plain imprisoned by walls upon wall composed of the ground and dead vegetation while in front stood a double gate. Veering toward the ground she commanded her mount to land and it did so. She hopped off her mount before approaching her fellow Tsakaram that did as she did. He dismounted his mount as well, a young then ate her he raised himself, one of the many he raised. He was a bulky male wearing a head medallion holding the sign of the Tippany, his clan, a shield. It signifies they were warriors, and hunters but protectors first and foremost. Behind him was a small group riding dire horses, within them was the Tsahik with her student, the Oloitkin with his son, and two of the most able-bodied hunters. All from the Olangi clan. Uh, where all of this creature that made loud noises go, Myruk wondered, it was something he noticed earlier but though the lost child had displaced them closer to his home, he still didn't see any. Probably hidden he guessed. Two T sitting behind him also noticed this but neither of the teens voiced it out or even informed anyone about it as the lost child had asked. They didn't understand how dangerous those bang bang creatures were. Yukato, the male Tsakaram of the Tippany informed with a frown, his gaze locked onto a red tetrapteron above the gate. A point that Nitiri noticed as well, causing her to tense up her hand close to her bow. The old Tsahik of the Olangi added and continued, and they knew why, the lost child could commune and control the fauna in a way similar to NA6, using them to learn was something that wasn't unheard of but rare to see. There was a moment of silence where the small group approached further until the door slowly opened, the red tetrapteron above not having lifted its four eyes gaze off them, being particularly focused over Nitiri and Yukato. It knew. The Oloik Tan said, his voice strict indicating that whoever acted rashly would be heavily punished. Be they of his clan or not. This was known to the two Tsakarams from foreign clans simply due to Tuti having divulged it in an outburst of frustration when they criticized the human a dozen of eclipses ago. Yet it wasn't spoken on more until now. It wasn't for the lost child defense in particular but for the two foreign Tsakarams. Akwe hadn't forgotten how this man stopped and flipped a hunter riding his charging mount with no visible effort. It was imprinted in his memory. This man had exceptional physical prowess, beyond that of any NA6, proven by his acts and further supported by the cryptic words of the All-Mother. None here was unaware of his impossible strength, though to what extent they overestimated or underestimated him was an entirely different story. The Tsakarams from the Omatakea and Tippany focused, their bodies tensing up at the figure walking out of the door. A human, sky person, demon, the lost child, or Liam Cram as they learned he called himself, over his face was no strange device only the usual Pelocyte known for his species, a short beard, a pair of eyebrows, and hair put into braids in an unknown style, all dark brown. His left arm had a strange metallic prism growing out it emitted a soft orange image that constantly flickered, something none of his kind had. It looked like an integral part of his body. He was wearing a pair of garments typical of his kind known as pants, this one made of plant fibers and animal hide with a pouch attached to his side. Over the upper part of his trunk was a chest plate, it was made partly unknown material but one that sported similarity to the one typically seen used by his kind, the rest being made of wood, leather, and plant fiber. Around his neck was a rather discreet leather necklace adorned by various objects from what looked like a seashell, to claw whether they were intact or in fragments, the broken part of a proboscis from some creature, a strangely shaped golden trinket, and more. His skin of an almost golden tan only put on display the defined and corded muscles of his powerful build, he was tall as well, for his kind. Taller and bulkier than any they ever saw. Not as tall as a NA6 far from it but it was notable nonetheless. Then his face, neither of the two cared much for the beauty standard of his kind so it was unimportant, but his expression, it was cold in a way, almost detached, 
his eyes of an unnatural silver grey studying any and every one of their moves like the one of an apex predator, yet no malice or want to harm could be seen, only justifiable wariness. Yet the most shocking part was that he was even if he looked dangerous, he was weaponless, completely unbothered by this fact as he approached them, were both were armed, Nitiri with a bow and Yukato with a spear. He never once let go of his gaze from them. The lost child said, a confident smile growing, his expression unchanging yet visibly more relaxed as he asked, unknown to the NA6 all of his turrets, the twelve of them were hidden in the wall behind him, and below them, in the ground were three dozen landmines he could independently detonate with but a thought. No, he wasn't weaponless even without his inventory, in fact, he had control over everyone's fate here. But nobody outside of himself and his tames needed to be aware of this detail. Chapter 38 Transhuman The words of the lost child resonated within the two Tsakaram's ears, neither Nitiri nor Hekatu having anticipated he would speak their tongue, and to such a proficient degree. Though ultimately it mattered little, it only eased communication. The eldest of the two responded proudly, looking down at the human both due to the great height difference and badly hidden disdain, his gaze concentrated on the metal that Liam's chest plate was made of. Hey, interesting. Pretty important guy, though he might need to tone down this air of superiority a peg or two, the human thought, unaffected by the general aversion from this NA6 on a general level, he broke the laws of Iwa but again, breaking a few laws and attracting the ire of a few was better than dying. He wasn't a NA6, something that also attracted ire, though he didn't come off his own free will like the other humans, something the All-Mother was perfectly aware of. And anything he did at most caused minor damage, and most of these were mostly due to the wildlife going beyond what is reasonable to end him. The only possibility as of now of causing long-lasting damage is if he started to burn and kill everything in sight, or poison the land, this type of stuff. If he wanted to cause long-lasting damage at his stage it would be intentional. Frankly, he could care less of how this NA6 disliked him as long as no violence was involved and a peace accord could be made, evidently him not hating his gut was always a plus but you don't solve this kind of problem with a simple talk and become best friends. He chose to have metal shown on him, there was no need to hide this already known fact. Hiding it could be taken as a show of weakness and lead to misunderstanding even if having this a part of his armor was ultimately unnecessary and the NA6 was well within the decapitation range of his war scythe. That didn't mean a small, clearly stupid, part of him didn't want him to punch the NA6 in the face. Liam's eyes briefly went over Hekatu's then ate her, the animal was showing great restraint. Good. Then his gaze shifted to the mountain banshee, it was relatively calm, and he didn't make direct eye contact to avoid unnecessary problems. It was a feeling doing so could risk the calm flying creature becoming overly aggressive. He asked the female NA6 standing in front of the mountain banshee, her expression was hardened, hand clasping her bow, ready to attack at any moment, clear hate in her eyes, but something told him it was more of what he represented than him. Nitiri Diskahan Mo Atidi, Tsakaram of the Omatakea. We have come hearing of the lost child through Iwa and words of the people, we have come far from our home to learn who is the demon upholder of such a title, she spoke coldly, at the end almost spat at him, he frowned slightly at that but not for her general unpleasantness and hostility. He couldn't care less, he was above reacting negatively to such behavior. But again like with the male NA6, a punch or two to the face with a bit less than a third of his strength should take her down a peg or two. The distance not being a problem as a simple leap would solve everything. Now that I think about it she is familiar. And the clan too, he wondered before rapidly finding out why she seemed so familiar, oh so this is likely the Pocahontas that Mr. Cripple falls head over heels over. And this clan was the one in direct conflict with the RDA, a fact that he learned Grace was tasked to solve. He could see how much of a mess it was the RDA while clearly the one at fault didn't equate to the NA6 being without fault. There were opportunities to be taken, plans to work with them already set in his mind. It wasn't a matter of him betraying his species, preferring an alien species over his own, but one of survival. 
he would love to be able to work hand in hand and cooperate with humanity, but alas it was impossible. It would never happen, or in a way remotely favorable for him as of now and in the foreseeable future. He didn't have much of a choice. He didn't want to be an added casualty. At least not within his own terms. Demon Hui, if it so fits your view of my person, I will not deny it. However, no all I want is a peaceful interaction between me and the people. May you believe it or not, it matters little, Liam said, and as anticipated he could see both not believing him, both having rather negative reactions. Nitiri was showing signs of visible anger, almost rage, though on the Olangi side no problem was to be reported, from the old formal NA6 he guessed was the Tsahik, the male with a bone nose that was the Oloik Tan, the two hunters and the two teens, of which both seemed mixed between proud and irritated. That is what your kind told us, peace. We believed them, as strange and different as they were from our ways and us. Blind as they were, we tried, but they didn't listen, were deaf to our words and peace was not what was given, only invasion, destruction, death, and tragedy, Nitiri hissed out as she approached him, just as Hakuto did, she stood several heads taller than him. The man was unfazed, this seemed to irritate her further but a soft glare and click of the tongue from the tzahik behind was enough to remind her to come down, for the moment. Trusting the sky people cost her a lot, too much, her sister. Believe what you want, Tsakaram Nitiri and similar for Tsakaram Hakuto, and anyone listening. I need, want, and desire peace. I know of why you react this way. But I'm not of the RDA, or of any humans present. I appear similar in appearance to them but I'm different, far different. On both mind and body, the lost child said truthfully, switching to English for untranslatable words. I'm not really human anymore the same way I was before, am I? It was a realization he had long since come to acknowledge and accept. It was ultimately good, more than good even but to know you will forever be different than anyone else thanks to a chasm that will never be crossed was more complex. Even if said chasm was really, really low on the problem ladder. Not necessarily bad but it entailed a lot. His engramic matrix where his personality, knowledge, and memories, which equated his soul, mind, and spirit. All of this resided within a glowing piece of metal intricately connected, fused even, to a genetically engineered superhuman body made in a tube. It wasn't mere cybernetic augmentation. And it was the tip of the iceberg, he sported many characteristics beyond what a baseline Homo sapiens possessed. He may look human, act like a human, and speak like a human, but he wasn't truly one. Or considered as one by the norm of this universe and his own as well. He was superior in every aspect related to physicality and the mind. It wasn't arrogance, it was factual. A lot are more knowledgeable than him in a myriad of fields, more apt at doing untold amounts of tasks, more beautiful, morally superior, wiser, and more but this was normal, he wasn't omniscient, or close to the ridiculous notion of perfection. It didn't change what he was. The word transhuman came to his mind several times, from both his knowledge and the game lores, and he supposed it was close enough. His words led to a short confusion within the two Tsakarams before a realization hit them. This was why his species never came to be mentioned by the All-Mother. Though, he still was a stranger, not a child of the All-Mother and mistakes were not to be repeated. His status as an individual resembling a human yet fundamentally different was already within the perception of the Olangi clan, even if none of them interacted with or had seen any other humans. They understand a general grasp of what a human was. Only appearance-wise Liam Cram was truly alike, and that was not entirely the case for this category either. He was the lost child, an apt designation, appearing from nowhere, alone, young learning about the world to survive, with no direct mention of him being of the Sky People. The All-Mother perceived him differently, rare were the individuals capable of garnering her attention, fascination even, and none to that extent from NA6 known history. Gladius come, the lost child spoke, words only Nitiri could decipher, and as she was going to translate for her fellow NA6 her eyes widened, 
her ear folded backward at what she saw, and with her and her fellow male Tsakaram backed away. At the same small gasps were heard from the Olangi hunters, then a low growl and guttural shrill, each respectively from the Thanator and her mount. The Tsahik and Oloiktan were already informed by the teens but seeing such creatures up close led to a small widening of the eyes. One known for its foul temperament, courage, tenacity, aggressiveness to any who approach and if mortally injured capable of killing or permanently crippling with its last cry filled with spite and rage to any who was too close. Even the rare ones that NA6 bonded with could lead to said NA6 finding themselves as the casualty of their temperament. They never truly became tamed, similar to the dire horses, but even more pronounced. They neither were the biggest or strongest or smartest or fastest or most prolific, venomous, poisonous, adaptable, or resistant of Iwas children but those earlier traits made it so why they were considered such a big threat, wild or not. Walking proudly out of the giant gate was said creature. It was taller than any NA6 or other animals present, muscular back wings spread wide open showing eyes like black dots encompassed of silky blood red skin. A colorful crest atop its head, followed by a long neck, its two pairs of front limbs ending each in three long, sharp metallic claws as black as the night. Their sharpened metallic sheen reflects the rays of the suns. It walked calmly, eyes scanning everyone in vigilance until it lowered its head and in front of everyone, of which only two weren't shocked, let Liam scratch its neck, an audible purr-like sound resonating, its body almost melting in the human grasp. It moved one of its cues, and without Liam's need to do anything the usual pink furry tendril waved softly in the air before connecting to the man's specimen implant. His eyes suddenly dilated and he felt every thought of his tames, compared to the simple mental link it felt as if a storm was gone. It was crystal clear and infinitely more complex and detailed, the experience was always a rush, all of his mind senses for lack of better terms focusing on the connection. Thought. I'm not dissimilar in various aspects, Technology is part of me, and I work to make it so. But my efforts, actions, objectives are toward my survival. I harm and will harm but I do not seek to harm more than necessary for me to live and prosper. If I'm a threat similar to RDA, the current threat to my life. This. It is for you to decide, know that harm will come to whoever wishes harm to me and act upon them. I do not wish to cause harm but will not hesitate to. Liam spoke, word holding but the cold hard, and honest truth. The same message he told to Iwa but formulated differently was risky but he won't hide in that aspect. He won't bend the knee and beg for their approval, he didn't disdain them but seeing they weren't backward in many aspects will be a lie. Being open and consistent in your words and actions was always a good quality. Particularly with a species that was now only learning what lies were and how words held no values but deceptions without actions. Trust was something that he didn't really believe will happen, at least not without underlying actions. The tension was rising, both Tsakarams of the Omatakea and Tippany, going over his words and the unhidden warning. And adding to that the full focus of four tetraptorons who appeared with no one noticing, the great ostropede with claws almost rasping together and the lost child, both NA6 at that moment deeply felt their instinct scream at them to back away. But all of it disappeared just as it came as a gentle smile graced Liam's feature, one of the tetraptorons flew out at the same moment he spoke, the conversations needed to be shifted to something else for Nitiri and Hakuto to have the time to digest his words, all was mostly going as planned. The crippled teen was puzzled as were the Olangi present, did as he was asked, and without care for the danger Liam and the great Ostropede were approached by the term in front of the gaze of the Tsakarams. A glare from Gladius and the word of acknowledgement from the Olangi Oloiktan stopped Hakuto from grabbing the teen's left hand to yank him out of potential danger out of sheer disbelief. This creature just threatened them. The soft beats of a pair of wings were heard right after and the tetraptoron that flew earlier landed on Liam's right shoulder a leather satchel in its beak. Good girl, he said, giving the bird a piece of meat jerky that came out of a strange trick of hands as he did so. He then gave the closed satchel to Myrak, without needing to be asked the teen undid the leather bind with his teeth and started at what was inside in shock, the conversation he had with Liam while the human inspected his right hand coming out full of force. 
still holding the satchel by the teeth he took out with his left hand half a right hand that sported a thumb and an index finger made of a pearl white wood, intricate carving of both known and unknown animal, attached to the wood was clasp and what looked like a sleeve. It was made of a black smooth to the touch material, and unknown to the NA6 it was nylon and carbon fiber woven together. In it were hidden sensors and cables, all built to be comfortable and keep everything together and working. Myruk asked in a voice trembling, not sure of what it was but his heart beat faster in palpation, his right hand shaking. His eyes locked onto the strange construct of expert craftsmanship. Yes but it isn't a simple accessory to hide, it is more. Let me help you, take that off first, the lost child said, his focus on both Myruk and the Tsakarams even if he didn't look their way, he had other pairs of eyes after all. Myruk took off the piece of the garment over his right arm that hit his ravaged right hand without hesitation, an unpleasant image for everyone if for different reasons and it was worse for him. He didn't feel physical pain from it, he felt sometimes the fingers were still there, clenching and he couldn't do anything. One of the symptoms known with this type of injury after healing but no solution was known but to grit your teeth and bear it. And with Liam's help the prosthetic was safely and securely attached over his forearm and what was left of his hand. Chapter 39 Cyborg of Wood The lost child said after the prosthetic was snugly fitted onto Myruk's right hand, straps made for it to fit and adapt to the limb if need be. The teen didn't truly understand what was asked, his heart thumping too loudly in his ears for this and by inadvertent he moved various muscles group within his forearm, wrist, two good digits and palm. All gave various data to a myriad of sensors within the prosthetic, they almost instantly traveled toward the microcomputer and it translated every piece of information into action as the various micromotors wired to life in silence. The wood thumb flexed completely, followed by the wood index finger doing the same before the two extended again, Myruk froze at that, his father having approached had a very similar reaction, to T's eyes widened at the sight mind racing to what Liam did this last time and the mention of a prosthetic and the tzahik of the Olangi smiled slightly at the sight. The teen might be an idiot but that equates to him needing to suffer more than necessary and whatever unknown artifact the lost child had made seemed to be able to replace a hand in more than a simple appearance. This is his blessing, the lost child's blessing, she thought, approaching closer, putting a hand over her great-granddaughter's shoulder as she did so. Old age didn't come with many positives and she was getting weaker day by day. This being held many surprises, and as he said becoming an enemy of his promised many great harm, that she held no doubt. She dearly hoped many would show it this way and didn't antagonize him due to past experiences with the sky people, but she wasn't naive, she mostly hoped he showed himself to be merciful. She was sure even if he currently was weaponless, and wide open to any attack he must have plans in place if either of the foreign Tsakarams acted rashly. Or even of her people, as unpleasant and shameful bringing the thought was. She held little doubt the hunter she exiled, a reckless psychotic boy that she held little respect for, came back for some sort of revenge and died by the lost child's hands but it was just as possible he got killed from many other sources. The All-Mother was not as merciful as one might think. Myruk gasped as one of the artificial digits moved again, flexed and unflexed, an ecstatic smile appeared on his face, eyes almost watering in joy at the sight, he tried to move each of the two digits again failing but the earlier vague explanation of Liam now made sense. Using what was left of his right hand, flexing the two remaining fingers with various groups of muscles the two artificial fingers moved in accordance. The microcomputer and motors seemed to be well calibrated together. It will mostly need training on his part to learn how it properly works. But he seems to do good, Liam thought, pleased with his craft, his implant glowing slightly brighter as packets of data from the prosthetic were delivered to him. The lost child interrupted himself, his silver eyes focused on Myrock, the male teen's entire body was trembling, his head down and left hand grasping his right wrist. Thank you, thank you. I thought I would have. Thank you. I I thank you, the teen mumbled, a voice that would have been inaudible to a normal human and it was also shaky filled with disbelief and joy, 
his entire being transfixed on the wood hand as he slowly moved the two artificial digits, disbelief, and a plethora of other emotions in his eyes. Happy to know it please you, I suppose you realize but this is the prosthetic I spoke of. An example of how technology can be used. There is no sense of touch like skin but you will feel weak forces against skin of right wrist meaning you holding an object with tip of wood fingers. Be careful precise movement will need time to get, Liam said with a warm smile, he put his left hand into the pouch at his side. He mimicked the action of picking something he took out a small round purple fruit and throw it at Myruk whose eyes widened and he reacted on instinct grabbing the fruit within both living and non-living fingers, and as Liam said a pressure could be felt when the end, almost rugged, part of the digits touched the fruit while there was no sense from them whatsoever. Myruk took a bite and smiled in excitement, blood rushing in his body as he ate the fruit without much ceremony and moved the artificial finger, closing and opening his fist. Each time he did disbelief could be seen, he felt like he was in a dream. Good reaction, excellent result. Better control than I anticipated. It will take time to get used to, Liam added, smile growing slightly, his eyes then briefly shifted towards the two foreign Tsaka men's. They stayed apart, seeing they were alienated wouldn't be the biggest of hyperbole but they stayed vigilantes keeping their eyes and ears on him and his actions with the Olangi clan's young ones. Their expressions were hard to read but conflict could be seen in their eyes. This act he did was quite impactful to them, neither were nihilistic or experienced enough to believe it was planned, or at least planned to somehow manipulate their feelings and better their impression of him. Not this way anyway even if it would be quite flagrant to humans. Though if these two were here or not Liam would have built the prosthetic. He just wouldn't miss the chance to show what he was capable of and that he had more than mere words. In all cases it was a heartwarming scene, to see such a young teen be almost brought to tears by a gift that gave him back lost bodily function due to a traumatic event. Nitiri, in particular, did pity his situation, he reminded her of many teens who act this way some less lucky than him. Death of children was extremely common. Hakuto on his part saw the teen as reckless and deserving of such punishment through the damage of the wounds but all the same not deserving of death. Stupidity was not to be praised, an appropriate action needed to be set. At least they do seem to be able to think things through. Rational individuals even if of different ideologies are always welcomed. And being on roughly good terms with them is but beneficial, the man internally remarked, he needed the RDA to be driven off Pandora, mostly the military part of it and for that, the help of the native was required. Ultimately something temporary but it will give time. He couldn't do this alone nor did he want to even be part of what would be a war in the first place. Killing and causing death was extremely selfish but better than getting killed or experimented upon, the life of the innocents mattered to his consciousness but his own life and well-being mattered excessively more than simply feeling good about himself. Cowardly, cold, monstrous even but rational, being emotional and overly emphatic will not be of help much here. Not that any actions he could take to stop the RDA will happen without the need for extreme violence and slash or putting himself in great danger. Warning the NA6 was pointless for now, not that they will truly believe him. This is incredible. He made you a new hand Myrock, Tuti declared in excitement, forgetting to stay composed. She ran, jumped, and then hugged Myrock from the back causing him to yell incoherently as he fell toward Liam who with an amused smirk simply dodged them by stepping aside. Hey! I did expect a positive reaction from them but I might have underestimated it, Liam thought, for him it was a bit less than three dozen hours of work not taking into consideration the wood treatment that took time too but not his direct intervention was required for most of it. Doing a prosthetic with only a few measurements and not a great understanding of NA6 anatomy and biology, and no prior experience in that domain was, to put it mildly beyond exceptional. And he could have done it faster, he took his time since he wanted something relatively robust robust enough to work for at least a few months as the hand of a reckless teenager while being reliable and as well not completely horrendous looking. Form and function working in tandem were always what should be thrived for when attainable. It could be better, way better but there was no real need to use more time and resources. It was a simple gift. 
just as 2T said he gave him a new hand, it would be very impactful towards the teen who might have dramatically thought his life was over and hid it, but this in any case was a new chance, though it was still not a real hand, a lesser version of it. Also why he didn't make it more lifelike, it isn't a real hand, there is no reason to pretend that it is, it wouldn't help the teen's mental health. My ruck, as cold and difficult as it sounded, needed to get over it. His right thumb and index finger were gone for good unless the use of cloning technology or similar regenerative solution were clearly out presently and even then he doubted the teen would accept. Asquai, the chief of the Olangi approached, staying at a safe distance from the great ostropede and said voice filled with joy and honest gratitude yet still stern and composed, his feature softened stand mirthful amusement could seem as he gazed upon the Myruk and Tuti. The human praised and asked his attention shifting toward the middle-aged N.A. 6. The N.A. 6 declared proudly said but then frowned and said with a lower voice, and I apologize for the action of one of my hunters. This shall never be repeated as long as I live. Apologies accepted, mistakes happen but as long as they are not repeated it is fine. Let's bury the hatchet, it means to make peace after a conflict, there is no reason to force more upon this incident more than necessary. Liam responded, the meaning behind those words being clear to Asque, he didn't forget, and as the chief, he was responsible in a grand party for the actions of his people. Asque thanked the lost child again, it was a grave mistake on his part even if impossible to have predicted. As irrational as it was, he felt deep shame, even more so now with the fact this man created and gifted such a precious and life-changing artifact to his son. He was greatly indebted to Liam Cram, a fact both new and one that didn't need to be mentioned. Know that as long as I and he live the clan will support you in future problems that may arise with the people due to what you are on the outside, I'm Morelli, the Tsahik of the Olangi and I deeply thank you for doing what you weren't needed to. They wouldn't have been able to come back without your assistance. I thank the lost child, the old NA6 said slowly with cloudy white eyes not fearing the great ostropede she walked closer. She had seen a lot that Liam could tell, and she looked like a crazy old woman that would outlive most of her descendants. She looked the part for her role, he supposed. And unknown to him, his amusing thought was right and the reality far from pleasant, Tuti was to be the Tsakaram for all others who had passed away. Life on Pandora was not easy, being in harmony with nature didn't equate to being safe they weren't separate from the food chain or other dangers. Liam hummed positively at that, though the opinion of the Tsahik, Oloit Tan, and a few more was important he was sure most of their clan didn't feel such a sense of gratitude towards him. As it should, he only saved Tuti and Myrak, not all were going to instantly become best friends or like him at all for that matter. The two hunters they brought looked serious if slightly puzzled and amazed about what was unfolding, nothing hinting toward aversion though those were surely chosen for that reason. It's just that as much their voice was important it didn't represent all of whose they guide and lead. The lost child stated calmly and in a relatively low tone, and to his stupor none of the two reacted negatively, the elderly and stern religious guide smiled slightly at his words. The All-Mother always watches, she always watches you, and I hear her voices, of the echoes informing me of great and many things of what she deemed me worthy to know. You broke our sacred laws but those are our laws. Our way of life is antithetical to yours in many ways, you did not come here of your own choosing. Abiding by them if it impedes your survival is not what is right. A great distinction from the sky people and the demons within them, Liam Cram, she still taking a deep breath, the All-Mother. And so I by extension of her will, do not condone you of using the metal of the ground for your crafts none of your actions were born out of simple materialistic greed. You want to learn and understand with a pure motivation of wanting to thrive. That is surprising for you to see it this way. But this only under certain conditions, right, he said pensively, he thought she would be more close-minded, and his implant glowed slightly brighter. Gladius shifted behind him, not letting his guard down even once. This little detail of his implant didn't go unnoticed by any NA6, it was one of the strangest parts about him, it was similar in some aspects in how their seuritan, bioluminescence, acted though it was distinctively different. 
conditions? No. Not truly, what is valuable is respect and understanding of what is taken and that all that was taken must be brought back to the All Mother one day, the Tzahik answered cryptically. Not doing in excess seemed to be key and he was essentially borrowing as long as ultimately all came back to the earth. It seemed simple enough but again this was the point of view of one Tzahik, one he was sure of if he didn't do so much would not have been so understanding. And also the different trees of souls, each being part of a greater whole that is Iwa but each contradictorily being separate entities with his understanding must have subtle discrepancies in their views. And so twenty more minutes passed with Liam speaking to the two most important figures of the Alanji clan, a deal was sealed, one similar to the one with Psumong of Anu Ray, and the two RDA scientists, knowledge for knowledge. Traveling people know a lot, from places to stories, fauna and flora. Not all would be immediately useful or useful at all but information was information. Chapter 40 Jake Sully May 19 Year 2154, currently 1711, Location Hell's Gate Dr. Max Patel was showing the new arrivals, two young men, the part of the base reserved for the Avatar program, more precisely the bio lab, both new ones having seen their avatar already. One was a thin man, Norm Spellman, a PhD in anthropology and xenobotany with a certification in xenolanguage on top of it. Having dreamed all of his life to be here and trained for years for it to become a reality, and lucky enough to be chosen among the several hundredth young minds. Overqualification was the bare minimum to have the possibility to be here with an avatar. He was speaking enthusiastically about a book on Pandora to a man in a wheelchair looking around broadly, Half listening to the scientist's words, this was Jake Sully, a discharged marine. He was paralyzed from the fifth lumbar vertebrae down to the legs, and everything in between he couldn't move or feel, all thanks to a spinal injury he got in Venezuela. Though being a war veteran didn't come with insurance for such injuries and even if easily healable it needed money, an exorbitant amount of it. One he didn't possess. Max suddenly spoke presenting to the two Dr. Grace Augustine, she was standing around an aisle looking over data on an hollow tablet and a lit cigarette between her lips, the woman not being deaf or blind had already noticed them. Sighing while running a hand over her hair as she walked toward them, Max presented Norm and was on his way to do the same as Jake but was interrupted as she spoke to Norm that then shifted to NA6. Not bad you still sound a bit too formal though. A problem only time here will fix. Grace praised. Norm nodded at the compliment while Grace's mood turned for the worse as her attention shifted to the crippled Marine. This is Jake Sully, Max presented the second new member pushing his back against the earlier mentioned aisle, he was prepared for what was to come under the poor sod. Ma'am, Jake said cordially and gave his hand for a handshake which went completely ignored. Yeah, yeah, I already know you. Not the PhD who trained years to be here. Your brother, the one I wanted and should be here but beggars can't be choosers, she said, forced to look down at him. He is dead, I know it's a big inconvenience to everyone. Sorry to disappoint, he responded sarcastically to her remark, annoyance hidden on his face. Do you have at least a modicum of training in labs? Ever used a gas chromatograph, or do you even know what that is, she asked voice laced with a mix of anger, annoyance, and frustration. Though she stayed composed, mostly, it wasn't specifically to him she was angry at but it still spilled. Negative for the three, sorry to disappoint ma'am, he responded plainly and mechanically, keeping constant eye contact. Any actual lab work at all, she breathed in and out, calming slightly the storm brewing inside, she asked further not having much expectation for the incoming answer outside of knowing he is a war veteran, ages, and other minor aspects such as blood type there wasn't much. High school chemistry. But I ditched, he answered plainly and that's what broke the camel's back. She had low expectations for him even if his twin brother was a genius from the little she got and Jake managed to still disappoint. You see? You see? They're pissing on us without even the courtesy of calling it rain. A fucking dropout trigger happy a shoal, she snapped before storming off to Slefertage. 
she was aware whatever she would say will enter one ear and go out from the other but that mattered little as of now. Nobody would have been happy to get the equivalent of a mole in their team, because that was what he was even if he doesn't realize it. That went smoother than I anticipated, Max mumbled but it was loud enough for Norm and Jake to hear and earned a raised eye from the latter. You sure? Jake asked amusedly, not believing the scientist one bit. His first impression of the xenobotanist wasn't the best. Trust me, when she learned of the situation it was worse but I hope you forgive her for her less than gentle behavior. It's just a lot is going on. And it has been for quite a non-insignificant time and most of the pressure is on her, Max explained further, his words unknown to the others included more than the NA6 and RDA conflict. The ex-marine gruffly nodded, he had got treated worse, way worse many times. Someone rude he just met won't faze him much, if at all. The next few days for Jake were one of the most interesting in his life, driving his avatar being at the forefront. It was more than surreal, being in control of a new, stronger, taller, new senses, new appendages, and bluer body was mind-blowing. And he could walk again, but it wasn't his body, it was an exceptional feeling, almost like a dream but there was a clear distinction between his avatar and his body. His first outing in Pandora's forest, a mission where he served as a guard for Norm's and Grace's avatars on the ground while they did their sciences. This simple mission turned into a fiasco thanks to his ignorance and after being chased by a giant six-leg hairless carnivore for an unknown amount of time where a long fall and the loss of most of his equipment were involved. Thereafter he was chased again by similar if considerably smaller creatures, to which he would have died if a female native didn't save him of which he later learned the name, Nitiri. This led from one thing to another and after going to her home, a giant tree, the biggest he ever saw, he became her student of sorts. He didn't understand why or how but it happened and this seemed to displease Nitiri. This meeting with the NA6 was significant and met with surprise, it got him a personal mission from Colonel Quaritch, to, somehow, convince the Omatakea to get out of their home tree. Jake accepted it without an ounce of hesitation. And not even two days later, he, Norm, and Grace with the latter two avatars, his avatar still sleeping in the NA6 clan, were escorted by an experienced pilot to Site 26 on Grace's order. This was for reasons Jake wasn't sure of but what he knew was that it made Norm beyond euphoric, like a kid in a candy store and he perfectly understood why. The site was supernatural beyond his comprehension of what should be possible etc., it is one of the most fabulous things he ever had the chance to lay his eyes upon, only coming second to the sight of this moon from outer space. Floating islands from car-sized to literal mountains, kilometers in height, and with most if not all connected by gargantuan vines, ever-present dense mist constantly replenished by giant waterfalls and so much more. The site was situated on such a floating island and was composed of a small pod-like habitation for no more than ten people lost in the middle of the Hallelujah Mountain. Completely cut off from the world due to the powerful magnetic field. This brought to the present, one of the link units unsealed itself, the door slowly opening itself. Groaning and repeatedly blinking Jake pushed his upper body up to then with practiced ease put himself on his wheelchair. Moving himself toward the fridge he took a ration, a 3D printed lasagna, before turning it in the microwave. He looked to his right and was met with a certain auburn-haired woman whose entire focus was on a smart watch. You know there aren't any signals here, right, Jake said, earning a bored glance from Grace. This old smart watch was something she seemed to always wear and from the look of it wasn't only to know the time and Max also had the same model. Though beside this he didn't really put any more thought into it. That wouldn't be entirely correct, we aren't actually deep enough in the magnetic vortices for us to be fully and completely cut off from the outside world. If that were the case we wouldn't be able to use the link unit, she turned off the watch and explained. She was waiting for Liam's message one that arrived slowly but surely, literally bit by bit, and each bit gave another bit to let the devices know it was successfully received or sent. Slow and tedious but it protected against loss of data. Liam knew she was here, she said it while the three of them discussed potentially meeting in person with a time and the like. Mostly her in her avatar with Liam. 
a meeting that either would need them to fly to where the man is, which means making his existence known to someone else or him moving to a specific location, or a mix of both. Either of those prospects is in no way possible as of now. Liam didn't care that others knew of his existence by itself, he knew that it was inevitable, what mattered was when, how, and who. He wanted there to be a minimum of control until all turn for the worse, to prepare, she inferred. Trust had started to build between the three but it was a great risk to be taken for him and them as well. It wasn't the man's paranoia, the only reason for it to be far from simple. Norm was one of the potential people on the list however to be given knowledge of the Liam situation, even if she knew him for barely a week. He was more trustable than an ex-soldier. All that needed to be said, biased maybe, but factual, and Jake was simply not the sharpest knife she met. He wasn't a bad apple, far from it, he was honest, a bit too much at times, and had a big heart, she just didn't know him enough but one thing she knew however was that for him duty came first. He was and still is a soldier at heart. And soldiers would do monstrous things even at the cost of their consciences and bodies. In that aspect, Jake Sully was a perfect example. She was more surprised Jake's avatar still hasn't become a porcupine. Or died due to slipping from a too high place or died with the hundredth of other ways to stupidly die. He was exceptionally lucky. Not omitting the fact Norm held no loyalty or interest toward anything besides Pandora and his passion. Coming here pretty much means abandoning everything back on Earth. A fraction of the frequencies still work, under circumstances, you wouldn't understand, I can give you that. Most of our equipment doesn't work very well if at all thanks to how fuck up this place's magnetic field is. Anyway. How did this dive go? Any good news or progress? She furthered her explanation and asked with some excitement. An overall disappointment he might be, a reckless idiot that grossly crossed the line of courage to stupidity by a few kilometers he is as well. But as he is he is very important for the future development and betterment of RDA and NA6 relationships, a fact Quaritch and Sferdage both understood as well. Liam on that aspect wasn't much different, he interacted with the natives a lot, something that could be realized by simple deduction, the Olangi, or one of the other horse clans she guessed. But Liam was in a fundamentally different situation, first, his interaction with the NA6 didn't consist of machine guns nor did he force them out of their home for metal. The Great Plains were unscathed from any RDA's activities, NA6 would hold a different view of anything humans are looking at or from human origin. And not forgetting the most important aspect, it wasn't his war but one he inevitably will be dragged in. That she was sure of but won't actively push him on that length. Outside of getting bullied, he said jokingly, opening the microwave he grabbed the plate and took a bite out of it with a fiberglass spork. This earned an eye roll from Grace. Hmm. I didn't mention it earlier because I didn't understand shit about the NA6 language, it's still the case. But now I noticed their leader, Uoliktian, and how was she called again? Sahik, with Nitiri, and a few others, speak of an individual. It seemed to be a big deal. I think the name was or something. Not a clue on what it means though. Also, it apparently is from faraway lands, Jake explained vaguely as he took more bites out of his food that could be compared to flavored digestible plastic. Horrendous pronunciation and without contact it's hard to tell you further. But it should translate to something along the lines of lone or, lost orphan or child, it's like this, Grace said and Jake nodded. Then her eyes slightly widened to ex-marine confusion, she realized that she should have had earlier. It's him. Unless it's a legend I never heard before, which is extremely unlikely, she thought, it both complicated and simplified the situation. The Omatakea knew of Liam Cram, this title with the mention of it being from far away and her vast knowledge of NA6 culture zeroed the possibility to only two, either an unknown and significant legend for the Omatakea and surrounding clans that now she only learned about or it was a certain lost human. There were other possibilities, there always are but extremely high chances where it was Liam and she will go with that hypothesis unless proven otherwise. This title was appropriate for Liam as well a human comparable to a child or an orphan, 
lost and alone. Anyway, she will ask later, but not in less than a dozen hours with how crappy the signal was here. Ultimately she decided to play dumb while telling a half-truth, though, I must say I have never heard of such an individual with such a title. I would like to hear more about it if you come to hear more of it. Chapter 41 Overqualified Teacher It has been slightly more than a month's worth of time since Liam spoke to the Tsakarams of the Tipani and Omatakea clans. He might have overreacted due to his inclination for paranoia in rapport to the meeting and the amount of lethal force put into the preparation. It ended with each cordially saying their goodbye and he assumed they travelled back to their respective clans. No deal was done with them, not for the fault of not asking but Nitiri denied it saying it was pointless, that her clan didn't need to learn more from his likes. If his appearance as a human displeased her this much then that was her problem. She was foolish even if he knew she instantly had second thoughts on her words but she was too proud to come back over them and excuse herself. But her words are mostly her own biased opinion of him from his appearance and her past experience with humans, so he didn't truly care. Primitive arrows even if equal to ballista bolts won't be enough against helicopters, he can only hope she realizes this fast, and the same for the rest of her clan, and Jake as well. He needed the NA6 to become truly united. For Hakuto it wasn't a full-on refusal but more along the line of needing the accord of his Tsahik and Oloiktan, which in his clan were one and the same to proceed further. He showed great interest in the prosthetic. As for the Olangi, all went smoothly, extremely so in fact. And as of now, they should stay in his general location for as long as the rainy season still lives on and the newborns need to commune with the Tree of Divergence. A very important and dangerous aspect of their culture that needs great preparation and one that even affects where and when mothers should give birth which is also affected by simple deduction when the act of procreation must happen. Even if he knew they were good at using various methods of contraception. All in all, it didn't really help him because he doesn't have any method of knowing how long the rainy season will last, and that the NA6 were exceptionally bad at telling the time to others considering they can't count past 16 he assumed it was some sort of biological clock or how they spoke and listened to Iwa. So he asked Max. He got his answer a few hours later and from what Max said it should last till mid-September. He was now, not only busy doing what he usually does but also being in almost daily contact with the NA6. The deal of knowledge for knowledge not directly being the only reason, as to put mildly he was a novelty, curiosity and an object of, something akin to adoration for a no small amount of the Olangi, mostly the younger side but not uniquely. Sometimes surprisingly to the point of lust, in big part from female teenagers he remarked but not only, he wasn't interested in kids and sadly that wasn't much different for the adults. There were more pressing matters than useless romance and drama for satisfying something as animalistic as lust. A good aspect of his body or newly gained experience or that were not humans, in all cases he felt exponentially less craving of the flesh than he did before, not that he ever was that depraved to begin with but it kept things effective and to the point. Though he could roughly understand the origin of such attraction, he was exotic so to say, and important by their standard while an anomaly he was far from even remotely being considered ugly. And not forgetting his actions and connection, all of this affected how the NA6 of the Olangi clan perceive. That didn't equate to every NA6 liking him, far from it, such as the family related to the hunter who tried to kill him. But from what he gathered it was quite mid as they themselves condemned the hunter's action. And there were a few others, but at the end of the day the leaders and nearly every member of the clans possessed a positive image of him, that he could guess was in grand parties thanks to Esque, Morelli, and the teenage couple aka 2T and Myrock. He wondered when they would assume it because the two seemed pretty dense and more than just best friends. Liam knew of all this because he came several times per week to the Olangi settlement, situated not far from the entrance of the Sacred Hallows. It was for teaching and learning. It was an experience, to say the least. And he was currently walking within the edge of their camp, Oxidon and Septon on each of his titanium shoulder pads, Unnoticeable grips were specifically added for that purpose, his war scythe placed diagonally behind his shoulder and above a bag. 
His inventory didn't need to be known, even now, the Tzahik didn't mention it so even if foolish he refused to risk his most important asset being discovered this way. The Tzahik and Oloiktan might be capable of keeping it a secret but he doubted others even without malicious intention will be capable of keeping their lips sealed with something like this, something magical, even probably divine to them. Na6, males and females were working in tandem, some sharpening stone arrowheads, some weaving plant fibers into baskets, some taking care of the dire horses, and kids that were too young to help were running around playing something akin to catch. It was normal, lively yet alien, and a bit out of time from his perception due to Na6 being for all intent and purpose at the Neolithic stage. The similarities between them and humans were flagrant but it made the many differences that much more obvious. Not that it needed all of what was mentioned to be remarked. They weren't humans, but they still were people, with the good and bad that came with it. All of them stopped what they were doing as he began to be noticed, his smile grew slightly as he waved while his two tetrapteron glared with a kind of subtly at anything and everything. Though unlike Gladius they weren't the most intimidating so the effects were insignificant. One of the young kids, a boy two heads shorter than him, his name was Ihani who ran up to him a flat piece of dry wood with black lines scribbled on it. This almost earned Oxiden jumping onto the kid's head, glassy claws wide open ready to thread the boy's eyeball out but he stopped it before it even happened. Teacher. I did it. Look, look, said kid exclaimed waving the dry wood in the air for Liam to take. Which he did with a simple movement of his hand, one faster than the kid could perceive, the writing was barely comprehensible but he could guess the gist of it and it was the response to the basic multiplication table from 1 to 10 and line of numbers going to 200 he asked to do last time. It was written with a charcoal pen he gave the knowledge of, he didn't make it for them. They were apt enough with this information to do it themselves. He had become a teacher of sorts, and the title of teacher had sometimes metal added in front of it thanks to his specimen implant and how he wore metal as armor. In NA6 it was Fnap Karyu. But that was of no importance here, he rapidly went over every result and he nodded, pleased. This was easy, incredibly easy, and that would still be an over-exaggeration of how easy it was. But the NA6 needed to learn from scratch at a level even lower than kindergarten such as how foreign the concept was to them, and this in approximately two hours of class per week fully focused on that. It was more than explaining addition, subtraction, and multiplication, they needed to learn how to count and truly understand it, not just parrot what he says. It was math not understanding was going to be obvious and a big problem. And he did an order of magnitude more complicated for the older ones, but he was starting to explain their division. He was someone capable of doing calculus that perfectly explained how to create a stable and safe method of teleportation between several points in the space-time continuum and he was teaching third-grade mathematics to primitive tall blue cat people. It was ridiculous, ludicrous, it looked and sounded like an insane joke but it was his life. This was the result of his actions and choices. Anyway, one of his best in that age group, adult and teenager, was Myrug, both surprising and unsurprising. The teen held such a high opinion of him it might even be considered unhealthy by some. Overall he found teaching a relaxing and pleasant experience but that was mostly on how eager his students were and that they held great respect for him. And that he promoted competition. The healthy kind at least he hoped it was. He did this by giving recompense to the ones giving correct answers multiple times, and speed being an important factor as well. He gave recompense, only to the lower end of the age spectrum, it was snacks, like candies, smoked meats, vegetables, and fruit. For the really young he gave toys, there needed to be a motivation, and he preferred to use the carrot than the stick. It was possible to do this because his classes were relatively small, never going past 30 individuals and he only had two of which one half didn't need this treatment. The adults were the ones that gave him things, such as a type of alcohol, however, NA6 didn't have problems eating things more than what he was used to traditionally eating. Such as living purple larvas, nothing he wouldn't have been able to guess, it didn't even taste bad. A mix between sweet and earthy with a crunchy outside and soft meaty inside. 
though he never was a fan of food being able to move or fight back in your mouth. One of his rules however was always to give it a bite before judging its potential taste from appearance or prior ideas. Tastes were the most important aspect of foods, even if aspects and presentation were important too. They just came second and always will come second to him. It was a cultural exchange, both learning from one another. These are correct. Good job and as promised, Liam trailed off, his left hand going into his backpack where he took from his inventory a beige articulated figurine, to be customized, made of a natural polymer he turned into biodegradable plastic. It was of a long since gone animal from Earth, he 3D printed it with his fabricator basing himself on models he has from techgrams of various artificial creatures in his mind, which was most of the vertebrates from the games. Not the most exact, far from it in fact, but he wasn't a paleontologist so it mattered little so he couldn't fix them to be right, and neither did he care. The flesh and blood creatures from the game were the result of GMOs pushed to the extreme without regulation, it was a given they weren't going to be accurate or be regular animals at all. Wow. Thank you. But what animal is that? Ihania grabbed and marveled at the 60 centimeter. 23.6 in, tall four-legged figurine, it had two pairs of thick legs, a long tail, and a long neck ending in a comparatively small head. It was such an alien creature. It's called a brontosaurus, one of the largest land-dwelling creatures to have ever lived. Specifically, it's a brontosaurus lazarus, it feeds exclusively on plants, Liam explained to the NA6 who was already playing with it. The kid noted, it was intended to be this way, they were scaled down but compared to others were rightly proportioned, and even if the brontosaurus was of right proportion it would still have been one, if not the biggest and certainly the heaviest land-dwelling creatures of Pandora. One of those big stegosaurus-like creatures in the Great Plain, while clearly bigger and bulkier than an elephant, were lighter by a bit more than a third, and it wasn't only the moon's lower gravity at play. It was funny in a way but again lighter didn't mean weaker and nearly all veritable have carbon fiber bones. And this figurine was made with the measurement unit he got from the smart watches of the scientists by doing a simple light trick and use of the screen he got it to the millimeter and everything after is divided by 10. It was just a quality of life, though one that could minimize the risk of future problems and accidents. As history proved, Using two distinct measuring systems in a high-precision project was a very bad and stupid idea. After this Liam moved through the crowd giving snacks as he did so until he was face to face with hunters, from teenagers and adults to olds, both male and female none was set aside. All were currently in the middle of training with bows, daggers and pole arms, that consisted of spears, and battle staff. He gazed at a spar between two teenagers in the distance. He supposed they were around Myruk's age, going at one another with blunt spears, one had a scar above his right eye and the other was slightly bulkier. It was fascinating even though he didn't understand all of the reasons behind most of their movements and actions. Though they were quite slow. The two kept eye contact with one another, their ears were flattened and tails swishing back and forth when suddenly the one with the scar moved his left foot to the side gaining space before he pushed most of his weight forward on his right and trusted the blunt tip of his spear toward the other throat with a yell hiss. He missed, or more like the bulkier one sidestepped causing the attacker's eyes to widen in shock as he flailed, lose his footing in the muddy ground, and fell forward face first into the mud. Three long seconds went by before the second took the hand of the first and yanked him up. The bulkier one said and the other grumbled before spitting globs of mud he just swallowed causing the other to chuckle. Liam commanded both of his birds to fly up, as he turned around hearing footsteps, already knowing who it was he looked up and was met with the Akwe, a long and intricate spear in his right hand. The Oloiktan greeted his eyes moving toward the human's war scythe, has the lost child come to observe how my people train? Or perhaps participate? Greeting and yes Akwe. It will be enriching. I'm a craftsman in fields not even the RDA could comprehend, but not a warrior. I won the same way an adult could beat a young child in a fist fight, no matter how skilled the child or unskilled the adult may be. And after I have important matters to discuss, Liam said as he placed his bag on a dry rock, 
his upper armor unclasping itself like the shed exoskeleton of an arthropod, showing his physique as he was now in only a pair of shorts. The chief agreed, and that was true for the winning part. The lost child was fast, incredibly so, and just as if not even stronger but his movements were that of someone untrained, but skill alone could not cross every gap. Strength, speed, intelligence, luck, equipment, number, experience, agility, and so many more factors were just as crucial in deciding how a fight will end. It was an art. Chapter 42 Liam V. S. Equay. The entire training area quieted down as the Oloik Tan and the lost child advanced toward a patch of short grass, one with a spear and the other a war scythe. Someone having overhead the first part of the two discussions told others about this and more NA6 came to watch. Their chief was their best warrior and hunter, in both skill, knowledge, and experience, it was the bare minimum requirement to even hold and keep such a position, one he held for the equivalent of 50 earth years. And he was one if not the best within the great plane at this art and way of life. Saying he wouldn't be one of the best of Iwas children of the current time wouldn't be an exaggeration. The chief asked, it was the first time he saw them and he knew it was from a kind of injuries you don't simply shrug off, the smaller one the chest particularly. Gladius parent for my back, but it got what it deserved in return, as for my chest? A surprise encounter with Alanaka, Slinger, pierced right through my armor into my lung, he let out offhandedly patting the metallic claw at the end of his weapon. Aqui nodded. His curiosity on that aspect satisfied he spoke again as he carefully placed his weapon to take a training spear, a blunt stick. Liam explained briefly as he did the same thing as the NA6, placing his weapon to pick one of the wood spears and breaking a third of it off for it to better suit his size. Wielding a 3 meter, 9 feet 4, long spear wouldn't do even if he was 1.97 meters tall, 6 feet 5, from what he measured, it would be impractical. The chief lifted his non-existent eyebrow at the sight but didn't say anything, it made sense and it was just a stick. Liam walked weapon in hand in front of Aque, the size difference evident and the reach of the weapon just as well. In normal conditions, the chief wouldn't even have entertained the thought of fighting with such drastically advantageous conditions compared to his opponent. But the lost child was far from the norm, the NA6 eyes focused on his opponent, and the human was relaxed while for him his body tensed up in anticipation. His earlier smile vanished to be replaced with a visage of seriousness. Liam didn't have the chance to finish as the chief already was on the attack, arms flexing and legs in positions he moved with superhuman speed, strength, and several decades of experience, the blunt tip of the weapon aimed right at Liam's chest. The said man's silver-gray eyes widened at the suddenness of it all. He saw the training spear move but he didn't move nor did he attempt to dodge. Instead, he reacted on instinct not knowing what to do in this instant due to sheer befuddlement. Letting go of his weapon Liam grabbed the incoming spear with his bare hand, stopping it dead in its tracks, then his grip strength splintered the wood to the point the spear broke in half but the blunt spearhead was already around the general area where his heart was. The chief eyes widened slightly at this. Liam didn't move a millimeter while he put most of his force behind this move and to boot it felt like he tried to stab a boulder or a large tree, unmoving, solid, and here for far longer than he ever was and ever will be. He shook his arms still feeling the shock going through his very bones, he was more hurt than Liam, it was terrifying, fascinating, and exhilarating. And how fast the lost child had reacted and stopped such a sudden attack from such a close distance. Incredible was all he could think. Dishonorable what he has done maybe but in a fight to the death honor is worthless, kindness to an enemy for something as infantile as pride is to bring harm to yourself and what you hold dear, he learned this the hard way. The being in front of him was a force of nature but a grossly untrained one, though if it was a fight to the death he was certain he held an abysmal chance of winning and even less of winning unscattered. Liam from what he knew and was told would go further and beyond to secure victory, and unknown to him to an obsessive degree. No one knew what he could use to achieve it. Surely by the use of artifacts only he and the All-Mother could comprehend all his other qualities. That could have seriously injured me or killed me if there was a bladed end but in normal circumstances, my armor will be on me. But still. 
I made the right choice. I don't need to be the most skilled but the one that survives and thrives, Liam thought he wasn't angry at Akwe for doing what he did, the opposite in fact. He asked for this, power without control or knowledge of how to use it didn't affect how dangerous it is but control affects what and who this danger is directed to and for what purpose and intent it is. He never was a fighter, at least not this way if Akwe was equal physically to him and without the use of tricks the NA6 would quite literally wipe the floor with him. Right now he could have run straight at the NA6 and punched a hole through his chest without the latter being able to react. He knew how strong his punch was, it did cost, destroyed trees and various destroyed or cracked stones from the lower to mid-range of the hardness scale with pure brute strength. No fancy technique usable in only controlled conditions is needed. He didn't harm himself for all of this though, he wasn't a masochist, and he took plenty of precautions. Which means if he didn't care about the potential harm to himself he could do even more damage. He was a monster, the corded muscles carved all over his body weren't only there to be pretty to look at like the ones of a bodybuilder, that was a bonus. Everything now was a first experience and what an experience it was to be taught by a respected leader of an ancient migratory clan. He didn't like or enjoy fighting but learning how to was a must, and fighting didn't only entail how to punch and stab with a pointy stick. It was an incredible honor that much he realized, one he earned, and ironically the chief thought the same about being able to teach the lost child in that manner. The anomaly and center of attention of their all-seeing and ever-present goddess, savior of his child, and crafter of wonder. May you forgive me for what I have done, as dishonorable as it was but this was a must. I must understand you. Now attack me with the weapon you dropped in any way you see fit. The Oloiktan said with a smirk growing as he took a new spear, heart pumping more blood in his vein due to the trepidation. Liam asked for confirmation, it was more rhetorical than anything as the NA6 knew better and as he said learning of various problems to be rectified on his non-existent technique. He was going to restrain himself, he didn't want anyone to be stupidly injured. Even a long stick can become a deadly weapon. Akwe made a barely noticeable nodding gesture and so with a shake of his head, Liam picked his weapon up. At this point, most of the clan was here, words of what was happening having been passed from one NA6 to another but never altered. Myruk with two tea clothes behind him arrived, waving between the small sea of blue bodies they stopped after climbing a large stone that gave them an optimum line of sight for what was going to happen and close enough to hear. Tuti asked to take a more comfortable seat using Myruk's shoulder as a chin rest, to both his great joy and annoyance. He expertly dodged the question, one was his father, and the other his savior and benefactor. He would prefer none would fight but saying he wasn't excited about what was to come would be a lie. I feel like a circus animal, Liam noted, having so many eyes over him wasn't new, but this feeling of being seen as a strange creature never vanished. It wasn't that the NA6 here were malicious, just curious and unused to him being here, at most he was a few hours per week in their settlement. He was a strange creature for them, garnering a great amount of attention for the smallest of details and actions was a given. Taking a deep breath he closed his and opened his eyes focusing on the Olangi chief, muscles tensing up he went on the attack. It was fast. Spear thrusting toward the NA6's chest yet it didn't hit as the lost child training weapon was deviated toward the ground with a simple flick of his weapon and use of his range advantage. This was but the start as Liam gained the control back and wiped his weapon as if it were a baseball bat to only end up missing again, the NA6 having crouched down. Liam's eyes narrowed at that, that wasn't that he attacked too slow but that he was predictable, his attacks were telegraphed. How do I fix this? He wondered face hard and focused, cold ethereal grey eyes never leaving their target, thrusting his spear's blunt wooden head again and again and again, each time aiming for a specific, belly, chest, shoulder, calf, they entered a rhythm it was as if a quay almost danced, predicting each of his moves before he even started. A dance that no humans and nearly no NA6 could follow to such was how fast and unpredictable it was. The crowd all around was mesmerized by it. One kept on dodging and diverting hits due to sheer experience of more than half a century, body control and deduction skill while the other attacked on repeat, 
never stopping or pausing once. He followed the first as if the principle of exhaustion was but a suggestion, each of his attacks getting faster, more precise, and more chaotic yet coordinated with one another, telegraphed and yet unpredictable. This incessant and ever-improving reign of attack was what shocked many, a Quay being first as he could directly feel it. The lost child was already adapting, improving, and learning, recognizing each of his movements and their patterns. The Oloiktan was relieved none of it was serious, it was almost scary to see such a quick changement. Not even two minutes had passed. Almost as if Liam was relearning. The difference in stature and weapon reach had many effects here and not helping in the matter of Liam hitting, he could attack with more strength or throw his weapon, but at that point sparring is pointless. He could win the fight but that wasn't the point here, the point is learning. Though he still will. And the Oloiktan was putting his entire focus toward dodging or redirecting blows whenever possible with an ease he found excessively frustrating. This continued for two impossibly long minutes, Liam used both hands equally, changing movement and targets but none hit and this caused a slight annoyance to rise within him but it came with respect and a sort of admiration toward the NA6 more than impressive body control and coordination. There was so much to learn, each of the NA6 movements was perfect, calculated even, they balanced speed, flexibility, agility and even grace to all in human degrees boosted with an experience only age could give. It was uncanny but again he wasn't too far in those inhuman aspects either. Liam suddenly stopped attacking, breaking the rhythm and confusing everyone, he then sidestepped, slightly crouched in a tenth of a second, increasing the size difference, never letting his eyes off his target. And then he thrust his weapon at the chief's left shoulder. The NA6 knew the human was going to do something but not exactly what still anticipated where he would be hit and so was already prepared to divert and dodge the attack but the attack suddenly stopped before even reaching him. This confused the NA6 for the briefest of instants but that was enough for the lost child as with an almost growl breaking his stone-cold face he continued his assault, pushing his entire upper body weight behind his attack. The NA6 eyes wished slightly as he blocked with the upper body of his spear but it was in vain. He couldn't block the attack from the lost child he was caught off guard and it was made in such a way he was forced to use the most damaged part of his weapon due to how frequently it was used during this fight. It was on purpose that much he related and he also realized this was going to be unpleasant. The spear broke a Quay's weapon in half, it flew high and spun into the air, while Liam's weapon went through it and continued and connected with his shoulder and it broke apart transferring enough force to crack open several human skulls in rapid succession. What was heard was a loud sound of wood snapping followed by an echoing pop and crack sound then the NA6 felt himself gravity abandon its hold on him as he was lifted from the ground by at least a third of his height and flew for at least his height in length before falling hard on the soft purple-green grass. There was silence, the crowd looking in shock only a small portion he going to understand what happened while the others registered what they were seeing. Liam moved, face calm, and a faint satisfied smile on his face his weapon falling to the ground he crouched down, he remarked that NA6's eyes were lost in thought his breathing ragged. The lost child did a strange action for the native, he gave his left hand toward the right and waited, a quay even if confused with the action grabbed the hand with his right and was then yanked up by the smaller being as if he waited less than a leaf and the strength behind the grip made him feel like his bone might as well be twig for the lost child. A quay's eyes cleared up as he properly propped himself up with Liam's help, the agony around his shoulder only helping but even a smile if pained appeared and only grew bigger as his. A strange sight for Liam and even more for everyone else present, particularly Myrock. Ha 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 ha. Incredible. Simply incredible. Aarg. You hit hard. You are something else. That was a very good trick, the Oloiktan broke the pending silence a slightly pained expression on his face as he breathed in and out. His left shoulder shagging he closed his eyes and he grabbed it with his right hand and in one swift motion slocked it back in place a muffled groan of pain escaping his lips as a result. Damn. I hope I didn't damage his shoulder too much, Liam thought at the sight of someone popping his shoulder back in as if it was nothing. On another note he didn't understand why Aquay was so happy, 
then he understood why and that greatly changed how he saw the NA6. A battle junkie, one that might as well be his great-grandpa in terms of age. Chapter 43 Time of Great Time of Sorrow to Come A few minutes later after the spar Liam was back wearing his chest plate, backpack placed to the side he was in a structure akin to a teepee but exponentially bigger, almost the size of a house, roughly cut wood beam with bones holding a hide sewn of various animals skin, some not even from the plains. In front of him sitting upon a stone covered in soft plant material with a backrest was a quay his face twisting in pain as the tzahik tended to his left shoulder. You asked for this, Akwe. Stupid actions earn you stupid dangerous consequences, you're lucky it was a spar, I can see yet again why you are the father of your son. He got this stupidity from somewhere, Morelli said in a low tone the emotion behind was a hint of something akin to mockery for the Oloiktan's actions. She took a concoction that was shimmering above a small fire at her right side with her wrinkled hand, killing the fire with a clay plate as she did so before giving it to a quay, it was a mix of the pink aloe vera, something akin to honey but gold in color and a mix of powdered plants. Ignoring the old hag's words, the same words he heard hundreds of times he gulped as rapidly as he physically could the mixture, stopping himself from gagging at the taste. For a human, it would taste sweet with a hint of spiciness but again the equivalent of taste buds for NA6 were fundamentally different from humans ones in every aspect besides their function as one of the senses. You hit hard, Liam. And by all means, you surely did hold back. It felt as if my shoulder was going to be ripped off, Aque said toward the human who simply nodded before he continued, Liam's face hardened and he spoke, the entire atmosphere becoming deadly silent. On the side one frowned Aque, face becoming solemn while Morelli stayed calm, composed as if knowing and both the chief and lost child knew she knew more than she let out. Extremely annoying but she was rational and wanted only the good of her clan even if she was senile. He continued, stating the obvious and both knew what was to be announced would be unpleasant. I understand. This fact is known for some time to the point it could be considered old. But this is none of our matter. Akwe said, not really following where Liam was going while the Tzahik only closed her eyes pensively. Liam continued with no small amount of venom and something akin to despair at something out of his control, this is an inevitability, I do not know when but it will happen, the conflict will but expand, expand, and expand. The ones leading RDA will not abandon their cash cow using diplomacy, particularly with the people being judged as simple-minded wild beasts needing to be tamed or culled to extinction. War will happen, that's a certainty. Even if Cripple Guy succeeds the RDA will still want more and more until nothing valuable remains of consequence to everything but themselves be damned. But for an alliance between most clans to happen more than my words are needed, Liam thought. Thanks to Overseer and his communication with the two scientists he was aware of many ongoing things about the RDA such as Jake Sully. Though as of now nothing truly concrete on the manpower and full resource of Hell's Gate, this lack of more concrete data was because neither Grace nor Max had the necessary clearance level or authority to have access to such data. But Liam still got an overall idea and a grasp of most of what the RDA down on Pandora had such as what material their equipment and vehicles are made of, like windshields made of a type of synthetic gem as hard as diamond but resistant to extreme physical strains and temperature variation, while the metal used is, to put it mildly, whatever was found in the ground that made mediocre alloys for what it must for but nothing exceptional. Not that they couldn't do better, they simply didn't have the need to. After all, the savages don't have anything to fight them. Another point was that the RDA machines weren't the newest, some being four decades old and from outdated if slightly altered blueprints for Pandora's hazardous environment. Blueprints he couldn't get his hands on due to them being unaccessible to the two scientists, again. And for more than hierarchical reasons, the blueprints were stored within the computers that controlled the giant 3D printer-like machines. They didn't craft their own machines by hand with those printers at hand and it translates as one of the reasons why there was a great lack of engineers but it was compensated by non-self-aware ace that were tasked with cleaning toilets, helping carry heavy charges, regulating the air quality, to building and repairing aircraft and other menial tasks. 
it was their purpose and that made them a weakness. The RDA here was limited in terms of manpower, resources, and machine, and they didn't use the top of the top in terms of technology due to various laws, cutting corners, and how old the base was but all way more advanced than technology he was used to before this. Powerful but not invincible and most important of all, the ones in their possession were arrogant and ignorant. Conflicts he couldn't stop at best directly influencing now will put him as a target and not stop the RDA from continuing its activities one bit as they will divert a figment of their earlier mentioned resources specifically aiming for him. The ex-Marine will learn about him, Jake was playing the spy within the Omatakea clan not realizing he was going native and that means mention of his existence will be brought up as he learns their language and ways. And it's what happened, even if it's under his title, he knew of this because Grace asked with Overseer and he gave an affirmative response. He supposed this brought up various other questions but as far as he knew she didn't ask any. But being discovered this way was a thing he was aware of from the moment he was in contact with the native. NA6 will speak about him to others be they other NA6, Avatar, or humans. Or Iwa herself. His secrecy was going to be not so secret in the next few months and then there were people like Norm Spellman, Grace's new assistant. He supposed this new one will also need to be informed about him to avoid potential complications as from what Max told it was almost a mental breakdown for Grace. In another aspect, he was glad Grace had the immediate response of taking Jake and Norm to a remote base in the Hallelujah Mountains, though unknown to her it helped him. It gave him more time. And it has happened. Grace having asked if he was this individual with this title and his answer was affirmative. He was and could only prepare, not being alone being one of them. The Olangi clan being the first on the list, he wasn't a leader, at least not in that sense, and wouldn't act as such, not that he ever could. The NA6 even if on friendly terms wouldn't let this happen like this even if it was a direct order from Iwa herself, he didn't lie to himself that he was and will be alienated. He wasn't one of them, never pretended to be or ever wanted to. But his words would hold a lot of weight and he will make sure they do. Even if it means the usage of force. Akwe frowned, face deep in thought. This was sudden, not what he expected, or more precisely what he didn't wish to hear. Deep down he knew conflict was inevitable, but he couldn't play the ostrich for all of his life. He couldn't comprehend what it truly entailed the scale of it that is, outside of what was told being horrifying and true. He trusted the lost child's words never would he doubt him but there must be other options as he was aware of what it meant. War. A word rarely if ever heard, NA6 conflicts were rare though only in rarer cases they became bloody, and as for war. It wasn't a foreign concept. Only a few instances of such events truly were heard of one that affected the entirety of the people was supposed to be the reason the three laws of Iwa existed. He personally experienced many battles, he was a warrior, but if what he heard was correct and even if he underestimated them, the sheer madness of what they represented. Birds of metal impervious to the strongest of arrows shot by the most skilled of archers that would rain down fire from the sky upon the land without discrimination, metal weapons that with loud deafening noise and flash of light killed instantaneously from a great distance, suit of metal that made them fight on equal ground, and giant creatures of metal bigger than anything from the land should be capable of devouring entire forest in mere days. Akwe didn't fully believe all due to Tail's tendency to twist facts but he understood it held way more than a few inklings of truth and in any case. He wasn't delusional, he couldn't see how winning was even a possibility. Not presently and as is. If they could cause great damage to the respected clan of the Omatakea in the rainforest where they are at their strongest he doubted on open fields his clan would fare better. Though he didn't despair or feel great fear. But we have time. Not much, not even for the rainy season to end but that is what we have and the time I have estimated before the war start, Liam tried and failed to reassure both his interlocutors, but they were not the ones to panic for so little. This isn't pleasant, a great calamity, a time of great sorrow you are speaking of but one that wasn't unanticipated. I believe you as your words echo the ones of the All-Mother. If you deemed it apt to speak with us now then you have plans, Liam Cram, may we know them and what do you ask for? You have reasons, 
you follow rationality and the path to survival, the Tsahik said matter-of-factly, seeing where Liam was going but not what he wanted. Yes that is correct, it isn't truly out of the sole goodness of my heart, it is for my own interest, my own gain, my survival. The RDA purpose will not shift when my existence becomes widely known to them, I will become another target, he said, voice getting colder by the second but holding only the truth. I will need your help, the help of your clan, the help of the ones under you, and that of many more. And you will need mine, they will need mine. This is born out of our mutual interest. Neither of us will survive without uniting, his implant glowed progressively brighter and brighter as more words came out. Indeed, the future is bleak but there is light, a light we can reach only with a form of unity. You have a better understanding of the sky people than us. But, for this unity to happen, someone capable of untiring the clans must be chosen by the All-Mother. The Tauric Macto, Morelli agreed almost instantly with the lost child. Ah, this. Yes. There was this in the movie with Jake, Liam thought it was something Tsu Mong, the Anure wandering artist, spoke fondly about but it didn't click, he simply thought of it as a random but important legend. A legend speaking of a warrior, savior and leader having tamed a Tauruk, great Leonopteryx, the largest and most majestic flying creature of this moon, an ultimate predator to aid within times of great sorrow. But ultimate predator as it was, it wasn't rocket-proof or would like having a multi-ton helicopter ram into its chest at full velocity, and he held great doubt on the rider's capability of uniting the various clans. Not forgetting if someone like that appeared at all to begin, thought Iwa will intervene, that he could almost feel it. But the Tauric Macto wasn't going to be him, it needed someone reckless and self-sacrificing and someone physically capable of taming an adult Tauric. He could hatch one but getting an adult one. No he couldn't and if he even could tame such a creature in this way it was extremely risky, to a suicidal degree. A Tauric Macto was a hero which he wasn't and didn't want to be. There will be luck involved, and why he was stacking the odds in his and the people's favors. Aquay didn't speak, he wanted to convince himself Liam was overreacting and overestimating the RDA and how horrible they could be but the words of Morelli drenched the amber of doubt to his great sadness. And so he lifted his right hand, attracting the attention of the other two. The Alangi clan will support an ally with the lost child for what is to come, and I vow upon my name, blood and soul to uphold those words. Personally, those words I will uphold, savior of my son and the Tsakaram and architect of metal. What do you have planned for the future, Liam, the Oloiktan said at the end with an almost feral smile forming at the end his yellow eyes staring into the silvery one of Liam. On the side Morelli closed her eyes, this will need an apt ceremony under the tree of divergence such words Aquay said weren't light such as the subjects involved. It needed to be officialized with the clan, war was going to happen whether she liked it or not and it was the same for every member of the Olangi clan. The elders will not be pleased, well some as the others were warriors and wanted to be back on the ride. People of all ages and sexes will die yet she wasn't despairing, on the contrary, she felt confident. Yet still a deep feeling of sadness was within her old heart for tragedies that are to come and not only for her clan. Liam nodded and said, a thin confident smile forming as he opened his backpack and took several objects, words of extreme arrogance to some but holding yet again only the truth, the RDA has access to technology from 2150 and uses the one from 2050, laws or not they could do better but they didn't, they can use antimatter safely and have a super metal that broke the regular laws of physics. A century is an eternity in terms of technological advancement with the use of modern standards of advancement and even more for him. Primitive in many aspects or not, the RDA on Pandora is still the most powerful by a long shot. Anyway. The objects consisted of two long and thin black smoothened pieces of wood both with different ends that he clipped together, Aque realized what this was at this instant then the strange stone objects he added one by one until it made a strangely shaped arrow to then add in the other end red flat piece of material only confirmed it. An arrow, one adapted to NA6 as it was nearly Liam's length in height. The chief mumbled visible confusion on his features. 
Outside of looking odd if masterfully crafted and unbalanced, it didn't look like much. Yes but one that creates fire, an explosion. An explosion is only possible with the black liquid found underground, Liam said after putting the arrow together, it was way bigger than the one he usually does. For him it was a lance, this size let him put a more explosive concoction within the arrowhead for a stronger explosion which here is made of ceramic, even metal such as bronze will be better. It wasn't a random decision he switched from bronze to ceramic here. Metal will be more resilient to shock and the environment, so safer and more stable that was a fact but it cost more in resources, skill, knowledge, and time. The first three only he possessed and didn't have the last to teach in so little time. And ceramic here used clay so it was not a metal from the ground. Adding that the petroleum used for the explosion, that he didn't know how NA6 will react as he didn't know what it represented for them, was it I was blood, some other fluid of the tree goddess, or something totally unrelated. Chapter 44 War Effort After Liam's spar with the Oloikton and his gift of the explosive arrows things drastically changed. He showed them the arrow's power by letting a quay test it on a rotting tree void of life in an area where no wildfire would have happened. His recent light injury did not stop him from using his bow, he had gotten way worse. The chief was, to put it mildly, horrified by the sheer destructive power but also amazed and fascinated at it if the smile was any indication. What was once a tree a third the size and girth of the one at his base, had become a fuming stump. Adding the light of the explosion and the shockwaves that shook his bones to the core, resonating deeply within his cranium. If it didn't blow up the RDA helicopter's blades it would greatly damage them and cause the vehicle to become almost uncontrollable in the air potentially leading to a crash. Flying was a complicated process, one problem, and gravity work again. They weren't alone and many show it after this event words of what was to come were announced by the Tsahik, Morelli, and traveled in the entirety of the clan. It didn't please anyone, some believing some not wanting to believe, but you can't deny reality. Reality does not care how you feel, at any given moment, and reality was that a war was coming. It was drastic and out of the blue but the announcement still hadn't had as much backlash as Liam anticipated, the opposite even, it didn't mean it was met with euphoria but neither did it was met with the other extreme that was despair. What followed a few days later was a short ceremony where an official alliance was made, present there were Liam, Morelli and Akwe, followed by the elders of the clan and more than NA6, all adult and able-bodied fighters. It was nearly the entire clan only being omitted the young from infants to teenagers, the pregnant females, the injured, sick and weak. It was a strange experience for Liam, he could remember it with extreme clarity. It was underground, precisely within the chamber where the Tree of Divergence was located. To go there he took Daisy, his slinger head he put in a backpack of leather made for this purpose, a fact that surprised the Olangi clan members but that was a welcomed one. In fact, it was something done regularly in their culture, but for this, they needed to kill the slinger's body, which they ate to collect the living head, then tamed it temporarily, to use the pheromones it produced. The pheromones were collected and stocked in a sort of dried-up fruit with a long and complicated process to then be filled with the regular heavy crude oil, web the super-dense one, found underground to conserve and transfer their property in the renewable petroleum. The mixture was then painted on specialized garments as the mixture irritated NA6's skin greatly, which might cause hallucinations and cause irrational fear. At least that's what 2T told him as to how they explored the depth in relative safety. Primitive didn't equate to stupid or less capable of improving and adapting to hurdles. The fact the head needed to be alone was important as it produced this pheromone only when separated he could guess it does this because it became incredibly vulnerable while in such a state. The body did the opposite of the head. It produced a pheromone that attracted prey, and he was sure those creatures knew how to use it. Both functions he could see many uses. Anyway. The chamber of the Tree of Divergence was magical, otherworldly, this effect of surrealness not having dissipated even if it was the second time he came down here. The pearly white bark and roots intertwined above a pond of a liquid so dark it almost absorbed the soft lavender light emitted by the inverted tree above. Liam walked in full armor, his helmet was opened, 
his feet treading carefully to not slip, even with the grip below his boot he was extremely heavy. His helmet was attached to his hip as several dozen of wood sprites floated all around him as soon as he entered, focusing in particular on his implant. This caused great surprise within the NA6, the elders in particular, he also felt as if an invisible gaze was on him, one that was amiable. It was confusing, to feel the underlying intent behind something like this brushing against him both physically and metaphysically, he had felt this presence last time but not this clearly and intensely. And so after a few minutes the ceremony began, the Tsahik and Oloik Tan below the tree connected their cue to the bioluminescent tendrils that would be this tree's equivalent of leaves. It was followed by the rest of the NA6 sitting cross-legged, they as well connecting their cue but with the roots instead a white pulse of bioluminescent light echoing with the ripple of the petroleum below. As for him, he stayed awkwardly to the side body covered in wood sprites as if hugging him, he didn't have a clue on what to do. Not the fault for not having asked but not having any clear answer, what he knew was that it was to be one with Iwa and the ones that you will fight with within troubled times. This you always keep a part of them within you, even after death and even if their spirits repose with the All-Mother. Something that could be interpreted in a lot of ways with the words themselves and the translation in English not diminishing the options. Connecting to the tree like everyone else was not a real option as it entailed him falling unconscious by envenoming himself with Daisy's venom. He trusted the two leaders of the Olangi clan but not to that degree and in any case it was something he didn't feel would be apt here. They were communicating with their ancestors he could only guess, in any case, it was a very important and private moment for them. He stayed this way for ten minutes before every NA6 disconnected at the same time, faces serene and solemn faces calm and what followed was something he would put on the doing of Aztecs from ancient times but with no death involved. In total silence, the Tsahik walked toward a naturally shaped cavity within the white roots and she slit her wrist with the blade of her necklace, a small and precise incision in one swift motion. Red droplets dripped within for several seconds until no blood dripped. The tree pulsed an ethereal light. Then the Oloik Tan who with his own blade did the same, after the elders one by one repeated the motion, followed by the other NA6, all happening in a religious and heavy silence. Each time the tree pulsed with light. Then the only one not having done this ritual was him. The wood sprites floated a bit away but never left him as he looked in confusion at the Tsahik and Oloik Tan for a brief moment on what to do. Liam approached the cavity, it was almost like an altar, one that was a third filled with the blood of a few hundred individuals, the sweet smell from the petroleum below and that of the blood wafting in the air not being as uncomfortable as he would like. He sighed and closed his eyes before his right gauntlet unclasped itself with a simple flick of his right hand while for his left a small knife shot out of his wrist as he grabbed it and did as the ones before him. The cut was done without hesitations on his part, it was clean, perfect, and already slowly healing due to its nature. This forced him to flex his muscle increasing the amount of blood dripping. His blood was thicker than any NA6, almost viscous, it was of a dark scarlet. He knew his blood was extremely rich in nutrients, oxygen, and more. He didn't do it with his left wrist due to an element being in higher concentration in that area than any other part of his body. His implant didn't work on magic even if for many the difference is non-existent. Though he doubted it would have done anything, and even then. It would take several decades for something to happen and several liters of blood while in a highly radioactive environment. But prevention is better than cure considering an error could in the worst case scenario end in the entirety of life within the Milky Way and he wasn't fully aware of everything. The tree emitted another soft pulse of light, the most powerful of all, the mixture of blood not oxidizing at the contact of air due to how fast the entire ceremony happened, just as the last and still no one spoke, the Tsahik crouched down and took at her waist what appeared to be a chalice carved from a bone. She filled it with the dark red liquid almost to the spilling point and Liam's suspicion came to become true about what was going to happen, she gave the chalice to him in an extremely respectful manner, with slow L and methodical movement. The Tsahik said, her voice low and soft yet enough to echo in the chamber, for everyone to hear. Liam closed his eyes, stopped breathing, and did as asked, drinking the entire contents of the chalice in one gulp 
his face slightly cringing at the coppery taste and how strange this entire situation was. It wasn't even that disgusting but extremely weird, wrong even from his point of view but he put himself in that situation and there were worse things. He simply assumed the consequences. This was followed by the Tsahik and Oloik Tan doing the same while he brought his left hand to his mouth, invoking water from his inventory to wash away the taste. And that was how he became an ally in blood, or blood brother, someone from another clan or in his case species that allied for as long as life was within them to one of the horse clans through this sacred if bloody ceremony that made them akin to a member of the clan yet not truly one, a family member yet a stranger. It was more symbolic than anything but the symbolism is everything within NA6 culture, not much different than humans. At least here there wasn't any child sacrificed. Day 220, the 10th of August in the middle of the day. Hmm, so Grace got the green pass to go to home tree though with the delay it must have been at minimum three days ago, Liam noted data from his armor connected to Overseer letting him know of the most recent message from the Xenobotanist. He continuously tweaked it, changing and optimizing it for the best result, and adding the Overseer program to it was logical. Adding quality of life features was all he could truly do, though was working and mostly finished on his shoulder turret. As for the Pandorium, quite a bit of progress was made, he managed to melt by transferring the energy generated by an induction forge toward the metal. Ineffective and pretty slow but it worked the fabricator while very useful couldn't do everything. A tokamak, a machine to produce plasma then said plasma would be used as the heating energy of a forge, it would be what he wanted but he did with what he had on his hands. Such an advanced machine was not possible for now. A metal he was pretty much still ignorant about outside that it could be used as a stupidly powerful and versatile magnet that could be used in anything you want for any purpose that will require the intervention of the law of electromagnetism depending on how you shape its molecular structure from how it was cooled down to what other elements were used it has the potential to make said fundamental force your bit asterisk h in a 3D space of existences so to say. Little and vague were what he learned but it was still very exciting and it pushed him to want to learn more. So many possibilities but so little time, he didn't really have much time for studying this incredible material. Things went relatively fine from what he got on Grace's side, Jake was still oblivious about him being human but he still was aware of him as the lost child and that he was a strange hairy creature standing on two legs, with a strange glowing metal bit in its wrist. If it was a simple denial of reality, or that he didn't really care or thought it was some random fairy tale nonsense of the native, or that Jake was as sharp as a hammer, Grace's words not his, or a mix between the four Liam didn't know but the longer it stayed this way the better. As for the metal bit, he didn't receive a question from Grace but he will still need to mention it. There have been other topics of discussion in tandem such as when and where a potential meeting could be decided. Shit will hit the fan soon, he thought with a deep dissatisfied frown, his silver-gray eyes gazing at nothing in particular. Did I make a mistake? Please tell me I didn't in front of the lost child, a small squeaky voice interrupted his internal rambling and he looked down, it was a preteen modeling clay into a precise shape, one of the components of the ceramic explosive arrowhead. No, I was just lost in my thoughts. And you don't have to worry, that is remarkable work you have done there Elia, he praised the NA6 with a gentle smile, something that seemed almost wrong with his features. A compliment that did hit home as the NA6 immediately get back to work with great enthusiasm. He remembered every NA6 name, face and character he ever met and spoke to, not because he particularly spent a lot of time individually with each, he picked those instinctively and they never left his memories. What Elia was doing was participating in the war effort, surprisingly this wasn't Liam who gave them the idea but Myrug, even if he was going to do it. The teen felt useless and didn't want to feel like this, so he acted. So Liam taught them how to do ceramic based on clay with various mixes to have different results but here was the one used for the arrowhead. The way how to make red silicon and use it to make the fletching, plastic vein, of the arrow via the use of mold and a hardening process using several plants. As for the arrow's shafts, only a certain type of wood was used. All of the components of the arrows follow relatively strict parameters to him, but vary for the NA6, 
particularly the arrowhead that needed to be an explosive hazard before being shot if it ever got damaged. Good things he taught the metric system and more before, it was of the utmost importance to have precision here. Explosives might be toys but they are very, very, dangerous toys. Alas, even precaution doesn't stop potential accidents from happening, even more so when it wasn't him doing the arrow. A fact the Olangi understood as he was quite vocal on the potential dangers, scaring a bit more than a few from ever using them but they will unless death is what they want, the most dangerous aspect of the RDA on what was to come is their air advantage. If some need to die for others to learn then so be it, he has done as much as he possibly could. This detail also pushed the ones in the war effort to work with as much care and precision as they mentally and physically could. The quality of their work will decide whether their clan mates survive or die. A very important task. In a war of such importance, everyone needs to participate in one way or another. Forcing children to work was not something Liam was a fan of, even less since it was to make weapons but the morals of a 21st century man from a first world country held little importance here. Chapter 45 Second Meeting with the Tree Goddess Day 229 the last few nine days and the one before had been extremely productive with a total of nearly 500 explosive arrows made, a fourth of which were done by him. Productive, maybe but not enough for Liam's comfort. The collection of the extremely dense oil necessary for their fabrication was easy with the clan accord, even if Liam learned it wasn't so much of a problem to collect it, all was good as long as no harm was done to the tree of divergence. The NA6 weren't unfamiliar with using it as well for various rituals. Though he didn't divulge the formula as it was pointless since he could largely produce enough of it on his own and the NA6 didn't possess the technical equipment and knowledge to begin with for them to be of any help. The number of arrows wasn't his only worry, he had no viable answer for direct defense against artillery outside of using the environment and tricks. He didn't hide the weapons the enemies would have, such as firearms from sniper rifles, regular rifles, pistols, and shotguns of which all NA6 except one were feeling from unease to fear but it only seemed to give them even more motivation to win. They named them death sticks, you pointed at something pressed the trigger, and what you pointed at it gained a new hole. The exception was Myruk who to put it mildly became utterly fascinated while Tuti realizes that the bang bang creatures that were around Liam's home could have killed them and to know the lost child was in possession of such creatures was extremely reassuring. The fact he knew this much earned questioning gaze from them, a quay in particular, and as such he didn't hide he had an allied connection within the RDA but that they were weak within and could but give snippets of information. This revelation went without a problem, his words being almost equal to that of the Tsahik and Oloiktan as he was their blood brother and someone that time and time again proved to be trustworthy. It helped morale as well. But even then that wasn't going to cut it for Liam, Overseer will see new future use as the programs didn't stay without updates or nasty surprises. He didn't connect to the main and subsystems of Hell's Gate for one reason, to stay hidden and lay low. Though he did some probing and asked questions to make sure it would somewhat work. He was no hacker, never coded as a sous chef, and he wasn't all-knowing on that subject but still one if not the most knowledgeable on Pandora on that subject. Either way, he knew enough to cause extensive damage. And in the worst of worst case scenarios having the possibility of shutting down the entire base was here, even if it will kill everyone from infants to random innocent workers, mercenaries and even the two scientists he started to see as friends. He wasn't one to do much in precision when it was to get rid of a threat when no other choice remained the humans needed a perfectly controlled environment where each parameter could make the difference between life and death. He absolutely didn't want to do this and greatly doubted he even could do it but having the option was a must. Currently, Liam was alone, deep in the depth of the Great Plain. Extending his armored left hand, a miniature crossbow appeared on the upper part, the metallic string drawing itself back that ended with a soft click when it was armed right after reality bent and a metallic arrowhead appeared neatly within the crossbow. Attached to it was a cable that led to a coil that appeared within the closed palm of Liam. A simple trick on how he could use his inventory, he had a small cylindrical area of which his implant was the center of around 8.10 cm, 
3.2 in, in radius and 37.10 cm, 14.6 in, in length. In this designated area, except from inside him of his body and matter in a more or less solid state of being, he could summon what was inside his inventory. Their size and volume were not important as they didn't strictly follow what one might call regular physics. The rest was simply practice, like a muscle, to gain better control and precision letting him do what he just did. He snuffed a yawn out, his line of sight multiplied tenfold by his helmet he moved his left hand up. The sound of the string being snapped shut echoed as the bolt flew out, the cable enrolling itself between his index and middle finger as it followed it. It planted itself deeply within a root above while three claws in the arrowhead snapped open, locking it where it was. Tugging it with a bit of force several times to see if it held correctly Liam then entangled the cable to his left hand then put a foot behind and hunched slightly over letting gravity to the test as he fell, advancing toward a lower root. Pressing a button on the side of the coil and the hook within the root above detached itself and the cable rapidly reeled itself back. He repeated this process several times rapidly going down until he was in front of a hole in the cave's wall, purple light emitting out of it. Right where he wanted to go. He didn't get attacked by any creature as he got the scented petroleum from the Olangi, who knew he was down there but not exactly why. Even with explosive arrows, an entire clan backing him up, allies within the RDA, and a trump card. He wanted, no he and the NA6 needed more to be certain a victory was assured and the loss of life on their side was as minimal as possible. Entering he was met with the now all too familiar but still otherworldly sight of the tree of divergence, the sound of his footsteps echoed as he approached. His helmet unfolded revealing his face. Wood sprites floated all around him and towards each of the entrances and exits, creating white barriers with their small and delicate floating body. The ever-presence of something greater yet not in the air focused on him with a mix of curiosity and anticipation. Liam's upper armor, from belly to head then unclasped itself, it was stored within his inventory. This revealed the form-fitting nylon titanium chainmail suit underneath which was then unzipped and taken off cleanly without a hurdle making him bare-chested. That was oddly sexual. Whatever. Liam thought amusedly as he walked toward one of the thickest intertwined roots right below the base of the tree. It looked almost like an armchair, even if the term throne would be more apt but that thought was dashed aside as he sat on it and a small syringe filled with a translucent blue liquid appeared within his left palm, Slinger's venom. Daisy's venom to be exact. The quantity unknown to him was enough to permanently paralyze and potentially kill a grown elephant bull and would do the same to him if his nervous system couldn't purge foreign substances and regenerate itself with extreme effectiveness. Let's do it, he mumbled, gazing up he saw hundreds of wood sprites dancing in the air, he sighed softly. His heart beat faster and stronger in trepidation as he felt five dozen thin furry tendrils growing out of the roots embracing his back. He stabbed the needle right into the most prominent vein of the crook of his right arm, injecting the venom he felt nothing for the first few seconds as the foreign substance circled through his body then a burning sensation was felt all over his body for a good minutes. Then the unpleasant sensation suddenly vanished as if the pain was but a foreign concept, he stored the syringe in his inventory. The feeling over his right arm was the first to go as he closed his eyes. Letting himself go he felt the brunt force of all the stress and exhaustion bottled up suddenly go as more of his rapidly numbing body got covered in a blanket of wood sprites and thin roots tendrils. The last sensation was both numb and clear, his implant was covered by the thin roots in a cradling manner, in a way his entire exposed body was. It shouldn't be comfortable by all metrics yet he found it so. And so he fell into a mix between a coma, a sleep, and a vegetative state due to a venom-induced vegetative state. Liam's eyes opened again to a different sight, an ever-shifting skin between a human and a transparent film letting him see blue and purple veins and nerves. He unfolded his completely nude body from its fetal position, his mind crystal clear, and structured and all emotions muted to the extreme as he gazed around. Still as fascinating, he mumbled willing the hexagonal metal structure to float above his palm, his voice as deep as in the physical world but with an inhuman echo to it and echoes, he suddenly shifted himself up as he felt a familiar presence. Indeed, it is. 
it is a fact that will never change but you. Even more so, you are different not only in form but in nature and quality. Body and mind and soul can be dissociative in infinitely rare cases, and have unique qualities to them be they positive, negative, or neutral in effect. But even, you. You are different from the ephemeral beings that are my children and the children from worlds of far distant stars. But that is not to hear our words about this subject that you have come down here Liam, correct, the unnerving and enchanting voice of the All-Mother resonated from below him, even if directions as a concept held little value in such a place. Liam looked down and saw the spirit form of the Tree of Divergence gazing up at him. Then the space suddenly shifted and both were in a face-to-face -face position, the dissension between futuristic living technology and an untampered primeval alien forest both pulsing at different rhythms and with distinct energy. All for both of them to see. He noted the lack of little one, and wanted to learn more about what she was speaking of but she was right. He didn't come here to speak about body, mind, and soul. And by ephemeral being did she mean mortals? To her scale of time, a 100,000 years old being will be as mortal as one who lives 30 minutes. In any case, this was a question for a less tumultuous time. Greeting Iwa, this is correct. I have come to request of you for your direct intervention in the incoming war, he moved slightly forwards and said both firmly and calmly, perfectly aware of what his request entailed and how arrogant it was. There was a long drawn out silence before the fragment of the All Mother spoke again, a thin, inhuman, smile forming over her elegant wooden feature. We do not intervene more than what is deemed necessary in those matters, the wars and conflicts of our children are not ours to solve as it impedes their growth and development. Too much death, each a life with dreams, regrets, purposes, and a part of us, all but vanished due to our past mistakes, she said sadly the several hundreds of tendrils that were her hair flashing slightly brighter. Liam frowned at that, it was what he had expected but he let her continue, not that he would have ever stopped her. We have chosen one of the dream walkers of the sky people to be the one to ride the last shadow and lead the clans of my children through the incoming time of great sorrow and bring peace. But that is for him to act upon this opportunity, she added, this was important information. Dreamwalkers were what the NA6 called the Avatar's drivers, it was a he so from what he knew it was either Jake or Norm as even if there were other male drivers he seriously doubted Iwa chose someone else. It was an incredible relief to know this but again it didn't stop the individual in question from dying. It is not a simple conflict or war with the NA6, it is far, far greater. The nature of this war is alien in essence to any conflict the people ever faced and you have seen. Liam paused before continuing to explain his point directly to the goddess, even with my help and a Toric Macto of your choosing that will create a coalition of clans this will not be enough. This war as you have mistaken, is not only theirs and mine, it is yours. Losing or having a truce is not an option. Losing will end in the total annihilation of the people against them, the enslavement of the others, my capture, or death and destruction of everything you have known, loved, and built. It is not a matter of feeling or wanting, it is a matter of survival for both of us and your children. While a truce is but a delay of the inevitable and will never happen without great, too great loss. A loss I cannot accept, each word becomes ever so impactful on the All-Mother. Distress could almost be felt, the cold and calculating kind as paradoxical as it was making it all the more impactful yet there was no begging. He was direct, offensively so, speaking to her in a way none had before, like an equal speaking to another, and in a way this wouldn't be far from the truth. He was free of fear in her presence, truthful, and respectful of his own words, those were one of the few reasons before many more he garnered her interest and more. To say he was the most fascinating existence she ever had the chance to be in contact with during the course of her very long life would be but the truth. He spoke of what he believed was the truth, and it was more than a simple belief, it was reality and its potential consequences. The being in front of her was a realist that saw and knew a lot, too much for his mental health in fact as she could see. She closed her pearly white glowing eyes before opening them again and gracefully and slowly approached toward the barrier between the two of them, gliding on the ever-shifting flora as she did so. 
We, she froze, Liam's eyes widened to the extreme, the hexagonal particles around him orbiting faster and faster while the metal ring around him spun with such a velocity they appeared frozen in time as the world trembled. One of the tufts of hair of the fragment of the All Mother was suddenly violently ripped off with a fraction of her skull and shredded apart in a shower of crimson red blood and she screamed. A scream that was inhuman, incomprehensible, twisted but yet Liam knew from his very being that no words were needed the emotions were clear to him in a way he couldn't have thought possible to the point he could feel them to a lesser degree. And it was a cry full of anguish, pain, loss, despair, disappointment, sadness, regret, and fury. Cold and burning fury. Thanks for listening.